Hi guys. I would like to invite you to the audiobook service where we upload more than 300 hours of different audiobooks a week, link in details in the video description. Chapter 1 As the sun was setting, the sky suddenly erupted into a thunderstorm. The horizon still held half of the sun, with the scorching heat waves meeting the lightning that pierced the sky. However, the lightning vanished in an instant, leaving behind a trail of smoke-white mist. The rain descended swiftly, creating a dazzling and torrential sun shower spectacle. This rain came without any warning but was quite timely, instantly dispelling the sultriness and oppression brought by days of high temperatures. The weather mimicry system how many times has it been this year? In the rain-covered city, some elderly individuals with white hair looked up at the sky, murmuring thoughtfully. New Asia Alliance, an island in the eastern region. Amid lush mountains and forests, a black umbrella moved quickly in the rain. The person holding the umbrella had an obscured face, and behind them was a protruding section of a long and thin package. The black non-slip fabric had been soaked, dripping water continuously. Despite the rough and uneven mountain path, this person moved effortlessly, agile like a hawk soaring up and down. Upon reaching halfway up the mountain, the umbrella tilted, revealing a fair and charming face. The young girl's dark eyes were lowered as she peered through the wet rain curtain, looking down the mountain from a distance. Perhaps due to the rain, the animals in the mountains had returned to their nests, creating an unusually desolate atmosphere. The only commotion came from the port on the opposite side. This was an isolated island with a mountain facing the sea, surrounded by a complex network of transportation routes. At regular intervals, various large transport ships sailed across the sea in an orderly fashion. The sky was dominated by public airways controlled by the Alliance, with state-of-the-art airships shuttling amidst them. The dazzling shapes of these airships, adorned with neon signal lights of different colors, created a mesmerizing and dreamy illusion, especially in the hazy rain. However, if one were to cast their gaze towards the depths of the ground, clusters of crowded and affordable housing, the air tainted with the salty smell of the sea. Faces of people coming and going, fatigued and numb, all acted like a splash of cold water, instantly sobering anyone up. This place wasn't a paradise, and it couldn't even be called a city. The prosperity of the sky was accelerating the decay on the ground. The budding nobility of the new civilization looked on coldly at the struggles of the ruins of the old civilization. The stark contradiction between the two led to District 177 consistently receiving an F grade in the Alliance's comprehensive development evaluations. F-177 District, a forsaken land unworthy even of its name. Because it couldn't catch up with the glorious 30 years of rapid technological advancement in the history of the new Asia Alliance, missing out on the opportunity of economic boom. District 177, relying solely on the export of marine products, gradually became the most barren digital city within the Alliancian underdeveloped area that could be counted on fingers. After leaving the mountain range, the rain suddenly stopped, as if entering a melancholic barrier. The distinct salty air of District 177 struck her face. The young girl closed her umbrella and carefully shook off the rainwater. After passing through a checkpoint, she continued forward. Nearby at the dock, a respected local sailor was smoking with a troubled expression. Beside him, a young woman anxiously tugged at his sleeve. Old Cheng, my husband Abing has been out to sea for almost half a month. Nothing bad will happen, right? The sailor furrowed his brows and blew out a long smoke ring. The Alliance requested a local guide this time, and Bing has been out to sea since he was eleven or twelve. He's the most experienced here. Don't worry too much, nothing will happen. The woman still wasn't reassured. But my eyelids have been twitching these past two days, and my heart's not at ease. With a resentful tone, she pulled the man's sleeve. This job was introduced by you. You said the so-called foreign research team studying ocean currents offered good money for minimal work. It was easy money for a quick trip. It was because of that, that Abing agreed. You can't just ignore whether he lives or dies. The sailor was being pulled and his face showed his frustration. He mumbled, wait a bit longer. The seas have been restless lately. If we don't get any news in a couple of days, I'll send someone out to search. Catching a glimpse of the young girl approaching, 
the sailor halted his words, and a gentle smile appeared on his weathered face. Looks like girl Ku is back. Song Ku respectfully greeted, Grandpa Cheng. Old Cheng smiled as he looked her over. Why are you all sweaty? Tired today. Song Ku obediently shook her head, a small smile playing on her lips. When she smiled, a shallow dimple appeared on her cheek, making her look particularly cute. The woman beside them turned her head, shooting a harsh glare at Song Ku, her eyes filled with lingering anger. Song Ku was always sensitive to the emotions of others. With a single glance, she instantly retracted her smile, and the dimple vanished in an instant. She nodded politely at Old Cheng and remained silent. The woman was known as Aunt Qing, a refugee who had come to District 177 years ago. She had always looked down on the indigenous people like Song Ku. Song Ku felt that both she and her chubby son were a little mean. Maybe because she herself didn't talk much, whenever they met, Aunt Qing would always make snide remarks in a sarcastic manner. Her husband, Bing, was a local resident and a straightforward and honest person. He had worked in Old Cheng's transportation team, and he had even given Song Ku some candy when she was a child. During this period, many research teams had come to District 177 to study various things, such as meteorology, ocean currents, and reportedly even microbial communities. Bing, experienced and willing to endure hardships, was happy to work as a guide for them to earn some extra money. But who would have thought he had gone missing? As Song Ku thought about Bing's disappearance at sea, she walked forward in silence. Passing by a fishing boat that was unloading its catch, several young men in black waders with rolled up sleeves were busy on board. S.S. Ouch! Someone suddenly exclaimed as they cast a net. What happened, Xiao Lu? Why the big fuss? A person nearby immediately asked with concern. Bad luck, I got bitten by a fish. Are you kidding? A few mullets could bite you. Just trying to be lazy, huh? No, really. It was the fish. If you don't believe me, take a look. The person called Xiao Lu was met with ridicule from his companions. His face turned bright red, and he pulled off his gloves with a grimace, showing them the deep gash on his hand. Song Ku had excellent eyesight. Following the sound, she saw from a distance that his palm was bloody and torn, the wound deep. Those who often did manual labor on the docks were accustomed to getting injured, so it wasn't taken too seriously. They continued to laugh and joke around. Oh, wow, this little guy's quite fierce. He might fetch a good price, someone said. Xiao Lu, come here and identify which fish did it. I'll stew it for you to vent your anger. Even Xiao Lu, who was injured, didn't seem to care much. After wiping off the bloodstains casually, he put his gloves back on. This fish had some strength today, it was stronger than me. Pulling in the net wasn't easy. Song Ku withdrew her gaze and spun around on her tiptoes, turning back in the direction of home. The lively scene behind her grew increasingly distant, and her figure gradually faded away, leaving her with a sense of unbelonging loneliness. After a few steps, she belatedly looked up at the sky. The fishing ban had just lifted, and autumn was approaching in a few days. However, the scorching sun above showed no mercy, blazing on the horizon, radiating heat as if it wanted to turn everything in the world into ashes. Song Ku was drenched in sweat, her head throbbing from the relentless sun. She felt like a lump of poor quality cream, on the verge of melting at any moment. She sluggishly opened her umbrella again, this time to shield herself from the sun. The searing sensation around her eyes forced her to squint. This summer was just too hot. Twenty minutes later, Song Ku, drenched in sweat, navigated her way through the crowded and narrow cheap housing and stopped in front of a dilapidated small house. This was her home. She used her key to unlock the door, but right before entering, she hesitated, dawdling for a long time. Seeing that there was no movement for a long time, Song Ku persistently shifted a little to the side, peeking into her neighbor's home. Why was Aiming so quiet today? Aiming was a chatty magpie. They had a special bond, and his chatter was several times faster than hers. He greeted Song Ku every morning and evening without fail. 
It was like the eunuchs in the history books of the old civilization who stood by the palace door with their arms crossed over their chest, observing the movements of their master at all times. When Song Ku ventured out in the darkness of the night, it hummed secretively go for it, Song Ku. Hang in there, Song Ku. When Song Ku returned, completely exhausted, in the pitch black darkness, aiming flapped its wings and exclaimed, Got beaten again today. Beaten again. Aiming, who usually liked to show off, what was up with it today? Song Ku went around to the base of the neighbor's wall, took a couple of steps back, crouched, gathered her strength, and with a swift movement, leaped onto the top of the wall. Then, she adeptly opened the sparse fence, peered inside, and softly called her friend, Aiming, Ming. Aiming had its back turned to Song Ku, lying low in its bamboo-made magpie cage. It appeared sluggish and weary. When it heard her voice, it took a good while to lift its head, laboriously flapping its wings to move closer. Its orange beak lightly pecked at her palm as a greeting. Song Ku glanced at the empty food trough. Although Aiming was usually free-range, the neighbor grandmother fed it daily, so it shouldn't be hungry. Was it throwing a fit because there was no food today? She hopped down from the wall, patted her knees, and slipped through her own front gate. She picked a string of dark and lustrous grapes from the green vines in the courtyard, swiftly turned back to the wall, and tossed it gently down, saying, Aiming, eat, eat something tasty. After just a while, Aiming looked even more listless. It remained curled up in the corner against the wall, not moving at all, not even lifting its head. Song Ku grew anxious, prodding its head with the grapevine. Unexpectedly, Aiming suddenly threw its neck back and let out a miserable scream, the hoarse ending note sounding particularly piercing. Startled, Song Ku refrained from further antics, holding the grapes in place, waiting anxiously for a while. Eventually, she confirmed that Aiming truly didn't want to pay her any mind. Dejectedly, she returned to her own home. Once inside, Song Ku eagerly unwrapped the package on her back, laying it out on the table. The long item inside slowly revealed itself it was an ancient Tang sword passed down from the era of the old civilization, a chilling and fierce weapon. Song Ku's eyes widened in awe as she touched the hilt of the sword, her hands reluctant to let it go. After admiring it, she retrieved a thick sketchbook from under the table, meticulously copying the details. Whenever she found a weapon she liked, Song Ku would painstakingly draw it, creating a detailed representation for future enjoyment. However, her preferences were varied and numerous, causing the book to grow thicker with each passing day. In the new era of civilization, the majority of cold weapons had lost their practical value, becoming relics and archaeological items. Song Ku was an anomaly. She wasn't interested in the new types of weapons that the Alliance had been promoting for the past few years she was only fascinated by the old civilization's blades. This sword was her master's recent acquisition, and she had only been permitted to borrow it after winning against her fellow disciples. She would have even considered sleeping with it if her master hadn't strictly prohibited it before she left the mountain. As for her master, he was the reason why she commuted twenty kilometers back and forth every day before dawn and in the dark. Song Ku had an extraordinary talent. Since she was a child, she exhibited astonishing physical strength and immense destructive power leading her grandfather to decide she should learn martial arts. She followed her grandfather for several years, wandering around, until they finally found a centuries-old martial arts training hall in Yu Mountain E-166 district. There, she found a historical martial arts training hall, led by Master Zhang Ting, who later became her benevolent master. It was rumored that he was a descendant of some lost Grand Marshal lineage, which gave him significant prestige. Yu Mountain belonged to an ecological landscape area and wasn't suitable for habitation. After considering the situation, her grandfather settled her down in the nearby notorious District F-177, known for its dirty and disorderly conditions. Since then, they never moved again. After thirty minutes of meticulous drawing, Song Ku stretched lazily and got up from the floor. The room was empty, except for a few large, standardized pieces of furniture, making it look bare. She walked into the kitchen, made herself a big bowl of plain noodles, sprinkled them with fresh green scallions, and even indulgently fried two sunny-side-up eggs. Once the noodles were ready, Song Ku carried the bowl, larger than her face, back to the living room. 
taking a bite of noodles, glancing at the tang sword on the table, taking another big bite, and then reluctantly looking back at the sketchbook indeed, it was a great appetite enhancer. Song Ku was an orphan her grandfather had taken in. She had no parents or siblings, truly on her own. A few years ago, her grandfather, her only companion, had passed away. She learned to live alone. Due to her inability to handle social interactions, she gradually descended to a point where the only company she had was a magpie from the neighbor's house. However, she didn't really care about the fact that no one talked to her, as she wasn't much of a talker herself. Because she had a stutter she was born with it. After finishing the noodles and cleaning the dishes, Song Ku sat back down on the floor and took out the old light screen left behind by her grandfather to start reading. This light screen was a task her grandfather had assigned her before he passed away. She was supposed to study for at least an hour every day. Due to certain circumstances, she dropped out of high school without completing her education. However, in this era of rapid development of the new civilization, the outside world was constantly changing. Her grandfather worried that she might grow up to be illiterate and unable to keep up with the times, so he had already set strict rules for her to study every day. At the very least, her level of education shouldn't fall too far behind others. After going through various options, Song Ku selected a book titled Particle Physics Advanced Microbiology from a corner of the cracked screen. With a dejected look, she started reading. The motion sensitive lamp above her head emitted a warm yellow light, making her feel drowsy. Song Ku tended to get sleepy while reading, and it was particularly intense today. Her eyelids felt like they were glued together and her upper and lower eyelids started fighting. Perhaps it was due to eating too much, and she felt weak. Her limbs were numb and lacked any sensation due to sleepiness. Bang! Suddenly, a loud crash echoed in her ears. Startled by the noise, Song Ku's head hit the floor as she tumbled over, and it took her a while to sit up sluggishly, holding her head. Realizing that something was amiss as she touched her head, she contemplated the situation. After all, her head wasn't made of iron how could it make such a loud noise? Song Ku lifted her eyelids and looked around in confusion. She saw a huge hole smashed in her window, and the floor was covered in shattered glass. The damp, chilly night wind blew in from outside, making her shiver as her pores involuntarily stood on end. Was it hail outside? Without any care for the light screen that had long since gone into sleep mode, Song Ku quickly stood up to investigate. A blurry black figure was rolling on the windowsill, convulsing uncontrollably. Song Ku raised her guard, cautiously approaching. The black magpie was trembling stiffly, its wings twitching involuntarily. Most of its smooth feathers had fallen off, revealing the mottled skin underneath. Its black bean-like pupils seemed to be covered by a hazy gray-white film, staring intently ahead with a dark, gloomy look. It opened its beak, emitting a hoarse cry that seemed both a plea for help from Song Ku and a menacing low growl. Strangely, its opened mouth revealed two rows of uneven, jagged teeth, smeared with viscous black bloodstains. It was aiming. Song Ku's grip on the windowsill tightened suddenly. Before she could fully process the situation, the magpie convulsed violently for a few moments, then its head drooped down, becoming still. Chapter 2 still engage in sneak attacks. How shameless! Song Ku had a dream. In the dream, she lay in the shade of grapevines. Aiming was still his arrogant and pompous self, dancing around her energetically. Occasionally, he lightly tapped her head with his sharp beak. When she woke up, it felt as if the touch sensation from that time was still lingering on her head. A whole week had passed since the night Aiming underwent a strange transformation and died. During these days, she had continuously tried to knock on her neighbor's door, but she never received any response. The tightly closed iron door seemed like a self-imposed barrier, cutting off all ill-intention prying from the outside world. Did they go on a trip? Was that why they didn't have time to feed Aiming? But if they went on a trip, why didn't they take Aiming with them? No, something wasn't right. Song Ku's action of knocking on the door gradually came to a halt. Aiming didn't starve to death, absolutely not. The dark memories rushed in like a nightmare. 
Every time she remembered Aiming's stiff and deformed body and the two rows of sharp teeth protruding from its mouth, her back would shiver with bone-chilling coldness. Song Ku rested her head against the tightly shut door, exuding a sense of loneliness. She had lost her only friend. She had buried Aiming on the slope behind the house, with a small mound of dirt and bamboo grasshoppers and grapes on top. Those were its favorites during its lifetime. She also wrote down the news of Aiming's death on paper and posted it on the neighbor's door. Hopefully, the family would see it when they returned. With her thoughts filled with Aiming, Song Ku left the house somewhat dispirited. Regardless, she couldn't neglect her training at the martial arts school. If her master caught her skipping class, she would inevitably be beaten up. The sky hadn't fully brightened yet. The entire District 177 was enveloped in a hazy mist. Occasionally, the sound of waves crashing against the rocks could be heard. The neon signal lights high in the sky continued to twinkle tirelessly, dividing the indigo surface of the sea into scattered fragments. When Song Ku passed by the dock, she noticed that there were fewer people working today. Although the dock work was arduous, since no identification was needed and the payment was given daily, it had always been popular among the local young adults. It was quite rare to see such a scarce situation as today. She cast a puzzled glance around and heard voices coming from a corner. They all took sick leave there have been fewer and fewer people recently. Did Xiao Lu not come today either? Don't you know? Xiao Lu died. What? He was perfectly fine a few days ago. How could this suddenly? Xiao Lu was poisoned. His entire right hand rotted away. Even the police from District C were alarmed by this. They came specially to handle his body. No way people from District C, how could they be willing to clean up District F's mess? That's because you don't know how terrifying his death was. I saw it with my own eyes. His eyeballs turned gray, and both eye sockets were bulging. His whole body was as cold as ice. The man lowered his voice, his tone carrying a hint of fear. I heard the police won't allow cremation. They want the forensic examiner to conduct a pathological analysis, and the body has to be sent for autopsy and research. Xiao Liu's parents fainted on the spot and went crazy when they woke up. Song Ku's footsteps abruptly halted. Xiao Lu Xiao Lu. She had just felt that the name was familiar, and it was only here that she realized. She remembered now, the Xiao Lu they were referring to was the young man bitten by a mullet fish that day. And the hand the bloodied hand she remembered seeing it back then his injured hand was his right hand. In a flash, Song Ku's heart raced, and she almost instantly connected it to Aiming. Aiming was the same way, his body turning cold and rigid, his eyeballs turning gray, exhibiting the exact same symptoms as Xiao Lu. The more she thought about it, the more her scalp tingled with unease. She dared not stay in place any longer and rushed toward the martial arts school as if fleeing. She had walked down this small road to Yu Mountain countless times. She could navigate it even with her eyes closed. But today, perhaps due to her imagination, everything seemed deathly quiet. Even the usual cacophony of insects and birds was absent, leaving a silence that was eerie. The scorching sun still hung overhead, and the scalding sweat continually dripped from her forehead, splattering onto the ground and silently dissipating. In the cramped environment, there seemed to be an infinite danger lurking. Song Cook quickened her pace, racing to the mountaintop. Inside the martial arts school, everything was as lively as usual, with occasional laughter from the students. Song Ku leaned against the door frame, panting heavily. Her turbulent emotions gradually calmed down. She exhaled heavily and stepped over the threshold. However, after just a few steps, a strong sense of impending danger struck her like a lightning bolt danger. A glaring red light suddenly erupted from the corner, like a burning meteor, carrying a murderous intent as it rushed towards her. Song Ku's pupils slightly constricted. Her upper body leaned back significantly, her supple waist almost folding in half. She executed a graceful backflip and landed lightly. The lethal red light narrowly grazed her forehead. The attacker fired an empty shot and no longer pursued, sneering in a sinister tone, little stew stutterer, you react pretty fast. Song Ku lifted her eyelids to glance at him, 
then immediately lowered them, remaining silent. The other person's tone turned unpleasant, how come you can't even call out someone's name? I remember you have a stutter, but you're not mute, right? Song Ku pursed her lips and reluctantly spoke, Tu Tun, Tun Chin. Tu Tun, Tun Chin. Tun Chin mimicked her speech with a twisted grin, his deep brown face exuding ill intentions. Indeed, you're just a little trash from District F. Who gave you the right to call me by my name? Am I not worthy of being your senior brother? Song Ku didn't want to pay attention to his provocation. She turned a corner and headed towards the backyard without any hesitation. Tun Chin followed with a step, angrily blocking her path, I'm talking to you, where are you going? I'm going to find, find my master. Tun Chin didn't seem to like Song Ku's words, and his expression turned cold instantly, in a hurry to tattle, huh? Heh, you really deserve to be Zhang Si's child bride. When he's not around, you're in a rush to play the filial role for him. Quite devoted, aren't you? Thick malice rushed towards her like a serpent's hiss protruding from the shadows. Song Ku lowered her head, clenching her fists with an audible sound. If it weren't for the rules in the martial arts school that prohibited random fighting among students, she would have already jumped up and kicked that annoying face, turning the troublemaker Tun Chin into a pig head. As the two were at a standoff, a clear female voice sounded from behind, Tun Chin, why are you bullying Junior Sister again? The newcomer was stunning with captivating features, dressed in a sleek combat suit. Her high ponytail exuded a hint of fierceness. It was their senior sister Rita. Good, taking advantage of senior brother Zhang Si's absence to break the rules, huh? Who allowed you to use a particle gun in the martial arts school? The Tun family was a local powerhouse in the Mutant C-55 district, controlling multiple arms factories in the area. They possessed a variety of illegal and prohibited weapons in their hands. Tun Chin seemed nonchalantly playing with his gun, allowing the faint deep red light to shimmer and fade, they're just defective prototypes. I had little stutterer here test their power for me. Is there a problem with that? As he spoke, he suddenly aimed the gun at Song Ku's head again, furthermore, didn't she dodge it? Dangerous particle streams gathered in front of her, yet Song Ku stood her ground. Rita reached out beside her and pressed the gun down, irritation in her expression, put it away. Do you want to be seen by master? Do you really want to get kicked out of here? Tun Chin's gaze flickered slightly. He withdrew the particle gun with a sarcastic mutter, the Zhang family's child bride is indeed precious. Rita didn't back down, challenging him, shut up already. All you do is complain and provoke trouble all day. Is it because you couldn't participate in this year's Azure Phoenix assessment? It was your own choice to withdraw. What does that have to do with senior brother Zhang and junior sister? And you still engage in a sneak attack? How shameless! The Azure Phoenix Elite Battalion, officially known as the Special Duties Force of the New Asia Alliance, was the most mysterious and highly talked about military unit in recent years. It quickly gained popularity across all regions, sparking a surge of interest in joining the military. Its recruitment criteria were surprisingly simple. No restrictions on nationality, background, or gender. Citizens over 20 years old are eligible to join. However, Behind these seemingly simple conditions lay unparalleled temptation. Those selected by the Azure Phoenix can directly obtain citizenship status in a B-grade city. Countless people were drawn to this offer, viewing Azure Phoenix as a ladder to change their destiny. The stronger the allure, the fiercer the competition. The assessment process for Azure Phoenix remains undisclosed to the public, and the admission rate is extremely low. Most people are eliminated without understanding the process. However, since it was an elite military unit, the physical requirements were undoubtedly stringent. Therefore, after the establishment of Azure Phoenix, the martial arts atmosphere within the Alliance quietly flourished. Tun Chin and Rita were both from the C District. They came here to train with the goal of joining Azure Phoenix. The team from U Mountain Martial Arts School that signed up for this year's assessment had already departed, led by Zhang Xi. You. Tun Qin's sore spot was poked, his expression contorting. However, due to Rita's background, he refrained from acting recklessly. Rita showed no fear, 
deliberately raising her voice, thank goodness you withdrew early. Otherwise, you would have gone and not been selected. Wouldn't that be even more embarrassing? After saying this, she grabbed Song Ku's arm and pulled her away, ignoring Tun Chin. Tun Chin, with a dark expression, watched the two figures walking away. After a moment, he disdainfully muttered, Idiot. There are no awakened people, no matter how many people go, what's the use? Yu Mountain Martial Arts School's architecture was a rare antique design within the Alliance. Its complex structure required passing through lengthy corridors from the front yard to the back hall. Along the way, Rita stammered as she spoke, Junior sister, you're not you know, senior brother Zhang's that. What that? She vaguely left it unexplained. Zhang Cai was their eldest senior brother, having arrived before many others. He was among the first to train under Zhang Ting. Rumors circulated that he was Zhang Ting's biological son, but the two's relationship was distant and respectful. Zhang Ting was hot-tempered, while Zhang Cai was reserved. No one dared to ask openly, so they could only gossip in private. Song Ku turned to look at Rita, and found that there was a unease on her face, and even the roots of her ears were red. Curious about why Rita was blushing, Song Ku, struggling with her words, eventually replied in a slow manner, No. Rita, seemingly relieved by her response, brightened up and affectionately wrapped her arm around her shoulder. As they passed the cafeteria, they coincidentally met Aunt Pang, who was in charge of logistics, coming out with a tray. Several steaming bowls of ginger soup were placed on the tray. Aunt Pang warmly greeted the two, Ah, girl Ku, you're here. Haven't had breakfast, have you? I've boiled two tea eggs for you. Take them. Song Ku's eyes lit up, and she vigorously nodded. Rita pinched her nose in disdain, Aunt Pang, it smells awful. Why are you cooking this? Aunt Pang sighed helplessly, it's strange, really. On such a hot day, many students are getting colds and fevers. I'm making them some herbal medicine. Rita expressed skepticism, could it be a way to slack off and pretend to be sick? There were no weaklings in the martial arts school, so it was indeed strange that so many fell sick for no apparent reason. Aunt Pang clicked her tongue, it seems like it. You know what that kid, Song En, told me? He said a wild chicken pecked him yesterday, and today his whole body hurts so much he can't even get out of bed. These brats are so lazy in coming up with excuses. I think he's just itching for a beating. Ha ha ha, he's quite creative. Rita lacked sympathy, laughing uncontrollably, what about that chicken that pecks people? I slaughtered it. It wasn't laying eggs anyway. Might as well use it to nourish these sick people, Aunt Pang chuckled. I'll take it over for you. Rita took the tray from Aunt Pang's hands, then turned to Song Ku and suggested, Master is still in the meditation room. Why don't you go check on Song En? While they were conversing, Song Ku had already sneaked two tea eggs from the kitchen and stuffed them into her pockets. Upon hearing Rita's suggestion, she obediently nodded. Chapter 3 Crazed Researcher Song En was the most troublemaking student among all the students. He'd climb onto rooftops, go into the sea to catch turtles, and even dare to patch up a hole in the sky. Every time the list of wrongdoers came out, his name was on it. After being punished and beaten many times, Song En gradually realized the truth, everyone else was unreliable, and only Junior Sister was loyal. Later, no matter how much trouble he caused, he never forgot to bring Song Ku along. Even if they ended up crying from getting beaten up, at least there was someone to accompany him. In the resting room, Song En was hooked up to an four, lying weakly on the bed. Song Ku sat beside him, peeling tea eggs. The morning news report faintly echoed in the background, the volume too low to catch everything. The Alliance Meteorological Bureau has issued a high-temperature red alert outdoor activities are to be suspended reduce travel. If any abnormal situations are detected, please report them promptly to the relevant departments. At the entrance, Aunt Pang was lecturing a mischievous student by the ear, her loud voice momentarily overpowering the news reporter. The Qinglan Research Institute Solar Activity Peak Initiating Weather Simulation System Song Ku's attention drifted for a few seconds due to the mention of the Research Institute. When she lowered her head again, 
the tea eggs she'd been peeling were now nothing but empty shells in her hands. On the bed, Song An was humming and holding his head, continuously chewing. Song Ku. Considering their past shared hardships, she, as the adult, chose to let it slide that he was hogging all the egg. She pulled another egg out of her pocket. In the beds next door, a lively discussion about this year's assessment for the Azure Phoenix began. The number of votes in favor of Zhang Xi passing successfully had reached 90%. Song En muttered in dissatisfaction, Next year, you'll witness my greatness. At just 19 years old, he hadn't reached the required age for registration yet, but he was already ambitiously planning his future. He initially wanted Song Ku to praise him a little, but when he turned his head to check, he saw his junior sister holding a completely peeled tea egg, lost in thought. What are you thinking about? Say senior brother, have you seen grey, greyish white eyes before? I have, Song En stared at the egg, answering absent-mindedly. Why, why would, they turn grey? Come closer, and I'll tell you. Song Ku leaned in. Song En suddenly opened his mouth, snatching the egg from her hand, what else could it be? Cataracts. Song Ku, he didn't really answer seriously. She could tolerate him making fun of her and teasing her, but the fact that there were two tea eggs, and she hadn't even had a bite, was truly intolerable. Expressionlessly, Song Ku raised her fist, and soon the room was filled with cries of pain. Junior sister, spare me. Junior sister, have you forgotten the bird nests we dug, the earthworms we collected, the beatings we endured together over the years? Have you forgotten about us cough, cough, cough? Mid-shout, Song En began to cough intensely. His face turned bright red from the high fever, and tears welled up in his eyes due to the fever. Watching his pitiful state, Song Ku hesitated a bit. Song En, on the other hand, quickly regained his composure after catching his breath and earnestly promised with a playful smile, Tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll give you four eggs to make up for it. Can't I do that, junior sister? Senior brother keeps his promises. After seeing Song En, Song Ku finally got to meet her chief master, Zhang Ting. Zhang Ting was the golden signboard of the entire Yu Mountain Martial Arts School, a top-notch combat master in the alliance. Despite his kind, approachable, and friendly appearance, in reality, his temper was both foul and unyielding. He was like a firecracker, bursting and popping at the slightest provocation. When Song Ku sneaked into the meditation room, Zhang Ting was in a cross-legged meditation. The room was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop, creating an unexpectedly solemn atmosphere. In other people's words, there was a certain aura around Zhang Ting. On the table were some shiny walnuts. Song Ku thought of her unfortunate tea eggs, so she surreptitiously reached out to touch them, but Zhang Ting, with his eyes closed, accurately slapped her hand away, saying, You're drooling. Didn't you have breakfast? Song Ku covered her reddening hand back, looking pitifully aggrieved, I I didn't eat. Zhang Ting slightly opened his left eye, peeking at her through the narrow gap. Are you so hungry that you've lost your mind? You dare to eye my walnuts. But as he caught sight of Song Ku's pitiable expression, he paused, I haven't touched my portion yet. Go and eat. Song Ku's eyes lit up, and she took advantage of the situation, moving closer, Master, about that, that sword from last time, could I, could I borrow it to take a look? Zhang Ting's expression instantly became difficult to describe. Don't even think about it. How did that sword become so sticky? Did you get your saliva on it? Song Ku felt embarrassed and looked down. Maybe, perhaps it was indeed her saliva. She had been a bit scared that night and ended up falling asleep while holding the sword. Zhang Ting snorted lightly, seeing through it but not saying anything. He stood up and walked a couple of steps, pulling two plastic bags out of a low cabinet. Your 18th birthday is coming up, right? Here, this is the gift from your master. Why are there two, two gifts? One is for you, the other is for your senior brother Zhang. Song Ku's birthday was the day she was picked up by her grandfather. Coincidentally, it was the same day as Zhang Si's birthday. Since she started learning martial arts on Yu Mountain, she had celebrated her birthday together with Zhang Si every year. This was also why everyone joked and called her child bride. 
While Zhang Ting appeared composed, his tone was a bit stiff, when he's back, find a moment to give it to him. You can give it to him yourself. Song Ku didn't understand why she had to deliver it. She really didn't know senior brother Zhang well. Zhang Ting's eyes narrowed, and he gruffly shouted, If I tell you to give it, then give it. Stop with the useless chatter. Zhang Ting's sternness startled Song Ku, making her shrink her head. Her master was really quite fierce. After sweating like a fountain in the martial arts hall all day long and receiving two swats with a wooden ruler on her palms, Song Ku returned home, her head hanging dejectedly. Just as she passed the checkpoint, she noticed that there were quite a few people gathered around the pier ahead. Standing on the outer circle, she listened with a tilt of her ear and found out that it seemed to be the group that Grandpa Cheng had sent to search for Uncle Bing that had returned. The crowd around was in a buzz, discussing the bizarre capsizing incident of the research team. The consequences of the accident were quite devastating, with everyone on the same boat with Uncle Bing either dead or missing. In the end, they managed to retrieve only one researcher who was barely alive. As the onlookers gathered more and more, before long, Song Ko found herself pushed into the inner circle. The scene of so many people talking in a cluster made her feel slightly uncomfortable. She was about to slip away when suddenly, a mournful scream erupted from the crowd, Where's Abing? Why is it only you who came back? Where's Abing? Aunt Ching's voice was hoarse as she forcefully clung on to the surviving researcher, shouting at the top of her lungs. Others tried to pull her away, but to no avail. Tugged back and forth by her, the researcher, who was lying limp on the ground, displayed evident signs of mental abnormality. His expression vacillated between blankness, tears, and laughter, as he incessantly muttered, Dead, all dead ha ha ha. His collar was pulled down halfway, revealing layers of dark bruises on his shoulder. His pupils were dilated, and when the dazzling sunlight hit them, they faintly reflected an inorganic grayish-white sheen. They're here. At that moment, the District 177 security officers rushed in with haste, accompanied by three individuals. The first two wore police uniforms and looked arrogant. However, when they spoke to the middle-aged man who followed them, they became exceptionally respectful, demonstrating a humble demeanor. The middle-aged man wore a plain work jacket and had an unfamiliar face. He wasn't a native of District 177. Furrowing his brows, he examined the crazy researcher before him. His expression then shifted dramatically, and he shouted loudly, Back away! Everyone, disperse! While the crowd was still bewildered, the researcher in the center suddenly went berserk. Initially, he had been pushed and shoved around by Aunt Chin, so he had already ended up sprawled on the ground in a sorry state. But now, he was like a dying fish on a chopping board, suddenly flipping over and leaping up. He unleashed indiscriminate attacks in all directions. Aunt Chin was closest to him and suffered the brunt of his first assault. He bit off a large piece of flesh from her arm, his teeth glinting brightly. In the span of a few breaths, uneven rows of sharp teeth somehow grew between his teeth, and in just a matter of moments, he had completely pierced through the lower half of his face, presenting a grotesque sight of blood and flesh. Monster! The scene was truly horrifying, and the witnesses were frightened pale. They scattered in all directions to escape the chaos. However, due to the proximity, many of them tripped and fell. Seizing this opportunity, the crazed creature pounced on them, plunging the scene into chaotic disorder. Song Ko stood frozen in place as the escaping crowd continually bumped into her shoulders and back. It was as though her feet were glued to the ground, and she couldn't move. The creature's eyes had turned gray-white. In this critical moment, the middle-aged man brought by the police took action. A gust of wind suddenly swept across the area. Before Song Ko could comprehend what was happening, the man's clothes fluttered, and almost instantly, he appeared in front of the frenzied monster. In disbelief, Song Ko rubbed her eyes and took a few steps back, seeking refuge on a nearby fishing boat. He's so fast. She hadn't been able to fully see his movements just now. The frenzied monster was blown high into the sky by the fierce wind column. It was trapped in a vortex-like state, completely powerless to resist. The already tattered clothes were shredded into pieces, and its expression grew increasingly violent. 
Looking at the middle-aged man in contrast, even though he was also at the center of the storm, he remained completely unharmed. He pushed both hands forward steadily, and the air in his palms fluctuated faintly, constantly creating a wind field to suppress the creature. However, as time passed, the man's complexion grew more strained, and beads of sweat started to form on his forehead. About ten minutes later, the struggling of the creature within the vortex gradually ceased. Its eyeballs slowly closed, appearing to have lost all signs of life. The middle-aged man let out a long breath, clasping his palms together. The swift winds that had arisen from nowhere around him suddenly disappeared inexplicably. The creature then fell from midair with a loud thud, kicking up a cloud of choking dust upon impact. He turned around and nodded slightly to the people behind him who were maintaining order, saying, It's done, take it away. Unexpectedly, one of the police officers suddenly had a drastic change in expression. In a state of panic, he shouted loudly at the middle-aged man, Watch out! The middle-aged man swiftly turned his head. The barely breathing creature had roared behind him, its sharp claws swiping towards him. The middle-aged man couldn't evade in time, and in his haste, his coat pocket was torn, resulting in a few strands of bright red blood being drawn. A sharp wind blade sliced across the creature's neck. More than half of its head was severed, hanging precariously on its neck. This time, the creature remained absolutely motionless. The middle-aged man's expression turned grim. He stared at his wound for two seconds, then immediately walked away with large strides, commanding, go back quickly. His demeanor was no longer composed, and his eyes held a trace of indescribable terror. The police officers dragged the monster's corpse away, and Song Ku slowly straightened her body. The ground in front of her was strewn with debris fragments of clothes, viscous brown liquid, and thin traces of blood mingled together, emitting a nauseating odor. The crowd that had surrounded the area just ten minutes ago had long since fled in every direction, leaving no trace behind. The researcher turned into a monster. Who is this middle-aged man? How can he control the wind? Song Ka's understanding was in utter disarray. What on earth was all this? Exhausted, she returned home, her perception of the world shattered. Passing by Aiming's grave, the once moist grapes had withered and rotted. Only the grasshopper made of straw remained vividly intact. She crouched down, adjusting the grasshopper, and muttered softly, Aiming, did you also turn turn into that kind of monster? Dead people wouldn't answer her questions, nor would dead birds. Song Ku was destined not to get any answers. The neighbor's door was tightly shut, and a piece of paper attached to it fluttered in the wind, lifting up one corner. Have these people not returned yet? She knocked on the door with force, but there was still a prolonged silence. No one responded. She looked left and right, and the surroundings were desolate and devoid of people. Song Ku glanced at the short wall nearby, took a deep breath, and then suddenly retreated, and prepared to jump. Suddenly, the flat wall surface began to flicker, and her field of vision was engulfed by an overwhelming brightness. Song Ku raised her head in astonishment. It was the moment of sunset. The sun, unwilling to sink at this moment, erupted with a dazzling brilliance, as if it would never rise again tomorrow. The scorching light grew more intense, accompanied by an all-encompassing burning sensation, pushing human senses to their limits. Song Ku felt the same dizziness and headache she had a few days ago when she was sunburned, but this time it was even more uncomfortable. She felt like she was suffocating, the air around her suddenly became thin, and even the flow of her blood felt like it was burning, consuming every inch of her muscles and bones. Without caring to look at the neighbor's wall again, she gritted her teeth and retreated in the opposite direction. The intense white light covered her eyes, and the brief blindness made her unable to see anything clearly. Bang in the distance, there was a faint sound of streetlight shattering, and then the world fell into silence, with no more sounds. She couldn't hear anything anymore. Song Cook collapsed to the ground. Her body was burning hot, her skin was reddened, and her head was becoming increasingly heavy. She struggled to crawl in the direction of her memories, finally reaching her own front door. She used her last bit of strength to push it open, and Song Cook crawled inside with great difficulty trembling as she closed the door. Then she let the intense heat engulf her, and she completely lost consciousness. Chapter, 
4. Awakening of Ability Song Ko burned for three whole days. For most of the time, she was tormented by continuous high fever, barely conscious, and fell into a deep state of coma, lying on the ground motionless. Occasionally, during brief moments of clarity, she could feel the lingering pain within her body, as if someone were using an iron saw to cut back and forth between her bones. Severing her tendons and veins one by one, then haphazardly piecing them back together with paste, the process repeating endlessly without respite. Her lips cracked due to dehydration, her clothes soaked with cold sweat, sticking damply to her back. The blood in her limbs would sometimes boil and scorch, bringing a sensation of nearly extinguished burning other times, it would freeze and stagnate, turning even smooth circulation into a luxury. When the pain reached its peak, Song Ku would futilely close her eyes, tilt her head back, and let out a silent scream, her frail body curling up like a shrimp, writhing on the floor. Amidst her scattered consciousness, vague thoughts flashed through her mind she was going to die, like aiming, dead in a remote and dark corner. Silently vanishing from this world, with no one to remember her existence not even anyone to bury her like she did for aiming, not even a memorial stone for her. She would live like this, all alone, and then die. Three days later, in a quiet room, Song Ka's curled fingers twitched, and she slowly opened her eyes. She hadn't died. She was still alive. The prolonged torment had finally ended, yet a sense of mental exhaustion lingered. Song Ko clung to the table, swaying unsteadily as she stood up. Her thoughts and consciousness seemed to have been thoroughly cleansed, becoming exceptionally sharp. Some sort of change seemed to have taken place within her body, but she couldn't quite describe it. Outside the window, there was a thick fog that obscured the sky, blurring the boundaries between heaven and earth. In such an environment, it was easy for one to have illusions. Could the bizarre experiences of these past few days have all been her imagination? However, the widespread ache in her joints reminded Song Ku at every moment that it wasn't an illusion. Three days ago the ferocious and bloody monsters, the intense solar storms, and the sudden high fever-induced coma were definitely not her imagination. I need to go outside and see for myself, Song Ku thought. At the very least, I need to figure out what exactly has happened. In the depths of the dense fog, ghostly figures seemed to float around, as if countless hungry souls were wandering. It might not be safe outside, I need a weapon for self-defense, a knife preferably a knife song cause thoughts were in disarray, various ideas swirling in her mind. She didn't notice that the wooden table she was holding onto was quietly undergoing a transformation, emitting a faint blue light from her palm as the center. The next second, the wooden table vanished into thin air, and in her hand there was an extra kitchen knife. With a sturdy spine, a broad blade, and sharp cutting edges. It was a bone cleaver knife. Perfect for heavy chopping and hacking. Song Ku held onto the knife handle, her gaze confused, where did this come from all of a sudden? She had just been imagining the structure of a kitchen knife in her mind with great detail why did an exact physical copy appear? Perplexed, Song Ku swung the kitchen knife forward. As she did, a surge of energy surged within her body. Then, with a resounding boom. The old wall across from her collapsed. So powerful. The faintly glowing kitchen knife flickered and disappeared from her palm after a few moments. Song Ku, as if sensing something, savored the profound sensation she had just experienced. She felt power, a vigorous, radiant, indescribable new power. It was like a gushing spring that continuously flowed outward from within her, uncontainable. Strong, yet difficult to control, and needing more practice. Looking around, without hesitation, Song Ku extended her grasp towards her single bed. With a thought, the ethereal blue light reappeared, and the iron bed transformed into a long wooden spear. The spear had exuded chilling air, radiating a cold and ominous aura, hinting at immense power like a thunderclap. With her eyes gleaming, Song Ku bounced around the room, transforming everything she touched into various weapons within her field of vision. Knives, spears, swords, halberds, axes anything she had seen before, anything she could think of, all materialized. Only when the last piece of furniture was transformed did she stop, her excitement still not sated. Darkness swirled before her eyes, and a sensation of exhaustion washed over her. She, 
who had only been awake for less than half an hour fainted again. Upon waking once more, Song Ku refrained from using that power. Even though she acted recklessly like a brute, performing dangerous stunts, which led to mental overload and fainting, through a strange twist of fate, she had largely figured out her current situation. Song Ku was now certain that her ability to transform objects at will into weapons stemmed from a mysterious energy within her body. This unique ability could be summarized as the deconstruction and recombination of matter. By employing her mental power and understanding of various weapon structures, she could break down a certain medium or property, then construct a new entity according to her thoughts. Song Ku referred to this new substance, manipulated and driven by her, as spiritual weapon. These spiritual weapons were covered in a luminous blue light, wielding astonishing destructive power. The collapsed wall in her home served as the best proof. However, her ability to deconstruct and recombine was constrained by the inherent nature of objects. No matter how daring her imagination, a small teacup couldn't turn into a massive axe weighing hundreds of kilograms at most, it could transform into a thin leaf-shaped knife. Moreover, maintaining the operation of these spiritual weapons relied on her own mental power. If she lost consciousness and fell into a coma, all spiritual weapons would disappear. As for how long she could sustain them, she hadn't tested it yet. Song Ku's understanding reached its limit here. The deeper principles and specific reasons behind this ability were beyond her current level of knowledge. After collecting her thoughts, Song Ku quickly freshened up and decided to go outside to investigate. Regardless of what had happened in the outside world, she couldn't hide at home forever. Additionally, she was worried about her master and fellow disciples on Yu Mountain, unsure if they were affected by the solar eruption. Holding her breath, Song Ku cautiously opened the front door. Due to the pervasive fog, all was eerily silent around her, and seeing was exceedingly difficult. She turned her head, looking towards her neighbor's house on the other side of the wall. This time, she didn't knock because she had a premonition that, no matter how long she knocked, it was unlikely anyone would come to answer. With a light jump, Song Ku vaulted over the wall and entered the inner courtyard. Passing through the fence and taking a few steps, she couldn't help but bend over and dry heave onto the ground. It smelled terrible. The courtyard was filled with a noxious odor, and flies gathered, permeating the air with the putrid smell of rotting fish and shrimp, their stench intensified by prolonged exposure to the sun. Holding her nose, Song Ku cautiously walked inward. The further she went, the more nauseating the smell became. Under the canopy in the small courtyard, there were half-eaten leftovers and bowls. The milky white fish head tofu soup had already spilled and dried up into clumps, leaving behind jagged fish bones. Song Ku stared at those dishes for a while. Even the utensils hadn't been tidied up, and it didn't resemble the appearance of someone going on a journey. Something must have happened. The main door of the neighbor's house wasn't securely closed, slightly ajar. The inside was dim and devoid of light, pitch black with nothing visible. Song Ku's ears twitched, faintly catching the sound of heavy, labored breathing emanating from deep within the room. Some colossal entity seemed to be dragging its massive body across the floor. The sinister ambience, the heavy breaths, combined with the slow crawl, immediately triggered her strongest sense of alarm. Song Ku abruptly halted her steps, a chill running down her spine. After a quick survey of her surroundings, she extended her hand towards the sturdy pergola. A fluorescent blue light swirled, causing the pergola to vanish in place. Moments later, a mighty two-meter-long sword appeared in her palm. With the weighty weapon in her grip, Song Ku finally felt a bit safer. Using the tip of the sword, she pried open the crack in the door. The rusty iron bolt emitted an unpleasant creaking sound, catching the attention of the creature lurking in the shadows. They turned their heads in unison. Their upper bodies were sprawled on the ground, their skin covered in dark metallic fur. Their eyes were grey-white, and they emitted rapid, panting breaths from deep within their throats, devoid of conscious awareness. Song Ku lowered her gaze to the clothes on the creatures. Her neighbors were an elderly couple living with their grandson. They didn't interact too often, and their relationship wasn't particularly close, but they did help each other out in everyday matters as neighbors do. The magpie they raised, aiming, was her only friend. 
the creature before her was mutilated beyond recognition, oozing pus and rotting in places, presenting an eerie purplish-black color. Yet, the tattered clothes they wore were oddly familiar the very ones the elderly couple next door often wore. A chilling thought sent shivers down Song Ku's spine. Perhaps, they had turned into something like this, just like Xiao Lu and the mad researcher at the pier. Xiao Lu was bitten by a mullet fish, the researcher encountered an accident at sea. What about them? Were they attacked by something else, or perhaps by aiming? In that moment of distraction, the creatures sensed the scent of a fresh living person. Slowly, they crawled out of the shadows and moved towards the door. The two twisted and grotesque figures drew closer to her. The leading creature extended the majority of its body, revealing its entire face, exposed in the chaotic daylight. Song Ku instinctively felt something was wrong. Two figures wait. She suddenly lifted her head, her teeth couldn't stop trembling. They're their grandson, where is he? The whitened eyes of the creature crawling in front stared fixedly at Song Ku. Their silver hair was tangled and disheveled, their fingers mangled and bloody, but their abdomen protruded like that of a woman pregnant for ten months, exuding a suffocating sense of bloodiness. The blue light on the hilt of the large sword in Song Ku's hand flickered, emitting a silent lament. Stimulated by the sudden illumination, the creature abruptly raised its upper body and lunged toward her. Song Ku used her sword horizontally to block, the sharp claws collided with the blade, producing a violent friction. The creature tumbled back to the ground, and Song Ku retreated two steps. Such immense strength. Failing the first strike, the creature was thoroughly enraged, splitting into two directions and attacking her. Song Ku flipped to evade, swung the large sword in a counterattack. The sharp blade halted as it aimed for the creature's heart, then barely veered a few inches downward, slicing a deep gash across the monster's abdomen. Should she kill them? Should she unhesitatingly kill her former kind? The black viscous liquid oozed from the severed wound, yet the creatures seemed impervious to pain, relentlessly attacking her. They were no longer truly human. With both hands gripping the large sword tightly, Song Ku used the weapon's weight to sweep her entire body, spinning like a high-speed top, flipping the two creatures outwards. Taking advantage of this opening, she rolled outside, swiftly closed the door, and wedged the steel pipes piled in the corner against the bolt, adding an extra one for good measure, ensuring it was secure. The room fell silent for a moment, but soon after, the sounds of banging on the door and the creature's enraged roars echoed through the room. Chapter, 5 Tonight at 8 o'clock, Fool's Wharf Song Ko was lurking in a corner of the garbage dump, observing without moving, holding her breath. After coming out from her neighbor's house, the heavy fog disoriented her, and she unknowingly ended up in this vicinity. Her destination was the villa area halfway up the hill, but to reach there, she had to pass through the garbage dump in front of her. From deep within the mist, there faintly emanated a grating sound of bones crunching, making one's teeth ache. About five or six meters away, a few figures swayed and walked past, their footsteps heavy, their postures strange. One by one, they walked mindlessly, clanging and clattering, stumbling into piles of tin cans. Through the faint mist, Song Ku could discern their faces, causing her heart to sink. They were those monsters. She couldn't stay here any longer. Seizing the opportunity as a few of the monsters crossed paths, Song Ku timed it right, lowered her center of gravity, and sprinted forward. The wind from her dash lifted a few scraps of paper, and the lingering monsters all turned their heads simultaneously. However, within the expanse of whiteness, they didn't catch anything, so they continued to wander aimlessly. Song Ku cleared a path with her sword, sprinting several hundred meters in one breath, breaking out in a hot sweat. The damp ends of her hair stuck to her neck, and even her eyelashes were damp with moisture. Running too fast, she couldn't rein in her speed, and she collided head-on with someone. The immense force made her head buzz. Out of reflex, Song Ko bowed and apologized, so sorry. The person turned stiffly, and their grey-white pupils slowly fixed on her. Drool dripped from their wide-open mouth. Song Ko. Her heart raced, and she swung her sword forward with all her might, bang! Sending the monster flying. Then she turned and ran, 
using the nearest pillar to propel herself onto the eaves of a nearby house. The slow monsters couldn't catch up, only angrily scratching the walls below. Song Kuk clung to the pillar, holding her breath, refusing to make a sound. After a while, the agitated monsters lost their target in the dense fog, circled in place for a few rounds fruitlessly, and then left in confusion. Song Ku let out a sigh of relief, and nimbly flipped onto the roof. This area was at the edge of District 177, serene and peaceful, with several detached villas scattered around. It could barely be considered the local wealthy area. Song Ku had come to inquire about the situation from Old Cheng, but the problem was that her last visit was two years ago, and she couldn't remember the exact location of Old Cheng's house. Squatting on the rooftop, Song Ku widened her eyes and diligently made out the door numbers, number 27 28 29, 29. After confirming the direction, Song Ku leaped down from the rooftop and made her way to Old Cheng's house. When she reached the door, she took a few steps up the stairs, paused before knocking, and looked down at the giant sword in her arms she felt that showing up like this might be impolite. With a thought, she stowed it away. Knock after knocking for several minutes, the iron door slowly creaked open a crack, revealing a shiny bolt in the middle and old Chang's wary and guarded face. Anxious, Song Ku blurted out, Ching Grandpa Cheng, Grandpa Lu, and Grandma Lu they're bitten, bitten by monsters just encountered them, they chased me. She became more flustered, her stuttering worsened, and her sentence structure turned chaotic, making it even harder to understand. Old Cheng looked surprised, Girl Ku, you child, how did you? The bolt was removed, and old Cheng observed the surroundings, then whispered for her to come inside, come in first, we'll talk inside. Bending down, Song Ku entered the door, her toe hitting something hard, nearly causing her to fall flat on her face. The living room was in a state of chaos, with several large suitcases scattered on the floor. Inside them, various men's and women's clothing and essential items were only halfway packed. Old Cheng locked the door again and double-checked it multiple times before turning to look at Song Ku. He asked, given how dangerous it is outside now, with monsters that eat people everywhere, how did you manage to get here? Song Ku was still racking her brain, trying to figure out how to explain, and she was left dumbfounded after hearing his question. What did he mean by monsters that eat people everywhere? Were the circumstances worse than she had thought, extending beyond just the neighbors and the garbage dump? Mr. Cheng carefully studied her bewildered expression, then shook his head slowly after a moment, sighing, take your time to explain. What happened just now? And where have you been these past few days? I, I've been at home the whole time. I was, I was sick, and that day Song Ku organized her thoughts and began to describe her inexplicable high fever, as well as waking up to the strange changes in the neighbor couple. She hesitated about mentioning her awakened peculiar ability, but Mr. Cheng waved his hand and interrupted her with a serious expression, I understand, child. You've been hiding at home all this time, so you're unaware of everything. Two days ago, the Alliance issued an urgent announcement due to an unprecedented solar storm disturbing the Earth's magnetic field with unknown energy, causing some organisms to undergo mutations. He paused at this point and his tone grew heavy and mournful, as for those monsters that eat people though the announcement didn't explicitly say, rumors of the end times are spreading. Now, nowhere outside is safe. District 177 has already fallen, and those capable have already fled. Song Ku's gaze swept over the suitcases on the floor Old Cheng was in District 177, so he indeed counted as one of the capable ones. Unaware of her subtle movements, Old Cheng continued to speak worriedly, we're getting ready to take a starship to evacuate. While we still can, we need to leave quickly. District 177 is no longer viable, and the situation in District D is probably similar. The schedules to District C are sparse, and if we miss this afternoon's trip, we might not have a chance to leave later. Song Ku listened quietly as he rambled on, blinking her eyes belatedly in realization. Old Ching also seemed to notice something as he spoke and suddenly stopped, his expression turning somewhat awkward. Girl Ku, um we couldn't reach you these past few days. Since you've come here, either you could join us. Dad. Old Cheng's daughter-in-law emerged from the inner room, holding a baby in her arms her tone was confrontational as she cut him off, come with me for a moment. 
They walked into the study one after the other, not bothering to hide the sound of the door slamming shut, their argument clearly audible through the door. At a time like this, you're still thinking about being a good person. Where do we have spare starship tickets to take her to District C? No need to buy for District C we can get tickets for District D. District D. It's easy for you to say. Does it not cost money to go to District D? Besides, at a time like this, where can we even find tickets? Dad. Are you getting senile? The woman's once shrill voice gradually turned into a sorrowful tone, if you take her along, who will you abandon? Your son who's still running a fever? Your less than a year old grandson? Or your daughter-in-law who's less than an outsider now? It's not old Chang's defense grew weaker and weaker, eventually fading into an embarrassed silence. Song Ku lowered her eyes, studying the patterns on the floor, silently repeating the word she had heard. Starship. The Lu Starship, the most advanced flight terminal of the Alliance, was one of the outstanding products born during the glorious 30 years. It was also the most conspicuous and eye-catching feature high above the isolated island, the brightest neon, the only passenger route connecting to the outside world. A place like F-177 District was easy to get into the ticket price was practically a giveaway. However, leaving was as difficult as reaching the sky. Even to travel to the cheapest grade D city required a substantial amount of money. Song Ku's wallet was cleaner than her face she was as poor as a church mouse. Given her financial situation, not only in this lifetime but also in the next and the one after that, she couldn't afford a starship to fly out of District 177. After Old Cheng came out of the study, he didn't dare to meet her gaze. The argument they had was so loud that Song Ku was sure she had heard it all. He awkwardly explained, Girl Ku, these tickets are now valuable commodities without a market grandpa put all his assets into this, exhausted every possible way, and managed to buy only four starship tickets. I, I know, Song Ku comforted him in turn, thank you, Grandpa Cheng. Grandpa have said before, you're a good person. After saying this, old Cheng's expression changed dramatically. Song Ku's use of grandpa felt like a sharp knife, accurately piercing his heart. Six years ago, a sickly-faced Song Ziyuan stood before him, smiling as he entrusted him, Old Cheng, hold on to this money. Song Ku doesn't understand the ways of the world, and we don't have any other family. When I'm gone, take care of her. When she grows up, if she's willing to stay in District 177, this money will last her for generations. What if she wants to leave? If she wants to go out and see the world, that's fine too. Let her choose between District C and District D. She doesn't have any identification, so you'll have to help her buy starship tickets. As for District B, District B isn't suitable for her. Tell her not to go there, say it's my request. Old Cheng accepted the money. At first, he did indeed take care of Song Ku as instructed by Song Ziyuan. He cared about her needs, her clothing, her shelter, her transportation. He even found a way to send her to school in District D. But then, midway through high school, Song Ku returned on her own and refused to go back. Old Ching asked her many times, and each time, she shook her head with resistance, saying she didn't want to go out again. And so, that money became a constant concern for Old Ching. He could see it and touch it, yet he couldn't have it. One night, in the depths of the night, Old Ching woke up again and finally mustered his determination. At first, he thought of just using a small portion, buying a few new model ships, expanding his transportation fleet. Later later his son got married, they bought a house, his grandson was born. Ultimately, it was all about money. Who wasn't spending money on someone? His business grew bigger and his family life became more fulfilling, and gradually, he couldn't spare much thought for Song Ku anymore. Returning to the present, Old Cheng's heart was pounding heavily. At the time, Song Ku was still young and, theoretically, unaware of the money Song Ziyuan had left for her. He observed Song Ku's expression and cautiously began, Girl Ku, before your grandfather left. Caught off guard by Song Ku's penetrating gaze, Old Cheng suddenly felt guilty. He gritted his teeth and admitted, he left some money before he departed, asking me to take care of you. Over the years, your expenses for food, clothing, study, 
and martial arts, every expenditure, Grandpa kept track of it all. That money wasn't much to begin with, and now, if you were to ask around outside, you can't even afford a single starship ticket. I truly considered you like a granddaughter, and Grandpa really had no choice, no way to help you. Old Cheng's daughter-in-law stood at the study door, watching coldly, the baby in her arms wailing loudly, the piercing cries particularly jarring. Song Kua remained stunned for a moment, then nodded slowly. She didn't know that her grandfather had left her money, so she had always felt grateful and close to Old Cheng for taking care of her over the years. Now that the truth was revealed, she felt a sense of realization. The Cheng family's decision to leave District 177 didn't include her, an outsider from the beginning. It was her who rushed to the door and made things awkward. In terms of closeness and distance, everyone's motives have a priority. And Song Ku had long grown accustomed to being placed last. She was distant, she was far, the one most easily discarded. If it weren't for the apocalypse, Song Ku wouldn't have considered leaving District 177, let alone think about starship ticket prices. Old Ching could have taken this secret with him to his grave, and in Song Ku's heart, he would still be the kind, benevolent old grandpa from the past. Song Ku looked up and smiled, I can't leave, I still need to go, go to you mountain to find, find my master. Old Ching seemed to shed a psychological burden, immediately chiming in, right. You can still go find your master. Or ask him if there's any solution. He's definitely much more capable than me. The electronic clock on the wall pointed to one in the afternoon. Old Ching discreetly cast a few glances toward it. Song Kuk caught his hint and stood up gracefully, Well, Grandpa Cheng, I'll be leaving now. Old Ching responded somewhat sheepishly, Oh. Leaving? All right, all right. Just before leaving, his expression was complex, betraying inner struggle. Such a fragile young girl, staying alone on an isolated island overrun by monsters, her fate inevitably leading to her demise. Perhaps it was guilt, perhaps it was remorse. Thinking of Song Ziyuan's pale face from years ago, Old Cheng lowered his voice and quickly said, Girl Ku, I heard from others. At 8 p.m. tonight, there will be a military retreat team passing through Fool's Wharf. If you can find them, go with them. It's your only chance to leave this place. Song Ku's clear gaze met his, and she repeated calmly, Thank you, Grandpa Cheng. The iron door behind her closed slowly, and Song Ku stood on the steps, exhaling deeply. Turning around, heading home, packing her things once all preparations were done, she stepped into the boundless mist once again. The air raid siren in the entire District 177 continued to blare ceaselessly. However, the streets and squares were eerily silent. Residential building windows were shut tight, ships at the harbor were congested and chaotic. The air was hazy and salty, occasionally punctuated by short, abrupt screams. Song Ku didn't dare to stop. She rushed towards the direction of Yu Mountain. Finally, as she was about to enter, she had a sudden feeling and abruptly halted her steps. Inside, it was deadly quiet no breeze, no birds chirping, no usual shouts from trainees during their exercises. One could hear a pin drop. Song Ku's expression tensed, a bad premonition rising in her heart. She took a shallow breath and proceeded cautiously. However, each room front courtyard, corridors, training hall, resting rooms were all empty. Finally, she stopped in the depths of the martial arts hall, at the entrance of her master's meditation room. A faint stench drifted to her nose, barely perceptible. Chapter 6 Something is about to come out. The entire martial arts hall fell into a stifling silence, an unexplainable tension hanging in the air. Song Ku went from room to room, pushing open doors to check. In the kitchen, shattered dishes and fragments littered the floor, but no one was there. The trainees' dormitory doors and windows were wide open, dried black bloodstains streaked down the walls, yet no one was present. The training grounds were empty, various equipment strewn haphazardly about, remnants of combat scattered everywhere, but still no one to be found. The further she walked, the more solemn her expression became. Her heart felt like it was submerged in ice water, gradually sinking into the depths of the sea. Finally, she reached the deep rear courtyard, 
hearing faint sounds coming from within the meditation room. Could it be here? The door wasn't locked. Song Ku grasped the handle and slowly pushed it open. Taking a quick glance around, the room seemed to have been ransacked. Most of the furniture was overturned, cabinets lay toppled, a short table was in pieces, even the ashes from the incense burner were scattered on the ground. She shifted her gaze to continue looking inside when, in the next second, her pupils contracted. Zhang Ting, her master, knelt in the depths of the meditation room, a hole the size of a bowl in his chest. Fresh red blood had dried and congealed, forming a large dark circle. Leaning on his sword, his head hung low, his body motionless. There was no trace of the lively appearance with raised eyebrows and reproachful words he would direct at her. He stood in silence, like a shattered statue. Song Ku stumbled forward, her hands unconsciously trying to block the hole in his chest, Master. Throughout you mountain, even throughout the entire alliance, who could kill Master? How could Master possibly die? Zhang Ting's body had already stiffened, and as she touched him, he tilted slightly. His bent finger joints loosened their grip on the sword, and it fell heavily to the ground. Song Ku reached out in a flurry to support him, but she couldn't. Unexpectedly, she discovered another door behind him that he was blocking. It was the storeroom behind the meditation room. Because it was too far from the training grounds, this storeroom had long been abandoned and was only used to store equipment or miscellaneous items Song Ku looked down at it dazedly. And after a moment, it suddenly dawned on her master's posture before his death clearly indicated he was guarding something. Perhaps stirred by the sound, the noise behind the door grew louder. The continuous banging quickly disrupted her thoughts. Bang! Bang bang! The entire bamboo door shook violently under the weight, its frame on the brink of collapsing, and the low, frenzied roar repeatedly echoed. Something was about to come out. Song Ku held her breath, poised for action. A deafening crash, and the bamboo door collapsed with a resounding thud. A large group of putrid-smelling monsters rushed out. Upon a rough count, there were surprisingly dozens of them, completely filling the meditation room. Seeing the monsters charging towards her at the forefront, Song Ku stepped on the wall and leaped upwards, executing a mid-air kick that viciously sent them flying back, the powerful force toppling those behind them. Landing nimbly, she was about to follow up with another kick and then flee through the door when her movements abruptly halted. The monsters fell to the ground, their grotesque faces fully exposed. Lin Senior Sister Lin. Song Ku cried out in astonishment. This momentary pause gave the monsters a chance to recover, the fallen ones rising, and those lagging behind catching up. The inside of the storeroom was dim, but still enough for her to discern the monsters' features. Song Ku panically lifted her gaze, recognizing the familiar brows and eyes among the grayish-blue faces. Junior Brother Xiao. Aunt Aunt Pang. Even if their eyes were clouded and ashen, describing their horrifying state, she recognized them at first glance, facing the people she had spent so much time with. These monsters were none other than the martial arts hall's trainees. There were senior brothers who had lost to her in sparring multiple times, gentle senior sisters who cared for her daily life. Each and every person who had once been alive had now turned into mindless monsters, their hair disheveled and filthy as they attacked her. The pitch-black sharp claws lunged at her. Song Cook couldn't evade in time, and a chunk of her lower hem was cut away. She fled in disarray, unable to effectively counterattack. No wonder. No wonder she had searched the entire martial arts hall, and no one was outside. No wonder Master stubbornly guarded the entrance. He couldn't bring himself to kill his own students, so he chose to lock them away. If Master couldn't bring himself to do it, neither could she. Her eyes grew increasingly moist, and as Song Ku rolled and dodged with no strength left, she repeated their names over and over, trying to bring back their senses. In District 177, she was a recluse, quiet and reserved, often leaving early and returning late. Except for Old Cheng, no one was willing to interact with her. But that was okay, she had Yu Mountain Martial Arts School, where most people wouldn't mock her. They would even celebrate her birthday with her every year. However, now those senior brothers and sisters who had once sung happy birthday to her had become unrecognizable. The horde of monsters surged forward densely. 
Song Ku retreated again and again, but there was no more room to retreat. Her slender back slammed harshly into the door panel. Escape. She could escape, but then what? There were so many monsters, the meditation room's door couldn't possibly hold them all. Should she release them like this? If Master were still alive, he would surely scold her thoroughly. In that distracted moment, a swift dark shadow stepped on the head of a monster behind it and leapt high towards her. Compared to the others, its size had swelled several times over. Its desire to attack was particularly strong, saliva dripping from between its jagged, sharp teeth. Its bloody claw clamped down on her shoulder, its mouth poised to bite into her neck. The stench of decay was close, and the guillotine of death was about to fall. Song Kuk pressed hard against its dark face, locking eyes with its grayish-white, murky gaze, tears streaming down her face. She cried out its name. Song En. That person who used to laugh heartily, who even when sick would seek to make her happy, that person who had promised to buy her four tea eggs, now only wished to viciously sever her veins. Song En emitted a throaty ho-ho sounds from deep within its trachea, its cruel and bloodthirsty actions showing no pause. Its nails pierced her clavicle, and fresh blood gushed out. Song Ku's pain triggered convulsions, and with tear-filled eyes, she twisted and broke its arm with a crack. It hesitated for a moment, its arm limp. Song Ku took advantage of the opening to break free, rolling frantically in the opposite direction. The one with the broken arm, Song En, paused for only an instant before fiercely attacking her again. It was already devoid of consciousness, feeling no pain whatsoever. Song Ku was trapped in an endless fight, her wounds multiplying. Limbs, body, heart the fragments scattered, blood and gore splattered. No matter where she attacked, no matter how she tried to resist, she couldn't stop the relentless tearing and biting of the monsters. Tears transformed from scalding to icy, and finally to dried up bitterness. Song Ku mournfully realized that she was faced with an eternal cycle of either being devoured by this horde of monsters or killing them all, and then surviving. Her physical strength was rapidly depleting. Unable to dodge once, she suffered another wound on her lower back. The deep red blood soaked through the floor. Song Ku threw a punch, counterattacking, and the nearest monster was thrown several meters away, causing her to tumble heavily to the ground. Coincidentally, she fell right next to Zhang Ting. Song Ku widened her eyes and instinctively looked at her master. Zhang Ting's eyes, which hadn't had a chance to close yet, stared at her coldly, devoid of sadness or happiness. It seemed like he was waiting for her to make a decision. I'm sorry. Song Ku turned her head away from his gaze and murmured weakly. This apology, she didn't know if it was directed towards the deceased master or the unrecognizable senior brothers and sisters. I'm sorry. But she wanted to survive. A powerful gust of wind brushed against her ears. At the critical moment, Song Ku pulled out the long sword from beside her master. A deep blue light suddenly emanated from her palm. In the blink of an eye, the long sword transformed into a sharp tang knife. This type of wide-bladed cleaver had a unique advantage in close combat. Song Ku flipped and jumped up, gathering her core strength without hesitation and swinging the sword forcefully. The monster's movement abruptly stopped, and it was almost split in half from top to bottom. Thick, viscous blood sprayed from its shattered throat. It struggled a few times in inertia, then fell to the ground lifeless. Song Ku's heart skipped a beat. She suddenly realized that chopping off the head seemed to be effective. However, the death of their kind didn't deter the remaining monsters. They continued to charge forward without hesitation. After identifying their fatal weaknesses, Song Ku no longer hesitated or hoped for luck. Her counterattacks were sharp and precise, each strike targeting their vital points. Expressionless, she was like an azura emerging from hell. Half an hour later, Dozens of monsters lay fallen on the ground, utterly lifeless. Except for Song En. Without a doubt, it was the most ferocious among them. Even with an arm and a leg severed, it still exerted an intense pressure on Song Ku. The stump of its severed arm exposed necrotic and decaying tissue, constantly dripping black, murky fluid. Song En fixated on her, its body twisted at an eerie angle as it crawled menacingly towards her. 
Her eye sockets were dry and gritty, having long lost the ability to shed tears. The hand that held the knife hung by her side, trembling slightly. After fourteen years of martial practice, this was the first time her hands uncontrollably shook. Everything should end now. She slowly raised the tang knife, its deep blue glow reflecting on her face, her beautiful countenance icy and cold. Closing her eyes, the tip of the blade gleamed with blue light and surged forward like a mighty force chop. Slash! A few drops of dark viscous fluid splattered onto her eyelids, tracing the shape of tears as they ran down her cheeks. In the dimly lit room, Song Cook carefully arranged the bodies of the monsters one by one, placing their heads back in their rightful places, preserving their dignity in death as humans. Then she sat amidst the blood pool, quietly gazing at these once roaring faces, striving to remember their former appearances. Suddenly, her gaze froze. Inside the head of one of the monsters, something seemed to reflect light and flashed for a moment. She had swung the blade too forcefully, and the monster's head had shattered like a watermelon. Bending down, Song Kook picked up a crystal from inside. A small crystal, about the size of a lychee, with an octahedral shape. It looked both cloudy and transparent, quite peculiar. She hastily pried open another head but found nothing similar inside. Not every one of them had it. She observed each one closely and ultimately found three of these crystals. The other two appeared similar but the third one was slightly larger and exhibited a more transparent white color inside. It had been found in Song In's head. What were these things? Song Ku stared at this thing that definitely wouldn't grow inside a human's head, something beyond her scope of understanding, giving rise to more and more confusion. As she pondered, a faint noise suddenly came from outside the window. More of them. Song Ku tensed her entire body, gripping the sword handle and swinging it outward. A killing intent surged out, and the window of the meditation room instantly shattered into pieces. Amidst the rising dust, a half-human-sized bird-like creature stood on the windowsill, staring at her motionlessly. Its appearance resembled a chicken, but it had a pair of massive wings on its back. A tuft of white feathers adorned its forehead, and its front and back talons emitted a metallic glint. Its whip-like tail feathers remained still. The giant bird remained in place for an unknown amount of time, observing her in silence. Its icy vertical pupils were locked onto her. As if an observer of Song Ku's execution, it watched her in despair and helplessness, watched her exhaustively gasping for breath, and then watched her unleash a killing spree. Song Ku's scalp tingled, her heart pounded, and with the demeanor of confronting a formidable foe, she held her blade forward. The standoff between her and the bird was intense. The bird-like creature's tiger-like front talons moved slightly, it lowered its head to size her up for a couple of seconds, and then disinterestedly turned its head away. It elegantly spread its wings and flew off without a sound. Song Ko clenched the pale white crystal in her palm, gazing blankly in the direction the bird had departed. A recurring thought circled in her mind. This world had truly gone crazy. Chapter 7 Island Escape Plan Song Ku buried the people from the Yu Mountain Martial Arts School in the back hills. She was clumsy and stubborn, only knowing how to dig with her head down. Sweat and blood mixed together as they splattered into the yellow earth with the rise and fall of the iron shovel. Her lips were tightly pressed, her movements repetitive and mechanical, as if she were an untiring humanoid machine. After digging the holes, she began to carve gravestones, until blisters formed on all ten of her fingers, and she barely managed to carve the tombstones for each person. A total of twenty-three small mounds of earth, each holding her senior brothers, senior sisters, her master, and all her attachments here. While counting the number of people, Song Ko unexpectedly made a discovery, not all of the academy's members had fallen here. Yu Mountain was situated in E-166 district, not very convenient for transportation. The school provided food and lodging for its students. People like Song An, who were wholeheartedly devoted to training, had everything they needed on the mountain food, clothing, shelter and wouldn't descend the mountain unless necessary. But there were also individuals like Tun Chin and Li Ta, who were self-assured, only coming to the mountain for scheduled training sessions and rarely staying at the academy. She didn't find traces of these two among the monster corpses, so they must have luckily missed this event. 
Besides them, there was Zhang Xiai, a senior brother who participated in the Azure Phoenix assessment, and his group. He took away the elites of the academy. Who knew where they were now? With the chaos outside, would they even return? Song Cook picked up a water hose and sprayed the ground, carefully cleaning the bloodstains from the walls and floor. After finishing the cleaning, she inspected the entire martial hall once again. The TV showed nothing but static no signal, but the water and electricity were functioning normally. She found a light screen in a student's dormitory. She wasn't sure whose it was, and it wasn't locked with a password. Many pages were open in the background. As Song Ko browsed, she realized that the online discussions were already in turmoil. People were discussing topics related to doomsday and zombies. Some criticized the lack of action from the Alliance, others were suggesting hoarding for self-protection, and some were despairingly sending out distress messages. She wasn't proficient with electronic devices and only had a rough understanding. Apparently, the outside world had also been infested with these dreadful creatures, but the situation was far better than in District 177. At least most cities hadn't fallen into chaos yet. Song Ku thought for a moment and attempted to search for the Alliance's official news account. The latest pinned message was posted two days ago, stating that the Alliance had opened hundreds of emergency shelters. Residents could navigate to them using their own guidance systems for nearby safety. She scrolled down and clicked on the details link, but a message abruptly appeared on the screen, no access permission. Power and status not only determined wealth distribution but also controlled information access. The owner of this light screen, just like her, wasn't allowed even the small privilege of viewing emergency shelters. Song Ku set down the light screen and finally noticed she was covered in grime. During the earlier fights, blood had splattered everywhere, staining her. Later, she had spent a considerable time digging in the dirt. She went to the bathroom and took a cold shower to clean herself thoroughly. Afterward, she used a bandage to dress her wounds. Cleaning the wound, stopping the bleeding, applying medicine, and bandaging it. The blood of those monsters, it should be blood, was black in color and flowed slower than a normal person's. Recalling the expression of panic on the middle-aged man's face at the pier when he was injured, Song Ko looked down at her wound, uncertain of what consequences might arise. Night fell, and the sky unknowingly darkened. Song Ko organized an 80-liter hiking backpack and packed it with warm, moisture-resistant clothing, a small amount of easily preservable food. A wide-mouthed water bottle and purification tablets, a flint flashlight, a portable first aid kit, a sleeping bag, and a tent. After some consideration, she also added a compass. As for weapons, her supernatural ability was her most potent arsenal, so she decided not to bring anything else. Before leaving, Song Ku hesitated for a long time while holding a pen. Originally, she had thought about writing something, but what could she write? Who would she write it for? To describe witnessing her master's tragic death. To recount how she had been forced by circumstances to take lives, ending the lives of the 22 individuals from the martial school. After today, you mountain martial arts school would cease to exist. Who would forgive her? No one would forgive her. In the end, she wrote nothing. Song Ku locked the gate of the martial school and took one last deep look before turning and leaving. At eight o'clock in the evening, the fool's wharf was brightly lit, and the passage to the harbor was jammed with people. There were no walls impervious to wind, and evidently, news of the military's passage through the harbor had leaked out tonight. Several green military trucks were parked at the end of the road, acting as temporary roadblocks. Standing beside the trucks were several tall individuals dressed in military uniforms they wore camouflage pants tucked into combat boots and had a resolute expression, emanating a sharp and determined aura. Officially, the Alliance hadn't issued a rescue mission in District 177. Technically, this team was just passing through and wasn't obligated to organize the evacuation of civilians. However, they still chose to bring along local residents as much as possible. Of course, this bringing along came with conditions. Each resident had to pass their thorough inspection before being allowed to board the starship behind them. Alone, Song Ku trailed behind the group with their numerous bags and luggage, craning her neck to look ahead. There were two lines in total, moving faster than she had anticipated. 
Everyone carried backpacks and dragged suitcases, moving forward silently and obediently. Along the way, someone would check the color of their pupils and whether they had any wounds or sores on their bodies and limbs. At the forefront of the line was a folding table with a black box about the size of a radio on it. Every person who had passed the previous inspection had to stand in front of the table with arms outstretched, like undergoing a CT scan. The black box emitted scans, and a screen extended from its side. From where Song Ku stood, she could only see a chaotic tangle of red and green lines on the screen. During the brief time she observed, three individuals at the front of the line were cleared, but the lines on the screen remained unchanged. One of them, a stern-looking man in his thirties who appeared to be the leader, moved his lips slightly. All three were directed towards the back half of the starship. Song Ku stared intently at the seemingly unremarkable black box. While she pondered, she felt a forceful push on her back. Move aside. Don't block the way. The person was ruthless in his actions, using his full strength. Unfortunately, even with the strong push, the seemingly fragile young girl's stance was as stable as a pine tree. She remained motionless, while he stumbled forward a few steps due to his own excessive force. He froze on the spot for a moment, then quickly regained his composure, glaring menacingly at Song Ku. Not wanting to draw attention to herself, Song Ku lowered her gaze, stepped back, and courteously made space for him. She recognized this man. His name was Su Weigua, and his fair-skinned son beside him was Su Xing. Su Weigua had made a fortune by engaging in some shady smuggling business, and it was rumored that he was quite influential in the outside world, even having connections in B-grade cities. He was the wealthiest individual in District 177. He always wore an oddly shaped gold watch on his wrist, and a blindingly shiny gold belt held up his round belly. While walking, his nostrils seemed perpetually aimed toward the sky. He might have been small-minded, if someone crossed him, he would hold a grudge for a long time. Song Ko had heard from Old Cheng about his domineering behavior and didn't want to stir up trouble at this critical moment, so she quickly made way for him without saying a word. Consider yourself smart. Su Weiguo was accustomed to being arrogant. Seeing her timid and apprehensive expression, he muttered a few words, but nothing substantial. He pushed through the queue of people, openly swearing and cutting in line. Holding his son's hand, he made his way to the very front. People dared not speak up, so they could only avoid him, suppressing their anger and swallowing their pride. His son was somewhat thinner-skinned, lowering his head in embarrassment and letting Su Weigua pull him forward. Chapter, 8. Island Escape Plan The two of them quickly passed the inspections along the way and stood before the black box. First, it was Su Weigua's turn. Similar to the previous residents who had been checked, the black box showed no response. However, when Su Xing stepped onto it, the dormant black box suddenly came to life. The chaotic red lines on the screen remained at the bottom, but several green lines undulated like rolling hills, oscillating in continuous arcs as if an electrocardiogram had regained vital signs after a long sleep. The man next to the black box slightly straightened his body, glanced at Su Xing, and said, Go to the front cabin. The commandeered starship was a standard civilian model, with two distinct cabin classes, economy and luxury. The economy class had a larger overall area, but the seats were cramped. The luxury class had small compartments for each seat, tea-colored glass with privacy film, and a greater focus on protecting passenger privacy. The two cabin classes were not connected, even having separate entrances. Upon hearing this result, before anyone could react, Su Weigua's face was filled with joy. Holding his son's hand, he was about to move forward. The man held his hand up, his stern expression conveying seriousness. You go to the back. Su Weigua's eyes widened, his tone grew frantic, This is my son. We are together. The man repeated, expressionless, You, go to the back. Su Weigua was so frustrated that his mouth seemed about to twist, but after surreptitiously glancing at the man's sturdy arms, his forceful demeanor wavered a bit. Sir can we discuss this and find a compromise, can't we? He reached into his bag, pulled out a thick bundle of newspapers concealing money, and discreetly tried to slip it into the man's pocket. The man pushed his hand back, his tone icy. 
ability users and ordinary people need to be evacuated separately. That's the regulation. Ability users. Song Ku, now somewhere in the middle of the queue, perked up her ears, catching this unfamiliar term keenly. Su Weigua's soft approach didn't work. His face instantly elongated, and even his tone grew more assertive. Who is your superior? Have him come and talk to me. Do you even know who I am? Do you understand the rules? I must be on this luxury cabin today. His small son was blocked by him, Su Weigua equally prohibited him from boarding the ship. Seeing this, the young soldier beside them simultaneously pulled out his gun, all of them aiming at Su Weigua. Captain, should we? Su Weigua trembled, but thinking about the starship tickets that had been unexpectedly cancelled despite being bought, and considering the complete collapse of transportation routes in District 177, a fierce determination flashed in his eyes. He gritted his teeth and refused to give in. The stern captain glanced at Su Xing, who had his head down, and signaled the soldiers to lower their guns. However, he didn't order them to let Su Weigua through, leaving him stranded. As Su Weigua remained immobile, the others in the queue shifted to the other side on their own. Luckily, there weren't many people left, so the inspection process didn't take much time. The line was getting shorter, and in just a few more people, it would be Song Ku's turn. However, a new situation arose unexpectedly. Ma'am, please remove your hat for inspection. A woman, tightly wrapped from head to toe, squeezed through from behind. She ran forward without any concern, holding a little boy with a duck-billed cap in her arms the boy's face was turned downwards, pressed against her neck, unmoving. The woman displayed astonishing strength, breaking through the line in just a few strides. She even knocked over a folding table, causing the black box on it to wobble and triggering a piercing alarm. The box tumbled to the ground, severing its connection to the display screen. However, Song Ku had already noticed. In that brief moment, the red line on the black box rebounded like it had hit bottom, shooting up to its peak. Please undergo inspection. The heavily armed soldiers surrounding her quickly reacted, encircling the woman. Blocked in her path, she trembled and knelt on the ground, repeatedly kowtowing, I beg you, please, save my precious child, please take him away. Though her plea was evident, half of her body bizarrely twitched uncontrollably. Someone cautiously stepped forward, lifting the scarf she used to cover her head. They then exclaimed in shock, Captain, she's already mutated. The woman's profile gradually became visible, and Song Ku was taken aback it was Aunt Ching. However, at this moment, Aunt Ching's face was ashen, with blue veins appearing to writhe menacingly beneath her skin. Drool incessantly trickled from the corners of her mouth. Despite her convulsions being so intense, the little boy nestled on her shoulder remained silent and motionless. Another soldier stepped forward, removing the boy's baseball cap and examining his eyes. He then turned to the captain, shaking his head slowly, the child is the same. Aunt Ching suddenly lifted her head, her eyes bulging. Her murky gray pupils froze, and her facial muscles seemed difficult to control, causing her expression to distort. Lockdown. The captain shouted loudly. The soldiers raised their guns, while the remaining civilians in the queue scattered in panic like birds and beasts. Amidst the chaos, Aunt Ching collided with Su Weigua and his son, Su Xing. Right at that moment, Su Xing, who had been lowering his head, happened to raise it and caught sight of her appearance. His face turned white as a sheet, his pupils quivering intensely, and he let out a piercing scream, piercing through eardrums, ah! Invisible waves of energy surged through the air, centered around Su Xing. The temperature plummeted around him, and a dozen ice spikes shot up from the ground, aimed directly at Aunt Ching and the little boy. Due to poor control, many of them scattered in all directions. Not good. The child's supernatural ability is out of control. Damn, it's an ice type. This just got tricky. In the icy and snowy surroundings, only the captain remained composed. He swiftly gestured, and a few well-trained individuals followed suit, the same tall figures that had been standing by the pickup truck earlier. A lean man stepped forward from the crowd, advancing toward Su Xing instead of retreating. Wherever he passed, countless ice spikes seemed to strike an invisible barrier and shattered into pieces. 
Everyone, get inside. The soldier with a simple and honest face pounded his fists on the ground, and hollowed out circles of earth akin to old Mongolian yurts emerged out of thin air. Startled residents followed his lead, taking refuge within the earthen circles. Su Weigua's legs had already turned limp, and he was dragged in like a lifeless fish. Song Ku jogged behind the crowd, but her gaze remained fixed on Su Xing's direction. These tall figures in military attire turned out to be ability users with exceptional skills. Suddenly, the corner of her eye caught a certain figure. The stern man moved like lightning, appearing and disappearing within his team's cover. Amidst the ice spikes, he maneuvered with ease, steadily closing in on Su Xing. His ghostly movements and speed far surpassed ordinary individuals, so swift that one couldn't see his actions clearly. Amidst the ice, wind, and flickering lightning, he exerted immense pressure on everyone. Su Xing fell into a state of panic, his pupils occasionally catching glimpses of the man's agile figure. However, he couldn't track his movements with the naked eye. In a fluster, he shook his head left and right, causing the ice spikes around him to waver, ready to collapse and randomly attack in all directions. The next second, the man appeared behind him, his hand swung down. Su Xing's terrified scream was caught in his throat as he blacked out. The ice spikes vanished, and the team members immediately surrounded Su Xing, securing him with special ropes in preparation to transfer him onto the starship. The Mongolian yurts crumbled, soldiers calmed the remaining residents, and they hurriedly conducted inspections and began to retreat. Su Weigua had already turned into a puddle of soft mud, no longer daring to be arrogant. He cowered as he was led to an ordinary cabin, not even daring to glance at his son. Song Ku's heart raced erratically. When the ice shards filled the air earlier, Aunt Qing had been pushed back by an invisible barrier, causing Xiao Bao to slip from her shoulder and fall nearby. Just as several sharp ice shards were about to descend, seemingly about to pierce the child on the spot. Song Ku grabbed a broken piece of wood from the ground, and a burst of blue light erupted from her palm, forming a shield to block the attack. Song Ku didn't know what mutation meant, but Aunt Qin was visibly different from the monsters encountered before. If she recalled correctly, Aunt Qin had been bitten at the dock. Despite the passing days, she still retained her clear consciousness and could speak normally. Amid her muddled thoughts, Song Ku felt that something was off. Given the urgent situation, she acted on instinct to save Xiao Bao. After the ice shards were blocked, Aunt Qin rushed over and picked up the child. Without saying a word, her grey-white eyes glanced at Song Ku, and she turned and ran. With everyone's attention focused on the icy battle, no one noticed the subtle movements here. Aunt Qin probably knew there was no hope of boarding the starship and chose not to linger, sprinting away without looking back. Song Ku gazed at her fading figure until a distant urgency echoed, Young lady, come for inspection. She responded with an acknowledgement, about to move forward. However, her foot accidentally kicked something, causing a small object to roll out quite a distance. It was the black box, battered from the melee, but its indicator light stubbornly stayed lit. Was it not damaged? Song Ku picked it up with both hands, gazing at it curiously. Suddenly, the black box seemed to have suffered some sort of stimulus. The red and green lines on the screen started dancing chaotically like disco lights. In a short time, they froze like a system crash, all lines turning rigidly straight, and then. Bang! Smoke erupted, and it exploded right then and there. Song Ku. Wait, how did this thing manage to self-destruct? Could she still throw it away now? Chapter, 9. Goodbye my home. Novice village completed. Song Ku stood in front of a folding table, exchanging glances with the tall figure in military attire. On the table sat that burnt and short-circuited black box. She subtly pushed it forward to convey her innocence. The tall figure glanced at the charred mess of wires and circuits, then back at her. Suddenly, he exclaimed, Oh, wow! Song Ku's nerves were on edge. She quickly waved her hands and shook her head, saying, And no, it's not me. Yeah yeah, not you, the tall figure beamed at her with a brilliant smile, then turned to report, Captain. The detectors busted. The stern captain approached, bending down to inspect. 
the ventilation panel of the black box was still emitting smoke. He pressed a button, the indicator light blinked twice, and then went out. He looked hopelessly at it, and then raised his gaze to Song Ku, narrowing his eyes as he noticed her hands. It really wasn't me, it malfunctioned all on its own. Song Ku continued to explain. She hadn't done anything, and if these two asked her for money, what would she do? Show me your hand, the captain's voice was cold. Song Ku obediently extended her open palm. Her hands were wrapped in white bandages, starting from her knuckles, winding around her wrists, forearms, and elbows, disappearing under her t-shirt sleeves. Except for her fingers, no skin was visible. Unwrap the bandages, the man ordered, each word pronounced deliberately. Song Ku hesitated for a moment, then slowly unwound the layers of bandages. The delicate palm of her hand had a few deflated blisters, and there were a few shallow scrapes on her arm. They looked somewhat long but not very deep, and they had already scabbed over. Accidental scratches, she explained. The man didn't respond immediately. He just looked at Song Ku with a stern expression, his gaze fixated on her hand. The young girl before him had bright eyes and moist pupils, occasionally darting towards the black box, appearing worried about having to pay money. Though they were just ordinary scrapes that seemed perfectly normal and lacked any signs of mutation, the captain seemed lost in thought, remaining silent, his gaze seemingly trying to burn a hole through Song Ku. The tall figure beside them couldn't stand it any longer, come on, captain, don't scare the girl. Look at her, she's so nervous that she's stuttering. Ha ha ha. Song Ku thought to herself, no need to worry, she was a stutterer to begin with. Have you awakened your ability? The man suddenly asked, catching her off guard. His voice was cold and rigid, as if it had been honed by grinding against stones for a long time. Song Ku didn't reply, her face displaying just the right amount of confusion. She didn't want to expose the secret of her ability, at least not right now. After what happened with Old Cheng, her guard had become even heavier. These people were not only strangers, but they were also fellow ability users like her. She couldn't trust them if things turned violent, it could become troublesome. The tall figure muttered, observing Song Ko from head to toe, I don't think so. Look at her delicate arms and legs. Doesn't quite fit. A few burly men carrying the tightly wrapped Su Xing passed by swiftly, boarding the luxury compartment of the starship. The tall figure's voice grew fainter and he awkwardly touched his nose, clearly reminded of how badly they had been dealt with by Su Xing, who had similarly delicate arms and legs. The man paid no attention to the tall figure's muttering and pointed out directly, you saved that mutant. A shiver ran down Song Ku's spine. She quickly started thinking. Did he see it? How much did he see? Her action of turning the piece of wood into a shield had been discreet, and she had retracted it after blocking the ice shards. How did he manage to notice while he was still engaged in battle? Mutants all eventually turn into zombies, without exception. Saving them serves no purpose. The man's cold attitude was like a needle, pricking Song Ku. Yet, she stubbornly explained, they, they aren't zombies yet. At least when she saved them, Aunt Qing and Xiao Bao hadn't turned into zombies yet. They shouldn't be treated like monsters. The man remained noncommittal, it's just a matter of time. Song Ko fell silent for a moment. She couldn't argue. Uncertain why the captain was being particularly stern with the young girl, and Chi Wen tried to diffuse the tension, Miss, don't be so nervous. We mean no harm. We're from the Azure Phoenix Army, the 11th Battalion of the Azure Phoenix. I'm in Chi Wen, and this is our captain, Wu Juamin. He turned his right palm upward, and faint electric arcs coalesced into a ball in his hand, if you have awakened an ability too, you can join us. See, the cabin in front is empty. He gestured towards the luxurious compartment of the starship. Song Ku stared at the lightning ball in his palm, pursing her lips, no, I I don't have an ability. If not, then stay at the back, Wu Juamin withdrew his gaze and walked away briskly. And Chi Wen followed him and glanced back at Song Ku, who was about to enter the regular cabin. Captain, are you still suspicious of her having an ability? Isn't it unlikely? I've even mentioned the name of Azure Phoenix. 
If she really has an ability, wouldn't it be safer for her to come with us? No need to hide anything. She's probably just an ordinary person. Wu Juamin's tone was cold, just suspicious, better if she doesn't. Wu Juamin had heightened senses, even more so after awakening his ability. During a recent teleportation, he had sensed a strange and intense energy fluctuation, fleeting though it was. At that moment, only Song Ku and two mutants were in that direction. Although the detector was broken, he could have detained her until they found a place for testing. But their squad had an urgent mission they couldn't afford to waste time here. She was just a suspected ability user and wouldn't cause much trouble. If she denied it, so be it. Furthermore, someone who disregarded orders to save mutants was inherently at odds with the values of Azure Phoenix. In the regular cabin of the starship. Passengers here were either numb or cautious. When Song Ku entered, she didn't draw much attention. Scanning the area, she noticed several rows of empty seats in the back. She lowered her head and took a seat in the corner. Not long after, the engine started, the starship accelerated, and it set forth into the boundless night. This was a low-orbit starship with openable windows. Passengers in the front seats had cracked their windows open, allowing the stifling late summer evening breeze to blow in, carrying a gloomy and humid atmosphere. An air of melancholy hung over every person inside the vehicle, and Song Ku heard a few low and hoarse sobbing sounds. Everyone's hearts were enveloped in unspeakable shadows. Far from their homeland, the future was uncertain. No one knew if they would survive or for how long. Song Ku looked out of the window. The mist had receded, and there was no moon tonight. The sea was pitch black, and the faint lights of the isolated islands gradually sank, melding into the darkness of the night. This also meant that District 177 was getting farther and farther away from her. Goodbye, my home. Song Ku bid her silent farewell in her heart. About an hour after the starship had departed, Su Weigua seemed to have regained his spirit and came back to life. He fumbled to stand up from his seat and skillfully made his way to the front where the active duty soldiers were stationed. Apparently, he realized that his money manipulation ability was no longer effective. He took out a pack of premium cigarettes and approached one of the soldiers with a friendly tone. Hey, buddy, let me ask you something. Where's this starship headed? The soldier accepted the cigarette, rubbed it a couple of times, sniffed it, and then pushed it back without lighting it, saying, the nearby D-class city. Su Weigua's hand holding the cigarette box trembled twice, and his voice dropped low, D-class. Why is it a D-class? Aren't we going north to the base? The soldier turned his head, gave Su Weigua a calculating look that was neither a smile nor a frown, and didn't directly respond, it's just D-class. We're relocating to a nearby D-class city for now. The next batch of rescue teams won't arrive for another two days. After that, we'll take you to the nearest emergency shelter. Su Weigua's expression turned grim. He leaned in and seemed to say something to the soldier, his emotions appearing slightly agitated. However, the soldier's attitude remained cold and unyielding. He shook his head at Su Weigua and repeated, I don't know. Follow the orders from above, stick to the protocol. Most of the people on the vehicle weren't in the mood to sleep. As soon as Su Weigua returned to his seat with a dark expression, many surrounded him to inquire about the information. Mr. Su, you're resourceful. I'd like to ask, where are we headed? Where else can we go? We're just waiting to die somewhere else. Weren't the soldiers supposed to evacuate us? Take us to a safe place. Do you actually believe that? Is a safe place that easy to find? For people like us, it's all up to fate. Although he said it's all up to fate, his expression was clenched and full of resentment and sarcasm. Mr. Su, what do you mean by that? Do you have some insider information? An anxious middle-aged man asked. Su Weigua stared intently at the person who spoke, do you think the apocalypse just came out of nowhere? Aren't they saying it's due to solar activity? Nonsense. Su Weigua's voice trembled, and he sounded deeply resentful, so many emergency shelters, so many ability users. Could it all have been arranged in just two or three days? Let me tell you all, they knew about this long ago. Those people knew long ago. 
And now, the apocalypse has finally arrived. The ability users have become superior beings, while we ordinary folks are just disposable lives, mere puppets for them. Eventually, we'll all turn into zombies. Blue light flickered in Song Ku's palm, a slender swallowtail dart dancing nimbly between her fingers. The sharp blade brushed against her delicate skin, yet it moved with a grace reminiscent of a child's toy. Upon hearing Su Weigua's words about ability users being superior beings and ordinary people being disposable lives, the swallowtail dart spun in a beautiful arc, radiating a chilling coldness. The middle-aged man who was the first to speak was berated by him, and his face turned sour, Mr. Su, it's true we're just disposable lives. As long as we survive, it doesn't matter where we go, a trace of disdain appeared in his eyes, but isn't your son an ability user? Why don't you have a way out? Su Weigua's eyes lit up, as if he had grasped onto a lifeline. He couldn't listen to anyone else's words anymore, muttering to himself, right. I have a son, my son is an ability user. The atmosphere in the vehicle, once again, fell into a deep depression after Su Weigua's inquiries. Some stared at the partitioned luxury cabin in a daze, while others softly discussed how abilities came about and why they hadn't been so fortunate. Yet, nobody could find a reasonable explanation, nor the courage to question the armed soldiers at the front. Around four in the morning, the starship came to a silent stop. At this moment, most of the passengers in the regular cabin were asleep. The few who remained were closing their eyes with evident exhaustion. The subtle mechanical sounds of movement were easily overlooked, but suddenly, Song Ku opened her eyes, rousing from a light doze. She opened the window, stepped onto the window ledge, like an agile gecko, and clung to the window frame as she bent down and slipped out. In a few moves, she climbed onto the top of the starship. Through the dim morning light, she saw that the starship was actually separating automatically. The luxurious cabin housing the ability users reconfigured itself into a separate small aircraft in a matter of seconds. It then switched tracks and headed in a different direction, parting ways with them. Song Ku wasn't foolish enough to shout and create a commotion. She stood on top of the starship, watching as the other aircraft vanished into the distance. She then observed her surroundings and was soon taken aback right in the city center, a familiar landmark building caught her eye. The nearby D-class city. It turned out to be here. As dawn broke, a civilian starship silently entered a food factory warehouse on the outskirts of Hua City D-99 district, a suburban area. This rectangular warehouse occupied an area of about 500 square meters and had been converted into a temporary shelter. Three sides of the walls were sealed, with only a single entrance in the south. A group of armed alliance soldiers patrolled the entrance, and sentry posts extended out two kilometers away. Surface-wise, the security measures were nearly impeccable. All the passengers from the starship disembarked, queued up for inspection, and entered the warehouse like a silent herd of sheep. Song Ku hung at the back of the line, her footsteps gradually slowing, and she started to create distance from the front. While this place appeared safe, it likely came with limitations on movement. Once inside, it would be difficult to get out. Song Ku never fully entrusted her safety to others she had a different plan since earlier. Taking advantage of several soldiers moving up front to maintain order, she flashed into a nearby alleyway. Chapter 10 who in their right mind would challenge zombies? Hua City D99 District was located in the southeastern part of the New Asia Alliance. The district had convenient land and water transportation, abundant natural resources, and was a rare livable city in Class D. When it came to the most famous aspect of Hua City, it was undoubtedly the extremely complex radial road network in the central city area. With its ingenious layout resembling the pattern of a Bagua formation, Hua City had won the gold prize in the first Alliance City planning competition. Song Ku was not unfamiliar with Hua City. She had studied here, walked through its streets and alleys, and experienced the summer rains and winter snow of Hua City. If it weren't for what happened later she might have been even more familiar with this city. However, the Hua City of the present could no longer see the lively scenes of the past. Song Ku traveled from outside the Fifth Ring Road and as she moved inward, the density of zombie groups along the way grew thicker. The once bustling central commercial area was devoid of people. 
Along the streets, shops were either looted or closed with thick iron chains hanging on the doors, preventing a clear view of the interiors. As if overnight, the city that had once been filled with crowds and noise had turned into a desolate wasteland. Zombies often roamed the main roads, and Song Ku didn't want any sudden intimate encounters with them. She had to find alternative routes. She jumped up and down between the rooftops of the residential area, quickly moving through. Unexpectedly, there was a young boy on the opposite high rise. He looked at her through a security window, and their eyes met. The boy's pupils trembled, startled. He was about to scream when an adult behind him quickly covered his mouth and led him away from the window. They hurriedly closed the curtains. For them, any creature wandering outside was as threatening as a zombie. Song Ku paid no attention to this, as she had spotted an unmanned supermarket. Jumping down from the third floor, she quickly approached her target. The glass door sensed the infrared signal and slid open slowly on both sides. The interior light suddenly dimmed, and Song Ku keenly sensed that there were people inside. Three or four men had their backs to her, rummaging through the shelves. Judging from their attire, they seemed to be local residents. Upon hearing the sound of the door opening, they became tense and turned around as if facing a formidable enemy. They frantically raised weapons like kitchen knives and rolling pins at Song Ku. Song Ku quickly scanned the area and realized that the supermarket had been mostly stripped of its contents. She didn't want to start a conflict recklessly, so she raised her hands immediately, indicating that she meant no harm. She kept her gaze on them and slowly backed out. While other supplies were manageable, after a day and night of traveling, the drinking water was running dangerously low. After exiting the supermarket, she observed the surrounding environment. She suddenly remembered that there should be a delivery station for an online shopping platform nearby. When the platform was first launched, there were a few s about it, including the location of the delivery station. It was supposed to be hidden, maybe at the end of a certain alley. Following her rough memory of the direction, she circled around a few times and indeed found the delivery station, surprisingly still undiscovered by anyone. Song Kook picked the lock and entered. The weather was hot, and the station was filled with the sour smell of rotting fruits and vegetables. She replenished her drinking water, then selected some cakes, dried fruits, sausages, and biscuits with longer shelf lives, stuffing them into her bag with effort. While reorganizing her backpack space, a sudden sound from outside caught her attention. Song Ku zipped up her bag and silently moved to the window, pushing aside the blinds to look outside. At the corner of the alley, several meters away, a burly bald man was dragging a woman, attempting to snatch the bag from her hand. Let go. The bald man's menacing expression was evident as he threw punches at the woman. The woman had disheveled hair and hunched back, appearing extremely weak, yet she clung tightly to her bag. Give it back to me. I've worked so hard to find it please, give it back to me. After the bag's mouth was pulled open, several cans of loose milk powder spilled out, followed by baby items like bottles and diapers, and finally, two or three bags of instant noodles. The bald man, having a clear view of the items on the ground, kicked the woman's face angrily, causing blood to flow instantly. Seeing that he had grabbed the bag and was about to run away, the woman disregarded everything and clung to his trousers, shouting hoarsely, You beast! You'll have a miserable death! Ah! The fight outside happened too quickly for Song Ku to intervene. The woman's scream had already pierced the night sky. She inwardly exclaimed, Not good! True to her fears, within a few seconds, over a dozen zombies came rushing from the main road, swarming into the alley and attacking the two individuals with wild bites. The bloody scene and the piercing screams were too distressing to watch. Both individuals fell to the undead onslaught, but the zombies didn't disperse. Attracted by the strong scent of blood, they gathered, more and more of them converging. Soon, the alley became so packed that there was hardly any room to move. The nearest zombie had wandered to the doorstep of the delivery station, passing right by Song Ku on the other side of the window. No, they were getting more and more. Waiting any longer would make it impossible to escape. Song Ku secured her bag strap, made sure its contents wouldn't spill, and pushed open the delivery station's door. The slight creak of the door caught the attention of the zombie horde. 
dozens of pale faces turned in her direction simultaneously. Facing the approaching zombies, Song Ku didn't back down but advanced. Swish swish, several swallowtail darts were thrown accurately, stabbing into the eye sockets and necks of the roaring zombies in front. Their movements were visibly delayed. She picked up a kettle from the station and in an instant, it transformed into a nearly three-foot-long staff, which she swung down fiercely. The foremost tall zombie's brain matter splattered, its head completely detached. Song Ku slung its head into the horde and, while rapidly advancing, skillfully swung her staff, knocking away the zombies converging from all sides. When she reached the entrance of the alley, she held the staff's end with both hands, sweeping it 180 degrees in front of her. The remaining zombies that hadn't squeezed in all fell down. In less than five minutes, she had cleared an escape path, climbed over the rooftops ahead, and swiftly disappeared. That night, Song Ko slept on top of an abandoned water tower in the industrial district. It was far from the city center, sparsely populated, and the zombies couldn't climb up. Lying on the concrete ground, she looked up at the chaotic night sky, feeling utterly lost. Since the day she learned of the impending apocalypse, Song Ku had been lost. Her grandfather had told her to live well, but she had only slept for three days. When she woke up, everything had gone awry. She hadn't understood anything yet, and she was already being chased by zombies, abandoned by the Qing family, followed by her master's death, the martial arts school's destruction, and being forced to leave District 177, exiled to Hua City. Then what? What should she do to survive in this kind of apocalypse? After nearly two days and nights without sleep, Song Ku was reaching her limit. As drowsiness gradually overtook her, she turned over, silently repeating in her mind, regardless of everything, just stay here for a couple of days, hold on until the rescue team arrives. At least, she was familiar with Hua City enduring for a while shouldn't be a problem. Moreover, she had to figure out how her special abilities came to be. The next day, Song Kuk continued her exploration westward. As the first light of dawn broke, she arrived at School Street in Hua City. This street used to have many shops, but unexpectedly, there wasn't much left in terms of supplies. It seemed they had already been scavenged once. Passing a corner, faint rustling noises came from up ahead. Song Ku's right hand gently brushed her pocket, where several swallowtail darts remained. She turned the corner and there on the ground, a huddled figure was present. Upon hearing footsteps, the figure froze instantly. After a strange silence, the figure slowly raised its head and turned it around, revealing grayish-white eyeballs, a mutilated face covered in flesh and blood, and jagged teeth smeared with who knows what kind of minced meat. Spotting live prey, its pupils dilated, and its mouth slowly opened, ready to roar at Song Ku. Just as Song Ku was about to make a move, a succession of shouts erupted from behind, here. There's a zombie here. Suddenly, a few teenagers in Hua City first middle school uniforms, each holding a baseball bat, appeared. Two agile boys rushed past Song Ku and charged ahead, yelling in terror. In a chaotic flurry, they dispatched the zombie. Afterwards, they turned their attention cautiously to Song Ku, while the remaining individuals slowly spread out, encircling her. Who is she? No, is she human or a zombie? Probably, probably human. But she was just standing with the zombies. Who in their right mind would challenge a zombie face to face like that? Which one of you wants to go ask her? I surely don't dare. No, why are you all looking at me? I said I don't dare. Finally, the chubby guy who repeated I don't dare several times was pushed forward. Gathering his courage, he nervously asked, Um, Miss, A, are you a human? Song Ku moved her hand away from her pocket and was about to answer, but the chubby guy started panicking on his own, Oh no. She's not speaking. She's so fierce. I said I don't dare, woo woo. Song Ku took a deep breath and explained, one word at a time, I am human. Tears welled up in the chubby guy's eyes, T T T then, H H H how did you come out alone? What are you all doing, standing here? At this moment, seven or eight more people arrived at the intersection, joining the group of students. Among them, a gentle-looking girl inadvertently caught sight of Song Ku and exclaimed, You're Song Ku. 
Song Ku slowly raised her gaze upon hearing that voice. E, do you know her? A round-faced girl asked with confusion. After finishing her awkward shout, Chao Yi unexpectedly encountered Song Ku's ice-cold dark pupils. She quickly averted her gaze, as if pricked by a needle, and stumbled to explain, Ah. Oh, she she was my former classmate. She glanced furtively at the figure of a certain guy ahead, her explanation distracted and hasty. The guy had his back turned to her, facing in Song Ku's direction, his posture appearing quite tense. Chao Yi bit her lip, fingers nervously clutching her clothes corner. Suddenly, she took the initiative to approach, grabbed Song Ku's hand, and put on an intentionally enthusiastic smile, Song Ku, you disappeared from school without a word. We were all surprised. Later, we heard you went back to your hometown to work. How did you end up here now? Expressionless, Song Ku stared at their intertwining hands until Chao Yi awkwardly let go. Then, she turned to the chubby guy and continued to answer in a measured tone, I got, got separated from the retreat, retreat group accidentally, so I, I'm alone. Oh, I see. The chubby guy didn't expect Song Ku to still answer him, and he responded foolishly. Someone was successfully amused, and the way they looked at Song Ku suddenly changed, what's this? A stutterer? I heard survivors from other districts have come over these two days. Seems like they want to manage us collectively. Weren't they supposed to be centralized? Then why is she wandering outside alone? Who knows, but she seems pretty bold. The girls in our class would scream at the sight of zombies. Amid their laughter and banter, Song Ko stood unmoved, her expression unchanged. Brother Jiang, what do you think? A young man, whose hair looked like it had been curled with aluminum foil, appeared more mature than the others. He asked softly, looking at the tall and silent guy who had been standing at the forefront. Jiang Rui's gaze was complex. He stared at Song Ku in silence, the old scar on his brow especially prominent in the sunlight. He clenched his hand tightly and then released it unexpectedly. He invited, Song Ku, our school has a safe zone with around a hundred people. Do you want to come with us? He added, we have people with special abilities. Jiang Rui. Why are you telling her all this? She's not from our school. Another guy complained unhappily. Jiang Rui touched the ring on his hand. His icy gaze swept over the person, and they immediately shut up in fear. Encountering Jiang Rui and Chao Yi unexpectedly made Song Ku's mood plummet. She felt irritated, truly annoyed, and wanted to avoid any interactions with them. She had already taken steps forward when she heard the last sentence, causing her to hesitate. Special abilities? They have people with special abilities. Maybe they know something. Song Ku nodded, sure. Chapter, 11 More terrifying than zombies Jiang Rui appeared to be the leader of this group of high school students, with everyone else in the team obeying his every word except for Song Ku. Song Ku had a carefree attitude, not quite understanding the twists and turns of social interactions. When Jiang Rui asked her to join him, she unreservedly stood by his side, paying no attention to the people behind her and their varied expressions. The atmosphere remained quiet throughout the journey, and the two of them only exchanged a few words after a long while. Song Ku was not one to speak much she had always been a few words. Jiang Rui, on the other hand, was acting unusually. In the past, he had been bold and unruly, making it impossible to ignore his existence. Almost three years had passed, and his recklessness had mellowed considerably. His entire demeanor had transformed as if he had undergone a profound change, almost as if he had completely forgotten the past grievances when facing Song Ku. He even took the initiative to explain the current situation. On the day of the solar eruption, it happened to be the day students returned to school. Many people suddenly fainted. At that time, no one realized the severity of the situation. They thought it was just ordinary heatstroke and took them to the medical room. The first zombie appeared that evening, followed by the second, the third in less than two days, the school was completely overrun. You mean, there are people with special abilities among you? Yes, there are three individuals with special abilities. And how many normal people were there? 123. 
Two days ago, there were nearly 200, but some didn't want to stay at the school and found ways to escape either back home or to nearby shelters. After they left, we lost all contact with them so there have been fewer people leaving these past few days. At this critical juncture, students who lost contact were probably facing dire circumstances. Song Ku tactfully refrained from further questions. Song Ku, how have you been? Quite abruptly, Jian Rui turned to her and asked. Song Ku glanced at him in bewilderment. This question was quite out of the blue, and she didn't know how to respond. If she said she was doing well, it would be a lie. With her family gone and nowhere to belong, how could she be considered well? If she said she wasn't doing well, she would have been bitten by zombies long ago on this journey and wouldn't be standing here conversing with Jiang Rui. Jiang Rui seemed to realize that his question was ill-timed. After a moment of silence, he changed the subject. Several minutes later, they found a western-style restaurant and managed to pry open the locked curtain at the entrance. The group was preparing to split into two teams for a search. We haven't been to this restaurant before. I'll take a few people to the main hall and the second floor. Zhang Hao, you and your group go to the kitchen to look for food. Keep it quiet and don't attract any zombies. Jiang Rui quickly organized the teams there were twelve people in total. He took seven with him, leaving the remaining five with Zhang Hao. Chao Yi was assigned to Jiang Rui's team, and she wisely refrained from engaging in conversation with Song Ku, keeping her head down and lost in thought. When it was Song Ku's turn, Jiang Rui hesitated for a moment. Song Ku, go with Zhang Hao to the kitchen. Zhang Hao, who had received this hot potato, didn't voice any objections upon hearing this. He cast a lingering glance at Song Ku before complying. The main hall faced the street, and the second floor had numerous outdoor balconies. Compared to the kitchen, which was situated deep within the restaurant, the danger level was naturally higher. By assigning Song Ku to Zhang Hao's team, everyone understood that they were looking out for her. Song Ku didn't mind. She was fine with going wherever. Since the teams were already divided, she simply agreed and stood behind Zhang Hao. The kitchen was located deep within the western-style restaurant. They crossed the main hall and walked along the corridor for a while. Someone exclaimed in excitement, there's a cold storage room here. Zhang Hao immediately decided, let's go check it out. When Song Ku tried to follow them inside, Zhang Hao reached out and stopped her. Wait here, classmate. Don't move around. Zhang Hao had already come out for the third time. He was more cautious than the others, and the addition of a fragile girl to the team, especially one who had a connection with Jiang Rui, didn't sit well with him. If this girl started causing trouble with tears and complaints, it could jeopardize their lives. At the moment, he just hoped that Song Ku would stay put like a fragile doll, not offering assistance and not causing any disruptions. Song Ku sensed his rejection and slowly retracted her raised foot. Oh. Zhang Hao and another boy continued to carry out beef, mutton, fruits, and vegetables from the cold storage room. They handed the items to the round-faced girl in their team, who squatted on the ground, organizing the various foods and packing them into the backpacks of several people. Song Ku was left standing aside, and the girl didn't show any intention of asking for her help. She ended up sitting on a table, watching them work. Inside the narrow kitchen, two boys entered one after the other, searching for supplies with curiosity. Wow, this restaurant's kitchen is so small. There probably isn't much here. So should we go back outside? Why rush? Going out now means helping with carrying things. Some of the potatoes in the basket had started to sprout. The taller boy picked up a small one, mimicking a basketball shot, and playfully threw it into the chubby boy's hooded t-shirt. Three points. Nice shot. The chubby boy wore a distressed expression. Kongzi Chi, stop messing around. Kongzi Chi ignored him and continued, it's fine. Brother Jiang and the others are outside. Hey, Tian Yi, don't dodge. Chubbs was afraid of pain, twisting and turning to evade. The small potato's aim was off, and it missed him, bouncing off the counter with a few thuds, seemingly hitting something with a muffled sound. Both of them were surprised and simultaneously turned their heads to the point of impact. 
several zombies stood up unsteadily, one of them wearing a white chef's hat and being as round as a small hill. Kong Zi Chi was dumbfounded, staying frozen for several seconds. These zombies were holding spatulas and knives in their hands. Oh my god! Tian Yi, run! Since he was close to the door, Kong Zi Chi rushed out in a few steps, gripping the doorframe and shouting, Quick, come over, Tian Yi! Tian Yi was positioned closer to the inside. He was facing the head chef zombie directly and, in his panic, stumbled. The head chef zombie reached out and grabbed his leg. Tian Yi desperately kicked and stomped on its face, shouting in terror, Help! Help! The commotion quickly reached the outside, and Zhang Hao's group hurriedly rushed out of the cold storage room, even Zhang Rui's team arrived in haste. Kong Zi Qi's voice was trembling with urgency. Brother Jiang, save Tian Yi. The kitchen's door was narrow, allowing only one person to pass at a time. Inside the confined space, Jiang Rui hesitated while rubbing the ring on his right hand. He wasn't particularly skilled in close combat. However, as he lifted his head and faced the expectant gazes of everyone around him, his breath caught, and with a voice hoarse with resolution, he finally ordered, Once I'm in, all of you retreat. But someone acted even quicker than him. Song Ku had been idly watching, swinging her slender legs, as the girls packed the food. Suddenly, she heard a scream from the kitchen. Soon after, a boy stumbled out, disoriented. Without much thought, she used one hand to support herself on the table and leaped out. Like a whirlwind, she rushed into the room. Delivering several swift kicks to the chubby chef zombie's belly, she forced it to retreat. Then, she grabbed a bucket from the sink with lightning speed and slammed it down on the zombie's head. When it staggered in confusion, flailing its limbs, she caught hold of the chubby boy's collar, pulling him up, and swiftly instructed, Run, now. The slightly chubby boy, Tian Yi, weighing around 160 pounds, was flung out of the kitchen by her like a ball. The pursuing zombies followed suit. Song Kuf targeted their vulnerable joints, attacking with cracking bone sound snap, snap. The movements of the zombies were disoriented, and she then picked up the baseball bat that Tian Yi had dropped. With a heavy thud, she struck the head of the head chef zombie who had just managed to free itself from the bucket. It fell backwards in confusion, its bulky body resembling a bowling ball. It collided with the other zombies, creating a clattering commotion. Taking advantage of the chaos, Song Ku swiftly shut the door, locked it, and pushed tables against it. Turning around, she faced a group of teenagers, their jaws dropping in shock as they looked at her. Song Ku kindly informed them, it's taken care of. We should, we should leave. Silencia eerie silence. After a while, someone couldn't hold back their amazement. It feels like Kong Zi Chi supported Tian Yi, swallowing hard, she's more terrifying than zombies. Jian Rui stood at the front of the crowd, looking at Song Ku's slender figure. The old scar on his brow seemed to throb slightly. He couldn't help but smile wryly to himself. Indeed, he had been overthinking things. Back in the day, Song Ku could handle an entire class on her own. Why had he ever thought she needed his protection? Pack up, let's go quickly. The journey back to the school went surprisingly smoothly, perhaps because Jiang Rui's group had become familiar with the route and didn't encounter any more zombies along the way. The high schoolers whispered behind Song Ku's back, no longer daring to mock her openly. Lin Xia, the round-faced girl who was previously in Song Ku's group, tugged on Chao Yi's sleeve and said with surprise, Yi, what's the deal with your classmate? She's amazing. Chao Yi lowered her eyelashes, her voice soft and hard to read. Is that so? She's always liked to fight. As they approached Hua City No. One middle school, Song Ku finally voiced the question that had been on her mind for a while. I have a question. What's the question? Tell me, if the school is, is infested with zombies, why is there still a, a safe zone? Well you'll find out soon. Instead of entering the school through the main gate, they took a detour around a side hill. When they looked down from the slope, the sight before them left Song Ku momentarily speechless. Hundreds and thousands of zombies dressed in Hua City No. One middle school uniforms had taken over the playground, 
dormitories, and teaching buildings. Their dense presence was enough to make one's scalp tingle. They wandered everywhere like ghosts, their heads twitching nervously as they turned, sniffing the scent of living humans in the air. This was the largest zombie horde that Song Ku had seen since the apocalypse, and also the most chilling. After all, these were once lively boys and girls in their teens, with bright futures ahead of them, the hopes of the Alliance. Now, they had become lifeless walking corpses. The expressions of everyone grew heavy. Tian Yi's sadness was about to overflow from his face. In our class, except for me and Kong Zi Chi, everyone our homeroom teacher was bitten by the zombies while trying to protect us. Even Kong Zi Chi, who had always been jovial, had red eyes as he turned away. Jian Rui pointed in a direction. There's the safe zone. He was referring to a stormproof, enclosed stadium near the edge of the school, built using the latest seismic and fire-resistant materials provided by the Alliance. Behind it was a high-voltage electric fence. Song Kook gazed at the tightly packed zombies outside the stadium. How do we get in? Through here. Jiang Rui took the lead, and the others followed him. They went around the slope behind the stadium. When they got closer, Song Kook noticed a hole in the high-voltage electric fence. It looked as if it had been burned open by intense heat, just large enough for an adult to pass through. However, two or three zombies were wandering nearby. Step back. The group halted in the woods not far from the zombies. Jian Rui's voice was stern. Everyone else took two steps backward, and Song Ku hesitated for a moment before falling back in line with them. She looked left and right, took small steps, and aligned herself with the others on the same level. Jian Rui took off his ring and walked towards the zombies. Song Ku's sharp eyes noticed a faint red mark around the base of his middle finger. Just then, Jian Rui raised his hand, and a two-meter-long flame snake burst from his palm, instantly transforming into a fiery whip. He lashed it at several zombies, the smell of burning flesh and skin quickly spreading. The zombies emitted cries of agony and soon fell to the ground. It finally dawned on Song Ku Jiang Rui was actually an ability user. After dealing with the zombies, Jiang Rui turned back and glanced at Song Ku. It seemed like he wanted to say something, but the others had already burst into cheers. Brother Jiang is amazing. That AOE skill, it's so satisfying to whip those zombies. After eliminating the minor obstacle blocking their path, the group passed through the gap in the electric fence and soon arrived beneath the wall at the back of the stormproof stadium. Jian Rui took out his phone and typed out a message. Two minutes later, something unbelievable happened. The wall in front of them rapidly dissolved, revealing the shape of a door, jutting out abruptly. A transforming door. Song Ku, welcome to the safe zone. After Jian Rui finished speaking, he pushed open the door without hesitation. The group filed inside, and the door closed again, existing for about ten seconds before suddenly disappearing. Song Ku turned around, only to see that the wall was as smooth as before. Chapter 12 Something in Common In the wind and rain-covered playground, about a hundred people were seated or standing, all looking over, Brother Jiang and the others have returned. After the door completely vanished, Song Ku noticed there was a boy standing beside her. His face was somewhat pale, but his eyes were very bright. He had a deep blue sports headband wrapped around his head, and his hands had just retracted from the wall. Song Ku stared at him for a couple more seconds. Jian Rui noticed her gaze and leaned closer to her, explaining near her ear, he's called Lu Zixuan. His ability is door opening. He can open a door on any flat surface, for 20 seconds. We use this method to enter and exit the safe zone. Song Ku wasn't used to people being so close to her, so she made a hum of acknowledgement and took two steps away. Opening a door out of thin air using an ability. No wonder this place could establish a safe zone. The entire wind and rain-covered playground was sealed on all four sides. The intelligent controlled gates to the east and west were tightly shut, and there were many heavy objects piled behind them. It was like a stronghold to defend against zombie attacks. Along with Lu Zixuan's ability, they had control over the initiative of entering and exiting, which helped avoid direct conflict with the zombies as much as possible. 
A group of thirteen people walked towards the center of the wind and rain-covered playground, where a young man was waiting for them. Teacher Sue, we're back. The members of the squad saw him and immediately surrounded him. We hit the jackpot this time. We found steak. Lamb leg. We can finally have meat. Teacher Sue, there are more and more zombies outside. When will the Alliance's rescue team come? Upon hearing this last sentence, the high spirits of the crowd gradually dampened. Every day spent here added an extra layer of danger. The reason why they hadn't lost hope was simply due to their faith, believing that the Alliance wouldn't easily abandon Hua City. Su Liren was a teacher at Hua City No. 1 Middle School, 30 years old this year, of average height. He wore rimless glasses and had a gentle and refined demeanor. At this moment, he was tilting his head slightly, patiently listening to a group of students chatter away. After they had finished speaking, Jiang Rui quietly briefed him on the events of the day and gestured with his hand towards Song Ku, who stood behind. She became the center of attention, initially unnoticed by those who remained in the wind and rain-covered playground. However, with Jiang Rui's gesture, several inquisitive gazes immediately fell upon her. After listening to Jiang Rui's account, Su Liren kindly beckoned her over, Song Ku, come here. The squad members parted like the Red Sea, instinctively making way to the sides. Song Ku, who lagged a step behind, was exposed. She took two steps forward, remaining silent. Su Liren had been her homeroom teacher and was aware of her stuttering issue. He didn't mind her reticence and simply gazed at her through his glasses, as if contemplating something. Teacher Su, Song Ku saved me today. Tian Yi eagerly wanted Song Ku to stay and spoke up for her. Yeah, yeah. When we encountered the zombies, she knocked down several of them. She's really impressive, Komzi Chi chimed in as well. The other members of the team, though they didn't say anything aloud, had eager expressions in their eyes. Song Ku's powerful skills had left a profound impression on them. With someone capable of fighting like this joining them, everyone's sense of safety improved significantly. Professor Su, let Song Ku stay, Jiang Rui proposed voluntarily. Let's not rush things, everyone, Su Liren said with a comforting smile, looking at Song Ku with care. According to what Jiang Rui said, you got separated from the retreating group, right? Hua City is quite dangerous now. I try my best to ensure the safety of every student. If you're willing, would you consider staying here temporarily? Su Liren spoke eloquently, like a gentle breeze, and those eyes behind his glasses seemed to hold an irresistible persuasive power when meeting someone's gaze. It was hard to summon the courage to resist him. Song Ku instinctively looked away and was about to agree. No, I disagree. A delicate and pretty girl walked down from the stands. When Chao Yi tried to grab her sleeve, she shrugged her off. Professor Su, this place is already dangerous. Why are we letting in unknown people? What if she seeks revenge on us or causes trouble intentionally? Seeing her, Jiang Rui frowned and patiently explained, Zhou Anqi, Song Ku isn't an unknown person. She's also your classmate. A classmate? Did she ever treat us as classmates? Don't forget why she dropped out in the first place. That's enough. Jiang Rui interrupted her coldly. Zhou Anqi was scolded loudly by him. At first, she was stunned, but then it seemed like she'd been slapped by a burning palm. Her father was on the school board at Hua City No. 1 Middle School. She was used to being a proud little princess and had never faced such a loss of face, especially from Jiang Rui. She was embarrassed and angry, on the verge of losing her temper. Su Liren sent the others to handle supplies, then turned to Zhou Anqi. He calmly said her name, Zhou Anqi. Zhou Anqi angrily lifted her gaze, suddenly meeting his calm eyes. She shivered, and her imposing demeanor vanished instantly. The foul language on her lips was forgotten. Su Liren spoke slowly, as if trying to convince her, at this time, all of us should unite and put aside personal conflicts. Think about it, Song Ku's addition is beneficial for us. Doesn't what I said make sense? Zhou Anqi found herself nodding along, not sure how she had agreed. Su Liren smiled contentedly, then looked at Song Ku. 
you've had a long day. Go rest. Those several rows over there are your former classmates from class 3. You can join them. Song Ku stared at Zhou Anqi, feeling a bit puzzled. How had Zhou Anqi, after three years of not seeing her, suddenly changed her attitude? Just a moment ago, she was furious, wanting to bite her, and now she was obedient. Interrupted by Su Liren, Song Ku followed the direction of the stands and saw her old classmates, who appeared both alarmed and embarrassed, none of them daring to meet her gaze. No need, Song Ku thought coldly, finding an empty corner to lean against the wall and rest. On the western side of the stands, someone curiously approached the group from class 3, asking for gossip. Who's that? So arrogant. Is she brother Zhang's new partner? You're such an idiot, the person speaking trembled all over. Don't provoke her. She's a disaster that scar on brother Zhang's head was caused by her. When Chao Yi came to find Zhou Anqi after collecting supplies, she saw her sitting by the stands with vacant eyes. Chao Yi adjusted her facial expression, putting on a concerned look, and whispered to her, Anqi, are you still angry about Song Ku? Zhou Anqi was confused for a moment before slowly regaining her composure. Who? Oh, her. Such bad luck. Professor Su agreed to let her stay. How did you guys run into this harbinger of doom? Chao Yi sat down beside her. Actually, it's not a big deal that we bumped into her. Jian Rui insisted on bringing her back. He even took special care of her on the way. We're all looking for supplies everywhere, and she just needs to watch. Zhou Anqi's anger flared up again upon hearing this. She stood up, ready to confront Jiang Rui, but Chao Yi grabbed her arm. Anqi, don't be impulsive. If you go to talk to Jiang Rui now, he'll only dislike you more. Jiang Rui is an ability user now. You can't provoke him like before. Zhou Anqi pouted. I just can't understand how she has the nerve to make Jiang Rui bring her back. Because she can fight, but Anqi, things are different now. Even though she can fight, she's not an ability user. Some situations are beyond even the capabilities of ability users. Without Jiang Rui protecting her, who knows what might happen Chao Yi trailed off. What might happen? Hey, can't you just say everything at once? Jeez, Zhou Anqi stared at her. Chao Yi choked a bit, inwardly cursing at how dense she was. She had dropped such obvious hints, and yet Zhou Anqi still didn't get it. She smiled gently. Anqi, do you know that Zhang Qi likes you? Leaning against the wall, Song Ku let her supernatural power circulate slowly within her body, trying to control every subtle change. Her outward projection of mental energy detected a mass of energy approaching. Opening her eyes, she saw Tian Yi placing a bag of meat floss bun in front of her. After being caught in the act, the chubby boy scratched the back of his head and shyly smiled at her. Thank you for saving me today. Song Ku retracted her mental power and responded succinctly, no need. It's necessary. Thanks to you today, I was so scared back then Tian Yi waved his hands repeatedly, carefully observing her expression. Actually, he was a little wary of Song Ku at first, but after experiencing her life-saving help, he felt a bit closer to her. Somehow, Song Ku's cold and aloof demeanor seemed to trigger his desire to talk. Tian Yi simply sat down on the ground and started chatting non-stop, Oh, you don't know, I used to be so afraid of disaster movies. Those moments when the zombies come rushing out. Chattering away to himself, he reminded Song Ku of aiming for a moment, so she didn't interrupt him immediately. But he just kept on going, and Song Ku finally reached her limit. Hey, you, shut shut up. Tian Yi stopped talking as if a parrot had its throat squeezed, looking pitiful. Song Ku sighed inwardly. If you really, really want to talk. Just tell me about, about the situation here. Sure, Tian Yi became excited again. I entered the safe zone on the first day. What do you want to know? Ability users. We currently have three ability users. Brother Jiang, you already know about him. He's a fire-type ability user, able to control flames like whips. He's adept at dealing with zombie groups. So, I declare, 
Brother Jiang is the strongest fighter here. Song Ku raised an eyebrow, neither agreeing nor disagreeing. Then there's Lu Zixuan. His power is the ability to open doors. He opened the door for us when we first came in. However, he needs a 12-hour interval between each door opening. Initially, he even passed out after using it, so we usually only go out once every other day. Thinking of how she had depleted her psychic power the first time, Song Ku couldn't help but think, Lu Zixuan's power might be unique, but its actual consumption is quite high. No wonder he can only use it twice a day. There's also Zhang Qi, Tian Yi pointed in another direction to a burly boy who was helping a female classmate lay out some exercise mats. His bulging biceps resembled small hills. His power seems to be super strength. Zhang Qi used to practice throwing iron discs. Now he can lift the whole platform with one hand. Look over there. At the west side of the smart-controlled gate, the entire platform had been uprooted and piled behind the gate. It probably weighed a few hundred kilograms when Song Ku first noticed it, she found it odd, but now she realized it was done by an ability user. However, luckily, you ran into Brother Jiang today, Tian Yi muttered to himself. How, how so? You don't know, Brother Jiang is not only strong with his power but also righteous in his conduct. He always takes responsibility when leading us out. That's why everyone's willing to follow him. But Zhang Qi, on the other hand, used to have a bad reputation. He's impulsive and easily angered. The last time he led a team out, some people didn't come back. Song Ku looked at Zhang Qi. After helping with the mats, he moved over to the stands and chatted with a few guys, causing them to burst into hearty laughter. Not far away, Zhou Anqi gave him a disdainful look, then Chao Yi approached, and the two started talking. She shifted her gaze back and continued asking Tian Yi, what about Professor Su? It seems like you all, all listen to him. Yeah, when the zombies first appeared, we were all terrified. Fortunately, Professor Su was there. He organized our retreat and came up with the idea of the safe zone. We take turns going out to find supplies, and Professor Su allocates personnel. What about do you know how the powers awaken? I don't know. The Alliance hasn't released an official explanation. It's all just hearsay, true and false mixed together. If it wasn't for people like Brother Jiang who are genuine ability users, I probably wouldn't believe it either. But I've noticed they share something in common. Suddenly lowering his voice, Tian Yi leaned in and confidentially revealed, I'm not sure about other ability users, but the night they awakened their powers, they all had a fever. Zhang Qi was the first to wake up, around 11 p. Then Lu Zixuan, around 3 a. And Brother Jiang was the latest, waking up almost noon the next day. Chapter, 13. Teach her a lesson. Was fever a precursor to awakening of supernatural abilities? Even long after Tian Yi had left, Song Ku was still pondering this question. Would her three-day high fever have any impact on her supernatural abilities? What exactly was the ability she had awakened? As one problem was resolved, new questions kept emerging incessantly, giving Song Ku a headache. Jiang Rui later paid her a visit, facing numerous gazes, and brought food and a mattress for Song Ku. From the past, she had always regarded him as a troublesome busybody, but she hadn't anticipated that after three years, he would still be like this. She was so fed up that she didn't want to bother with him at all. Perhaps sensing her impatience, Jiang Rui didn't linger much either. He just left after putting down the items. At night, the wind and rain on the playground subsided, and everyone lay on their mats, lost in their own thoughts, gradually slipping into slumber. Song Cook picked up her backpack from the ground and stealthily entered the equipment room in the darkness. Inside the stuffy equipment room, she bit her lower lip, undoing the bandages wrapped around her body. The gauze separated from her skin with a slight tug, and after removing all the bandages, Song Ku was momentarily stunned. Several wounds on her body, deep enough to expose bone, had actually healed within just a few days. Fresh, tender new skin had grown, and even when she lightly poked at it, it didn't hurt much. Was this related to her awakening of supernatural abilities? Her body's healing speed had significantly increased. 
Previously, Song Ko had been unwilling to walk alongside those soldiers, partly because of her injuries, especially the ones on her back and abdomen. At a glance, they looked grisly, so she intentionally wound long bandages around her arms her aim was to divert attention to her hands, thus downplaying the existence of other wounds. After all, she had been wounded by zombies, and she didn't know if any abnormalities would arise. The group of powerful and vigilant supernaturals, if they noticed anything amiss, given their inhumane treatment of those who showed abnormalities, the consequences would likely be unpredictable. After reapplying the ointment and tending to her wounds, Song Kook closed the door, retreating back to her corner. In the latter part of the night, she dozed off, hugging her backpack, until the tranquility of the safe zone was shattered by a loud exclamation. There's news. The Alliance has issued a statement. Spots of light from cell phones began to flicker one after another. The awakened individuals who were awoken by the noise didn't even have time to complain as they rubbed their eyes and checked the official messages. It's true. The nearest rescue team is less than 80 kilometers away from Hua City. They say they will clear out the peripheral zombies first and then dispatch starships to the urban area for rescue. Survivors can upload their locations. This is fantastic. We can finally leave. The girls embraced each other, jumping and rejoicing with tears of joy. The hope of survival ignited the entire safe zone. Nobody felt sleepy anymore they gathered together, excitedly discussing. Su Liren gathered a group of students for an emergency meeting, seemingly discussing matters about contacting the rescue team. Song Ku wasn't interested in their meeting's contents. She rolled over, facing the corner of the wall, and continued to sleep. When she escaped from District 177, she had already known that a rescue team would be coming in the next couple of days. The news now confirmed it, and for her, it meant just another place to wander. What she didn't expect was that, in a short while, the group that had just finished the meeting was heading straight toward her. Song Ku, wake up. We need to talk to you, Song Ku. Representing them, Lin Xia called softly for quite some time, but Song Ku, with her face buried in her bag, was sound asleep and showed no response. In fact, she had awakened when this group of people had approached, but with so many people buzzing around, her morning irritation got the best of her. She wasn't really keen on dealing with these people. Su Liren knelt down in front of her, as if he knew she was awake. He said in his usual tone, Song Ku, today Zhang Qi is preparing to lead a team to the starship port to gather information. We're missing one person. Would you be willing to go out for a bit? Although it was phrased as a consultation, a dense crowd of people was behind him, and dozens of pairs of eyes were fixed on her. Everyone was waiting for her answer. Unable to pretend to be asleep any longer, Song Ku slowly opened her eyes and let out a big yawn. Feeling so sleepy, her eyes even welled up with tears. Seeing that she wasn't taking it seriously, Zhang Qi's expression immediately turned grim. Su Liren paid no mind to her impoliteness and continued to persuade her gently, Song Ku, everyone in the team has their own position and contribution. You're new here, and fairness is important in the decisions I make as a teacher, right? I know you're skilled and capable of handling this task. I've talked to Zhang Qi, and he agrees with your involvement. Through the corner of her eye, Song Ku saw Tian Yi madly gesturing behind. Jian Rui stepped forward, his lips tightly pressed. Professor Su, let me lead the team today. Zhang Qi was already very displeased. When he saw Jian Rui stepping up, he immediately sneered, Jian Rui, do you look down on me? You think you're better than me? You're a hero, and I'm a coward. Su Liren interjected in time, extinguishing the brewing argument between them. Searching outside is important, but protecting everyone within the safe zone is equally crucial. Jiang Rui, I trust you, and you should trust your fellow students' abilities, right? Jiang Rui wanted to argue further, but Zhang Qi standing nearby quickly pulled him back, murmuring something to him. Both supernatural individuals had fire in their eyes, staring each other down in tension. As the tension escalated in the background, Su Liren remained calm and lowered his voice, gently persuading, Song Ku, let me speak candidly. Jiang Rui is steady I'm at ease with him leading. Zhang Qi has a stronger personality, but I believe you're capable outside. 
Also, John Chi's words he's a bit more assertive. Keep an eye on him when you're out there. I know you're quite capable. He stressed the last sentence meaningfully. Song Ku's heart skipped a beat, uncertain about the meaning behind his last words. Su Li turned away, speaking in a loud voice, Zhang Qi, you're leading today. Remember, we can't afford to lose anyone else. He seemed to smile, his eyes behind his glasses hiding unfathomable depths, carrying a hint of warning. In the dimly lit playground, a few hanging lights illuminated the ceiling but couldn't reveal everyone's expressions clearly. Song Ku's gaze swept across Zhou Anqi and Chao Yi in the distance, Tian Yi and Lin Xia closer by, Jiang Rui and Zhang Qi in a standoff, finally settling on Su Liren. Each face held its own thoughts. What were they calculating? What were they worried about? What were they afraid of? Grandfather was right. Dealing with people was truly the most exhausting thing in this world. With her bag slung over one shoulder, Song Ku pushed herself up and stood. Got it, I'll go out. Lu Zixuan placed his hand on the wall. After a violent surge of energy, the outline of the door gradually became visible and eventually stabilized. He patted Zhang Qi on the shoulder. Send me a message when you're back. Zhang Qi made an okay gesture. Just before opening the door, Zhang Qi suddenly withdrew his hand and playfully said to Song Ku, Hey, I heard you're pretty amazing. How about you go first? Compared to going in, going out was certainly more dangerous. Who knew if they'd face a group of zombies when they opened the door? Sure, Song Ku couldn't be bothered to expose his ulterior motives, so she simply responded, not bothering to look at him, and opened the door to step out. Arrogant, way too arrogant. Zhang Qi's face was almost twisted with anger. This time, the team, including Song Ku, consisted of eight people, all boys. There wasn't a single familiar face among them, except for one, Zhang Hao, who somehow tagged along. On the way, he took the opportunity when others weren't paying attention to come over and remind her, Zhang Qi might cause trouble for you. Be careful. Having heard gossip from Tian Yi, Song Ko knew that Zhang Hao was a repeat student, older than the rest. He had a somewhat serious disposition and was quite close to Jiang Rui. She neither liked nor disliked him, so she nodded in response. Brother Qi, should we head to the starship port first? Shortly after leaving Hua City No. One middle school, one of the team members asked. No rush. Zhang Qi glanced at Song Ku. She was trailing behind, drooping her eyelids, giving off an indifferent air, as if she were keeping a distance from everyone. Student Song, Zhang Qi called her leisurely, we still have some time. I'm thinking of searching for supplies first. What do you think? Song Ku lifted her gaze, her eyes like lustrous gems locking onto Zhang Qi's. His heart inexplicably trembled under her gaze. Slowly, she nodded. Sure. As they would be heading to the starship port afterward, their search pace accelerated. The team walked westward along School Street. The journey was calm and peaceful, and soon they arrived at a commercial street. The storefronts here were not very large, but their numbers were considerable, closely packed together. The group stopped at the entrance of a row of connected shops. Zhang Qi surveyed the surroundings and made a half-smiling suggestion, Student Song, how about we split up and search separately? One person per shop. Would you like to choose first? He remained still, and the group behind him dared not make a move, as if they were trying to force Song Ku into agreeing. Song Ku casually chose a gift shop, gripping the door handle. Suddenly, she turned around and asked, split up, one person per shop. Whose belongings are these supplies considered? It was better to clarify such matters beforehand. She wasn't part of their group and didn't accept their unified distribution practices. Zhang Qi smirked but didn't really smile. Whoever finds them can claim them. Song Ko was satisfied. Okay. Once she entered the shop, Zhang Qi quietly instructed his subordinates. The remaining members split up and entered adjacent shops. Zhang Hao was searching for supplies when he faintly heard some commotion outside. Something seemed off to him, so he put down what he was doing and rushed out. 
Sure enough, Zhang Qi's group had somehow brought over several thick iron chains and locked Song Ku's door with them. Zhang Qi, what are you doing? Zhang Hao realized their intentions and moved forward to remove the chains. Zhang Qi's burly arm intercepted, and he punched Zhang Hao against the wall. He squatted down, staring at him sinisterly. I'm warning you, stay out of this. Zhang Hao shouted angrily, have you lost your mind? Aren't you afraid of causing fatalities? I just want to teach her a lesson. Why are you so worried? If something happens to her, not just Jiang Rui, even Professor Su won't let you off. The way Su Liren treated Song Ku was quite polite, and Zhang Qi hesitated briefly. But then he remembered the boasting he did last night and his anger flared up. Do you think I'm stupid? Lock it up. He yelled. Chains as thick as a bull's rim wound around the door handle, forming an impenetrable barrier like a spider's web. Half an eternity passed, yet inside remained quiet. Several followers grew uneasy. Brother Chi, what if there are zombies inside? If there are zombies, wouldn't she scream? When she begs me, kneels down and surrenders properly, only then will I let her out. Let's see how arrogant she is afterward. As soon as he finished speaking, urgent knocking suddenly came from inside. Everyone's hearts raced as they all stared at the door. One follower muttered in panic, she why isn't she screaming? The intense knocking continued for over ten seconds. Then, the door shook violently a few times, causing the metal chains to produce a crisp metallic clash. Gradually, the sounds inside the room fell silent. The extreme quietness made everyone's hearts feel as heavy as a stone. Someone couldn't hold back anymore. Brother Chi, could something really have happened? Zhang Chi hadn't expected Song Ku to be this obstinate. She hadn't even uttered a plea for mercy. He wasn't as foolish as he appeared. He really wanted to bring her to the brink, but in the current situation, it was difficult to decide. Gritting his teeth, he held on for another five minutes. Sweat rolled down his face. Finally, unable to bear the psychological pressure, he said, go open the door. Before they could take action, an earth-shaking roar erupted from inside. Bang! One, two, three consecutive roars echoed. In full view of everyone, the entire shop door split from the middle, sending debris flying in all directions. Amidst the dust, Song Ku appeared like a war deity descending from the heavens. Shouldering a massive azure warhammer three times her size, she stood before them. She locked eyes with Zhang Qi's group and tugged at the corner of her mouth. Spoils, of war. With a forceful kick, several headless zombies were sent hurtling toward Zhang Qi. Chapter, 14 You're an ability user. When the zombies rushed towards them, Zhang Qi's muscles bulged as he exerted his arm strength, using several punches to send them flying. His subordinates behind him weren't as lucky. Song Ku had aimed shrewdly, and the headless zombies pounced right onto them, exposing their bloody necks. Each one screamed as if their hearts were being torn apart, unaware that those zombies had been long dead. You're an ability user, Zhang Qi kicked away the obstructing zombies and fixed his gaze on Song Ku, confirming word by word. Song Ku remained silent. Her slender waistline generated force in her forearm as she swung the massive hammer, lifting it with a single hand as if it were a toy. The hammerhead slammed heavily into the ground, creating a powerful shockwave that swept towards Zhang Qi. His shoulders felt as if they were carrying a thousand pounds, and his feet involuntarily sank into the ground. Gritting his teeth, he used all his might to withstand this immense energy. She was intimidating him. She actually dared to. How could she dare? Zhang Qi was an ability user himself, so he knew just how terrifying the pressure Song Ku was emanating was. He couldn't even move a finger right now. Her supernatural ability was definitely at a much higher level than his. It appeared that Song Ku wasn't just an ability user she had awakened the same power-based ability as his. That's why she could completely suppress him. He regretted trying to deal with her earlier it was simply laughable. Everyone in the group were high school students, and even though they were bold, the consecutive crises had left them somewhat pale with fear. Song Ku slowly emerged, dragging the massive hammer, and helped Zhang Hao up from the corner where he had fallen. 
Zhang Qi had held back when he attacked, leaving only minor injuries on Zhang Hao's back, scraping off a layer of skin, and causing some minor abrasions on his limbs. However, his movements were unaffected. Zhang Hao's face didn't look good, though. He spoke urgently as he tried to steady himself, there's too much commotion here. It'll definitely attract zombies. Let's leave quickly. Although Zhang Qi was impulsive, he wasn't entirely foolish. After being reminded, he immediately realized the peril they were in. This wasn't the time to argue with Song Ku, moreover moreover, he couldn't win against her. So, with a grim expression, he ordered, retreat. After hastily tidying up, they quickly left the commercial street. As they increased their pace on the road, Zhang Hao's movements noticeably became more laborious. Sweat beads continuously formed on his forehead. Song Ku glanced at his ankle and reached out to support him, but Zhang Hao instinctively declined, I'm fine, just twisted it a bit. Oh. Since he didn't need help, Song Ku calmly withdrew her hand. Zhang Hao, he had just been trying to be polite, why did this person take it seriously? He had to find something to say, so he muttered, Jiang Rui was going to come on his own, but I suggested I'd come instead. I didn't expect you to be an ability user too. Zhang Hao's emotions were complicated. He had volunteered to come out because he had witnessed Song Ku's strength and figured that nothing major would happen. He had intended to just stand by and receive a favor from Jiang Rui in return. He never expected Zhang Qi to go berserk and provoke Song Ku. Furthermore, he didn't anticipate that she was also an ability user. He ended up getting hurt in the process, making the situation worse for himself. It was just asking for trouble. Why did you come out? I could have handled it on my own. As expected, after listening, Song Ku didn't show the slightest bit of gratitude. Instead, her face was full of disapproval, accompanied by a good dose of disdain. Zhang Hao's ankle throbbed even more. Song Ku's decision to expose her identity as an ability user was, of course, deliberate. Firstly, she felt that Su Liren had long figured something out. If she didn't come clean, he would likely keep manipulating her. Secondly, she didn't want to keep attracting trouble. People like Zhang Qi, once they knew her abilities, would seek attention, bullying the weak and fearing the strong. After this whole journey, he had stopped taunting her as if he'd been struck mute. The group continued on their way in silence, occasionally stopping to search for supplies along the route. By the afternoon, they arrived near the starport. Finally, a bespectacled boy couldn't help but ask, his voice trembling, have any of you felt that something's off? Everyone stopped and carefully thought back on their journey. They all shared the same feeling. They couldn't pinpoint what exactly was wrong, but something seemed strange. Zhang Hao had an idea, is it too quiet? Indeed, it was too quiet. When they had ventured out a few days ago, most of Hua City's basic infrastructure was functioning normally. They had seen autonomous buses, traffic guiding robots, and the vibrant nighttime scenery. On the night when Song Ku had spent the night at the water tower, she had even witnessed a fountain show at the Hua City Theater. However, today as they walked, the broadcasts in the malls, the music in the amusement parks, and the large projections on screens had all disappeared. The boy with glasses turned pale, hastily taking out his phone. My phone has no signal. How about yours? No signal. Mine too. They finally realized what was wrong. The hydraulic power, electricity, and the network everything symbolizing modernization had ceased to work. In the seventh day after the solar eruption in the 46th year of the new calendar, the city system completely malfunctioned. At this point, Hua City had turned into a dead city. The true doomsday had arrived. Amid the deathly silence, Zhang Qi spat, let's go to the starport. Right. And there's the rescue team. They said it's less than 80 kilometers away. The Alliance won't abandon us. Grasping onto this final straw of hope, Zhang Qi's group hurriedly headed toward the starport. The design of Hua City's starport was inspired by a lotus flower. The entire building had a soft, silvery white appearance. The blooming flower bud at the top served as the control center and boarding platform. The petals scattered throughout the middle were departure runways. 
However, at this moment, when they looked around, only a few starships were docked on the petals. A nearly eerie silence enveloped the entire harbor. Zhang Qi's group didn't enter the starport instead, they found an observation platform outside. The view was expansive, and there were no zombies around. Someone's there. Song Ku crouched atop the rangefinder equipment and softly alerted them, southeast, and also north, both directions there are people. Are they together? Zhang Hao asked. No, they're scattered. It's chaotic. It should be survivors, like us, coming to gather information, Zhang Hao analyzed calmly. When the Alliance made their rescue declaration public, no one could stay put. Survivors in Hua City would be lurking nearby, waiting for opportunities. It made sense. Several boys were anxious yet excited, unable to resist whispering to each other. There are very few starships here. Have they already been reassigned by the Alliance? Probably. The rescue team should be coming in soon. Let's wait a bit longer. As they waited, the sun started to dip, and soon, numerous black dots appeared in the distant sky. Look over there, it's the rescue team. A sharp-eyed boy exclaimed, immediately raising his arms and shouting. Others who had been pointed out by Song Ku in various directions excitedly stood up, taking off their clothes or hats, waving them vigorously at the sky. The group of black dots rapidly approached them, growing in number. They filled the sky densely, akin to a migrating flock of birds. Strangely, a few seemed to fall behind halfway, plummeting from the high altitude to the ground, one after another. Song Ku initially thought her eyes were playing tricks on her and rubbed them. It wasn't until someone nearby shouted in terror, something's wrong. It looks like they're falling. The closest black dots were already distinguishable, their silvery metal shells reflecting an eerie coldness. They were indeed starships. However, these starships seemed to have lost their propulsion mid-air. Their trajectories were crooked and skewed. After persisting for a few seconds, they suddenly nosedived straight down. They crashed into the crowd that had been cheering moments ago. Boom, boom, boom. Like falling meteors, the out-of-control starships hit the ground, causing intense explosions. The deafening roar of the explosions rendered them momentarily deaf. In the midst of the fiery glow, Song Ku saw Zhang Qi's face contorted, roaring silently, run. The blossom-like structure of the starport and its petals were struck by the falling debris. Soon, black smoke billowed and flames ignited. The deafening explosions continued in succession. A staggering number of starships whizzed overhead, their overwhelming shadows blotting out everyone's retinas. Song Ku looked up, and in her pupils, she saw clear silhouettes. Several starships were getting closer to them. They were about to crash. Zhang Qi ripped off the protective netting and hoisted a steel frame over ten meters long, roaring as he raised it to block. The steel frame hit the starship, momentarily halting its descent before it veered several inches sideways, brushing past the edge of the platform. The team members hurriedly ran in the opposite direction. The recoil force from this strike was equally terrifying. Zhang Qi nearly exhausted all his strength in an instant. His left arm dislocated upon impact, and he staggered for a couple of steps. After struggling to regain his balance, he looked up only to see another starship hurtling rapidly towards the path where the others were running. No. Come back. Don't run there. The massive starship plummeted straight down, creating a deep crater in the platform, instantly engulfing the few individuals at the forefront in flames. Zhang Qi's eyes turned bloodshot, and his knees gave in, causing him to kneel down. However, the crisis was far from over. After the main group had passed, two starships trailing behind lost control and fell from directly above them. You all, all take cover together. Song Ku managed to push Zhang Hao just in time before she charged toward the descending starship. Suppressing the pain in his ankle, Zhang Hao helped up his teammate who had been knocked aside by the shockwave they quickly moved closer to Zhang Qi. Song Ku jumped onto the platform's top and swung her massive hammer to intercept. The deep blue hammerhead staunchly held up the metallic starship, draining her energy almost instantaneously. Following that, the hammer shattered, and the starship, influenced by the force, rotated and veered off course, 
colliding with another starship. Both starships overloaded and exploded in mid-air, blooming into huge black fireworks. The intense shockwave sent Song Ku tumbling outwards, and she rolled off the platform, swallowed by the thick smoke and debris. Song Ku. Zhang Hao urgently shouted, rushing down the platform to dig through the rubble. As they dug, two more individuals emerged beside them, Zhang Qi, whose arm was hanging limply, and another boy who had come to assist. After about five minutes of digging, the pile of debris finally shifted, and Song Ku crawled out, her face covered in ash. She looked severely injured, with one arm badly burnt, blood dripping from her forehead down, and with a cough she said, let's let's get out of here first. Supporting each other, Zhang Qi, Zhang Hao, and the other boy limped out of the explosion zone. Behind them, the lotus port was ablaze, while ahead, a massive fleet of star ships swept across Hua City, bombing a path from north to southeast. Star ships continued to fall along the way, explosions and flames erupting in a continuous cycle. How could this be, how is this possible? Those are the Lu family starships. A survivor with an ashen face muttered in disbelief as he lay on the ground. Lu family starships were known not for their metallic shells made from the rare element Rhenium Re, or their highly advanced artificial intelligence, but for their propulsion, powered by the cutting-edge alliance technology known as EU. This new energy source allowed these starships, weighing tens of tons, to hover in the sky without any external force and achieved self-circulation, self-cleaning, and self-recycling. Since their introduction, Lu family starships had boasted of being absolutely safe, claiming to be the blue bird that never falls. Over the decades of operation, they had never experienced a single accident. These were Lu family starships, the pride of the Alliance. However, in this moment at the Hua City starport, over a hundred starships collectively crashed, like a meteor shower of shattered beliefs. After leaving the starport, Zhang Qi and the others could no longer hold on, collapsing from exhaustion on the ground. The survivor who had narrowly escaped death couldn't stop sobbing. What do we do? Starships are gone, the rescue team is gone. What do we do now? Let's head back to the safe zone, Zhang Hao suggested. No signal. How do we contact Lu Zixuan? How do we get inside? The boy's expression turned desperate. Zhang Qi hadn't said a word since coming out. His arm was broken, and his face occasionally contorted in agonizing pain. Glancing at his phone, Zhang Hao saw that it was almost 6 p.m. He thought for a moment and said, I've kept a record before. Our two teams usually return between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. The earliest was at 4.50 p.m., and the latest was at 6.40 p.m. Professor Su and the others definitely know there's no signal now. Therefore, I speculate that Lu Zixuan will open the gate at 7 p.m. So, before that, we must get back. Chapter, 15 Truly exasperated with this old sixth. Three minutes behind, Zhang Qi and the others hurried back to Hua City No. One middle school, racing against the last shreds of time. The non-stop running and the toll of their severe injuries had drained too much of their energy. They sat down against the wall, utterly exhausted. A surviving male student covered his face, tears never stopping. Time ticked away second by second, but the wall remained still, without any signs of movement. Why isn't the door opening? Did we arrive late? Have they already opened the door? The male student repeated these two sentences incessantly, his anxiety growing as he spun in circles, his tone becoming more and more neurotic. Why isn't the door opening? Why won't they open the door? Calm down for a moment and wait a bit more, Zhang Hao said, placing a hand on the student's shoulder to prevent him from attracting nearby zombies with his restless movement. Even though he spoke words of reassurance, he was gradually becoming uneasy himself. About twenty more minutes passed, and the wall finally softened and collapsed, gradually revealing the shape of a door. I knew you guys would come back. They told me to wait a bit more as the door was pulled open, Lu Zixuan's face lit up with a brilliant smile. However, as he saw the figures before him clearly, the curve of his mouth instantly drooped. Four, he counted again in disbelief, just four. What happened? Where are the others? 
Su Liren came over from behind him, his expression unusually solemn. Professor Su. The moment the student saw him, his psychological defenses crumbled completely. He couldn't hold back anymore and collapsed before Su Liren, sobbing uncontrollably. Zhang Qi's face was gloomy, supporting his limp left hand. Zhang Hao had a lame leg, and Song Ku, although all limbs intact, was covered in blood, making it difficult to see her facial features. The grim condition of the four quickly drew the attention of everyone around. It's all gone everything exploded the starships the rescue team. What exploded? What happened to the rescue team? Hurry up and tell us, you're driving us crazy. What exactly happened? The student's emotions were too agitated, and his words were incoherent, making it impossible for him to explain clearly. Su Liren had someone help him move the student aside to rest and then calmed and dispersed the crowd that had gathered, leaving only a few core members. Only then did he start to carefully understand the situation. Among the four, Zhang Hao, the only one with coherent speech, took the initiative to explain, let me explain. This afternoon, around three o'clock, the entire Hua city lost power and network connectivity. When we found out, we rushed to the starport, hoping to meet the rescue team there. However, what arrived were numerous starships that had lost power and were falling from the sky. The others couldn't escape the explosions, they all died. As the words left his mouth, the entire room was shocked. For these high school students, the notion of starships falling was something out of a fairy tale. Su Liren pondered for a moment, it seems it's not just the school the entire infrastructure of Hua City has shut down. He paused and then asked, we didn't hear any explosions. Where did those starships that you mentioned head towards? And roughly how many were there? They headed southeast, and there were probably around twenty of them. No wonder. The school is to the west of Hua City. As they conversed, Song Ku walked towards a corner on her own. The others were still immersed in the shocking news brought by Zhang Hao, and few paid attention to her. Only Jiang Rui cast a concerned glance at her back. The commotion at the entrance sparked whispered conversations among the people. Zhou Anqi emerged from the restroom, her face filled with impatience. What's wrong with Zhang Qi? He's supposed to handle Song Ku. Why is he making such a mess of himself? Chao Yi gripped the railing tightly, her brows furrowing slowly. Something doesn't seem right. Zhou Anqi followed her gaze and quickly spotted another figure in the corner. She was infuriated on the spot. No, why is Song Ku still alive and kicking? It's driving me crazy. He didn't fulfill what he promised me. I'm going to hold him accountable. Anchi, just wait a moment. Chao Yi was truly exasperated with this old sixth. Would she be foolish enough to confront Zhang Qi in front of everyone? Wouldn't that expose all their secret calculations? Chao Yi reached out to grab her, but Zhou Anqi walked briskly, evading her grip. In the process, Zhou Anqi stumbled, and Chao Yi had no choice but to follow behind, feeling helpless. The two of them arrived next to Su Liren, just in time to hear Zhang Hao speak, Professor Su, there's one more thing Song Ku is an ability user. Jian Rui, Lin Xia, and others beside them were taken aback. Zhou Anqi, upon hearing this terrible news, felt her vision darken. The world seemed to spin around her, and she thought that the darkness of the world had never been this profound. Su Liren pushed up his glasses, a sharp glint passing through his eyes. His tone remained gentle, though. Oh. What kind of ability user is she? Same type as me, a power type, Zhang Qi, who had been silent until now, suddenly interjected. And her level is roughly similar to mine. Zhang Hao gave him a sidelong glance. He remembered how Song Ku had suppressed Zhang Qi in front of the store entrance, unable to move. He found Zhang Qi's inflated bravado somewhat ridiculous. However, Zhang Qi's intact hand was tightly clenched into a fist, emitting faint creaking sounds. It was evident he had exerted a lot of force. Zhang Hao held his tongue, planning to explain to Su Liren and Jiang Rui later. No wonder she could lift Tian Yi with just one hand last time, Lin Xia murmured, so, she's a power type ability user. For a moment, various emotions envy, jealousy, 
resentment began to brew covertly. The news that Song Ku was an ability user was the only consolation in their dire situation. After losing contact with the rescue team, their situation had become perilous. Were they going to remain in the safe zone indefinitely? Who knew what other challenges lay ahead? Amidst the anxious crowd, the only one able to maintain composure was Su Liren. He stood on the elevated platform of the playground, overseeing the people below. Everyone, don't panic. Calm down. It's not time to give up yet. I'll work with you to find solutions. What we need to do now is to honestly share the situation with everyone. Su Liren gathered everyone and conveyed the news they had brought back from outside. No water, no electricity, no network, starship crashes, coupled with the disconnection from the rescue team one heavy piece of news after another weighed down on them, shrouding them in darkness. Despite Su Liren's efforts to console, quite a few individuals succumbed to pressure, collapsing on the ground in sobbing fits. A few bold souls who couldn't bear the oppressive atmosphere approached Lu Zixuan, raising a commotion without restraint. Staying here is a death sentence. Let me out. I want to go home. Lu Zixuan initially tried to reason with them politely, but as they continued to agitate him, he grew annoyed and retorted with irritation, you want to leave? Go ahead. But I've exhausted my supernatural abilities. I won't be able to recover until tomorrow morning at the earliest. So, just wait here. On the other side, Tian Yi cautiously approached, Song Ku, are you okay? Do, do you have water? Song Ku's eyes were so crusted with blood that she couldn't open them. However, what was even more uncomfortable was the sensation from within her body the burning pain that came after her supernatural ability was drained, causing her body to feel inflamed. There's a restroom over there, Tian Yi pointed in a direction, luckily, we had stored water before. You can use it. Song Ku entered the restroom and filled a basin with water from a container. She began splashing water onto her face at an increasing speed. The cold water droplets soaked her skin, washing away the congealed bloodstains. The persistent burning sensation seemed to slightly subside. But immediately after, she felt hunger a deep emptiness and hunger from the depths of her stomach. Song Ku sat down on the floor, opened her backpack, and started stuffing food into her mouth beef jerky, crackers, ham sausages, sandwiches. She consumed about half of the stored food, and only then did the burning feeling gradually fade. Her supernatural ability seemed to rejuvenate like a dry spring, replenishing itself at an astonishing pace. A good half hour passed, and the tumultuous sensation within her body settled down again. The abundant energy resumed its steady circulation. Song Ku now felt much more comfortable. She stood up, examined her injuries, finding abrasions below her earlobes, along the edges of her cheeks, and several fresh wounds on her left arm. She applied a piece of gauze to her face and changed into clean clothes. Opening the restroom door, Jiang Rui was waiting outside for her. I heard from Zhang Hao that you were injured. I came to check on you. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. It's still better to tend to your wounds. Should I ask Chao Yi or Lin Xia to help you? Two girls stood side by side behind Jiang Rui, with Lin Xia giving her a friendly wave Song Ku glanced at them and coldly refused, no need. Ignoring their reactions, she carried her deflated backpack and found a corner to sit cross-legged. Jiang Rui's gaze remained fixed on her face. Suddenly, he extended a finger and pointed, you have something on your face. Song Ku casually wiped her face, finding nothing. A little lower. Song Ku wiped down a bit lower. It's not there. Jian Rui watched her clumsy movement and unexpectedly burst into laughter. The smile of the young man was transparent, without any trace of gloom. He then knelt down on one knee, getting very close to Song Ku. His eyes were like a lake sparkling with countless stars. Swiftly, he raised his hand and brushed away the cookie crumbs from the corner of her mouth. Jian Rui's movement was so natural, and Song Ku was unprepared. She was caught off guard. But she quickly stepped back, then another step, until her back was against the wall. She stared at him with a head full of question marks. If there's something on her face, so what? 
It's not like it's on his face. Why would he be so concerned? Was it necessary for him to remove it with his own hand? Hey! E, look! Lin Xia excitedly tugged at Chao Yi's sleeve and let out a soft scream. She was engrossed in the excitement of the moment, completely unaware of the emotion of her companion. Chao Yi was fixedly observing the ambiguous interaction between the two, her expression darkening. Despite Song Ku's repeated refusals, Jiang Rui still left a first aid kit for her. Song Ku didn't like being in close proximity to people. She always found a corner in the safe zone to rest where nobody else was. When Jiang Rui left, he looked back several times with a worried expression. I noticed that Song Ku's bandaging was quite rough. I've learned basic first aid before. When I have time, I'll come back to check on her, Chao Yi followed him, speaking gently, don't worry, I won't tell Anchi. Speaking of Zhou Anchi, Jiang Rui's brows slightly furrowed. Yeah, you've been helpful. It seems that you and her are the only ones in your class who can talk to each other. Yeah, Song Ku she's not always the easiest to get along with, Chao Yi smiled. Late that night, heavy rain poured down on Hua City. The sound of raindrops pelting the skylight of the playground echoed. The rain grew louder, intensifying, preventing many from falling asleep. They climbed to the windowsills, peering outside. They were greeted by a curtain of rain that seemed to touch the sky. The rain continued until the next day, forcing them to cancel their plans to go outside. That night, even in her dreams, Song Ku heard the sound of the rain pouring. When she woke up, she learned even worse news. Zhou Anqi had a fever. Old Sixth Camper is a reference to the video game Counter-Strike, Global Offensive. In the CSGO game, there are only five players on each side in a competitive mode, a camper is considered unhelpful to the team as a whole and equivalent to the sixth member of the opposing side. A camper is a player that stays in one spot in a first-person shooter game, someone who seems to be unable to see the life and death of his teammates, and who sticks up to protect his gun. Chapter, 16 Save the Lunatic Zhou Anqi started running a fever after falling asleep. She had caught a cold these past two days a sore throat, runny nose that flowed like water, and yet she was stubbornly concerned about her appearance. To avoid showing her embarrassment, she went to the restroom multiple times a day to touch up her appearance. She endured like this until night, her temperature soaring. The next day, when her classmates came to check on her, they discovered that she had been burning up in a daze for quite a while. With precedents like Jiang Rui and others, there was a high probability that Zhou Anqi's fever at this moment was a precursor to awakening her ability. 41, Su Liren announced the number on the thermometer, a worried expression on his face. She needs to take antipyretics as soon as possible. If she continues to have such a high fever, even if her ability awakens, she might end up with brain damage. The value of an ability user was clear in everyone's minds. Jiang Rui, Lu Zixuan, Zhang Qi, and even Song Ku were living examples. Without ability users leading the way, ordinary people couldn't venture outside alone. As ability users, they enjoyed privileges. Despite Song Ku's indifference to group activities, her sporadic attendance in meetings, and her lack of interest in collective actions, Su Liren still tolerated her behavior. Even if Zhou Anqi had a terrible personality, as long as there was hope for her ability to awaken, she wouldn't be easily given up on. However, the current issue was that when they hastily evacuated from the school earlier, they didn't have enough medical supplies, especially prescription medicines. They had to take the risk of searching outside. But it's still raining outside. That's right, going out in this kind of weather, even if we don't encounter zombies, people might still die, right? Don't make me go out, please, don't make me go out. Since two days ago, the rain in Hua City had been growing stronger, gradually showing signs of engulfing the entire city. Heavy rain, zombies, a sealed-off city, and coupled with the loss of communication signals, going outside had become several times more dangerous. Faced with various doubts and whispered conversations, Su Liren stood up slowly. His cold gaze swept across the room. From the very first day we established the safe zone, I promised everyone that even in the direst circumstances, I, as a teacher, will not abandon any one of you. 
this promise will always stand. His voice always had a kind of magical persuasiveness. Gradually, the crowd quieted down. Su Liren then turned to a tall boy standing next to him. Jiang Rui, I would like to ask for your help. Will you lead a team to go out and find medicine today? Jiang Rui's fingers curled slightly. Meeting Su Liren's expectant gaze, he nodded with determination. Mr. Su, I'm willing to go out, but the other members of my team, they're not ability users. I don't want to force them. Almost the moment his words fell, several boys, including Zhang Hao, Kong Zi Qi, and Tian Yi, stepped forward, expressing their support. Brother Jiang, I'm going with you. I'm going too. Count me in, the more people, the faster we'll find it. Young people still had vigor in their hearts, and camaraderie was highly valued. They believed in Jiang Rui and were willing to follow him on this risky venture. Despite this, Su Liren's expression remained tense because the group was still small. One ability user and five or six regular individuals the risks of going out with this composition were still high. Count me in two, Zhang Qi suddenly spoke up from the back row, his head lowered. His dislocated arm had been reset, but his despondent spirit hadn't recovered yet. Among the members of their two teams, they each brought their most trusted companions. Jiang Rui was popular among friends, and Zhang Qi had his own group of brothers. However, that day, he had helplessly witnessed his good friends being engulfed by flames, intensely hating his own helplessness. Since then, a psychological shadow had been cast, and these past few days, he even felt a strong aversion to the idea of going out. Now, the girl he liked lay on a mat, her life hanging in the balance, her face pale from the torment of high fever. Could he really be so cowardly as to beg others for help again? Would he still be considered a man if he did that? So, Zhang Qi clenched his teeth, overcame his fear, and stepped forward. Just me. Zhang Qi's voice was hoarse as he emphasized, not wanting to burden others any further. Su Liren nodded solemnly, for the first time not opposing the request for both ability users to go out together. All right, you're both powerful. Seated nearby, Chao Yi clenched and unclenched her fingers, her inner turmoil akin to a raging fire, burning her from within. Why? Fine, that bitch Song Ku is an ability user, but why does even someone as dumb as Zhou Anqi awaken an ability? This idiot, this fool who can be easily manipulated with a few words, why is she any better than her? But she couldn't show her anger because, in everyone else's eyes, Zhou Anqi had always been her best friend. Moreover, Jiang Rui was also going out. As long as Jiang Rui was there, safety shouldn't be a problem. Perhaps she could even find an opportunity for privacy. Chao Yi struggled to maintain her expression. It took great effort to put on an appearance of righteousness. Mr. Su, I'm also willing to go out. Su Liren looked into her eyes, now inflamed with jealousy, and slightly squinted, as if he could see through her dark thoughts. Teacher knows you're concerned about your friend. You should stay and take care of her. Chao Yi and Su Liren locked gazes for a couple of seconds, and she nodded, as if bewitched by some hidden motive. Is there anyone else willing to help Zhou Anqi find medicine? Su Liren raised his voice, surveying the surroundings. As expected, he met pairs of eyes that avoided his gaze. Is there anyone else willing to go out? He repeated. The entire safe zone seemed muted, as if someone had pressed a mute button, and silence spread like wild grass, unfurling in all directions. Me. Amidst the prolonged silence, a calm and unruffled voice suddenly broke through. Everyone turned their heads in unison, and when they saw who the speaker was, their jaws almost dropped, especially the students from the original Class 3. Their expressions were as if they had seen a ghost in broad daylight a truly captivating spectacle. Song Ku leaped down from a three-meter-high skylight, facing a crowd of terrified and astonished gazes. She silently repeated, I want to go out. Jian Rui's blood pressure surged, and he took a deep breath. Ignoring everyone else, he strode forward and pulled Song Ku aside to a corner of the room. You don't need to do this. Everyone saw how Zhou Anqi treated you. Don't risk yourself for someone like her. Stay safe in the secure zone. Song Ku blinked in confusion. 
Wait, he thought she was going out for Zhou Enqi. She tried to explain, I'm not. Jiang Rui interrupted her, I'll talk to Mr. Su and ask him to let you stay here. Turning away, he started walking, but then Song Ke's patience reached its limit. She directly swung her backpack at the back of his head. Not for, for her. I haven't, haven't eaten. Need to find supplies. After getting hit, Jian Rui looked at her almost empty backpack and remained stunned for a few seconds. It took a while for him to snap out of it, coughing awkwardly. Then I'll bring something back for you. No, I'll find it my myself. Shaking off Jiang Rui, Song Ku went around him and stood in front of Su Liren, locking eyes with him without flinching. Today, I want, want to go out. Not a request, not asking for help. Both of them understood that Song Ku was just informing him. Su Liren stared at her for several seconds before nodding slowly. Okay. With three ability users joining the team, their strength became formidable, not to be underestimated. Even if unexpected situations arose, they would be able to handle them promptly. Find the medicine and come back. Don't linger outside, Su Liren counted the number of people and softly advised Jiang Rui and Zhang Qi. Seeing that others were allowed to go out, Lu Zixuan couldn't sit still either. Mr. Su, let me go out too. You can't go out. Unexpectedly, Su Liren decisively refused him, despite his typically gentle demeanor. Why? I'm also an ability user, and if I go out with them, it'll be easier to come back. We won't have to wait outside. Lu Zixuan's eyes sparkled with hope. Su Liren sighed meaningfully. Yes, you are also an ability user. Lu Zixuan felt a glimmer of hope and his excitement showed in his eyes. So, does that mean you agree? Lu Zixuan, remember, only you, only you can't go out. Every single person here could go out, except for Lu Zixuan. He was the cornerstone of the entire safe zone, or rather, everyone in the safe zone relied on his presence. If he were to go out, and something happened outside, if he couldn't come back, or worse if he abandoned everyone and ran away, what would the remaining people do? The entire sports field was both a comfortable area constructed by Lu Zixuan himself and a cage that trapped him. Lu Zixuan hadn't realized this truth and was still standing there, disappointedly protesting. However, others instantly understood and exchanged various glances privately. The members about to go out used their time wisely, putting on raincoats and checking their backpacks, making preparations. Song Ku walked along the wall and pushed open the equipment room's door. Her gaze swept over the mountains of shot puts, javelins, and discuses. When she emerged, she was carrying a huge umbrella. Its canopy was incredibly wide, and when opened, it could shield half the sky. The umbrella ribs hung slightly downward, making it look more like half of a steam basket cover than an umbrella. Her umbrella was indeed quite peculiar. It had a metallic luster and a unique deep blue color, instantly capturing the attention of many. As Song Ku walked toward the door, someone muttered in confusion, Do we have this kind of umbrella in our equipment room? Where did she find it? Chapter, 17 Save the Lunatic After agreeing on the return time, Lu Zixuan activated his ability. As the door opened, torrential rain poured in, drenching everyone. This rain wasn't light drizzle it felt as if someone were holding a huge container in the sky, pouring all the water down on the city at once. The sky outside was dark and devoid of light, accompanied by fierce winds and thunderstorms stepping into the rain, the group immediately got soaked, and some nearly lost their footing. Jiang Rui's group faced the storm with raincoats tightly wrapped around them. They struggled forward, carefully treading with every step after losing the navigation from their phones. They stopped frequently to verify their direction. At a fork in the road, Zhang Hao shouted through the rain, Brother Jiang, which way do we go? There was no choice in such weather, a soft-spoken voice was impossible to hear. At this moment, they were faced with two choices, either continue west towards the outskirts of Hua City, a newly developed area, or detour southeast through the city center, where there were likely to be many hospitals and pharmacies. Jiang Rui pondered for a moment and quickly came to a conclusion, let's head west. I remember there's a pharmaceutical factory in the outskirts. 
Isn't it too dangerous to go to the outskirts? Isn't it even riskier to go downtown? It was just bombed. I agree. The drugstores in the city area must have been searched. We might not find fever-reducing medicine. After a brief discussion, the group wiped rain off their faces and proceeded towards the outskirts of Huadu. About 40 minutes later, they indeed found the pharmaceutical factory. Jiang Rui and Zhang Qi teamed up to deal with a few wandering zombies at the entrance and some hiding in the security office. Meanwhile, others took the opportunity to run into the factory area and seek shelter from the rain under the eaves. Let's find the warehouse first. If it's not there, we'll head to the logistics center, Jiang Rui made a decision after studying the fire evacuation map posted on the wall. The warehouse's iron door was tightly shut, so they had to break the windows and climb over the wall to enter, then split up to search for medication. When it was Song Ku's turn, she remained motionless outside the window ledge, gazing at the rain. She had no intention of coming inside. Jiang Rui glanced at her but didn't voice any objection. None of the others dared to boss her around either they acted as though they were collectively oblivious. When Tian Yi crawled in, he asked in a hushed tone, Song Ku, why did you come out? To, to find food, Song Ku answered stiffly. Tian Yi suddenly realized, I knew it. I heard your relationship with Zhou Anqi used to be bad. Why would you look for medicine for her? But at first, I thought, maybe you came out because you were worried about us and wanted to protect us. Huh, maybe? Song Ku widened her eyes slightly. He he he, I guess I was mistaken. Tiani chuckled and, as Kongzi Chi called him from the front, he dashed over with light steps. Song Ku shifted her gaze and leaned against the window frame, looking into the distance. The pouring rain masked many sounds and dulled the perception of ordinary people. She closed her eyes and connected her ability with her surroundings, extending her invisible and acute senses outward. The world quieted completely she heard Tian Yi and others talking, the faint sounds of people searching the shelves, and further out, the howling wind, the roaring rain, mingled with the crisp shattering of glass. Suddenly, the abrupt sound of something heavy falling startled her, but it quickly vanished under the sound of the rain. Was it an illusion? Song Ku hesitated for a moment, carefully turned around, and intended to investigate further. However, she unexpectedly collided with a powerful, surging, and chilling intent to kill. It nearly brushed past her, full of danger. It was a fleeting encounter. It's an ability. She abruptly opened her eyes, her gaze like a torch, staring straight ahead, a hundred meters away. Numerous factory buildings stood there, hidden among the tree's shade, making it impossible to pinpoint their exact locations. Song Ku turned back, the high school students behind her remained oblivious, still busy searching for items. Too close. The killing intent from that ability user was so strong she could sense it even here. If the other side detected her, these people would be in great danger. Song Ku lowered her eyelashes. Tian, Tian Yi. Hey. Did you call me, Song Ku? It was the first time Tian Yi had been called by her, and he ran over eagerly like a puppy. What's over there? Song Ku pointed towards the misty rain. I don't know, seems like it's within our jurisdiction. I know, I know. Kong Chi joined in, casually putting his arm around Tian Yi's shoulder. There's a big research facility there called Qingsong Biotech. Last time my dad drove me by, and I took a good look. Wow! The guard at the entrance glared at me. Song Ku listened quietly as he finished, picked up her umbrella, and headed outside. Where are you going? Ju just, just going to take a look. You can't. It's too dangerous for you to go alone. Tian Yi grew anxious at once and lunged to grab the large umbrella, but Song Ku dragged him several meters forward with determination. Brother Jiang. Brother Jiang. Seeing that they couldn't convince Song Ku, Kong Zi Chi cleverly decided to report to Jiang Rui. What's wrong? Jiang Rui arrived quickly. Song Ku wants to go out. Jiang Rui hesitated only for a second, then swiftly put on a rain hat. Where are you going? I'll go with you. 
After shaking off Tian Yi's hold a few times, Song Kuk finally managed to free herself from his grip. She lifted her gaze, coldly warning, No, don't, don't bother me, and don't follow me. Jian Rui's movements faltered, and he felt a chill from head to toe. He had seen this kind of gaze from Song Ko before, three years ago. When he hurriedly arrived at Class 3's classroom, she had stared at him like that, her pitch black eyes devoid of any emotion. The next day, she dropped out of Hua City No. 1 middle school and hadn't appeared since. All right, I won't follow you, Jiang Rui's heart twinged painfully. He cleared his throat and asked, Will you come back? Song Ko opened the umbrella and hopped into the rain with a few strides, her figure gradually disappearing. Again. Why does she always act alone? She has no sense of unity someone had noticed the commotion here and couldn't help but complain. Song Ku was indeed being too stubborn. Even Tian Yi didn't know how to explain for her, so he had to awkwardly clarify, well, she's an ability user, you know. Ability users tend to have strong personalities. Besides, she'll come back after she's done. Why is she the one doing something special? Brother Jiang and Brother Qi are ability users too, but they haven't. Jiang Rui's brows furrowed, but before he could say anything, Zhang Qi interjected with a scolding tone, Shut up, all of you. The bones that had been set after his dislocation were still throbbing faintly. Zhang Qi hadn't initially wanted to intervene, but he couldn't help thinking about that day when Song Ku had leapt into the air to intercept the starship for them. A surge of anger overcame him. Let her go, let her be arrogant, let her be reckless. She would sooner or later die outside. Enough with the chattering. Let's find the medicine quickly. He grumbled and scolded, but no one knew who he was actually speaking for. Qingsong Biotech. A modest and stylish plaque stood in the center of the lawn, the heavy rain adding a touch of mystery to it through its cleansing touch. The architecture here presented an inverted mountain shape overall, with testing factories and various laboratories on both sides and a five-story comprehensive building in the middle. The facility had long been automated, and no traces of zombies were found along the way. However, in the offices of the factory buildings, several decomposed bodies lay in uniforms bearing the Qingsong Biotech logo. They sprawled across the floor, their coagulated blood extending to the doorway, now cleansed by the pouring rain. Song Ku's heart sank these people had been deliberately killed. The opponent she was about to face was far from benign. Song Ku understood this and became even more cautious in her demeanor. In the midst of the howling wind and pouring rain, a slender figure maneuvered between the buildings. After scouting the areas on both sides, Song Ku finally fixed her gaze on the central comprehensive building. To avoid premature exposure, she closed her umbrella and slowly approached in the heavy rain. Unexpectedly, the main entrance of the building was a sturdy steel door. She tried pushing it, but it didn't budge. If she used force to break in, an alarm would undoubtedly go off, alerting others. Song Ku had no choice but to give up and search for another entry point. Finally, on the side, she discovered a row of arched windows. However, even the lowest windows on the ground were quite high. She tiptoed and reached out her hand, but she was still quite far away. Song Ku inverted her umbrella, using its handle to hook onto the anti-theft mesh, jamming it into a gap. With a leap, she easily pulled herself up onto the windowsill. After wiping away the mist outside the window, she could faintly see two figures inside one tall and one short. Indeed, there were people inside. It was a laboratory of about 40 square meters. Song Ku cautiously leaned out half her head, her ear pressed against the window glass. The conversation inside gradually became clear there was a man and a woman. Both of them had their backs to her. The woman had long curly hair, and the man was slender, wearing a white coat. Where is it? I advise you to hand it over quickly. The man demanded sternly. Don't waste time with him. Search him directly. If you can't find it, break one of his legs. The woman's voice sounded impatient. She stomped forward with her toe, as if she stepped on something, and Song Ku heard a muffled groan. She clung to the windowsill and inched upward. It was then that she noticed a man sitting in the corner. 
The man had light-colored eyes, a few strands of hair falling onto his forehead, and looked exceptionally disheveled. Yet, amidst the rain and mist, he exuded a thrilling sense of beauty. His upper body was straight, but his right leg was softly bent and immobilized, with fresh crimson blood still seeping out. Despite his severe injuries, a faint smile hung on his lips. His entire presence seemed fragile and contradictory. Perhaps Song Ku stared a bit too long, for the man suddenly, without any warning, lifted his gaze and looked directly at the window. Their eyes met through the rain-soaked glass, causing Song Ku to lose her focus for a fraction of a second. Someone's there. Who's there? The man and woman quickly noticed her and rushed toward the window. The pen in the woman's hand slipped, the platinum tip gleaming coldly. Like an arrow, it shot toward Song Ku's throat. She released one hand and deftly dodged to the right, but to her surprise, the pen had tracking capabilities. It turned and relentlessly continued its trajectory toward her. In a moment of crisis, Song Ku's years of martial arts training kicked in. She hung on to the windowsill, exerted force with her waist, and adjusted her body's center of gravity through a series of precise sways, barely avoiding the lethal weapon. Nevertheless, the pen was still too fast, leaving a few red gashes on her collarbone. Song Ku clenched her free hand into a fist, smashed the glass with a few strikes, and swung into the room like on a swing. The pen followed her through the broken hole but ultimately fell short. Faced with Song Ku's preparedness, it had lost its threat. If it were an ordinary person, they would have probably been pierced through the throat and killed instantly by the sudden and unexpected attack. Wu Yuro, the woman inside the room, paled. She hadn't expected the intruder to react so swiftly. She immediately raised her voice in a scolding tone, Yang Bo, what are you staring at? Aren't you going to take action? The pale-faced Yang Bo slinked behind Song Ku. These two individuals didn't give her any chance to speak. They intended to kill her directly to silence her. Their ruthlessness and cold-bloodedness were quite apparent. The white lab coat on Yang Bo fluttered without wind, and over a dozen test tubes floated out of his pocket. The liquid inside exhibited a murky dark yellow color. Cough, cough be careful, its sulfuric acid, came a soft reminder from the corner. In the next second, the test tubes shot toward Song Ku like arrows, their contents spilling out due to the inertia. Song Ku's pupils contracted, her brain sounding an alarm of imminent danger. She leaped toward the window, grabbed the iron umbrella hanging on the anti-theft net, and then executed a somersault in midair, turning herself around and opening the umbrella. The massive umbrella rapidly unfolded, forming an impenetrable shield that securely protected Song Ku from behind. It also intercepted the attacks of the test tubes and liquid. As the two collided, the smooth surface of the umbrella seemed to be corroded by some toxic substance, emitting a pungent white smoke. Almost simultaneously, a fluorescent blue shine lit up the surface of the shield, illuminating even the walls, before gradually subsiding. The remaining liquid on it was absorbed entirely. Wu Yuro, who had been watching on the side, had a sudden change in her expression and spoke with urgency, kill her quickly. She's an awakener. Having yelled this, she extended her hand with a fierce expression, and that shadow-like pen appeared once again. On this side, the three of them engaged in an intense battle. The man in the corner seemed like an outsider, sitting leisurely as if watching a show. Even though he was confined, soaked in a pool of blood, his expression remained calm, almost like he was on a vacation. His fingers rested casually on his left knee, occasionally tapping out a melody. While the two attackers had peculiar methods of attack, their combat awareness was far inferior to Song Ku's. Additionally, the limited space within the lab constrained the effectiveness of the pen and the test tubes. Swinging the massive umbrella she had transformed from a lead ball and iron disc, Song Ku blocked, struck, and delivered heavy blows to their joints and vital points from above. After a few rounds, the two were left disoriented, bruised all over, and lying on the ground, groaning. Jumping down from the lab table, Song Ku looked once again at the corner. Chapter 18 Save the lunatic. From the eruption of the battle to its conclusion, the man in the corner hadn't shown any astonishment. Neither the unusual attack methods of the two nor her unconventional weapon, the enchanted umbrella, 
seemed to evoke any emotional fluctuations in him. Meeting her gaze at this moment, the man's lips curled upward. Cutting the grass cough, cough, without uprooting it, there will be endless troubles. Song Ku furrowed her brows. Almost as his words faded, a multitude of test tubes flew at her from behind. Not this move again. Song Ku countered by opening the umbrella in her hand, her line of sight momentarily obstructed. When she moved the umbrella away again, she found the woman gone. A faint sound came from the back of her head. In a life or death situation that left no room for delay, Song Ku swiftly turned around, her eyes on Wu Yiro, whose hair was disheveled. The ferocious pen was aimed straight at her eyes. Die! She shouted. Song Ku's eyes remained calm and composed. Unfazed, she drew a short sword from the umbrella's handle. A move upward thrust. She blocked and deflected the pen, sending it spinning in reverse, crashing into the wall and shattering. A move to repel. Wu Yiro was first struck by the fierce sword energy, and then the short sword that followed impaled her sternum, pinning her harshly against the wall. After dealing with Wu Yiro, Song Ku turned around and swung the iron umbrella in her hand, sending it several hundred pound weight crashing down on the frail young bow. He was pressed down, unable to move, and promptly spat out blood before losing consciousness. In less than a minute, the battle was decisively over. Song Ku looked at the man in the corner for the third time. He put away his smile and began slow applause. Quite impressive, easily taking down two sea level awakeners. Is your power related to that umbrella? A weapon based ability? No, it seems like it can transform the man's raven like eyelashes, fluttered as he analyzed, muttering to himself. Gradually, he seemed to understand. Ah, I see, it's a metal based ability. Song Ku's initial reaction was. Then, in the next second. While her expression seemed impassive, a storm was raging inside her. Observing her astonishment and confusion, the man's expression registered a hint of surprise. Ha! Huh. Don't know anything, do you? This little girl who seemed to know nothing, yet had managed to survive and scathe in the apocalypse, dared to wander outside during such a torrential rain? Perhaps she wasn't just incredibly lucky she might be incredibly powerful and fearless as well. Judging by her performance just now, she most likely belonged to the latter category. A lone, powerful, yet naive top-tier awakener. Heh, yeah, indeed she seemed very easy to manipulate. The man's gaze shifted, and a few thoughtful traces appeared in his eyes. Song Ku snapped back to reality, casting a wary glance at him. She silently picked up the iron umbrella that had been on top of Yang Bo and was about to leave. Her grandfather had once said that the secret to his longevity of 103 years was minding his own business. Since the advent of the apocalypse, due to various unexpected situations, Song Ko felt like she had aged several years prematurely. This man seemed to be trouble, and her rationality reminded her it was best no, it was imperative not to get involved with him. After all, the danger here had been eliminated. She should hurry back and meet up with Tian Yi and the others. Hey, the man called from behind. You forgot your sword, he said. Song Ku turned her head and saw him struggling to stand up on his almost disabled right leg. He limped to the wall, pulled out her short sword, and then, right in front of her, forcefully stabbed it back into Wu Yuru's heart. Wu Yuru trembled all over. Within a few seconds, she lost her breath. The man withdrew the sword, then turned to thrust it into Yang Bo on the ground. Hot blood sprayed out, adding a cruel, bloody touch to his handsome profile. A chill ran down Song Ku's spine. She stared at him with frosty eyes. The man lifted his head, revealing a weak smile. He explained to her in a mocking tone, Do you think I'm ruthless? But if I don't kill them, then it's me who dies. The feeling of being at the mercy of others is truly unpleasant. This person could kill and still smile without a care. He was without a doubt the most cold-hearted person Song Ku had ever encountered. The man tossed the sword back to her. Song Ku instinctively caught it. Then, he calmly retrieved a handkerchief and wiped away the blood stains, all the while lifting his eyelids to observe her. Outside, the pouring rain drummed against the windows, creating a continuous sound. 
The two stood there, one by the window, the other leaning against the wall, quietly facing each other in confrontation. Yes, quite composed. Unshaken even when Mount Tai collapsed before her, her mental resilience was quite impressive. The man set aside his probing thoughts, and a smile curled on his lips. Little girl, you saved me. I don't have much to repay you with. After thinking it over, how about offering myself to you? Song Ku stared at him as if he were insane, slowly brandishing the short sword in her hand. You, you, you are sick, do you want to seek, seek death? Emotions were finally stirring within her, and her stammering tendency escalated at this moment, revealing her unease. Haha the man laughed like a malevolent character causing calamity for the nation, his dark trousers completely soaked with blood. Leaning against the wall, he appeared anything but embarrassed. Instead, he radiated an eye-catching brilliance, as elegant as a nobleman. He gazed deeply at Song Ku and said confidently, You won't kill me. This person Song Ku felt exasperated. She sheathed the sword and turned to run, one foot already on the windowsill. Hey, he called after her. Song Ku didn't stop, silently reciting, I won't listen, I won't listen, I won't listen, as she popped open the umbrella and prepared to leap into the rain. I am a researcher at the Qinglan Institute. The Qinglan Institute. Song Ku was familiar with this name. She had heard it on the television at the martial arts school. It was said to be the most top-tier and enigmatic research institution in the Alliance, renowned internationally for its achievements. Aren't you curious? About the apocalypse, about your powers, and even about the origin of this torrential rain in Hua City. No one has told you anything about these matters so far, right? Song Ku's back stiffened. She retorted with the stubbornness of a dead duck, I'm not, not curious. If you weren't curious, you wouldn't have shown up here today. The man's lips were pale due to blood loss, but he seemed oblivious to it, still attempting to seduce her. You want to know the real truth? I know everything. Or rather I know even more than you could imagine. How about we make a deal? Three sentences made Song Ku stop in her tracks. She stood by the windowsill, the sound of pouring rain in her ears, while a struggle raged within her. What Song Ku urgently needed right now was the truth. She stayed in District F, isolated from the world since childhood, living a life at odds with everyone around her. She knew very little about this world. This man seemed to have unraveled her thoughts, grasping her lifeline and leaving her with no way to retreat. If there really was someone who knew all the secrets about the apocalypse and was willing to tell her, she wouldn't be able to refuse. How can you, how can you prove it? Song Ku's heart was already wavering. The man smiled, pulling out a work badge from his pocket with the name Qinglan Institute on it and his own photo. Song Ku took a glance and found the photo not as good-looking as he was in person. How do you want to, to trade? If I'm not mistaken, you have companions, right? Transfer me to a safe zone and then find a healing type awakener for me. Okay. There was a safe zone the sports field of no. One middle school would do. As for a healing type awakener, she hadn't seen one, but she could look for one gradually. The man's request wasn't unreasonable. Song Ko retracted her leg hanging outside the window and jumped back into the room. The deal was struck, and the man seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. He sat down weakly, asking, Do you have any first aid supplies? Song Ko rummaged through her backpack, taking out some bandages and medical supplies. She pushed them toward him. Without changing his expression, the man quickly did a simple job of dressing his wounds, swaying a bit when he stood up. With such a major injury, jumping out of the window was clearly out of the question. Song Ku had no choice but to head towards the door. The man followed behind in silence. She walked a dozen meters, turned around to look, and found that the man had only moved less than two meters. Trouble, this was truly troublesome. Song Ku took a deep breath, turned around, and approached him with determined steps. She stared at him from top to bottom, then reached out and grabbed his waistband. What are you doing? This was the first time the man had lost his elegance since entering the room. His expression was no longer composed instead, his handsome face bore a cold and stern look. 
Ignoring his outburst, Song Ku held onto his collar with her other hand. With a slight effort, she lifted him off the ground, his heels hovering about two inches above the floor. You, you're too slow. The man grabbed her wrist, veins pulsing on his forehead. Turn left after leaving the main entrance of this building. It's the second building there. You'll find a medical equipment production line for assistance devices. Go look there should be a wheelchair. The door downstairs, it's locked, she reminded him. She could freely come and go through the window, but a wheelchair was too big to fit. Going through the main entrance would require her to spend time and effort dismantling the door. It was better to just carry him down directly. The man took a couple of steps forward and pulled out a silver-white access card from a drawer. Here, use this to swipe. Song Ku went to the place he indicated and indeed found a variety of finished wheelchairs. They came in various styles and looked state-of-the-art, with a bunch of complicated buttons. She grabbed two with her hands, one in each hand, and hurried back to the main building. In the laboratory, the man propped himself up and sat in the wheelchair, his forehead beaded with cold sweat. Can we, can we go now? Song Ku urged him. Just a moment. Before leaving, he maneuvered the wheelchair to the bodies of Wu Yuro and Yang Bo, bending down without avoiding Song Ku and purposefully patting them down. Finally, he took off Yang Bo's valuable watch and Wu Yuro's string of pearl necklaces. Song Ku was absolutely astonished, her worldview shattered. What kind of person was this? Even at a time like this, he was still thinking about seizing a few things. Facing her incredulous gaze, the man smiled wryly, his voice slightly trembling, it's not what you think. Song Ku nodded absently a couple of times, avoiding his gaze with unease. She began to reflect on whether her impulsive decision was correct. Or should she just leave him here and sneak away? She glanced somewhat guiltily at the man. After plundering the belongings of the two deceased, he sat with his hands neatly placed on his knees, smiling at her. Song Ku, oh no, she couldn't run away now. With a sigh, she resignedly walked towards the man. At the entrance of Qingsong Biotech, the majestic signboard stood tall and unwavering, like a silent witness to the bloodshed and conflict that had taken place here. Song Ku opened her umbrella, firmly shielding both of them. With one hand, she pushed the wheelchair and stepped into the endless rain curtain. The muggy sea breeze blew against them, instantly wetting the man's knees and her back. The pouring rain gradually swallowed their figures, leaving only faint traces of conversation in the air. I forgot to ask earlier, what's your name? Song Ku, Ku. Song Ku Ku. Hmm quite cute. Not, not that. It's Song Ku. Alright, got it, Song Ku. Hey, could you move the umbrella a bit over here? Don't just keep it to yourself. Also, my name is Zhuang Qinyan. Chapter, 19 My person, I'll take care of it. Brother Zhang, someone is approaching, Zhang Hao said, his eyes fixed on the window as he promptly relayed the message to Jiang Rui. Jiang Rui had just finished counting the quantity of medicines when he heard this and looked up to the rain outside. Despite the continuing severe weather with thunder and rain, two figures emerged from the misty boundary between sky and earth. A slender girl held a massive iron umbrella, steady against the wind and rain, while using one hand to push a wheelchair with a young man leaning against it. As everyone squinted, trying to discern the identity of the newcomers, Jiang Rui had already opened the warehouse doors and dashed into the rain. You're back. He ran a few steps to reach Song Ku, his gaze fixed solely on her figure. You're not injured, right? No. That's good. Come in first. The rain outside is too heavy. Despite only having been outside for a short while, his hair and clothes were thoroughly wet. However, Jian Rui seemed not to mind at all in fact, he looked rather happy. And, of course, he was happy. This time, Song Ku hadn't disappeared she had come back. Acknowledging him with a response, Song Ku closed the large umbrella and entered the warehouse with him. We've already found the fever-reducing medicine. As a precaution, we've also prepared some other prescription medicines to bring back, Jiang Rui explained the current situation to her. His attention shifted to the man sitting in the wheelchair, whom he had belatedly noticed. 
And this gentleman is. Um, he Song Ku hesitated, mainly because she wasn't very articulate, and the situation with Zhuang Qinyan was quite complicated. For a moment, she didn't know where to start. After Song Ku's brief trip outside, bringing back an unfamiliar man, her unusual behavior had already attracted attention. The others huddled nearby, secretly sizing up the situation. However, they had interacted with Song Ku several times before, so their curiosity was more innocent than malicious. Facing the crowd's gaze, Zhuang Qinyan coughed a couple of times. Hello, everyone. I'm a pharmaceutical researcher at the neighboring Qingsong Biotech. Before the apocalypse, I was conducting closed-door experiments at the company. Unexpectedly I've been trapped in the research building for several days now. Fortunately, this fellow student Song rescued me while passing by. He let out a sigh with a lingering fear, giving the impression of someone who had narrowly escaped a disaster. I'm really grateful. If it weren't for student Song, I'm afraid I might not have made it out. Song Ku. Well, she didn't need to explain this person had already concocted a complete story. And he said it so earnestly, shifting focus away from the real issues. Not a single truthful word. What pharmaceutical researcher? What closed-door experiments? At his place, experiments meant poking people's eyes with pens or splashing sulfuric acid on their faces, right? Song Ku grumbled inwardly, but outwardly, she maintained her composure and didn't expose him. Jian Rui noticed the slight twitching of her expression and whispered, Song Ku, come over here for a moment. Song Ku followed him a few steps away from the crowd. Is this person truly someone you rescued from Qingsong Biotech? Yes. Though there were some discrepancies in the details, the outcome was indeed as such, without a doubt. You intend to take him back to the safe zone? Jian Rui's brows gradually furrowed. Is that not okay? Song Ku asked in response. It's not that it's not possible, but Jian Rui disliked discussing others behind their backs, so he had to hint subtly, inside the safe zone, Teacher Su ensures fairness by distributing resources based on everyone's contributions. In a situation like his, where he relies solely on a wheelchair and has no physical strength, he might not receive any supplies or food. Indeed, a physically frail researcher who relied on a wheelchair and had no strength to contribute, and lacked any unique abilities to shine, what value could he bring to Su Liren? Both of them fell silent. Unable to resist, Song Ku turned her head to glance over. There, Zhuang Qinyan, pretending to be a researcher, had become the center of attention. Holding a pile of drug boxes with long and complex names, he explained to everyone while noticing Song Ku's gaze. He turned his head slightly, smiling at her with his eyes curved. If he can't get any then, he can't get any, Song Ku was momentarily blinded by his affected smile. She quickly averted her gaze. She wasn't surprised by the situation Jiang Rui described. When she decided to bring him back, she had anticipated this outcome. For Song Ku, the matter of whether she could stay in the safe zone wasn't as crucial as Jiang Rui had assumed. It wasn't even as significant as the information Zhuang Qinyan himself could offer her. She had the mentality that if this place didn't accommodate her, she could find her own way out. Ultimately, if need be, she would just leave. The, the person I saved, I, I will take care of it. Jian Rui's breathing suddenly became uneven. With some time left before the agreed return time, the group tidied up and planned to search the nearby areas again. The outskirts of Hua City were vast and sparsely populated, making the search for supplies extremely challenging. They had explored several places in a row, but the gains were meager. As the days of the apocalypse passed, fewer and fewer people were seen outside. The local residents had either fled to higher-level cities or hoarded supplies in their homes. With limited resources and no basic productive capacity, consumption continued unabated. Sooner or later, everything would run out. Kongzi Chi walked and muttered in puzzlement, Why do I feel like there are fewer zombies recently? Is it just me? Zhang Hao replied, It's not your imagination. The frequency of zombie appearances is indeed decreasing. No way. Zombies are afraid of rain too. I don't know, logically they shouldn't be. Damn. Where do the zombies go? 
The boys conversed up front, while Song Ku held the umbrella for Zhuang Qinyan and trailed behind them. The group was large, and it wasn't convenient for the two of them to communicate privately. They didn't have time for whispered conversations along the way. Finally finding a canned food factory, when the group dispersed to load supplies, Song Ku seized the opportunity. She wheeled Zhuang Qinyan to a corner of the wall, and asked, Can you, can you answer my questions now? Leaning his chin on his hand, Zhuang Qinyan, completely helpless, was pushed by the stammering girl. After a moment's thought, he nodded, Well, I can answer, but let's make one thing clear first only three questions per day. Why? Song Ku was shocked. He never mentioned this condition when negotiating with her. Zhuang Qinyan pointed to the wheelchair and smiled leisurely, how should I put it? Tisk, I'm disabled now, I should still keep some tricks up my sleeve, right? What if you've asked all the questions you wanted and you feel I'm not valuable anymore? Then you just don't need me. Song Ku, this person was really shameless. Her cheeks puffed with anger, but luckily she had the foresight to confirm with him, how can I be, be sure, what you're saying is, true. Zhuang Qinyan looked hurt by her suspicion. We're complete strangers. What benefit would I gain from lying to you? A bit of twisted reasoning there. Well, she did save him, so whatever, she trusts him for now. Song Ku posed her first question sullenly, then, I want, want to ask, who were those two people just now? Why did they want, want to kill you? Zhuang Qinyan replied, you're talking about Wu Yuro and Yang Bo, right? I had a research finding that they cared deeply about. Hey, don't look at me with that kind of expression. I didn't steal it, and it's not theirs either. Well strictly speaking, it belongs to Qinglan. But they've coveted this research finding for a long time. As for me, I wasn't willing to just hand it over. So, they got angry and came after me. What research finding? Song Ku pressed further. She couldn't completely trust Zhuang Qinyan. His background and appearance were too suspicious, and what kind of research finding could prompt two ability users to resort to killing, even going so far as to silence someone? Zhuang Qinyan raised his gaze and smiled playfully in response, Are you sure you want to ask? Explaining this finding will take more than a few days, and this would already count as your second question. No, it shouldn't. Song Ku's frustration grew. Shameless, this person was just shameless. Not getting the upper hand in a conversation and unable to outmaneuver him in wits, Song Ku was close to losing it. She swiftly wheeled the wheelchair in circles a few times and then, coincidentally, aimed it towards the direction of the main gate. She lifted her feet off the ground, releasing her hands on the handles. Student Song, let's talk peacefully. Don't resort to violence. The front wheels of the wheelchair lifted slightly. If Xuan Qinyan dared to play tricks on her again, Song Ku was ready to send him rolling headfirst into the pouring rain. After gaining the upper hand, Song Ku released a sigh of frustration. She assertively posed her second question, what exactly is my, my ability? Xuan Qinyan had figured it out. The young girl didn't trust him, and she was truly determined. She wanted him to give up some information first before she would reciprocate. Otherwise, she might just abandon him along the way. He pondered for a moment, then asked, Can you manipulate the form of objects? Song Ku didn't say a word. She casually picked up an empty pineapple can nearby. In an instant, the can transformed into a shiny dagger as she waved it forward, a glint of deep blue light passing through it. Zhuang Qinyan nodded, For the time being, known abilities can be roughly divided into three categories, mental abilities, physical enhancements, and mystical. Mental abilities mainly involve controlling elements and telekinesis. For instance, the gold element is widely recognized as a strong offensive ability. From the surface, you possess a commendable gold element ability. But being able to transform weapons already signifies your command over materialization. Compared to other superhumans of the same level, you would be more powerful. He pointed at the dagger in Song Ku's hand, just like this. Spiritual weapon, Song Ku interjected. Spiritual weapon. Although it looks like a knife and feels like a knife, it isn't an actual knife. It's the external manifestation of your gold element ability. 
If I'm not mistaken, you should be able to manipulate it with ease. Turning her palm, the dagger disappeared into thin air, leaving no trace. Chuang Qinyan paused. Song Ku's control over her ability was incredibly precise. Her ability to switch weapons in battle was seemingly unrestricted. Forget just being in the gold element, she was likely among the most powerful and dominant of all awakeners. He continued, physical enhancement superpowers are more common. They involve enhancing basic attributes, physical transformations, and accelerated healing. As for mystical abilities, they encompass a wide range of abilities, including precognition, healing, external object manipulation, and temporal manipulation, among others. These abilities are elusive and unpredictable. When encountering them for the first time, it's easy to be taken off guard. Chapter 20 My person, I'll take care of it. Song Ku meticulously recalled her experiences since the apocalypse began. Aspects that previously puzzled her suddenly became clear, like dispelling clouds and fog. So, the middle-aged man she saw at the docks wind, Su Xing ice, and Qi Wen thunder, and even Jiang Rui fire were all elemental awakeners of the mental abilities category. Zhang Qi's strength, Wu Jiuamin's teleportation were both attributes of physical enhancement. As for mystical abilities, the tracking pen of Wu Yuro and the sulfuric acid test tube of Yang Bo had just proven to be incredibly unpredictable. The strength of awakeners ranges from E to A, ascending step by step. E level is the lowest, representing individuals with relatively acute sensory perception. A level is the strongest, with superpower intensity reaching up to about 83% of the body's maximum tolerance threshold. However Zhuang Qinyan said up to this point, he smiled ambiguously, if one can surpass this threshold and unlock more potential during awakening, there might even be awakeners with an S level beyond the upper limit. Zhuang Qinyan was almost certain that Song Ke's superpower level was not low. Not only could she externalize her abilities, but her physical qualities also far exceeded those of ordinary physical enhancement awakeners. Not to mention the precise and fierce combat skills she displayed at Qingsong Biotech, which was why he had thought it over and ultimately decided to hug her thigh. You could easily defeat two C-level awakeners, which would suggest your level is probably above B and might even be A. However, superpower reactions have a strong variability. To get the most accurate data, we'd have to rely on authoritative testing equipment. Song Ku remembered something, testing. Is it that kind of, of black box with lots of, wires? You've seen one. Zhuang Qinyan was mildly surprised. But what you're referring to seems to be the most basic superpower detection device, an outdated product. Aside from assessing whether the subject has superpower fluctuations, it doesn't serve any other purpose. I'm actually curious, where did you see one? Zhuang Qinyan stared at Song Ku with interest. The most advanced R-type superpower detection devices of the Alliance were all stored in various Qinlan research institutions. Portable versions that were available on the market were mostly owned by the military. If Song Ku had undergone superpower testing, would those people have allowed her to leave so easily? I've seen it, but it, it was broken. Song Ku felt irritated recalling the incident. She briefly recounted her evacuation from District 177, omitting the part where she rescued someone and the objective fact that the testing device exploded because of her. Ah what a pity, Zhuang Qinyan sighed after hearing her story. Pity, for what? He he don't misunderstand, I'm pitying those people. Zhuang Qinyan looked out at the pouring rain outside the door, his gaze becoming distant. Azure Phoenix. He hadn't heard about them for a long time. As the once most glorious fighting force of the Alliance, they had fallen to the point of needing to recruit Awakeners from civilians. Could that not be considered a pity? With only one question left to ask, and with Song Ku having too many questions in mind, she was paralyzed by indecision. So, she temporarily put the matter aside, planning to ponder over it once she returned to the safe zone. With limited supplies of her own and now the added burden of another mouth to feed, she had to accompany Jiang Rui's group in scavenging the canned food factory. In the process, they managed to collect a variety of strawberry, peach, and orange canned fruits. During this time, Zhuang Qinyan remained silently seated in the wheelchair. 
Song Ku inexplicably felt that when he was quiet, he wasn't as annoying as she had initially thought. Half an hour early, the group returned to Hua City No. One middle school, waiting for Lu Zixuan to open the door. As the appointed time arrived, the wall recessed, and the superpower door opened punctually. Lu Zixuan appeared and couldn't wait to ask, did you find the medicine? Zhou Anqi woke up, but the fever hasn't gone down. We found it, Jiang Rui nodded. Lu Zixuan breathed a sigh of relief. That's good. Her ability has awakened. Zhou Anqi's awakening had been a foregone conclusion even before Jiang Rui and the others returned. There was a subtle magnetic field sensitivity between awakeners. Earlier in the morning, Lu Zixuan sensed energy fluctuations in her. He immediately reported it to Su Liren. However, she was mentally weak due to the high fever, making it difficult for her to speak. This continued until Jiang Rui's group returned with life-saving medicine. Su Liren took the medicine box and after several checks, had Chao Yi feed it to Zhou Anqi to take. Anqi, how do you feel now? Zhou Anqi leaned weakly against Chao Yi. Hearing the question, she merely raised her eyelids. She was now the focus of everyone's attention, with everyone looking at her expectantly. Only Jiang Rui's gaze drifted elsewhere, not in the same direction as the others. Suddenly feeling displeased, Zhou Anqi couldn't care less about manners, not good. My throat hurts, my head hurts, my whole body hurts. Everyone exchanged glances. Su Liren didn't tolerate her tantrum and asked straightforwardly, Do you know what ability you've awakened? What kind of ability I've awakened is none of your DMN business Zhou Anqi, in the midst of anger, was about to blurt out a rude retort. However, upon seeing who was asking, she forcibly swallowed her words, lowered her head, thought for a moment, and honestly replied, I've always been afraid of getting hurt since I was little, worried that scars wouldn't look good. When I just awakened, I could vaguely sense something related to wounds. Wun Su Liren's eyes lit up. He called over the guy who had gone out with Zhang Qi last time. Although he had managed to escape the starship explosion, his arm and leg were still bruised and had not been properly treated. They had even begun to fester. Zhou Anqi stared at the ghastly wound, looking at it with disgust for quite a few minutes. Eventually, with Su Liren's encouragement, she placed her hands over the wound through the gauze. About ten minutes later, sweat started forming on her forehead, and she slowly withdrew her hands. The guy eagerly removed the gauze, only to find that the wound had completely healed. His skin was as good as new, not a scar left. He excitedly hopped in place, no different from any regular person in his movements. Witnessing this miracle with their own eyes, the atmosphere in the safe zone ignited like a spark, bursting into an uproar. It's a healing type ability. Really? Are you not joking? This is amazing. We won't have to worry about injuries anymore. Come on, do you think Miss Zhou would be kind enough to heal you? Ah, uh, that's true. Got excited for nothing. Su Liren smiled gently and kindly advised Zhou Anqi to take her medicine on time, rest well, and then stood up to attend to other matters. Just as he did so, Jiang Rui walked over to him and whispered, Mr. Su, Song Ku brought someone back. Oh. Who is it? The delight on Su Liren's face hadn't faded yet, and he nodded unconcernedly. I'll go take a look. When the others swarmed around Zhou Anqi, only Song Ku stood there like a wooden pole, rooted to her spot. Of course, Zhuang Qinyan, who fancied himself as the disabled person, also remained still, calmly watching the crowded scene. Your classmate seems to have awakened. Don't you want to join the excitement? No, no need. Oh. You don't want to see the excitement. Have you had a conflict with someone? Is this person telepathic? How does he seem to know everything? Song Ko was speechless, poking at the wheelchair's wheel with the tip of her foot, making the wheelchair spin chaotically. Zhuang Qinyan in the wheelchair was affected by the chaos, and his perspective spun around, forced to face multiple directions. However, he didn't seem annoyed at all. He maintained his smile and continued teasing her, really? Did I hit the nail on the head? You really have a grudge with someone? This only made Song Ku angrier, causing her to spin the wheels even faster. 
While the two were playfully bickering, Su Liren and Jiang Rui stopped in front of them. Song Ku, I heard you brought back a stranger. Song Ku's actions came to a halt, and the faintly expressive look on her face vanished instantly. In the awkward silence, she suddenly recalled Jiang Rui's mention of the distribution according to work system. She forced herself to speak stiffly, you don't need to give, give him supplies, I will take care of it. Su Liren's expression turned sour as he scolded her in a low voice, what do you think this place is? The girl in front of him lowered her gaze, presenting a rebellious appearance. It was like this before, and it's still the same now. Su Liren had taught for many years, and while Song Ku wasn't the most unruly student he had seen, she was certainly the most stubborn. She would never learn to be submissive. Suppressing his impatience, his tone grew even more stern. The safe zone is the result of everyone's hard work. Back then, we were willing to take you in because of the fate between teachers and students, not so you could act capriciously. You saved someone on a whim today, who knows if you'll pick up a cat or a dog tomorrow. If this continues, teacher won't be able to manage it. Song Ku's mind went blank, and she automatically started her turtle reciting scriptures technique, allowing her thoughts to wander freely. Su Liren's words entered her left ear and swiftly slipped out of her right, coming and going lightly, leaving no trace behind. Unluckily for her, her act of pretending to be dead didn't escape the notice of another. He he a magnetic chuckle resonated, interrupting Su Liren's words. Zhuang Qinyan, likened to a cat or dog, seemed to have a better sense of self-awareness than Song Ku. Recognizing his own rudeness, he quickly apologized, sorry, couldn't help it. You can continue, please continue. Su Liren's glasses glinted, a cold glint passing through his eyes. In the safe zone, nobody could challenge his authority. He composed himself, looked down at the wheelchair, and saw the languidly seated man. His handsome face seemed to be emitting a glow. His features were exquisite, a perfect work as if crafted by Niwa herself. Caught off guard, their gazes locked. Zhuang Qinyan arched an eyebrow, his smile unchanged. But Su Liren, as if struck by lightning, paled in disbelief. He appeared complex, even a touch frightened, staring at Zhuang Qinyan. Innocently and perplexedly, Zhuang Qinyan said, Um, Mr. Su. Are you okay? Su Liren gazed at him for a long time, not detecting anything unusual. He let out a suppressed breath, I'm fine. He then turned to look at Song Ku, his expression cold. Song Ku, you brought this person here, and we have no obligation to take care of him. You are responsible for him yourself. Furthermore, this is the last time. Jiang Rui quickly left a message I'll find you later and followed Su Liren as they left. Once they were far away, Song Ku asked in confusion, what's wrong with him? He was having a normal conversation and then suddenly collapsed. It's pretty unsettling. Maybe he had a sudden illness. Zhuang Qinyan looked at Su Liren's departing figure and smiled. Chapter, 21 Get out of here. Song Ku stared at his smile, a chill running down her spine, and a row of goosebumps appeared on her arms. She recalled the ancient court dramas that Aiming enjoyed. Occasionally, when she had free time, she would catch a glimpse of them. The way Zhuang Qinyan smiled was just too similar to the beautiful and sinister main antagonist in those dramas. After the others had walked away, the corner where the two of them were located regained its quietness. Zhuang Qinyan suppressed the smile on his face, and his expression finally appeared somewhat normal, since we have time now, tell me about the intricacies here. Intricacies? Song Ku was bewildered. The safety zone you brought me to, surely you can't know nothing about it. Of course, she wouldn't know nothing. On the first day she entered, she cleverly asked Tian Yi for information. Song Ku straightened her chest full of confidence, go, go ahead and ask. What is the organizational structure and management model here? Who are the main leaders? How are the Awakeners, as a scarce resource, allocated? Song Ku was taken aback for two seconds, hesitated, and shook her head. How is defense and patrolling arranged? What are the rules? Are there any taboos? Also, have you noticed any unusual places? Defense? Unusual? 
Song Ku continued shaking her head she had no idea. Zhuang Qin Yen couldn't continue his questioning. After a while, he helplessly rubbed his forehead, Student Song Ku, can I ask, what do you do every day? Eat, sleep, and fight, fight zombies. So, not really using your brain, huh? Very well, perfectly reasonable, can't find any faults. Song Ku glanced at Zhuang Qinyan's expressionless face, guiltily fiddled with her fingers, and the next second she shouted, Tian Yi. It's okay, if she couldn't explain, there's someone who can. Tian Yi's ears were quite sharp he heard her call from quite a distance and hurriedly ran over, bouncing, Hey, here I am. What's up? Song Ku pointed at Zhuang Qinyan, Can you, tell him about, the safety zone? Tian Yi had been curious about Zhuang Qinyan for a long time. He had wanted to approach him outside but didn't dare. Now that he had the chance, he immediately came over with enthusiasm, Brother Yen, can I call you Brother Yen? You were also saved by Song Ku, so we could consider it as having a deep connection, right? What do you want to know? I will definitely tell you everything. Zhuang Qinyan keenly caught the also in his words, gave Song Ku a slow, deliberate glance oh, the little girls in the wholesale business of saving lives, huh? After Song Ku passed the baton, she released her mental burden, lowered her head to rummage through her backpack, not noticing his gaze. Zhuang Qinyan also stopped looking at her, saying, I want to understand the personnel structure here. Let's start from the beginning. How did you all come here? Tian Yi responded with an O oh and began talking about the origin of the safety zone. He recounted from the advent of the apocalypse, the first wave of zombie outbreaks, Su Liren leading them in a hurried retreat, and he continued all the way to the current situation. Zhuang Qinyan occasionally interrupted with questions he was particularly concerned about. Tian Yi couldn't answer them all, but after some thought, he spoke for a long time. Song Ku, who was by the side, was getting bored. With one hand, she knocked and twisted, opening a can of orange slices. She buried her head in the can, her nose twitched, greedily sniffed, and then pulled out a spoon from her bag, happily stuffing it into her mouth. She quickly finished a can. So, the number of awakeners among you isn't large. After listening to Tian Yi's account, Zhuang Qinyan quickly sensed the core issue. Yeah, not counting Song Ku, there are currently four, Jiang Rui, Lu Zixuan, Zhang Qi, O, oh, and Zhou Anqi. 4. Zhuang Qinyan's expression shifted slightly. You mentioned a teacher named Su Liren. Didn't you say he's in charge? So, he's a regular person. Tian Yi scratched his head. Uh, teacher Su is a regular person. He teaches the first year students and he's also the only teacher left in the safe zone. That's why everyone is willing to listen to him. Without him leading us these days, we probably wouldn't have survived. High school students aged 16 or 17 naturally had inherent trust and respect for teachers. Tian Yi's thoughts were understandable. Zhuang Qinyan didn't comment and casually tapped the metal wheelchair with his slender finger joints. You said he's the only teacher left. Yes, initially, there was teacher Wang, teacher Chen, and vice principal Li, but they had accidents so only teacher Su remained. Zhuang Qinyan smiled very faintly. Whether he's a selfless dedicated teacher or a benevolent dictator in disguise, I'm afraid only by peeling away that layer of hypocrisy can one find out. His words were somewhat cryptic, and the only two in the audience didn't quite understand. Song Ku set down the empty can, burped softly, then opened another can of a different flavor and swallowed large mouthfuls. She was carefree whether she understood or not, it didn't affect her focused eating. After discussing for nearly half an hour, Zhuang Qinyan had a basic understanding of how the safety zone operated. Tian Yi also received a call from Kong Zichi in the distance, asking him to quickly collect today's supplies. Before leaving, he remembered something, oh, by the way, you probably don't know yet. Zhou Anqi awakened as a healing type ability user. Song Ku's movement of stuffing a peach slice into her mouth suddenly froze. The fruit slipped off the spoon and landed with a soft plop on the ground. She didn't have time to feel sorry for it as she reflexively turned her head to look at Zhuang Qinyan's legs. Zhuang Qinyan supported his chin, sighing softly. Um, I got lucky. 
At that time, there were two conditions for their deal, one was to bring him back to the safe zone, and the other was to find a healing type ability user. To achieve both so quickly, of course, luck was on their side. However, Song Ku didn't feel happy at all. Her emotions had changed too obviously, which Xuan Qinyan noticed. He then recalled her being alone in the corner earlier, and asked with a hint of realization, you don't want to ask for her help. Song Ku didn't say anything, and after a long while, she reluctantly nodded, her face showing evident reluctance. Zhuang Qinyan fell silent and looked down at his own knees. Perhaps due to losing too much blood, unconsciously, his complexion had become even paler than when they first met. At this moment, he seemed to be standing on the wheel of fate, Song Ku obviously was unwilling. Would she give up this opportunity just like that? He didn't know if he could hold on until they found another healing type ability user. Going alone to find someone of unknown strength? Maybe he could save his own life, but undoubtedly, it would anger this new ally. The prospects were indeed worrying. Zhuang Qinyan needed to make a high stakes gamble, an all in bet, and the price was his own life. Unfortunately, he had always been the most reckless gambler. However, Clever gamblers tend to use some confusing tactics before placing their bets. Opening his mouth again, Zhuang Qinyan's emotions stabilized, and his voice was gentle, if you're unwilling, you don't have to ask her. Song Ku's moist eyes blinked, and she felt somewhat guilty. Your legs. Zhuang Qinyan harvested her sympathy without hesitation and said gently, like a gentle breeze, don't worry, they've already been bandaged. It's not that serious. Song Kuk felt a bit relieved and found him more agreeable than before. After thinking for a moment, she took out a beautifully packaged small cake from her backpack and handed it to him. Please, have it. What? Egg cake. Why cake? Zhuang Qinyan gestured toward the pile of empty cans on the ground. I thought you might treat me to canned food. Because today is my, my birthday. Song Ku smiled subtly and the small dimple on her cheek became more pronounced. This was the last piece of cake she had hidden away, and it was the most visually appealing one. There were even pointed strawberries on top. She had been reluctant to eat it, wanting to save it as a reward for herself on her birthday. Zhuang Qinyan poked the cake with a plastic spoon. The small portion on the very top had oxidized to a pale yellow, indicating it was made of the cheapest vegetable fat cream. It was a type of junk food that he would never have tried in the past, categorized as garbage district specialties. However, his expression remained unchanged as he gently scooped up a very small piece and put it in his mouth. His eyes then curved into a smile. Thank you, it's delicious. Song Ku, happy birthday. Song Ku's eyes widened slightly. From the time she could remember, this seemed to be the first time someone other than her grandfather had specifically said happy birthday to her. It wasn't a surplus from Zhang Si's birthday at the Yu Mountain Martial Arts School. It was a complete and wholehearted wish for her alone to have a happy birthday. Song Ku felt somewhat overwhelmed, her fingers tugging at her backpack strap. She hesitantly pushed two unopened cans over to him. Here, these are for you too. Couldn't get supplies. No problem. She had them. During this time, she could manage that for him. In the early morning, the rain-covered sports field was completely silent. Song Ku tossed and turned, finding it hard to sleep. She had a nagging feeling that she had forgotten something until a ding resounded in her mind. She suddenly remembered she had one remaining chance to ask a question. With only three opportunities a day, she had to be frugal, so how could she waste it? Swiftly, Song Ku rolled over, feeling around in the darkness and moving towards the side. Zhuang Qinyan was sleeping quietly, his hands neatly resting on his abdomen, and even his breath was light. Song Ku poked him, but he didn't respond. She tugged at his sleeve, only to encounter a damp chill. Song Ku was taken aback and crouched down to examine him closely. The nighttime lighting wasn't great, but her night vision was exceptional, allowing her to quickly make out the person before her. Zhuang Qinyan was covered in cold sweat, his face pallid. His jet black hair hung on his forehead, and he looked extremely unwell. He had been drenched in rain during the day, 
hadn't changed his clothes, and spent the night in the cold and wet. Now his wound had deteriorated rapidly, and he had lost consciousness. Song Ku rolled up his pant leg, and the white bandage was stained with a large patch of glaring red, like vividly blooming nirvana flowers. She gently pressed on the broken leg, and the fragmented bones were like mush, devoid of any support, completely contradicting what he had said about it not being that serious. The injury was even worse than she had imagined. Zhuang Qin Yen, Zhuang Qin Yen. Song Ku urgently called his name while tapping his face. She applied a bit too much force, accidentally knocking his head askew. His handsome face had lost its vitality and slowly tilted to the side. This can't be Song Ku was startled, quickly supporting his head. Pressing her ear to his chest, she was relieved to hear a faint heartbeat. Song Ku anxiously picked at her fingers, wondering what to do. Regardless of his words, he probably wouldn't make it through the night. But to save him, the only option now. She raised her gaze and looked in another direction. It was pitch black there, with faint signs of vitality shimmering. Go ask that person. Even if they were willing, getting them to act wouldn't be that easy. What bargaining chips did she have to exchange? And what kind of price would she need to pay? A voice deep within her kept urging her, give up, don't bother. After all, they had only known each other for less than a day. Leaving him behind wouldn't matter much. There must be more than one person who knew the truth about the apocalypse. She could always go outside and capture another researcher. Forget it, forget it. But for some reason, Zhuang Qingyan's voice kept flashing in her mind. He had said to her, Song Ku, happy birthday. Song Ku closed her eyes and when she opened them again, she stood up with a swish. She picked up Zhuang Qingyan and placed him in the wheelchair. Chapter 22 Get out of here. Hasty and disordered footsteps, the intense friction of the wheelchair against the ground this commotion woke up a large group of people who were sound asleep. Who's making noise in the middle of the night? Is something wrong? Did zombies break in? Who? Who broke in? Flashlights flickered, and a group of people at the center of the safe zone sat up warily. Pushing Zhuang Qinyan in the wheelchair, Song Ku stopped right in front of Zhou Anqi. Save him. Zhou Anqi, still half asleep, was first startled by the pale complexion of the person in the wheelchair. After hearing what Song Ku said, she incredulously lifted her head. Are you out of your mind? You're a healing type ability user. Please, please save him. Why should I? I won't save him. It seemed that the tables had turned. Fate had its way of circling back, and unexpectedly, there came a day when Song Ku had to beg Zhou Anqi. Zhou Anqi didn't even have time to set off firecrackers in her heart to celebrate, and she was still counting on her to save people. It was utterly outrageous. With folded arms and a condescending stance, she glared fiercely at Song Ku. Mockingly, she said, I've said it before, you're a star of disaster. Whoever comes into contact with you will be unlucky. It serves them right to die. Let's see who you can deceive from now on. Zhou Anqi's eyes were filled with resentment and malice. Song Ko knew that continuing to talk to her was futile. She pushed the wheelchair in a different direction, turning toward the person who could actually make the decision, save him. Su Liren stood in the center of the inner circle, wearing a coat, half his face obscured in the darkness, silent and still. Song Ko had considered that Su Liren wouldn't agree unconditionally. She raised her eyes and surveyed the faces in the darkness. One by one, they looked panicked and bewildered, looking helplessly at the confrontation. This included Tian Yi, Lin Xia, Kong Zi Qi, and others, their hushed whispers filling the air. Why did this person faint? His complexion looks terrible. Can Zhou Anqi's temper improve? She should just help out a bit. Um, Song Ku, are you okay? Tiani looked at her with concern. Song Ku roughly counted the heads. The survivors in the safe zone were decreasing continuously, and now there were just over a hundred left. Just over a hundred ordinary students, unarmed, facing the zombies outside Deet was no different from sending them to their deaths. She roughly estimated her mental strength, clenched her fist, and played her negotiation card. In the chaotic night, 
Song Ku's right hand swiftly slid over the back of the wheelchair and then opened her palm. A mountain cutting knife emitting a faint blue light quietly appeared, its blade jagged and sharp, exuding a piercing aura. One hundred weapons, exchange for his life, she said. The flickering blue light illuminated the astonished faces of the people nearby, quickly causing a commotion. Wow! Unbelievable! One hundred weapons! How did that knife just appear? Did anyone see it clearly? Am I dreaming? I must not be awake someone pinch me. Song Ku. This knife how did you round-faced girl Lin Xia exclaimed in shock, nearly losing her ability to speak. Supernatural powers, Song Ku responded slowly, enunciating clearly. The surrounding noise quieted for a moment. So, you're not a power-type awakener at all. A boy who had been healed by Zhou Anqi pointed at her and shouted, when we went out earlier, that huge hammer you used to break the door, and the strange iron umbrella from before, you made them with your supernatural power. Made with your supernatural power. You've been lying to us all along. It's not really lying, Song Ku never admitted she was a power type. We all just guessed Tian Yi weakly defended her. The sudden appearance of powerful weapons out of thin air, combined with Song Ku's proposal, left everyone in the safe zone dumbfounded. One hundred weapons was a grand offer, almost enough for each of them to have one, fully arming their group of a hundred. People were uncertain, whispering and discussing among themselves. Taking advantage of the distraction, Chao Yi's expression shifted slightly. She leaned in and said something to Zhou Anqi. Su Liren took the spiritual weapon mountain cutting knife from Song Ku's hand. After observing it for a moment, he suddenly, without any warning, swung at a nearby volleyball pole. Crack! The sturdy steel pole snapped, and the volleyball net fell to the ground. He weighed the handle of the knife, his expression no longer calm. He suddenly looked up at Song Ku. Weapons of equal quality, are you sure you can provide a hundred? He inquired. I can. When can the delivery be made? Within half an hour. Exchanging spiritual weapons for Zhuang Qingyan's life was the only valuable bargaining chip Song Ku could think of. Through her observations over the past few days, she realized that the safe zone's most pressing need wasn't food, but weapons. With weapons, the teams going outside for exploration could expand in numbers and deal with emergencies. After all, the situation in the apocalypse changed rapidly. Hua City No. One middle school was surrounded by zombies from all sides, and it could only serve as a temporary buffer zone. How long the safe zone could truly remain safe was uncertain no one could guarantee that. Su Liren adjusted his glasses and seemed shaken. However, he neither directly agreed nor disagreed. He appeared to be waiting for something. I don't agree. Why should I save him? Zhou Anqi, who had been ignored for a while, suddenly interjected, complaining discontentedly. Su Liren gave her a faint glance, his eyes behind the lenses devoid of warmth, why don't you agree? It's my own ability I have the right to decide. Zhou Anqi said, her voice faltering for a moment, her gaze suddenly distant, as if a momentary sense of familiarity and fear enveloped her. Her voice grew quieter, her teeth chattered, yet she continued to insist defiantly, straining her neck, you can ask me to save him, but I have a condition. In the dim light, Su Liren's tone took on a deliberate inducement. You're right. So, what's your condition? Everyone's gaze focused on her. Zhou Anqi's fear diminished, and her courage gradually grew. I dislike Song Ku. If you want me to save him, she has to kneel down and kowtow to me twice, crying and begging for forgiveness. Then she can get out of here. Chao Yi closed her eyes, her nails digging deep into her palm. Idiot! This idiot! She had made everything so clear to her. The immediate priority was to get Song Ku out of the safe zone, yet here she was adding unnecessary drama. Zhou Anqi! Jian Rui's stern voice interrupted her. It's already this late. Can't you stop acting crazy? This is going too far. Song Ku is an awakener, Zhang Hao said with a serious expression. What's the big deal about being an awakener? I'm a healing type ability user. She can only produce some worthless junk. 
Is she more important than me? If you're not happy with this, why don't you go save him? Don't come begging me. Su Liren remained silent. He looked at Song Ku, then turned his gaze to the unconscious man in the wheelchair, lost in thought. An unruly piece on the chessboard, a disabled pawn whose potential was uncertain how much benefit did they still bring him at this point. Zhou Anqi's demand seemed unreasonable and overbearing, but upon closer inspection, it might not be a bad choice. Zhou Anqi, that's enough. It's unacceptable to degrade a fellow student, Su Liren advised, his words neither harsh nor gentle. His true intentions were even harder to decipher. He seemed to be giving the decision-making power to Zhou Anqi. With the reins of power firmly in her grasp, Zhou Anqi had no understanding of the concept of stopping while ahead. She looked smugly at Song Ku, a cruel innocence in her beautiful face. How about it? Either watch him die or obediently kowtow to me and then get out of here. In the tense atmosphere, Jiang Rui suddenly spoke in a calm tone, if Song Ku has to leave, I'll go with her. Brother Jiang. Don't act recklessly. Jiang Rui, why are you joining in this madness? One stone caused a thousand ripples. Song Ku leaving and Jiang Rui leaving carried two completely different meanings. Song Ku, the lone wolf who kept to herself most of the time, hadn't been around for long, so even if she left, nobody would care too much. But Jiang Rui was different. He was a pillar in the safe zone, strong in power and popular among the people. His departure would undoubtedly shake the morale, especially considering that losing two awakeners in one fell swoop, especially one of Jian Rui's caliber, would be a heavy blow to the entire safe zone. Zhou Anqi was so furious that her eyes turned red. She screamed hysterically, Jian Rui, you're like this again. You're like this again. Seeing that the situation was about to get out of control, Su Liren stared at Jiang Rui for two seconds before pulling him aside. I'll give you some time. Calm down. There's always room for negotiation in everything. Don't be so impulsive. Behind them, Zhou Anqi began screaming and smashing things, and everyone else avoided her like the plague. Amid the hesitant gazes of people like Zhang Hao and others, Jiang Rui returned to his spot and began packing his bag. Suddenly, a slender palm stopped his movements. Why? Song Ku asked. You don't need to worry. I'm doing this willingly, Jian Rui replied. Why willingly? Song Ku's gaze was clear, pure curiosity in her eyes, wondering why he had made this decision. Jian Rui looked into her eyes, his lips moved, and after mustering the courage, he finally said, Song Ku, I made a mistake before. I apologize to you. There's something I didn't have a chance to tell you back then actually, I I like. No need for this. Song Ku withdrew her hand, her brows lightly furrowed. No need to, to apologize. The past is in the past. Those embarrassing experiences that had once made her uncomfortable, she had come to accept. While she wouldn't reconcile with Zhou Anqi and the others, she didn't need Jiang Rui's compensation or apology. Besides, she already had Zhuang Qinyan as a complication. She wasn't suitable to carry another burden. I understand, she reiterated, there's no need for this. As expected he was rejected. Jiang Rui lowered his head, looking at the hand she had pulled away, and couldn't help but smile wryly. You don't know, you've never known. You don't know about that summer, when the shade covered the sun and a boy had once had feelings for you. He struggled to say the words I like you, and because of every wrong choice he made, he ended up growing distant from you, unable to get any closer. Squatting in front of him, Song Ku tilted her head, looked at him for a couple of seconds, and suddenly realized. She patted his shoulder, don't worry, I'm, I'm strong. She stood up, her thin shoulder blades stretching as she moved. She walked to the front, past Zhou Anqi and the others. Zhou Anqi clenched her teeth, her expression as if she wanted to devour Song Ku. Song Ku, are you satisfied now? Aren't you pleased? Let me tell you, I won't help you save him even if I die. I want all of you to go die. A faint blue light pierced through the darkness, brushing against the edge of Zhou Anqi's hair, slicing through her falling bangs. Clang! 
The platform behind Zhou Anqi split in two, exploding with a resounding noise, debris filling the air. Save him. I'll leave, leave this place. Song Ku maintained her stance with the blade. The throwing knife circled the area once before firmly returning to her palm. Zhou Anqi's pupils shrank in fear. Her legs shook, and she collapsed to the ground, too terrified to utter a word. Her master had once said that when reasoning failed, one had to rely on fists to determine the outcome. Well, it seemed like it worked quite well. Song Ku felt reassured. Chapter 23 You won't leave me, will you? In Hua City no. One middle school, at the storm-proof, enclosed stadium. A variety of objects formed piles resembling small mountains, filling the entire equipment room. Song Ku had only mentioned the need for materials, the more the better, without specifying any particular type. As a result, apart from heavy objects used to block the door, everyone brought over anything they could carry. Kong Zi Chi set down the last basketball storage basket and leaned towards Tian Yi, draping his arm around Tian Yi's neck. As they approached Song Ku, before they could speak, Kong Zi Chi gave a thumbs up with a grin, awesome. Even though this might be a little unfair to Princess Zhou, I still want to say, it's so satisfying. Tian Yi, caught in Kong Zi Chi's grasp, flailed his limbs in the air, struggling to break free. He kicked Kong Zi Chi hard in the heel, and Kong Zi Chi let go, clutching his foot while hopping and wailing, like an agile flamingo. Despite their daily play fighting, their relationship was actually quite good. By the way, Song Ku, Tian Yi asked me to ask you what those flying things that went swoosh 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 just now were. They were so cool. Kong Zi Chi, you were the one who wanted to ask in the first place, so why blame me? Tian Yi retorted indignantly. Oh come on, isn't it the same if you ask or I ask? Kong Zi Chi chuckled, then leaned closer to Tian Yi's ear, whispering, you're quite close to her, huh? Song Ku didn't keep it a secret either, taking something out of her pocket. It was a thin blade, as thin as paper, about seven inches long, resembling a willow leaf. A bright red silk was tied to its end. In the dim indoor light, the blade's surface was covered with a faint blue glow. Kong Zi Chi let out a whistle and his eyes lit up. For you. Seeing how much he liked it, Song Ku handed him the throwing knife generously. Really? Well then, I won't hold back. Kong Zi Chi was ecstatic and accepted it without hesitation. Joking aside, there was no need for hesitation. This wasn't an ordinary throwing knife it was a legendary supernatural throwing knife. It could cut through iron like mud and hit the target every time. Even if he didn't know how to use it, it was still great for warding off evil spirits. Song Ku, are you really leaving? Tian Yi asked in a low voice from the side. Yeah, once Shuang Qinyan gets better then I'll leave. Tian Yi's tone held a hint of reluctance as he murmured, oh. He was a reserved person, unable to voice his thoughts within the safe zone. Even Jiang Rui couldn't convince Song Ku, and coupled with Su Liren's silent approval, it seemed that Song Ku's departure was an unchangeable outcome. After Kong Zi Qi and Tian Yi had moved the things, they closed the door and left, leaving only Song Ku in the spacious equipment room. Faced with a room full of equipment, Song Ku's expression turned focused. She placed her hand on the nearest metal rack, and in an instant, the rack nearly two meters high vanished on the spot, transforming into three brand new entrenching shovels. This process continued with the second and third items. Like a meticulously organized assembly line, a large number of standardized weapons lined up in perfect order under Song Ku's guidance, revealing their imposing momentum. At the same time, connected to over a hundred spiritual tools, Song Ku accelerated the drainage of her abilities, and the immense spiritual energy gradually became insufficient, reaching its limit. With a thought, she severed her connection with this portion of energy. Almost instantly, Song Ku realized that she had lost her connection with these spiritual tools. This was her first attempt at cutting off spiritual energy. She gazed at the entrenching shovels in her hands, pondered for a moment, and released her spiritual energy again. After a few seconds, the newly formed spiritual tools were destroyed and dissipated, but the spiritual energy within them didn't return to her body. After severing the connection, 
did the spiritual energy become unidirectional and unable to be retrieved. In this way, these spiritual tools no longer required her effort to sustain them. While their power might decrease, they would be more easily circulated. Song Kung had left a safeguard she discreetly marked each handle of the spiritual tools. Based on their natural rate of consumption, the energy within this batch of spiritual tools could last for about two to three years before depleting and causing the tools to shatter and vanish. 100 Weapons Although this wasn't her current limit to bear, the enormous energy consumption over a short period had still put a considerable burden on her. Counting the shimmering spiritual tools on the floor, Song Ku slowly rested and drank water, recovering her exhausted mental energy. Considering the users were a group of high school students with no combat training, she only transformed two types of weapons, machetes and entrenching shovels. These two types of cold weapons were easy to handle and versatile, suitable for both defense and offense, especially effective against zombies. There were people guarding outside the equipment room. When Song Ku emerged, several key members of the safe zone walked over to her and entered the room to tally the quantity. Song Ku didn't move. One hundred weapons, no more, no less she had handed them over. How to distribute them was an internal matter for them. The male student responsible for tallying came out and nodded at Su Liren, who stood behind, Teacher Su, it's all here. With the deal completed, Song Ku couldn't be bothered with the insincere conversations and left without looking back. On the other side, treatment for Zhuang Qinyan was underway, but the situation wasn't going smoothly. Zhou Anqi seemed a bit queasy at the sight of blood. Zhuang Qinyan's broken leg was terrifyingly misshapen. Just looking at it made her turn pale, and she often had to stop to cover her mouth and rush to the side to vomit. Song Ku brought over a stool, sat in front of her, and stared for a while. Unexpectedly, she grabbed Zhou Anchi's wrist, and Zhou Anchi tried to pull away instinctively. But Song Ku's strength was too great her grip was as unyielding as steel claws. Just now, she had been intimidated by force. The tremble of fear from Song Ku hadn't yet dissipated within her. Even though she was reluctant, she dared not confront this ominous figure recklessly. All she could do was put on a pretense of strength and ask, What, what do you want? Song Ku's expression grew cold as she shifted her gaze to Zhuang Qinyan in the wheelchair. If you ignored his excessively pallid face, his features were still handsome, even at a time like this. However, from the knee down, his half-twisted, deformed leg ruined that perfection. Why is it like this? Perhaps her gaze was too terrifying, Zhou Anqi's teeth were chattering, I've already stopped the bleeding for him and tried to help the wound heal as much as possible. His leg his leg it can only be like this. To be honest, just keeping him alive is an achievement. From the surface, the wound on Zhuang Qingyan's right leg had indeed healed. However, when you touched it, it was soft and feeble. Inside, the broken bones were jagged and irregular, causing the lower leg to remain curled up. Did you do this, this on purpose? Zhou Anqi, overlooking her fear, stood up angrily, Song Ku. Stop spouting nonsense. This has nothing to do with me. His leg is broken like crushed ice. I'm not a doctor. How would I know how to set it? Besides, my spiritual energy was automatically absorbed when it came into contact with him. I couldn't control her words raced ahead of her thoughts, and she realized she had said too much, regretting it instantly as she bit her lip. Couldn't control her spiritual energy. Song Ku keenly grasped the key point and formed a conclusion in her mind. It seemed that her ability was insufficient she hadn't intentionally tampered with the treatment. Staying here any longer was pointless. Song Ku arranged Zhuang Qinyan's pants, pushed his wheelchair, and prepared to leave. Zhou Anqi timidly chased after her from behind, I've already saved him. So when are you going to leave? Tomorrow, check on him again. Why should I? Song Ku looked at her expressionlessly. In a space imperceptible to ordinary people, a domineering surge of spiritual energy swept forth like an overwhelming tide. Zhou Anqi's hair stood on end, and she quickly yielded, I, I understand. Zhuang Qinyan felt like he was traversing through a cold mist, surrounded by countless indistinct faces. They stared at him gloomily, closing in slowly and urgently, 
reaching out with pairs of hands to grab his legs, clutching his throat, covering his mouth, dragging him into an endless swamp, sinking together into oblivion. Just before suffocation, he suddenly opened his eyes. His vision gradually focused. Song Ku held a tissue in her hand, less than an inch away from his nose. Zhuang Qingyan's eyes turned icy, and his reflex made him want to wave her hand away. But he quickly realized this action contradicted the image he had crafted. He paused for a moment, then softened the corners of his eyes, crafting a feeble yet handsome smile. Song Ku didn't mind, and she hadn't even noticed his subtle change of expression. Seeing him awake, she tossed the tissue at him, Zhou Anqi has already, already treated you. How are you feeling now? Zhuang Qinyan lowered his head to look at his leg. The same oppressive feeling, like a bone abscess, returned. He soon sensed something was wrong. His entire right leg, from ankle to knee, felt as though it had been injected with a heavy dose of inferior anesthesia. Nerve cells were dead, meridians paralyzed, devoid of any sensation, and stiff like a crude prosthetic castoff. Zhuang Qinyan's eyelashes quivered as he braced himself on the wheelchair, attempting to stand up. Clang after losing a leg, maintaining balance became nearly impossible. He lost his center of gravity, tilting and crashing heavily to the ground. Worthless. He clenched his fist, silently spitting out the word in his heart. Enduring a whole day with his injured leg, Zhuang Qinyan was well aware that his situation was far from optimistic, requiring prompt treatment. Although he had taken a risk by betting his life, he was fairly confident that Song Ku would save him. As expected, he won the bet. However, he had overestimated Zhou Anxi's ability. This newly awakened healing type ability user likely didn't even possess a D-level power. And what's more, she turned out to be an utter medical imbecile, merely focused on sewing up the surface of the skin, giving no thought to the underlying structure of flesh and bone. Consequently, he had truly been reduced to a cripple. He clenched the wheelchair handles tightly and repeated the word in his heart, not knowing if he was cursing Zhou Anxi or himself. Song Ku didn't help him up. Zhuang Qinyan lowered his head, and the veins on the back of his hand strained. She couldn't clearly discern his expression at the moment. Zhou Anxi's ability is for stopping bleeding and wound healing, but her control is very poor. She doesn't know how to set bones. She pursed her lips and revealed her plans, she'll check on you again tomorrow, then we'll leave. What? Is this the condition for saving me? Zhuang Qinyan supported himself to sit back in the wheelchair and responded coldly. He was always clever, quickly inferring the implied meaning in Song Ku's words. Yeah. Song Ku briefly explained the events leading up to the exchange using spiritual tools. Her use of force against Zhou Anxi in front of Su Liren could be seen as a last resort, completely burning bridges with the safe zone. Staying here any longer would likely pose hidden risks. Even if Zhou Anxi hadn't made any demands, Song Ku had intended to leave anyway. Furthermore, her original intention for coming here was solely to gather information on Awakeners. After encountering Zhuang Qinyan, these issues were essentially resolved for her. Before we leave kill them. Zhuang Qinyan listened and lightly uttered these words. His face carried a smile that wasn't quite a smile, and that casual bloodthirst from when they first met, the one that had led him to kill two people without a second thought, resurfaced. Kill them, and you won't have that much trouble. Go wherever you want, no one can order you around. Chapter 24 You won't leave me, will you? Song Ku stared at him, not saying a word. Their gazes clashed, neither of them looking away first. As seconds ticked by, Zhuang Qinyan gradually subdued his smile. Just kidding, he leaned back against the wheelchair, returning to his lazy state. Those sharp edges of his presence seemed to have been but a fleeting illusion, concealed away. I just didn't expect you to be so unwelcome. This person's mood swings were too rapid. Song Ku couldn't be sure whether he had truly harbored murderous intent in that instant. Standing still for several seconds and seeing no abnormality, Song Ku pulled out a new blanket from her bag and covered his legs. Your leg, I will, I will heal it. Zhuang Qinyan lowered his gaze and glanced at her, allowing her actions. It's not that simple. 
healing type ability users are rare to begin with. Given my current condition, even having an A-level ability might not necessarily guarantee success. He wasn't intentionally making things difficult for Song Ku. To truly achieve a complete recovery, to be able to run and jump like a regular person, his dislocated bones and tendons would have to be shattered again, using spiritual energy to reposition them correctly. The precision of this process was comparable to a top-tier surgical procedure, something beyond the capabilities of an ordinary healing-type ability user. I will, heal it. Song Ku stubbornly repeated herself. She rarely made promises, but once spoken, she was determined to fulfill them. For a long while, neither of them spoke. Around them, there were the echoes of noisy voices, the patter of raindrops, but in their corner, silence reigned. Song Ku felt a sense of guilt, as well as a deeper sadness. She had taken this person in, earnestly vowed to take responsibility for him, yet she had messed up. Not only had she failed to heal Zhuang Qingyan's leg, but she had also burdened him with the need to follow her around again. I'm sorry. She hugged her backpack tightly, curling up in disappointment. After a while, Zhuang Qingyan spoke in a faint voice, no need to apologize. It's not your fault. Song Ku shook her head, her mood still low. You're wrong. They all, they all dislike me. At her words, Zhuang Qingyan's gaze shifted to the corner. Song Ku was crouched there, looking like a frost-bitten cabbage, her head covered by the continuous drizzle. She appeared wilted, bereft of her usual vitality. All of them. What did you do? Did you offend so many people in one go? He shifted into a more comfortable position, a hint of interest in his eyes. I remember D District implements collective education, right? Did you blow up the school? Or burn down the dormitories? Based on your personality, you can't possibly have beaten up everyone, right? Song Ku's eyes widened. How? How did he guess it right again? Feebly, she tried to defend herself, no, not all of them, just just a few dozen. Just Zhuang Qinyan drawled, emphasizing it slowly, a few dozen. You're pretty good at fighting. Just, just all right. In the midst of the prolonged silence, Zhuang Qinyan's light laughter broke through the awkward atmosphere. He turned his wheelchair and leisurely gazed at Song Ku. So, why did you beat up those few dozen people? Song Ku clenched the strap of her backpack with her fingers. Because because. Her voice grew smaller and smaller, and she trailed off mid-sentence. After waiting for a response for a while, Zhuang Qingyan's patience remained, his slender fingers tapping the wheelchair in succession. Lowering and then lifting his gaze, in the blink of an eye, his expression had shifted to a different one. Let me guess, our classmate Song here is so kind-hearted that it must be those people's fault, right? Song Ku abruptly raised her head, revealing two round, gleaming eyes from behind her backpack. She stared directly at him. With a smile in his eyes and an air of certainty, Zhuang Qinyan said nothing. He seemed to completely trust her. The taut strings in Song Ku's heart loosened inexplicably. After carefully considering it, she realized there wasn't much she couldn't say. Slowly, she began to speak, I used to go, go to school in Hua City. This was the first time she had proactively shared that part of her past with someone. Perhaps enough time had passed, and the feelings associated with that time had become distant. As she spoke, Song Ku unexpectedly felt a sense of calm. Three years ago, the Alliance introduced a new compulsory education law, merging the junior and senior high school systems into a five-year program and reallocating teaching resources across different regions. At that time, Song Ziyuan was already critically ill, yet he clung to life and, with the help of Old Chang's connections, secured a spot for Song Ku to enroll in school. This gave Song Ku, who had always been confined at home, the opportunity to attend school. For Song Ku, who had been isolated from society since childhood, going to school was a completely novel experience. And so, with great excitement, she came to Hua City. Hua City D99 District was a D-grade renowned city, and no. One middle school was the school with the highest enrollment in the newly established educational system within the district. Song Ku, the country bumpkin from F177 District, 
was like a drop of water in the ocean, attracting no one's attention. She was an inconspicuous figure in her class, her test scores consistently falling in the bottom five. Because of her natural stutter, slow speech, and poor expression, she didn't have much interaction with her classmates. However, Song Ko was content with this life. She attended school in Hua City during the week and traveled to Yu Mountain E-166 District for martial arts practice on the weekends. Unlike between F and D District, transportation between D and E Districts was relatively normal, and the costs weren't high. And so, just like that, by the end of the first semester, Song Ko's peaceful life was disrupted. At the end of June, during the scorching summer afternoon, after finishing her meal, Song Ko passed by the outdoor basketball court. The deafening cheers and shouts from the court attracted her attention, prompting her to turn her head. Right at that moment, a nimble figure flashed by her. Running, turning, skillfully dribbling the ball, followed by a high jump dunk. The young man wore an oversized white basketball jersey, like a soaring white seagull, his single hand gripping the rim for several seconds before landing gracefully, exuding confidence. Ah! Song Ku opened her mouth and muttered to herself. She couldn't fathom the point of this activity where a group of people fought over a ball. However, a sudden realization dawned on her as she observed the young man's footwork. This fancy footwork must be what her master often referred to as chickens die from too many moves. It looked good but was riddled with flaws. Placed in an actual combat situation, she could swiftly find a hundred ways to counter it. Unconsciously, she stopped in her tracks, her gaze fixed on the basketball court. A basketball rolled to her feet, and the youth in white stood in backlighting beneath the hoop. He called out to her from a distance, Hey! Classmate, can you throw the ball back? Song Ku cradled the basketball in both hands, looking at the young man and then at the hoop above his head. She thought he meant for her to do the same thing as he had just done, to throw the ball into the hoop. So, she responded with a slow, oh, and from a distance of almost 30 meters, she lightly pushed her wrist forward. The basketball traced a perfect parabola in the air and landed directly in the center of the net. The boys on the court, who had been chatting away and adjusting their wristbands, were left dumbfounded. Some even sprayed their mouthful of mineral water in astonishment, what the? The youth in white also froze for a moment but quickly jogged over and tossed the other basketball to Song Ku. Classmate, want to try another throw? Perplexed, Song Ku threw the ball again right in front of him, and the basketball once more swished through the net, drawing exclaims of amazement. A second successful throw, and it was evident she excelled at this. With a piercing gaze, the youth spoke up, invitingly, you have a good aim. We're a player short. How about joining us? Song Ku shook her head rapidly. No, I, I can't. Seemingly amused by her baffled expression, the youth's eyebrows relaxed, and a radiant smile bloomed from the corners of his eyes, revealing his pearly white teeth. It's all right, I can teach you. I'm Jiang Rui. Leading Song Ku back onto the court, Jiang Rui organized a game of 3v3. Although Song Ku's shooting was precise, she was clueless about the other rules, making her play utterly awkward. Patiently, Jiang Rui explained the rules repeatedly, continuously fed her the ball as he backpedaled and ran, and the warm sunlight generously embraced him, even favoring him with its sweat. When the game ended, Song Ku had transformed from a mere rookie into a long-range marksmanship wizard who could hit her target accurately from half the court away. Their opponents lay scattered on the ground, gasping for breath and begging for mercy. Jian Rui stood at the heart of the crowd, shining radiantly. He spun the ball in one hand, his sword-like eyebrows and starry eyes exuding a triumphant and carefree smile. Idle on the sidelines, Song Ku hadn't even broken a sweat. Not enjoyable, she evaluated inwardly. She thought this would be the end of it. She didn't even remember Jiang Rui's name. However, the next day during the break, as the teacher walked out of the classroom, someone boldly tapped on her desk from outside the window. Song Ku looked up, and Jiang Rui had both hands resting on the windowsill, his expressive eyebrows arched. Little Junior, want to play basketball together this weekend? Song Ku shook her head. No, I, I have something to do. All right then. 
Let's make plans for next time, Jiang Rui didn't dwell on it, waved casually at her, and before leaving, reached in and placed a bottle of chilled milk on her desk. Here, have this. You're so short, you can't even reach the rim. Song Ku wiped off her test paper where the moisture had smudged her name, furrowing her brows in displeasure, not noticing that in the back of the classroom, all the girls who had been fervently discussing cosmetics had fallen silent. Zhuang Qinyan, who had been quietly listening all along, seemed to sense something. He frowned and scoffed, tisk, troublesome. Song Ku halted in her speech, looking at him with a bewildered expression. Zhuang Qinyan lifted his chin slightly, indicating for her to look to the other side. The sun had just broken through the dawn, people bustling about. Jian Rui, wielding a trenching tool, was demonstrating its use. His tall figure was almost swallowed up by his enthusiastic fans. The lively scene made their corner appear even more desolate and ignored. You and him are not on the same path. The closer you get, the more troublesome it'll be. Jian Rui was like a luminous and scorching star, with all celestial bodies within his gravitational pull orbiting around him. Those lonely wandering stars, used to being adrift, would find themselves burnt badly if they accidentally fell into his orbit. Thinking of the unfortunate incidents that occurred later, Song Ku nodded in agreement. Yeah. Troublesome. Chapter 25 You won't leave me, will you? Meeting Jiang Rui marked the beginning of disaster for Song Ku. To the girls at No. One middle school, Jiang Rui was the unattainable North Star, the little prince of the Rose Stars, an existence that could only be hoped for but not obtained. As for Song Ku, who had the fortune of catching his gaze a few times, she became nothing more than a pile of filthy mud at the feet of the gods. At the start of a new week, Song Ku clearly felt malice coming from all directions. Dead snakes and mice were stuffed into her desk, her handed in papers were frequently soaked in ink for no reason, and her backpack. Left on her seat one moment, would inexplicably vanish the next, only to turn up in the wash basin of the restroom. Although the Alliance's anti blying law had been in place for years, it was as good as non existent in the remote D level city of Hua City. At the time, Song Ku had no idea what blying meant, nor did she understand the magnitude of the harm caused when evil was amplified. During that period, Song Ziyuan eventually succumbed to illness, leaving Song Ku an orphan. She had no one to vent her grievances to and no one to help her unravel why she was being treated this way. Before his passing, Song Ziyuan had admonished her not to stand out in Hua City, not to act recklessly, and especially not to casually resort to violence against ordinary people. Thus, Song Ko only disposed of the desiccated animal carcasses in her drawer, retrieved her backpack, and silently returned to her messy seat. From the very beginning of this malicious prank, she had lost her desk mate. However, the Blies interpreted this as a sign that Song Ku was enduring and acquiescing. This meant that the victim wouldn't fight back. As a result, those who were cruel became even more audacious, gradually crossing the line. One day, the most beautiful girl in class, three, the proud Zhou Anqi, like a peacock, cornered her in the cafeteria, flipped her food from top to bottom, and poured it down Song Ku's neck. At the time, there were many students having lunch, and even two supervising teachers witnessed the misdeed, yet no one stepped forward to stop it. Some saw but remained silent, and others pretended not to notice. The thick liquid flowed down her back, all the way to her heels, and Song Cook caught a whiff of the damp and fishy smell of the muddy mixture. She wiped the liquid off her face and belatedly realized, so it wasn't soup. It wasn't soup, and it wasn't an accident either. It was another malicious prank that had been occurring to her day after day. Hey, stutterer, can't even speak properly, but you've already learned how to seduce men. Zhou Anchi arrogantly tossed her plate aside, pinching her nose in disgust. I heard you're from the F district. No wonder you smell so fishy I can smell it from miles away. Hey! Come over here and see if she stinks. Stinks, it stinks terribly. Ha ha ha. Ugh I'm gonna puke. At a table behind her, Chow Yi, who had a delicate appearance, considerately handed over a tissue, unfortunately, it was for Zhou Anchi. Anchi, be careful, don't splash yourself. Each time, it was Zhou Anchi, the domineering instigator, 
who led the blind against Song Ku. Standing behind her, forever untainted, was Chao Yi. Their temperaments and characters were vastly different, but the smiles at the corners of their mouths and the malice in their eyes were perfectly aligned no matter how you looked at it. At the time, the homeroom teacher for class 3 was Su Liren. Song Ku stood in the bustling office, stuttering as she recounted her ordeal. Su Liren was busy grading papers, rapidly circling and marking with a red pen. When she finally managed to finish speaking, it took a while before he seemed to extricate himself from his busy state. He pushed up his glasses and said, Our class is about to conduct evaluations. Teacher thinks that it's better to avoid unnecessary trouble. It's best to resolve these minor conflicts among classmates. I believe you can reconcile, right? Moreover, have you ever considered why others are fine, but it's only you who's facing all of this? Sometimes, we shouldn't just blame others. We also need to reflect on ourselves. But Song Ku couldn't do it. No matter who she faced, whether it was cold sneers or the constant barrage of pranks, she couldn't reconcile. She only felt stifled, and going to school was no longer a happy affair for her. Now, people in her class were talking to her, but unfortunately, it was all insults and curses. Jian Rui still occasionally came to find Song Ku, bringing her snacks and inviting her to play. Because of her frequent absence, he complained a few words. He had no idea about Song Ku's experiences in the class. He remained the same carefree, radiant campus idol. At first, Song Ku didn't understand the source of the hostility around her. But as Jiang Rui's visits became more frequent, even she, as foolish as she was, could sense that this person was the cause of her troubles. So, she earnestly told him, Don't, don't look for me anymore. Naively, she believed that if Jiang Rui stopped looking for her, everything would return to normal. Jian Rui didn't take her word seriously. I just like hanging out with you. What's up with your hair? Why is it stuck with chewing gum? I'll get it out for you. The cool young man leaned down near her in the shade of a tree, clumsily pulling apart the clump of sticky hair. Song Ku turned her head to avoid his touch, quickly stepped away, paying no mind to Jian Rui's displeased shouting behind her. In the opposite teaching building, Chao Yi put down her phone, which contained the pictures she had just taken. She gazed at Jian Rui's departing figure, swiftly scrolled through her contacts, found Zhou Anqi's name, and clicked send. The explosion came swiftly. On the day of the outburst, it was Song Ku's turn for class duty. The boys in the class deliberately lingered, making loud noises by dragging tables and chairs around. Before she realized what was happening, they had surrounded her in a concave shape against the wall. Her classmates used the water pipes from the restroom, usually used to clean, and splashed water all over her head. Some got carried away, swinging iron buckets in their hands, one of which struck Song Ku on the head with a resounding clang. The classroom fell silent for an instant, followed by nonchalant laughter as if nothing had happened. The high-pressure water flow prevented Song Ku from opening her eyes and completely washed away her patience, making her increasingly aware. Grandfather had said that she should get along well with her classmates at school. She had tried, but unfortunately, she hadn't succeeded. But her master had also taught her an eye for an eye. If someone hit her, she had to hit back, and this, she could do. Song Cook kicked over the desk in front of her. She didn't think she was being overly harsh. She was merely giving back what others had done to her. However, when she poured the filthy water onto Zhou Anqi and Chao Yi's heads, the group of boys seemed to be collectively possessed. They all twisted their expressions and charged towards her. Song Ku hooked the mop with her toe, and the dirty cloth slapped their faces, smearing them forcefully. Her actions were measured she didn't even break anyone's limbs. However, this group of 14 or 15-year-olds lacked exercise, and after a few moments, they were defeated. What Song Ku couldn't understand, especially, was that she was just returning the favor, yet now these tormentors were writhing on the ground, crying and wailing in pain. Hadn't they ever thought that others might suffer just like they did? The commotion caused by the brawl in class 3 was too intense. Even people from other floors came running to watch. The front door, the back door, and the corridors were filled with onlookers, hecklers, 
gossips, and rumors flew like wings, spreading everywhere. Jian Rui was the first to receive the news. He rushed over in a state of anxiety, and upon entering the classroom, he was shocked by the chaotic scene of people sprawled all over the floor. Zhou Anqi was lying amidst a pile of trash, her school uniform skirt covered in scraps and dirt. She was calling his name while sobbing uncontrollably. Chao Yi's braids were undone, and she timidly hid behind Jiang Rui, gently gripping the hem of his school uniform. Senior, please stop Song Ku. She's hurt many students. Anchi's father has already informed the principal. If this goes on she'll be expelled. Jiang Rui's full attention was focused on another person, and he didn't notice Chao Yi's small movements. He bypassed her and approached Song Ku with a stern face. Stop. Jiang Rui grabbed the mop, which still dripped dirty water, and his expression turned icy. Do you know the consequences of starting a fight? Stubbornly, Song Ku glared at him, neither nodding nor shaking her head. Jian Rui felt a headache coming on. He lowered his voice. You've hurt people. Apologize first. With teary eyes, Song Ku stubbornly resisted. No. Suddenly, cries of surprise came from outside the classroom. Mr. Su is here. The principal and the dean of discipline are here too. Jian Rui grew increasingly anxious. With a strong pull, he tried to take the mop from Song Ku's hand. Listen to me. No matter the reason, fighting with classmates is wrong. Wait for the teachers to come, apologize first, and then. With reddened eyes, Song Ku pushed forward. Caught off guard, Jian Rui, along with the mop, was pushed a few meters away. The back of his head hit the wall hard, and the iron hook hanging on the mop hit his eyebrow, cutting open a gash that immediately started bleeding profusely. Time seemed to stand still, and everything around them fell silent, so quiet that it felt like one could hear the sound of blood drops falling. Chao Yi's face paled. Ignoring Zhou Anqi, who had fallen to the ground, she rushed to Jiang Rui's side in a flurry, using tissues to cover his wound. Amidst the chaos, the stern-looking dean of discipline rushed in first, his breath heavy as he shouted, Stop it all! Following him was the displeased Su Liren. The class teacher of class, three stared at the whole scene, realizing that any hope of this year's awards was gone. His gaze landed on the only one standing, Song Ku, his expression cold as a knife. Jian Rui's head was spinning, his ears ringing with screams and exclamations. Through his bloodied, blurred vision, he saw Song Ku's lips move slightly, whispering something. Then, she climbed over a windowsill and ran away. As the white light and ringing gradually faded, Jian Rui belatedly realized what Song Ku had said, you're just like them. Zhuang Qinyan fell silent for a while after listening to the story. He knew that Song Ku's willingness to share these things wasn't because she harbored resentment or sought comfort. The girl was strong physically and rather straightforward in her thinking. It was highly likely that, seeing him with a crippled leg, she decided to tell a more distressing story to ease his mind a bit. So you just ran away like that? He asked. Yeah. From that day on, Song Ku had returned to F-177 district and had since refused to go outside. Oddly enough, neither Zhou Anqi nor the school authorities bothered her afterward. Getting your frustration out by giving them a beating might help, Zhuang Qinyan sighed lightly. The governing level in D district is uneven. Without the backing of parents, even if you're in the right, you might not be able to explain yourself. Even if you caused a scene in the city center, I'm afraid it wouldn't change much. Song Ku shook her head. Throughout the ordeal, she had never thought about seeking fairness or justice. Su Liren said she was wrong for not letting things go, Jian Rui said she was wrong for assaulting her classmates, everyone thought she was wrong. Zhuang Qinyan scoffed lightly, wrong. Would this matter just disappear if you didn't act? If Song Ku hadn't hit Zhou Anqi, the blind from class, three would have continued. She couldn't endure such days any longer. At this point, Zhuang Qinyan's eyes slightly narrowed, veiling the destructive urge he had to destroy everything. You hit them because those people deserved it. Even if you were wrong, what can they do? Some people spend their whole lives doing right things, only to die in the end, and no one will put up a monument praising them for it. 
He reached out and ruffled Song Ku's hair. You're still a kid. Remember this, in this world, right and wrong aren't that important. Living happily is what matters. It was twisted logic, but Song Ku couldn't argue against it. This man's mindset was completely different from what her grandfather had taught her. Her grandfather had said she needed to assimilate into society, try to be like everyone else. However, Zhuang Qinyan seemed to not care about anything. Whether others lived or died had nothing to do with him, as long as he was content and happy. If it were you, what would you do? Song Ku asked. What would I do? Haven't you already seen? Zhuang Qinyan rubbed his chin and revealed that characteristic smile of an antagonist. She thought about the fates of Wu Yuru and Yang Bo, and her heart felt heavy. Unknowingly, time passed quickly. The sky outside gradually brightened, and a new day began. The atmosphere in the safe zone had also changed. High school students who received new weapons grew bolder, and a particularly large exploration team was gearing up. Song Ku stood up. I'll go out to find supplies. You rest well. They were leaving today. Song Ku intended to go out early to scout the route. When Lu Zixuan opened the door again at night, she would take Zhuang Qinyan with her. Before leaving, she poked Zhuang Qinyan's leg, and this time, he didn't dodge. Remember, go check again. Zhuang Qinyan didn't promise. Instead, he stared at Song Ku, his eyes filled with sorrow. What's wrong? I'm wondering, you won't just leave me here, will you? Song Ku rolled her eyes internally, thinking only someone like you could come up with this, I'll come back and pick you up. Zhuang Qinyan saw her off, much like a worried wife seeing off her husband. He leaned against his wheelchair, waving with a bright smile. Remember to come back early. I'll be waiting for you. There was something oddly strange about it. In a grand procession, Song Ku followed behind, as usual, keeping her distance from the others, appearing isolated and detached. She carried the massive spiritual weapon umbrella with her again. After everyone had left, Zhuang Qinyan returned to his corner and took out Yang Bo's wristwatch from his pocket. He lowered his gaze and examined it for a moment, then with a slight movement of his finger, seemingly imperceptible, a new set of clean clothes appeared out of thin air. After changing clothes, he checked the wristwatch and the necklace again. Yang Bo's watch contained only clothes and food nothing out of the ordinary. However, in Wu Yuru's necklace, Zhuang Qinyan discovered something unexpected. A silver miniature intelligent terminal, far surpassing Deep District's technological level. Zhuang Qinyan nonchalantly operated it a few times and destroyed its positioning device. Chapter 26 Insect Tide the watch Yang Bo left behind was actually a storage space crafted by a space-type ability user. The area wasn't large, around 20 square meters. Perhaps the level of the Awakener who opened up the space wasn't high enough to impose strict restrictions on entry. Anyone who released a trace of mental power could unlock it. This gave Zhuang Qinyan an unearned advantage. Before the apocalypse arrived, Awakeners were monopolized by the military. These personal storage spaces were only circulated within the military. Obtaining one from the black market would cost a significant price. Nowadays, even as the order broke down and more ordinary people awakened to supernatural abilities, these items remained rare and precious. Zhuang Qinyan was slightly taller than Yang Bo, but their body sizes weren't significantly different. He picked out a new set of black casual clothing from the space and took out a large bucket of purified water. He thoroughly cleaned himself from head to toe. After changing into clean clothes, he looked refreshed and neat, appearing as youthful as a college student who had just stepped out into the world. Song Ko was not around, and the overly familiar chubby guy Tian Yi had also gone out with the main group. The remaining people were all strangers to Zhuang Qinyan. However, he didn't feel the slightest discomfort or unease. He strolled around the safe zone as if on a holiday, manipulating the wheelchair to survey the entire area at his leisure. In his view, this place was not suitable for long-term stay. Although there was still some stored water in the washroom, at the current consumption rate, it would run out within three days. Yet, this wasn't the biggest issue. 
the safe zone had a fatal flaw there were too many wastes here. Wastes referred to those who lacked the courage to venture outside, unwilling to use their brains to find solutions. They spent their days whimpering in corners while consuming a significant amount of resources. Of course, this category also included him, the disabled person, Zhuang Qinyan self-deprecatingly thought. He didn't believe that Teacher Su was so kind-hearted. At least, he hadn't noticed any dazzling halo above the person's head like a saint. Su Liren must have his own motives for keeping these wastes. The metal wheelchair smoothly glided over the ground and soon entered the inner circle of the safe zone. Upon hearing the commotion, Zhou Anqi and Chao Yi both looked up and then visibly froze. Zhou Anqi was someone who focused on appearances. With the poor early morning lighting and being agitated by Song Ku, she hadn't really looked at Zhuang Qinyan before. But now, Zhuang Qinyan appeared clean and tidy. Facing his smiling eyes head on, she realized that this young man was unusually good looking. Regrettably, Zhou Anqi pouted. He was brought by Song Ku. Chao Yi waved gently with warmth and smiled at him, Hey, how are you? Hello, Zhuang Qinyan replied with a calm expression. However, Chao Yi seemed genuinely concerned about him. After a moment, she sighed softly, Song Ku is usually careless. You should take care of yourself. By the way, have you known each other for a long time? She had taken care of Zhou Anqi yesterday and hadn't gone out with Jiang Rui and the others. She only heard that Song Ku was the one who discovered him and brought him back when he was seriously injured. As for the exact relationship between the two, no one was clear about it, so she skillfully phrased her question. Zhuang Qinyan smiled quietly and replied in line with her intentions, No, we just met yesterday. We're not that familiar. I see, Chao Yi mused, adjusting her hair thoughtfully. There's something I don't know if I should say. Please go ahead. You probably don't know this. Yesterday, Song Ku angered teacher Su quite a bit. That's why she was kicked out. If she hadn't caused so much trouble and dragged you into it, maybe you could have stayed here to recover. Oh Chao Yi realized she had slipped up and bit her lip in frustration. I wasn't intentionally speaking ill of Song Ku. I just think you have the right to know the truth. She might have her reasons. You shouldn't argue with her. Ah, well, I should have kept quiet. I just felt it wasn't quite right. Zhuang Qinyan gazed at the person in front of him silently, appreciating her clumsy acting. Even though his golden thigh, classmate Song, was a bit simple-minded, her intuition was accurate. This Chao Yi, with her overflowing tea aroma, indeed wasn't a good person. He lightly tapped his fingers on the wheelchair, his deep and magnetic voice carrying hidden meaning, so, that's the situation. I knew we were doing fine, so why suddenly leave? Thanks for telling me. Chao Yi shook her head, you don't have to thank me. I only told you because I consider you a friend. Zhuang Qinyan supported his chin and smiled, since that's the case, how about you think of a way to help me stay? Chao Yi stammered, huh? Song Ku is too fierce. I can't handle her. You seem nice to me, gentle and kind-hearted. Help me figure out a way to stay and recover. I'll repay you. Zhuang Qinyan blinked at her, displaying a deeply affectionate look full of unspoken emotions. Chao Yi nearly choked on her own saliva. What could she possibly do? Why was this guy so shameless? He was acting like he deserved to be taken care of without a hint of embarrassment. Chao Yi awkwardly responded, You you're not serious, are you? Zhuang Qinyan looked surprised, I'm not joking. You care about me so much and consider my feelings. I thought maybe you. His face was full of accusations as his beautiful peach blossom eyes drooped sadly, and he covered his mouth in a heartbroken manner, you didn't need to tell me. But now that I know the truth, can you really watch me go to my death? How can you claim to care about me while not taking responsibility? I find you quite frightening. Chao Yi hesitated, at a loss for words. What do you call lifting a stone only to drop it on your own foot? What do you call stealing a chicken but losing the rice? She just wanted to sow discord between this guy and Song Ku, making sure Song Ku wouldn't feel at ease even after leaving. Yet, what kind of weirdo was this person? 
How did he manage to turn everything around and make her seem like a terrible criminal? No, blame it on Song Ku if you must. Why is this being pinned on me? Chao Yi rarely found herself at a loss for words. She quickly tugged on the sleeve of the person next to her, attempting to change the topic, Ayan, Anchi, aren't you still going to examine him? Maybe you should do it now. While the two were engaged in a tea-making showdown, Zhou Anchi had remained silent on the side. She supported her head, looking quite uncomfortable. Hearing Chao Yi call her, she could only weakly say, fine, let's hurry up. I'm not feeling great. After speaking, she stood up impatiently and reached out to touch Zhuang Qinyan's leg. Zhuang Qinyan abruptly maneuvered the wheelchair with a sharp turn, evading Zhou Anchi's touch. His left hand's finger joints twitched nervously, and a flash of icy killing intent seemed to pass through the air. No need. His evasive movement was quite sudden, and his disgusted expression was evident. Chao Yi, however, didn't notice anything unusual because Zhou Anchi stumbled forward a few steps, and then turned pale and fainted. Anchi. Anchi. Awakeners with healing abilities are very precious, and someone rushed up from the side immediately, calling for Su Liren loudly. Zhuang Qinyan was pushed out of the inner circle by the commotion, leaning lazily against the back of the wheelchair. He looked towards Zhou Anchi, who was surrounded by a crowd of people, and raised an eyebrow in surprise. Perhaps others didn't understand what was happening, but he was well aware. When an awakener faced external spiritual force, their internal energy field could become disrupted. If their own strength wasn't formidable enough to resist this impact, they could lose consciousness and fall into a coma. In severe cases, their brain's neurons could be damaged, possibly leading to mental impairment. He knew that Song Ku had previously used spiritual force to frighten Zhou Anchi, but at that time, she had been perfectly fine. It had taken a considerable amount of time for her to lose consciousness afterward. This didn't seem like the result of a recent impact rather, it seemed like an eruption caused by prolonged accumulation of suppressed spiritual energy. This was interesting, Zhuang Qinyan smirked. In this safe zone, aside from Song Ku, who else would have been prolongedly and oppressively using spiritual energy on her? After various back and forths, Zhou Anchi finally stirred weakly, but her spirit seemed somewhat listless. She couldn't muster the energy to speak. The others didn't discern any particular cause for the incident, so they could only attribute it to the lingering effects of her awakened supernatural ability. Chapter 27 Insect Tide At exactly seven o'clock in the evening, Lu Zixuan stood up on time and said, It's time, I need to get ready to open the door. The team that went out for exploration this time was particularly large. Everyone hoped for unexpected gains. They gathered at the door, ready to welcome the returning people. Zhuang Qinyan's wheelchair stopped in the slightly shaded area further back. He had nothing with him, only waiting for the door to open so he could leave with Song Ku. Lu Zixuan placed his hands against the wall and began to release his special abilities. Soon, the outline of a door gradually became clear and fixed. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and exhaled a breath. His expression became more relaxed, and he smiled as he pulled the door handle. The wind and rain outside poured in an instant, hitting people's faces so intensely that they couldn't open their eyes. Others hadn't yet seen the specific situation an unexpected event had occurred. A burst of crimson flames shot up into the sky, sweeping sideways, forcing the people inside the door to retreat continuously. In the next second, they smelled the strange scent of burned protein, followed by the eerie sound of crackling and rubbing. Jian Rui's loud shout was caught in the midst of the raging storm, the door is open. Hurry inside. Everyone, step back. A thunderous roar came from the sky, illuminating a large open space outside the door. Lu Zixuan, closest to the door, looked dazed. In his retinas, there was an endless and densely packed tidal wave, along with countless pairs of grey-white unsettling pupils. One by one, disheveled figures rolled in. Zhang Qi, Zhang Hao, Jiang Rui finally, at the forefront, was Song Ku. The artifact umbrella in her hand was fully open, with menacing spikes raised on it. The sound of impact echoed, and the umbrella surface kept bearing weight, pressing down, 
and pressing down again the noise wasn't the rain it was the sound of thousands upon thousands of living things hitting it. Some fish that slipped from the net crawled in through the gaps in the door, swiftly making their way inside. Jiang Rui cracked his whip, flipping over a section, but a few still managed to rush into the crowd. Ah! Fearful screams echoed, but fortunately, Zhang Hao and the others successfully entered. They had weapons in their hands, and with concerted effort, they managed to kill those things. Song Ku wedged the umbrella handle against the wall, rolled on the spot, and slid inside the door. Bang she forcefully closed the heavy door behind her. Zhang Qi's arms bulged with veins as he held onto the door frame, but things outside were increasing in number. The sounds of impact grew louder and louder. Others realized the situation and rushed to help prop up the door panel and the wall. They held on for more than ten seconds like this, but the supernatural gate gradually disappeared as it exceeded its time limit. The intruders were blocked from entering, at least for the time being. What what are these things? In the terrifyingly quiet atmosphere, someone pointed to the floor and shouted in desperation. Ten minutes ago, Jiang Rui led the team back to the side wall of the enclosed stadium. This time, there were more people in the group, and they had walked a bit further. They went eastward, approaching the outskirts of the city's outer ring. The supplies outside were becoming scarcer, and the survival conditions were becoming increasingly harsh. If they continued to roam around in the same place, they wouldn't have any gains. Fortunately, from yesterday to today, they hadn't encountered hordes of zombies. This heavy rain seemed to make them disappear. The safety of going outside had improved significantly. The team members were wearing raincoats, resting against the corner of the wall, either sitting or standing, chatting and waiting for Lu Zixuan to open the door. Several boys had a particularly positive attitude. They were shooting vlogs at the corner, saying that they would post them on social platforms after they were safe. They were sure to gain a lot of views. The heavy artifact umbrella covered most of Song Ku's figure. She had a pen in her mouth and was at a loss while looking at the spread out city map. Her geography had always been poor, and now, apart from the cardinal directions and a few circular traffic networks, she couldn't make sense of anything. Jian Rui approached her gently and said in a low voice, Before the network went down, I saved the locations of nearby shelters. Should I send it to you? No need, Song Ku refused. She didn't plan to take Zhuang Qinyan to crowded places, and besides, she didn't have a phone. Thank you. Jiang Rui fell silent. His hair and face were wet, like a wet dog pitiable and stubborn. Song Ku glanced at him and tilted the umbrella to cover his head. A few minutes later, she paused and suddenly looked up, Do you hear, hear any sounds? What sounds? Jiang Rui was puzzled. Song Ku frowned. She couldn't quite describe it. It was like the buzzing of wings in motion, or the sound of many feet walking on the ground. The frequency was fast, and it was extremely dense, causing her eardrums to pulse and swell. Song Ku looked in the direction of the distant mountains meeting the horizon. Apart from a black dividing line, there was nothing else. She shifted her gaze away, circling left and right a few times, but she found nothing. The next second, Song Ku abruptly turned back. She hadn't seen wrong that dividing line was clearly moving. The rustling sound was getting closer to her ears, soon becoming extremely close. Song Ku held her breath and focused her senses. The people around her were influenced by her serious expression and stopped talking, their expressions becoming vigilant. The grass in front swayed gently, and suddenly a large insect leaped out. The insect had black wings that vibrated rapidly and harmoniously behind it, as if it were flapping, and it flew towards them. Zhang Qi was closest to the insect, and his reaction was swift. His biceps bulged as he swung his machete, cutting the insect in half from its abdomen, cleanly dividing it. Black pus flowed out from the insect's belly, creating a foul-smelling puddle in the water. Before the others could catch their breath, the second, third, and countless more insects flew out. It wasn't a moving horizon at all it was a dense horde of insects. Several guys who were shooting videos stood slightly forward. Their steps hesitated for a moment and were instantly engulfed by the swarm of insects. 
Within moments, layers upon layers of insects crawled over their calves, arms, and faces. They emitted heart-wrenching screams, frantically trying to swat the insects away, but their movements became slower and slower. In the end, what fell were broken, blood-soaked skeletons. Get closer, everyone. Jiang Rui's ring emitted a red light, and a massive whip of fire shot up into the sky, pushing back a part of the insect vanguard. The remaining people quickly raised their weapons, standing in formation to defend themselves. After devouring the flesh and blood, countless pairs of compound eyes among the insects quivered slightly, then they turned their gaze towards Jiang Rui and the others, locking onto their next prey. The commotion outside the door gradually subsided, but inside the safe zone, it was a deathly silence. What on earth what the hell are these things? The shattered remains of insects on the ground were about the size of a volleyball, oval-shaped, entirely brown-black in color. They had two long antennae on their heads and cloudy gray compound eyes. They bore a striking resemblance to the mutated zombies. Just looking at them was enough to send shivers down one spine. These are cockroaches, Chuang Qingyan suddenly spoke from his wheelchair. The crowd showed a puzzled expression. Flattened body, dark brown, medium-sized, long filamentous antennae, well-developed compound eyes, membranous wings in front and back. Based on the biological data from the ancient civilization, these are cockroaches, commonly known as roaches. Most people still looked bewildered, but a boy with good academic performance remembered something, but didn't cockroaches go extinct a long time ago? He was someone who enjoyed studying prehistoric creatures. Recalling the books he had read, he furrowed his brow and said, according to the Alliance records, cockroaches went extinct in the fourth year of the new era. And besides, how could there be such huge cockroaches? Normal cockroaches were no more than a few centimeters long. The ones before them were nearly the size of a volleyball. Zhuang Qinyan wrapped a stick with a tissue and flipped over the bodies on the ground. Because these are mutated cockroaches, you could also think of them as zombie cockroaches. Like zombies, they feast on carrion, and they possess the characteristics of cockroaches' rapid reproduction, fast movement, and appearing in groups. Rapid reproduction, appearing in groups. It was as if the sky had fallen, and many people, upon hearing this, looked utterly hopeless. Could there be any worse news? Dealing with zombie humans was already difficult enough, and now there were zombie cockroaches as well. Could they still make it out alive? Was there any hope of waiting for the next alliance rescue? Don't lose heart, everyone. Lin Xia's hands and feet were trembling, but she mustered the courage to console, these zombie cockroaches aren't that terrifying. Didn't we kill some of them? Someone immediately chimed in, yeah, they're dead, right? We have weapons, so we can just kill them. Exactly, one by one, ten by ten, a hundred by a hundred. Let brother Jiang burn them all. The teenagers became excited, each one shouting louder than the other, we have weapons, and we still have brother Jiang. What's there to fear? However, Jiang Rui's expression wasn't optimistic. Fire-based abilities were the most suitable for dealing with these creatures, but unfortunately, it was pouring rain in Hua City, greatly diminishing the power of his abilities. His true strength was less than 40% of its usual, and facing so many zombie cockroaches alone, he had no chance of winning. Amidst the clamor, Su Liren made a gesture to quiet everyone down. He pushed up his glasses, his face unusually serious, that's right, we can kill one or two, maybe even ten or a hundred. But what about a thousand, or even ten thousand? Based on our numbers, which one of you has the confidence to kill ten thousand zombie cockroaches outside? Song Ko frowned, recalling the densely packed black swarm of insects. It even seemed challenging for her. No one could answer this question, and the hope that had just ignited was quickly extinguished. Ten thousand zombie cockroaches that number was like an insurmountable mountain, crushing everyone's will. A boy who had narrowly escaped death at the starship port suddenly broke down. He angrily raised the knife in his hand and viciously stabbed the abdomen of the zombie cockroach over and over again, muttering, I don't believe it. It's all fake, all fake. There are no zombies, no apocalypse. Zhang Hao managed to restrain him in time, but it was too late. 
someone couldn't bear the oppressive atmosphere any longer and burst into sobbing tears. Fear and panic were contagious. Soon, the safe zone was immersed in sorrow and confusion. Perhaps there are more than 10,000, it was at this moment that Zhuang Qinyan spoke up. When you spot a cockroach under the sunlight, it means that there are so many in the dark places that they can't fit anymore. Everyone. Wu Wu. Chapter 28. Kongzi Qi shivered uncontrollably. Song Ku sat on the ground, cleaning her spear. Her spiritual weapon umbrella, previously used to ward off the insect tide, had been left outside the door. Moreover, the iron umbrella itself was too bulky to have an advantage against these small creatures. So, she transformed it into a pitch black spear about one to two meters long. She meticulously wiped the spearhead. Sorry, I should have taken you away earlier in the morning. Zhuang Qinyan shook his head. It doesn't matter. With this many in number, we would sooner or later encounter them if we went out. His gaze drifted into the distance, and he continued, this safe zone won't hold for much longer. Be cautious tonight. What you just? Hmm. What's wrong? Song Ku's spear-cleaning motion paused briefly as she swallowed the rest of her sentence. Looking up, she saw Zhuang Qinyan still smiling, seemingly oblivious to the recent incident that had sparked anger. She had come to realize that this person had a remarkable ability to infuriate others without even flinching. A casual sentence from him could make over a hundred people in the safe zone want to pull out their weapons and attack him. If she hadn't decisively intervened and pushed him away, someone might have lost their patience and attacked him. Troublesome, really troublesome. Song Ku sighed inwardly and didn't pursue the topic. Instead, she silently raised four fingers. Zhuang Qinyan looked puzzled. What does that mean? Song Ku explained, Yesterday, I asked one less question, so today, I can ask up to four. Zhuang Qinyan was taken aback for a moment and then realized the situation, finding it somewhat amusing. His proposal of three questions per day as an exchange condition was a temporary measure. Before understanding Song Ku's character, he had left himself some leeway. However, after the events of last night, the two had shared some candid moments. He thought that, based on the understanding that adults had, this unreasonable condition would naturally be nullified. It was just a matter of answering a few extra questions, and he wouldn't lose much. He didn't expect the child to be so serious about it, actually counting on her fingers. Zhuang Qinyan didn't need to imagine he could already picture it. He was about to admit that the restriction was lifted starting from today, but then he changed his mind. Continuing to tease her was quite enjoyable. Suppressing his amusement, Zhuang Qinyan said, Right, it's four questions. You got it right. Song Ku felt satisfied. Little did she know that this guy was quite mischievous. She even thought that she didn't suffer this time and became smarter. And she certainly didn't know that some people with no moral boundaries would even deceive a child. Drawing a bit closer, Song Ku asked seriously, are the cockroach mutations related to the apocalypse? They are, Zhuang Qinyan nodded. What you want to ask is probably the truth about the apocalypse, as well as how the supernatural abilities and zombies actually originated. Song Ku nodded eagerly these were her biggest questions. Zhuang Qinyan playfully teased her with a hint of distress, well, that's kind of two questions already. Song Ku looked baffled. Song Ku gritted her teeth. Song Ku raised her spear. Zhuang Qinyan coughed lightly and decided to back off, uh, calm down a bit. Put the spear down, and I'll talk, I'll talk. Contrary to what many people believe, this apocalypse wasn't caused by a virus. It was caused by radiation. Zhuang Qinyan's expression finally turned serious. Have you ever thought about why the mutation of zombies is so rapid? Why in different places, some people awaken superpowers simultaneously because in this apocalypse, there's no fundamental pathogenic strain or so-called transmission chain. Every one of us is exposed to the air, and the real culprit is radiation. Due to frequent solar wind outbursts, the current radiation dose has exceeded five times the normal value. The Earth's strong magnetic field has become chaotic and cannot withstand the sudden increase in radiation impact. 
high-speed particles and cosmic rays freely penetrate the surface and the air. The continuous radiation energy integrates into the cells of the human body, leading to genetic mutations. In this scenario, some people successfully evolve, upgrading to superhumans with explosively enhanced abilities. Others can't endure the excessive radiation, leading to rapid cell decay and the transformation into zombies. However, more people maintain a delicate and fragile balance, becoming ordinary individuals in between. People can mutate into zombies, and naturally, animals can too. Moreover, animals that turn into zombies often possess stronger aggressiveness, Zhuang Qingyan's gaze inexplicably turned colder, the Alliance has done plenty of behind-the-scenes animal experiments. Whether events like today's large-scale insect tide are due to fate or human manipulation it's hard to say. Zombies lack consciousness, and logically, zombie cockroaches should too. Song Ku recalled the bizarre bird she had seen in the martial arts hall. She vaguely felt there was a difference. That bird didn't seem to have strong attacking tendencies. Perhaps she got lucky. The big bird was already full. It didn't care about her, this little sprout. Song Ku shook her head to dismiss these baseless speculations and continued, if someone is bitten by a zombie, will they turn into one? Based on the outcome, the answer to that question is yes. Song Ku was puzzled. What do you mean? Zhuang Qinyan explained, I just mentioned that the cause of the apocalypse is radiation. So, when someone is bitten by a zombie, it's like undergoing radiation bombardment once again. However, this time, it's radiation that's already contaminated. Most people can't withstand this impact. Their internal magnetic fields go haywire, and they transform into zombies. Most people. Song Ku keenly grasped the focus. Did that mean there was a chance of survival? Since it's a magnetic field imbalance, there's naturally an extremely slim probability of awakening passively, evolving into superhumans. Song Ku pinched her palm, feeling its dampness. Unconsciously, her hand was sweating. She pursed her lips. What if the one bitten is a superhuman? Zhuang Qinyan squinted. What, were you bitten? The hair on the back of Song Ku's neck stood up like lightning. I, I wasn't bitten, no. Zhuang Qinyan couldn't be easily fooled. Song Ku felt incredibly guilty. To prove herself, she hastily extended her arm for him to inspect. The bandages on her arm were already removed, leaving a bare and unscarred surface. Not to mention her arm, the wounds on her back, abdomen, and lower waist had all disappeared. It had only been a short week since the battle at the martial arts hall, yet her body's healing ability was so fast that she couldn't believe it herself. Zhuang Qinyan lowered his gaze, his inquiring eyes seeming to penetrate her. Song Ku had just been caught in the rain. She had taken off her coat and was only wearing a thin t-shirt and knee-length shorts. Zhuang Qinyan's gaze swept from her delicate neck and wrists, all the way down to her ankles. The girl had shoulder-length damp hair, gleaming eyes that looked like a startled small animal, nervously shifting around. There was gauze on her cheeks. With her slender arms and legs, merely judging from her appearance, she could be categorized as completely harmless. If superhumans mutate into zombies, the consequences are unimaginable. Therefore, if discovered, even if there's a one in a million chance of self-recovery, they have only one fate. What is it? Execution. A cold, cynical smile played on Zhuang Qingyan's lips. The Alliance can accept sacrifices, but it absolutely won't allow the existence of superhuman zombies. Song Ku pressed her lips tightly, a chill running down her spine. Tonight, no one could fall asleep. In an effort to conserve power, only a few flashlights were lit within the vast safe zone. Accompanied by the ferocious winds and torrential rain outside, survivors lay wide-eyed, huddled together, trembling. Su Liren convened an emergency meeting, and attendees presented two different opinions, leading to a swift dispute. Let's charge out. Have you gone mad? There are not only zombies outside, but also tens of thousands maybe even more roaches. Are you trying to get killed? If we don't charge out, staying here is a death sentence. The radical faction led by Jiang Rui and Zhang Hao believed that they should take advantage of the situation before it further deteriorated and break out. 
Not far from the safe zone was the parking lot of the No. 1 Middle School. Zhang Hao had observed that there were several buses there. They could safely drive out. However, the risk of this plan was extremely high because even the nearest route required passing through two dormitory buildings. In other words, they would have to traverse through thousands of zombies, running about 100 meters. On the other hand, some people held conservative opinions, like Lu Zixuan, who believed that staying within the safe zone was the wise choice. The outer wall of this enclosed stadium was made of the Alliance's latest materials, rendering it an impregnable fortress. By guarding the two large gates on the east and west sides, those inside would be safe. They could wait for the rain to stop and the insect tide to recede before figuring out their next move. But when would the rain stop? Would the insect tide really recede? Lu Zixuan had no certainty. Chapter 29 Kongzi Qi shivered uncontrollably. The two sides held their ground, arguing loudly. However, the two individuals in the corner were unaffected. Song could gesture to both sides of Zhuang Qingyan's wheelchair, gradually concentrating her spiritual energy. In the palm of her hand, a dim blue light coalesced into the shape of a crossbow, which she mounted on his wheelchair. In case of an emergency, even if she couldn't attend to Zhuang Qingyan, he could defend himself. Then she picked up a piece of Shikima and, while nibbling on it, observed Zhuang Qingyan. Zhuang Qingyan was adapting to the wheelchair's control panel, forward, turn, brake, elevate, lower those complex instructions posed no difficulty for him. Soon, he was handling them with ease. Once familiarized, Zhuang Qingyan raised the spiritual crossbow. It was a lightweight repeating crossbow with intricate and complex internal structure. The accompanying bolts were around 8 inches long, and it could fire 10 in one go, making it virtually invincible in terms of short-range crowd control. Zhuang Qinyan lightly brushed his fingertip over the arrowhead, immediately causing a cut, blood flowing out. So, this is what you call a crossbow. How did you make it? The Alliance doesn't possess weaponry of this kind. An artifact from the old civilization. He quickly contradicted himself, no, this type of repeating crossbow had already been lost during the old civilization, right? Song Ku's eyes dimmed. The Shikima in her hand didn't taste as good anymore. My master my master drew it for me. Zhuang Qinyan had heard Song Ku mention that her master and her fellow disciples had turned into zombies. Knowing her current mood wasn't good, he didn't probe further. He played with the crossbow bolts a bit and smiled, saying, Teacher Xiao Song, how about teaching this frail researcher how to use this? What do you think? Oh. Song Kuk gulped down the rest of the Shikima, wiped her mouth, and approached to teach him. On the other side, the argument over whether to charge out or stay put escalated into a heated dispute. Everyone, stop arguing. Listen to Teacher Su and let Teacher Su decide. Zhang Qi, whose eardrums were tortured by both sides, shouted in exasperation. With a forceful shout, the voices of the people attending the meeting fell silent. Zhang Qi was momentarily surprised when did his words become so effective. He quickly realized it wasn't his words that were effective but rather that everyone's faces had turned pale and they anxiously stared at the floor. Squeak, squeak. Creak, creak. There was something moving beneath the floor. Lu Zixuan's statement was only half correct. While the outer wall of the stadium was indeed unbreakable, unfortunately, the ground underneath wasn't. Sounds of stone being gnawed cracked continuously. In just a few seconds, the floor suddenly broke open into a two-meter-wide hole, as if a hornet's nest had been punctured. A large number of zombie roaches flew out from below, crawled out. Impossible. They could actually burrow through the ground. The actions of the three awakeners within the area were swift. Jian Rui cracked a fiery whip, repelling the first wave that surged out. Zhang Qi's muscles surged as he lifted a plank of wood, pressing it heavily onto the gap. Meanwhile, Song Ku, like an agile leopard, leaped from the ground, spear in hand, precisely striking down each crawling zombie roach that emerged from the hole. Turn on the lights quickly. It's too dark. Zhang Qi yelled. The flashlight beams flickered inconsistently, illuminating the majority of the safe zone with effort. However, dark, 
ghostly figures still darted around in the shadows. Some responded by raising their weapons and striking with all their might, while others faltered, unable to wield their weapons effectively. Their fear grew as swarms of zombie roaches converged on them, gnawing and devouring from toes, shins, mouths, to skulls within a matter of seconds, leaving only bloodied skeletons behind. The light overhead suddenly dimmed, causing everyone to look up in panic. The skylight was now covered in densely packed zombie roaches, countless pairs of grey-white compound eyes coldly fixated on their prey, obscuring the last faint moonlight. Seeing the dire situation, Su Liren made a decision, we're going with plan one to escape. Everyone get ready, I'll open the east gate. Song Ku rolled back to Zhuang Qingyan's side, securing her backpack to her body. We we need to escape. Zhuang Qingyan swiftly adjusted the wheelchair's direction. Yes, I'm ready. Zhang Qi cleared the obstacles behind the door, and Su Liren rushed over to input the password. The long-sealed automated control door slowly opened again, and everyone scrambled to be the first to rush out. The people squeezed in the back couldn't break through, so they shouted to Lu Zixuan, Lu Zixuan. Open the door. Open another door. Lu Zixuan attempted to gather his spiritual energy, but the faint light sphere dissipated before forming. He shook his head at the person speaking, saying, No, this damn ability is useless at critical moments, I can't release it. However, the person who had just spoken stared at him in terror and pointed, Bugs. Bugs. The skylight couldn't withstand the weight of the zombie roaches, shattering with a crash. Glass fragments and countless black insects cascaded down like a waterfall, covering Lu Zixuan from head to toe and swallowing a few stragglers who hadn't managed to escape. Ah! Continuous, eerie screams echoed from behind. The boy who had been running at the front turned around excitedly, his face displaying relief from having survived. He called back to his companions, Ha ha ha, we made it out, you stinky bugs. His words were cut off abruptly as a lean figure in school uniform lunged out from the dark rainy night, biting into his neck. It was a zombie. The students halted, afraid to move forward. Beneath the shadowy dormitory, hundreds of zombies turned their heads in unison, their hollow pupils fixated on the group's direction. Flames ignited, shaping into a whip of fire that lashed out diagonally. It severed the heads of five or six zombies. Jiang Rui led the way, running forward determinately, stick close to me, get ready to charge through. Song Ka's long spear flew out piercing through zombie after zombie and roach after roach, like a long string of candied hawthorns. Jiang Rui's flames followed closely, burning a path through the encirclement. Zhuang Qinyan followed behind Song Ku, deftly evading. It was unclear how he managed it, but the zombies and roaches around him were noticeably fewer. A nearly vacuumed area formed around him as the center. Two powerful awakeners cleared the path. The students with good speed and physical endurance had successfully crossed the first dormitory building and the parking lot was faintly visible. Tian Yi followed at the rear of the group, wiping away tears as he ran. He dared not cry aloud. He had almost failed to make it out of the stadium. Kongzi Chi, W what should we can we make it out? He was lagging behind and relied on Kongzi Chi, who grabbed his collar, to give him a physical boost. It's fine. We're following Teacher Su. With Teacher Su here, there won't be a problem. He'll lead us out. Su Liren was also not running fast, staying three or four meters ahead of the two. A few girls and a slender boy were beside him. This small group of people was among the worst in terms of physical agility. Even if they pushed their limits, they still couldn't move very fast, gradually falling behind the main group ahead. From the side of the dormitory, a window on the first floor suddenly opened, and several zombies leaped out. Caught off guard, they collided with Kongzi Chi and Tian Yi, sending them tumbling. A few boys at the front emitted cries of agony, pinned down by the zombies who began to bite. Su Liren was also knocked down, rolling into the midst of the zombies. Just as a zombie with a gaping maw was about to pounce on him, its foul saliva even dripping onto his glasses, Su Liren's pupils contracted. The two girls beside him cried out, Teacher Su. Their voices abruptly ceased. 
as if invisible hands were choking their necks, their expressions twisted and their bodies convulsed violently. Gradually, their movement slowed, and their bodies eerily toppled backwards. Seizing the opportunity, Su Liren yanked them, pushing the two into the mouths of the zombies. Using the recoil, he struggled to get up, without even looking back as he continued to run forward, desperately trying to catch up with the group ahead. In the middle of his sprint, Su Liren felt a sensation and swiftly turned his head to glance back. The two girls had been savaged by the zombies, their appearances unrecognizable. Not far behind them, Kong Zi Chi reflexively pushed down Tian Yi's head, making him lie face down on the ground, using his own body to shield him. Kong Zi Chi lifted his head, meeting Su Liren's gaze. The eyes behind the lenses held no warmth. Kong Zi Chi shivered uncontrollably. Chapter, 30 The Fake Holy Father Song Ku and Jiang Rui held the entrance of the parking lot. The engine of the bus behind them roared, and the headlights in front flickered, casting a dim light through the pouring rain. People kept rushing over, putting all their strength to climb onto the bus, collapsing onto the seats, gasping for air. At this critical moment of life and death, no one cared about their appearance anymore it was considered fortunate to save one's own life. Song Ku and Jiang Rui waited for a full five minutes, but very few of the expected arrivals made it here. No one's coming, let's go, Jiang Rui closed his eyes, his voice hoarse. Due to the sudden attack of the zombie cockroaches, their escape this time was rushed, resulting in more casualties than anticipated. Out of the originally over 100 people, almost half were lost, leaving less than 50. Jiang Rui clenched the whip of fire in his hand and at that moment, he realized very clearly that he couldn't save everyone. Any movement in the rainy night would be magnified infinitely. From their direction, a faint light penetrated and caught the attention of the dark creatures. On the playground a hundred meters away, thousands of zombies raised their heads and started moving toward them. Hurry, get on, we're closing the door. Zhang Hao leaned half his body out of the driver's window and shouted at them. Wait! Song Ku slammed her palm against the bus door. She saw Kong Zi Chi and Tian Yi stumbling towards them, followed by several hideous looking zombies and a tide of cockroaches. Her wrist moved slightly, the spear flew out like lightning, and with incredible speed, it pierced through the enemies. Song Ku sprinted forward, using a move called Whirlwind Snow Sweep, creating a powerful airwave that knocked down the pursuing zombies and cockroaches, giving them a momentary buffer. Kong Zi Chi and Tian Yi scrambled and managed to get onto the bus. Let's go! Zhang Hao roared, started the engine, and in the rainy night, the bus swerved and accelerated. It crashed into the path, overturning the zombies and cockroaches in its way. It then rushed through a gap in the iron fence and onto the road. After more than ten minutes, they finally shook off the densely packed pursuers. The bus was an old model with hybrid power. Even if it lost its automatic driving energy, it could still be manually controlled. In recent years, automated driving had become popular in the Alliance, and fewer and fewer people were getting driver's licenses. Zhang Hao had repeated a year and was two years older than them. Last year, he had casually taken a driver's license for fun, never imagining that this seemingly useless skill would become a life-saving straw. It normally takes about two hours to drive from No one middle school to the downtown area of Hua City. However, it was raining now, visibility was poor at night, and there might be zombies and insect swarms appearing at any moment. Zhang Hao didn't dare to be careless. He slowed down and drove forward vigilantly. Three hours later, the bus neared the city area of Hua City, and Zhang Hao was the first to notice that something was off. It was nearly five o'clock in the morning, but the highway was still packed. Many private cars were heading in the same direction as them, all rushing towards the city. They were being chased by zombies and insect swarms so why were these people doing the same thing? Why were they heading back to the city at this time? Thump, thump, thump. A series of intense pounding sounds shattered the silence, and the people in the bus looked out immediately, startled. A young woman was pressed against their bus, weaving through the traffic without any care. Her shoes were gone her toes covered in blood. She ran while desperately pounding on the bus door. From her lip movements, you could faintly make out the words, help me. 
Her actions were extremely dangerous. Lin Xia's face showed sympathy, should we save her? Zhou Anqi suddenly stood up, her voice sharp and cold, don't open the door. Her sudden shout startled the others. No one spoke, and no one moved. They all sat stiffly in their seats, as if the person outside didn't exist. The woman saw that the bus door was not opening, and the light in her eyes gradually dimmed, eventually giving way to despair. The people on the bus averted their gazes. Several fierce zombies stomped on the roof of the car, leaped from the other side, and pounced on the young woman. Looking from the rear window, her outstretched hand gradually fell. Look at this. She's been bitten. We can't let her on, Zhou Anxi muttered nervously to herself, we can't let her on. In the back row of the bus, Song Ku was observing the outside environment when she heard the commotion and turned her head. Zhuang Qinyan approached her, his voice soft, don't you think she's too noisy? Song Ku was briefly taken aback and upon closer thought, it was indeed the case. Since Zhou Anxi awakened her ability, it seemed like her emotions had become increasingly uncontrollable. She either shouted loudly at the slightest provocation or spoke incoherently, making it hard to comprehend. Someone is controlling her using spiritual power. Zhou Anqi is an E-level awakener someone who can silently influence her behavior and character, the other party is at least a C-level awakener with mental ability. Care to guess who's the one behind the scenes? Zhuang Qingyan's breath was close, and the warm air made Song Ku's ears itchy. When did this person get so close? Song Ku extended two fingers, pushed him away with a slightly disgusted expression, thought for a moment, and provided an answer. Su Li Ren she recalled the peculiar sensation when she locked eyes with Su Liren on the first day she arrived in the safe zone. At that time, Su Liren must have released his mental ability to try to influence her, but he failed. This led him to suspect that she was an awakener, and thus began the various tests and manipulations. After realizing that Song Ku was difficult to control, he seemed eager to drive her out of the safe zone. Bingo! Zhuang Qinyan snapped his fingers. He can control even E-level awakeners of course, he wouldn't spare ordinary people. In his eyes, these people are all his puppets, expendable scapegoats when necessary. No wonder he's willing to keep so many wastes. This Mr. Su is a complete fake holy father, the true hypocrite. At the mention, Song Ku looked at Su Liren. He was sitting in the front row of the bus, his frameless glasses set aside with visible cracks. He was wiping his face with a towel, his current expression unclear. Zhuang Qinyan followed her gaze, saying, You want to expose his true identity? Don't forget, we're the outcasts. They won't believe your accusations. Don't worry, Su Liren's tricks can deceive all of you those naive high schoolers because they were all in a safe environment. But the more life and death situations arise, the more his sinister thoughts will be revealed. At 5.40 in the early morning, the bus entered the inner ring of Hua City. The sky was as gloomy as if it hadn't even lit up yet. The city was in chaos, with collapsed buildings from impacts, debris and wreckage of starships scattered around, and the piercing sound of air raid sirens echoing through the streets and alleys. This is a level 1 alert, Kongzi Chi stood up, gripping the back of the chair with a serious expression. My dad is the designer of the Bagua Formation. He once said that a level 1 alert only sounds when Hua City experiences the most severe natural disasters. Lin Xia added with a pale face, I've participated in safety drills in Hua City. I remember that the highest priority order during a level 1 alert is to enter the Bagua Formation as quickly as possible. That's right, the Bagua Formation is Hua City's last line of defense. Once activated, it means the outer perimeter of Hua City is completely abandoned. Hua City is naturally a basin-like terrain, with lower elevation in the center. The concentric transportation network extends downward layer by layer, reaching the central eye of the Bagua Formation and Airborne Mall, also the most famous landmark in Hua City. Whether day or night, it shines brightly and is bustling. When Hua City faces an unstoppable disaster, the eight entrances leading to the eye of the formation will close urgently. The entire Bagua Formation will hide underground, forming excellent air raid shelters. Kongzi Chi listened carefully to the frequency of the alerts, becoming anxious. 
Quick, Zhang Hao. Drive forward quickly. The entrance is about to close. In the distant sky, the floating mall was slowly descending. As the alarm became more urgent, enormous cracks appeared all around the ground, making way for its descent. Zhang Hao pressed the accelerator like mad, rushing forward. The streets were filled with people running in panic, various vehicles, and the ever-present shadows of zombies, making it nearly impossible to move. Even the survivors who had been hiding in their homes came out, desperately sprinting toward the various entrances of the Bagua formation. The entire Hua city was in the process of falling. The cracks in the ground grew deeper and deeper. Tall buildings and circular skybridges lost their support, swaying and collapsing, crashing heavily to the ground. Suddenly, a steel bar pierced through the bus's window. The glass shattered like a spider's web, and wandering zombies crawled in through the window. They grabbed Lin Xia's arm and pulled her out. She didn't even have time to scream before she was dragged out. The others inside the bus looked bewildered, not knowing whether to save her or not, but Song Ku had already jumped out right after her. Zhang Hao, slow down. Jiang Rui stood up suddenly. Zhang Hao was nervous and sweating profusely. He clenched his teeth and pressed the brakes hard. In midair, Song Ku had already swung out her spear. In one swift motion, the spear was like a snake darting out of its hole, its tip like a snake's fong, piercing through the zombie's head in an instant, firmly pinning it to the ground. Then, she swiftly picked up Lin Xia, ran, and with one hand, grabbed onto the window, flipping back into the bus. Lin Xia tightened her grip on Song Ku's arm, trembling uncontrollably. Luckily, she was wearing long sleeves and pants today, and she had put on a thick raincoat on top. Apart from a few scratches from the fall, she hadn't been bitten by the zombies. However, with this delay, the crack from behind had already caught up to the bus's wheels. Ah! Zhang Hao pushed the accelerator to the floor, and the bus lost control, swerving forward. The intense acceleration made the passengers dizzy and disoriented. Amidst the chaos inside the cabin, Kong Zi Qi grabbed Tian Yi's shoulder. Tian Yi, Tian Yi, listen to me. After entering the Bagua formation, there's a hidden door inside. It's right below the main control room. This is the life gate of the Bagua formation, and it's the most crucial design my dad was involved in. It's not on the map. I'm going to tell you the route and the password now. You must remember it. Tian Yi had a bad feeling, Kong Zi Qi, what's wrong with you you, you just remember it. I'll follow you. Kong Zi Qi fell silent. A few seconds later, he rolled up his pant leg. I was bitten by a zombie. Tian Yi's eyes widened, looked down in disbelief, and the next second, tears burst forth. On Kong Zi Qi's calf, there was a clear torn wound. After a few hours, the surrounding veins turned a dark black, and the whole leg had become swollen and festered. How is this possible? When did this happen? Tian Yi suddenly went quiet. He remembered just outside the dormitory building, when Kong Zi Qi had accidentally bumped into a zombie while trying to shield him from Su Liren's view. Could it be, was it that moment? Kong Zi Qi's eyes were red, during that incident at the cafeteria, I didn't intentionally leave you and run. I just didn't react in time. I, Kong Zi Qi, am not that untrustworthy. Plus, you're my best friend. Tian Yi held back tears, Kong Zi Qi, you're also my, my best friend. Kong Zi Qi wiped his tears, his expression turning serious. He glanced toward the front of the bus, did you see it? Yeah. Tian Yi knew what he was referring to. Both of them had just witnessed how Su Liren, to ensure his own survival, callously pushed others to their deaths. Remember, no matter what happens later, don't follow Su Liren. Stay as far away from him as possible. Kong Zi Qi took out the indigo leaf-shaped knife from his pocket and handed it back to Tian Yi, go find Jiang Rui or stick with Song Ku. Song Ku managed to save Lin Xia, so she definitely won't abandon you. Tian Yi held on to his sleeve, Kong Zi Qi, let's think of a solution. There must be a way. Kong Zi Qi tugged at the corners of his mouth, there's no solution, Tian Yi. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. Look, my hand isn't listening to me anymore. 
His eyes were bloodshot, and the base of his nails had a faint grayish-white hue. His fingers were twitching uncontrollably. I want to live too. I want to remain human. I don't want to turn into a zombie. Komzi Chi's smile was uglier than crying. Tian Yi, you must stay alive. Chapter, 31 True Heroes On the shattered ground, a bus wobbled and slid forward. At the center of the formation, there was a floating mall with eight glass suspension bridges, each connecting to one of eight entrances, Qian, Kuan, Kan, Li, Zhen, Sun, Zhen, and Dui. The entrance closest to them was the Kuan Gate. Zhang Hao tightly gripped the steering wheel, driving the bus towards the direction of the suspension bridge. With less than 50 meters remaining, an unexpected event occurred. A high-rise office building suddenly crumbled and collapsed, falling directly in their path. Zhang Hao slammed the brakes, but the bus was moving too fast, already out of control. It executed a 180-degree sideways drift, spinning wildly around bends, causing passengers inside to see the world spinning, their insides almost shifting. Boom! Tons of steel and concrete came crashing down, hitting the middle of the bus precisely, splitting it into two. The people seated in the middle were instantly crushed into a bloody pulp. Zhou Anqi and Chao Yi were sitting in the rear seats among those people. Zhang Qi acted swiftly, covering Zhou Anqi's eyes. Chao Yi, however, wasn't as fortunate. Confronted with the approach of death, she witnessed people who were once whole turn into mush, smashed into a bloody mess. A suffocating fear surged into her mind, leaving her brain blank. The severed bus body experienced a tremendous force of impact, sliding in two different directions. The front half, with Su Liren and Zhang Hao, continued rolling towards the Kuan Gate due to inertia. The back half, carrying Song Ku, Jiang Rui, and Zhuang Qinyan, was pushed towards the direction of the Zhen Gate. Kuan Gate Zhang Hao's forehead slammed against the steering wheel, blood soaking his eye sockets. Amidst a continuous buzzing sound in his ears, he faintly heard an anxious shout from a distant place, Brother Hao, wake up. Wake up quickly. Zhang Hao was irritated by the noise, struggling to lift his head. The aftermath of the concussion was evident he felt an urge to vomit. After a moment, he managed to open his eyes with difficulty, only to realize that the one who had been calling his name was Tian Yi. Tian Yi's foot seemed to be trapped by the door, and he lay on the ground, desperately tugging at Zhang Hao's pants leg, trying to wake him up. Kong Zi Qi was on the side, pushing against the door panel with all his might, but his efforts alone were insufficient. Zhang Hao held his head, stood up dizzily, and said, Don't move, I'll help you. Tian Yi's voice was hoarse, tears streaming down as he yelled, Don't worry about me, Brother Hao. Run, quickly. Zhang Hao half crouched down and, together with Kong Zi Qi, exerted force. They finally lifted the door, but the significant movement caused his dizziness to worsen. He had to lean against the front windshield, gasping heavily. Where are the others? What happened to all of you? Before he could finish speaking, Zhang Hao's eyes suddenly widened, shocked and speechless at the strange scene before him. The floating mall ahead had descended below ground level. The Kuan Gate suspension bridge was gradually retracting, but at the gap between the ground and the bridge, there was actually a road built from people, forming a living ladder. Some were natives running towards the entrance, but most were survivors from their bus. Once their comrades, now each of them had a vacant expression, mechanically moving forward, using their bodies to construct an escape ladder. Behind this group of people, Su Liren stood abruptly, his face dark and gloomy, resembling a corpse driver. The people in the safe zone, to varying degrees, had been subjected to mental suggestions by Su Liren, making them easier to manipulate. However, even this was pushing the limits of his mental ability. Dividing his focus to control ordinary people would likely overwhelm his mental strength. No, he absolutely, absolutely couldn't die here. He was so close, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. One more person, just one more to fill the gap, Su Liren's expression grew anxious as his eyes scanned around. Then he spotted the three individuals in the driver's seat. Zhang Hao struggled to comprehend what was happening before his eyes. Suddenly, his pupils trembled, and all thoughts in his mind vanished. 
his brain became empty, devoid of any content. He stiffly stepped out of the bus, walking slowly towards the human wall. Tian Yi's body shook slightly, his thoughts gradually becoming chaotic at that moment, the willow leaf knife in his pocket flew out uncontrollably. A faint blue light floated calmly before his eyes. Tian Yi's days flickered and immediately snapped back. Brother Hao. Don't go over there. Kongzi Chi. It seems like Brother Hao is being controlled. Kongzi Chi was already half zombified, black veins spreading to his right jaw, making him look eerie and terrifying. Ironically, it was these zombie-like traits that prevented Su Liren from controlling him immediately. Kongzi Chi shook his head, fully aware that his human thinking was slowly fading. He used his last bit of willpower to take a few steps forward and heavily hit Zhang Hao's head from behind. Zhang Hao's head was already injured, and this caused even more pain. His vision went black, and he instantly broke free from Su Liren's mental control. Kongzi Chi pushed him in Tian Yi's direction and, looking at Tian Yi, shouted his last words. Run! Tian Yi's tears streamed down as he rushed over, helping Zhang Hao up and running towards the back of the bus. Su Liren struggled to do anything, his attention fixed on the progress of the human wall. Managing his puppets had become difficult, and he managed to steal a glance in the direction of the bus. Seeing the approaching figure, he furrowed his brow. What's going on? He had focused his control on Zhang Hao, so why was it Kongzi Chi coming over? Never mind, Su Liren consoled himself. Their heights were similar. As long as he could make it onto the last section of the human ladder, he could ascend to the focal point. Once inside, he could carefully scheme and continue to manipulate his puppets. Kongzi Chi's steps were sluggish, getting closer and closer to Su Liren. An abnormal whiteness faintly appeared in his eyes. He stiffly extended his hands, reaching out to the person in front of him. His arms were just long enough to touch the slowly descending gangway. Su Liren's heart eased. He could go now. Stepping on the backs of those people, on this ladder of bodies he had personally constructed, gruesome and blood-soaked, he couldn't wait any longer. He ran forward unhesitatingly, getting closer and closer to the entrance of Kuen Gate. Almost there, almost there. Suddenly, intense pain shot through his shoulder. Su Liren couldn't believe it, he turned around, and Kongzi Chi's face was twisted, biting onto him fiercely. Su Liren's eyes widened, his body staggered as he climbed onto the platform, forcefully pushing Kongzi Chi away. Kongzi Chi's arms left the gangway, taking the entire string of people down with him. Trembling, Su Liren unbuttoned his collar. There was a bleeding, distinct bite mark on his shoulder. Kuen Gate. The situation at Kuen Gate was even worse. This place used to be the main street of a commercial district, bustling day and night even before doomsday. Now, it had amassed the largest number of zombies. Coupled with the fact that most of the gangway had been torn away by zombies, the fragmented terrain had formed steep cliffs, making conventional methods utterly impassable. We don't have time, Zhou Anqi muttered, her face ashen. Zhang Qi turned to her, gritting his teeth. We have time. He frantically searched around like a gust of wind sweeping fallen leaves. Astonishingly, he actually found a trailer iron chain as thick as a thigh. He picked it up and dashed towards the edge of the cliff. As he passed by Song Ku, she lent him a timely hand, her palm flashing blue light, using her ability to reinforce the steel claws at the end of the chain. Zhang Qi shouted loudly and threw it, hooking precisely onto the entrance of the gangway. Anqi, you all go first. Don't worry, I'll hold on to you. Zhou Anqi stared blankly at him, as if she was only just recognizing him now. These days, her head had been muddled and confused, often unable to distinguish between illusions and reality. Sometimes, she even forgot things she had said and done. However, in this moment, the downpour seemed to wash away the water that had entered her mind. Her thoughts broke free from their constraints, and she had never felt so clear. Anchi, let's go quickly. Chao Yi tugged at her sleeve, her tone urgent. People who had survived until now, even the girls, had extraordinary physical abilities and determination. Otherwise, they would have died when escaping from the No. One Middle School. 
there were no complaints from the girls in the group. They held on to the iron chain for dear life and slowly climbed across the gap. After landing safely, Zhou Anqi, Lin Xia, and the other girls anxiously turned around to look at their companions on the other side. There seemed to be a dispute over there. Some survivors who were also headed for Kuen Gate had spotted their escape route and tried to cut in line. Jiang Rui's face turned cold as he stopped them, saying, let our people go first. Those who were still persistent pushed Jiang Rui aside and leaped to catch the airborne iron chain. However, they overestimated themselves. Perhaps they were afraid of heights, or perhaps the surrounding zombie cries had shattered their courage. After only a couple of attempts, their hands went weak and they let go. In a state of terror, they fell into the chasm, devoured by the thousands of zombies below. Zhang Hao and Tian Yi had gone through hardships and finally arrived at this point. Brother Jiang. Seeing Jiang Rui at this moment was like seeing a savior. Jiang Rui patted the backs of the two without wasting time saying much. Can you hold on? Hurry over. Zhang Hao clenched his teeth. Yes. In a life and death situation like this, you had to be able to, even if you didn't want to. Due to the collapsing earth, a massive sinkhole formed beneath the focal point, filled with countless zombies crawling up ceaselessly. The fastest ones were almost reaching the end of the iron chain. Across from Zhou Anqi and the others, the last group of companions was moving slowly, still some distance away from the entrance of the gangway. Suddenly, Chao Yi pushed past Zhou Anqi and went madly to dislodge the iron hook stuck in the gangway. Her movements were too swift and too aggressive, catching everyone off guard originally, they had all planned to deal with the zombies that were climbing up together. After just a few attempts, the steel claws loosened and fell from the edge of the gangway. Zhang Qi, who was already on the edge of the cliff, kept sliding forward. He barely managed to stabilize himself, but the support from the opposite side suddenly disappeared. Unable to stop his steps, he plummeted down from the edge of the cliff. Zhou Anqi's eyes widened, futilely reaching out her hand. Zhang Qi. Not just Zhang Qi, but also Zhang Hao and Tian Yi, who were on the iron chain, along with Jiang Rui of them fell down. Zhou Anqi couldn't contain her anger, rushing forward to give Chao Yi a hard slap. What did you do? Do you realize you just killed someone? Half of Chao Yi's cheek was swollen, but she still covered her face with a cold smile. Fool. The zombies are climbing up, can't you see? They're coming up, and it's us who are going to die. If you want to die, go die yourself. Don't drag me down. Chao Yi was terrified. She feared being crushed like the people in the bus or bitten by zombies. She knew Jiang Rui hadn't come over yet but wasn't she in danger too? Who could save her? She was only sixteen years old her beautiful life hadn't even started. She could only save herself. In that moment, extreme selfishness overpowered everything else, but she didn't regret it. Chao Yi didn't even glance back at her former companions. She turned around and ran into Kuen Gate. At the verge of falling, Jiang Rui whipped out his fire whip, looping it around the steel beams of the gangway. However, with both ends of the iron chain losing their supports, it swung uncontrollably downwards. Jian Rui's feet were just a few meters away from hordes of roaring zombies below. Zhang Qi. Jian Rui yelled in anguish. Zhang Qi had completely vanished after falling into the sinkhole. Damn it! Damn it! Jian Rui's eyes turned bloodshot as he cursed profusely. He truly hadn't expected such cruelty from a fellow student like Chao Yi, someone who was utterly indifferent to the life and death of others. The fire whip couldn't support the weight of so many people. It had already started sliding down, and Jiang Rui's strength was insufficient. His arms trembled, and he was about to lose his grip. In his gradually blurred vision, a lithe figure jumped over. Like a swiftly flying falcon, Song Ku moved rapidly through the air. In one move, she leaped onto a slanted lamppost, and in the next, she grabbed hold of a protruding rock in the middle of the cliff. Maintaining an upright posture, she moved forward like walking on a tightrope. The long spear in her hand had transformed into a nine-section whip chain. Utilizing the power of her entire arm, she swiftly spun the whip, then flung it out, 
one end hooked the gangway and then went to Jiang Rui's side. Catch it! Jiang Rui reached out, the scorching fire whip intertwining with the Cyan Nine section whip chain, inseparable from each other. Song Kuv exerted force from her waist, pulling backward. The people on the iron chain suddenly rose significantly, returning to midair. Next, she demonstrated what was meant by whip tossing from a textbook. With her right hand holding the iron chain and her left hand conjuring another long whip, she swung it in midair, catching Zhang Hao and the others hanging on the iron chain. Then, she tossed them upwards, the group resembling a silk-wrapped gourd, accurately landing and disappearing into Kuan Gate with a thud. Zhou Anqi and Lin Xia, still on the platform, hurriedly went to help them. Song Ku retracted her whip, then swung it again, throwing a few more people over. A third time, a fourth time. Lastly, it was Jiang Rui's turn. Utilizing the two entangled whip ropes, he swung like a swing and flew over, tumbling to the ground. In the next second, he stood up in a flurry and hurriedly ran forward. It was too late. The entrance of Kuan Gate was slowly closing before his eyes. The Bagua formation was descending rapidly, falling into the sinkhole amidst the encirclement of countless zombies. Song Ku. Jian Rui shouted with heart-wrenching pain. At the edge of the sinkhole, Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan watched as the Bagua formation fall with their own eyes. Zhuang Qinyan applauded slowly, a playful glint in his eyes. Heroic sacrifice, a tearjerker indeed. Song Ku didn't pay attention to his ambiguous words. She turned her gaze directly to his eyes. Just now, why didn't, didn't you leave? When Jiang Rui threw away the iron chain, Song Ku had suggested that he could send him over, but Zhuang Qinyan had refused. Zhuang Qinyan didn't answer directly. Instead, he spread his palm and caught the falling raindrops. Look, the rain has lessened. He smiled. Since the rain has stopped, everything should come to an end. Song Ku's brows knitted into a character. She couldn't fathom what Zhuang Qinyan was thinking, but she also didn't believe that he would give up his life so easily and wait for death obediently. Why did he always have to speak in riddles? Why couldn't he just be straightforward? Annoying, Song Ku grumbled unhappily. Zhuang Qinyan had a slight objection to her complaint. I'm not the one who's annoying. They are. The two turned their heads, and a swarm of black insects was pouring in from all directions, surrounding them. Nine Section Whip Chain Chapter, 32 Found you, little thing. After the central eye of the formation fell into the sinkhole, the surface of Hua City became a wasteland. Song Ku pushed Chuang Qinyan as they swiftly moved, reaching the rooftop of a skyscraper. This was the only tall building nearby that hadn't completely collapsed and was currently the highest point in the area. The elevated terrain granted them a moment to catch their breath. Looking down from the city's highest point, in the east, south, west, and north directions, an endless tide of insects formed a black expanse. This horrifying sight was suffocating. Song could deeply question what the top student had said earlier. Wasn't it claimed that cockroaches had been officially eradicated? Then what were these? Where did they come from? Ah! Rain still fell from the sky, transitioning from a heavy downpour to a drizzle, without any sign of stopping. The damp rainwater trickled down through their hair. Splashes of tiny water droplets scattered at their feet. Song Ku was dressed in combat gear, her posture straight like a spear. She zipped up her jacket all the way, pressing it tightly against her chin. Perhaps this was the most dire scene she had encountered since the apocalypse began, Song Ku thought solemnly. Even though Awakeners had extraordinary abilities, there were limits to human physical and mental capacities. She could face the endless insect tide alone, but there would still be moments of exhaustion, times when her spiritual strength would be depleted, and she might not return. However, hiding here would eventually result in being overwhelmed by the endless horde of zombie cockroaches that would overrun the entire city. She wasn't going to sit and wait for death. If hiding wasn't an option, then it was time for battle. Song Ku raised her hands and formed a tiger seal with her fingers. Sword cut sight, Slays ghosts, tigers, wolves, insects, and rodents, blow, pinch. 
Then, she pressed her two thumbs together and curled the index, middle, and ring fingers, while keeping the little fingers extended, forming a hand seal. The hand seals were intricate and incredibly fast. This was the Taoist secret technique of the Golden Sword, a technique representing the Divine Sword for vanquishing ghosts and demons. Song Ku was that Divine Sword. Of course, her execution of the technique wasn't perfect. She couldn't employ it in battle like Zhang Teng and Zhang Xiai did. At most, she could go through the motions to stack up a psychological buff. But this was the rule of the Yu Mountain Martial Arts School, and more importantly, Zhang Ting's rule. Song Ku had always been obedient. Different hand seals held different meanings during formal competitions, duels, and challenges. The hand seal Song Ku was currently forming men to fight to the death. Fight only, no retreat. With the determination to fight her last battle, she was about to take a step forward. Wait. Zhuang Qinyan grabbed her hat, causing Song Ku's foot to halt midair, and her momentum was greatly reduced. Zhuang Qinyan looked at her with a bit of a headache. Don't be so reckless. There's a way out. What way? Song Ku's round eyes widened. If there's a way, why didn't you say so earlier? I just confirmed it myself, Zhuang Qinyan adjusted his expression, speaking seriously, within this batch of insect tide, there's a king presence. Earlier, I had suspected that this wave of insects wasn't solely a natural disaster. Do you remember? The zombie cockroaches first appeared in the western mountainous areas, then followed you all to the safe zone, and accurately traced a path from the safe zone to here. Their actions exhibited logic, completely confirming my speculation. Similar to the relationships between male bees, worker bees, and the queen bee in a bee colony, the king within the zombie cockroaches possesses commanding authority. It can command and control all its kind. So, as long as we take down the king, the remaining cockroaches will surely become leaderless, scattered and disorganized. The Qinglan Institute had once conducted a secret biological research project for the alliance known as Plan Eternity. Zhuang Qinyan had reviewed the confidential information of that project, which included various experimental specimens of arthropods, many of which could be considered monstrous. Song Ku blinked and asked, but how can we find and locate that king? Below, in the dark abyss, there were easily over tens of thousands of zombie cockroaches. Trying to pinpoint this king from among them seemed like a far-fetched idea. Don't worry, Zhuang Qinyan slid forward two steps, I'll figure something out. The black tide had already overrun the surface of Hua City, crawling upward along the shattered walls and debris. If not restrained, in another ten minutes or so, they would have no escape route left and be completely consumed. Zhuang Qinyan's beautiful peach blossom eyes gradually deepened. The countless zombie cockroaches below seemed like faded black and white silent films in his eyes. His gaze swiftly swept around North No, East No, South Wait a moment. In a corner to the southeast, there was a cluster of filthy and chaotic black energy, that was it. Zhuang Qinyan made a quick decision and deduced the direction using the remaining Bagua formation on the ground. The sound of roaring thunder, Xuanfeng advance and retreat. Third Zhen, fourth Sun, then rotate to the right and move out. Song Ku. Zhuang Qinyan. They exchanged puzzled looks. Two seconds later, Zhuang Qinyan cleared his throat lightly and rephrased, go east first, reach the end, then head southeast for about 200 meters. Song Ku, once again. East? Where is east? And where is the southeast? Zhuang Qinyan. He saw a bewildered look on Song Ku's face. Had the collective education in District D reached such a dire state? At that moment, Zhuang Qinyan rubbed his forehead helplessly and attempted a third phrasing, head straight towards the three o'clock direction until the end, then turn right. Head towards five o'clock for approximately two hundred meters. The king will emit strong radiation. Pay attention to fluctuations in energy around you, he added. Song Ku's face remained expressionless, oh. She thought, couldn't he have explained it this simply earlier? Zhuang Qinyan, should he feel fortunate that Song Ku can at least read a clock? Song Ku carefully turned 90 degrees to face the east, then uncertainly glanced back at Zhuang Qinyan. 
Zhuang Qinyan nodded with a deadpan expression. Receiving confirmation, Song Kut tightened her grip on the spear with a determined air. I'll go and take it down. She leaped down from the high point. Her tiny figure crashed into the ground and was instantly engulfed by the swarm of insects. However, in the next moment, the long spear burst forth from the ground with an unstoppable force, flipping countless cockroaches over, their six legs flailing in the air. With just a single person, she defied an army. Song Ku supported herself with one hand, executed a mid-air somersault, and used her foot to kick the spear. The icy cold tip of the spear continued its assault, the blue light almost leaving an afterimage as it shattered the oncoming swarm of insects like fragments in the wind. One person against thousands. Song Ku had no intention of lingering in the battle. She broke through at the fastest speed, her goal being to locate the insect king. Near the Sun Gate, the magnetic field fluctuations twisted and tangled chaotically. Song Ku's steps abruptly halted. She closed her eyes, and her psychic power surged out, quickly sensing something amiss. She snapped her eyes open and looked straight ahead. Within the encircling mass of zombie cockroaches, there was one with unique patterns on its back. Its body was as round as a basketball, but its head was incredibly small, like a badminton shuttlecock, and it was squeaking loudly. Found it. Song Ku's face lit up with a satisfied smile. She released her grip on the spear, and like a lightning bolt, it shot toward its target. Surprisingly, fear flickered in the insect king's compound eyes, and it was about to turn and escape. Thunk the first shot lodged into its back. The shell there was unusually tough, and though the spear went in, it didn't penetrate completely. Instead, it left a deep dent, followed by a gush of black fluid. Swoosh the second shot. The insect king flapped its wings, narrowly evading the attack. Its panicked squeaks grew more urgent as it fled toward the nearest drainage pipe, intending to burrow underground. Song Ku couldn't let it succeed. Her spiritual power surged, and with the third shot, a blue light brimming with the force of a thunderbolt slashed forward. Thud this shot pierced the bug king's small head. It collapsed at the entrance of the drainage pipe, its antennae broken. Song Ku retracted her spear and calmly delivered another strike, ensuring the insect king's thorough demise. However, after the insect king's death, the surrounding swarm of cockroaches didn't disperse instead, they seemed to be provoked, converging on Song Ku from all directions. Before she could even be shocked, she was already caught in an endless cycle of battle. She could only curse silently in her mind, Zhuang Qinyan, you bastard. High up in the skyscraper, Zhuang Qinyan quickly realized that something was amiss. Why? Ordinary zombie cockroaches didn't have any self-awareness to begin with. So why, when the insect king died, did their aggressive tendencies not recede, but instead intensify? Suddenly, a dreadful conjecture dawned on him. Unless there were two kings. Not just one king. Within the bee colony, fortunate larvae could occupy the royal platform, enjoying royal jelly for their entire lives, eventually transforming into queens. However, there wasn't just one royal platform. If two queens emerged from their pupae simultaneously, a battle to the death between them would inevitably ensue, continuing until one emerged as the ultimate victor. What if these two insect kings were in the midst of such a battle? Zhuang Qinyan fell into deep thought. If he was one of those insect kings, he wouldn't foolishly expose himself. He would hide in the shadows, using the help of these foreign creatures humans to eliminate his competitor, and then proceed to eradicate humanity without any reservations. Using others to do the dirty work, huh? Perhaps the king that Song Ku eliminated was just the bait it released. The true commander of this swarm of insects was still alive. Amidst the patter of raindrops, faint sounds of movement seemed to echo. Zhuang Qinyan abruptly turned around. Cockroaches had already climbed up to the edge of the rooftop behind him. So fast. They had occupied the rooftop nearly seven to eight minutes earlier than anticipated. No, not all of the zombie cockroaches had arrived. It was only a few thousand, acting like a vanguard. When did he expose himself? These zombie cockroaches seemed even fiercer, their grey-white cloudy compound eyes fixed on him, seemingly contemplating where to strike. 
At this distance, even Song Ku herself couldn't ensure his safety, let alone save him. Zhuang Qinyan released his spiritual energy, rapidly surveying the approaching horde of cockroaches. None of the zombie cockroaches charging at him possessed the energy of a king. How was that possible? But Zhuang Qinyan, after all, was Zhuang Qinyan. He was stunned for less than a second before devising a strategy. You're hiding and refusing to show yourself, right? I'll make sure you have nowhere to hide. Even a low intelligence bug dares to play tricks with him. Zhuang Qinyan raised a crossbow and swiveled his wheelchair half a turn, pretending to aim towards the left with apparent clumsiness. He deliberately exposed a vulnerability on his backside, while the approaching zombie cockroaches mindlessly charged forward. Not on the right side, huh? He feigned defeat, awkwardly turning his wheelchair rightward in a panic, pushing it as if he were trying to escape, his retreat appearing desperate and disheveled. The horde of cockroaches behind him suddenly erupted into frenzy, collectively changing their direction to converge on him. It's on the left. Zhuang Qinyan's fingers danced rapidly, typing a series of commands on the panel. The wheelchair shot out uncontrollably. As the rooftop's edge drew closer and a fall seemed imminent, he suddenly swiftly turned around, his head snapping back. Within the chaotic swarm of charging cockroaches, a smaller figure stood out. It remained stationary, wings fanned open on its back, antennae raised high, and its mouthparts buzzing rapidly as it issued instructions. Found you, little thing, Zhuang Qingyan's lips curled into a cold smile. A sharp killing intent condensed into a thin line, shooting toward the smaller king at lightning speed. Mental force piercing. The tiny insect king, which had been hiding in the shadows all this time, was ensnared by invisible threads. It was suspended in midair, its small six-legged body swaying as if it were dangling. The intense and rapid mental force impacts caused its antennae to tremble violently. Finally, with a resounding pop, it burst open. Its components shattered and scattered, accompanied by bursts of foul-smelling viscous fluid. With the true insect king dead, the remaining cockroaches clearly lost their sense of direction, becoming a disorganized rabble. These lower-level zombie creatures lacked intelligence, rendering them impervious to spiritual attacks. Zhuang Qinyan raised the multi-shot crossbow attached to his wheelchair, taking aim. Dozens of powerful energy arrows whizzed through the air, quickly clearing the area. Zhuang Qinyan concluded the battle, steering his wheelchair toward the southeast. He lowered his head, gazing at the ground. The terrifying cockroach army was rapidly retreating. Amidst the endless waves of black, standing in the distance was a slim figure. She stood on a piece of debris, gripping a spear dripping with a malevolent aura. The spearhead pointed downward, dripping a black, murky liquid. Her whole body was covered in filth, as if she had been pulled from the mud, except for her eyes, which shone remarkably through the rain. Separated by a hundred meters, they couldn't clearly discern each other's expressions, yet it felt as though their gazes had locked inescapably. For no apparent reason, Zhuang Qinyan smiled. Chapter, 33 Please show your ID. Separated by a considerable distance, Song Ke couldn't see Zhuang Qinyan's expression clearly. She could only faintly make out him waving his hand, probably indicating that he was calling her over. Just a moment ago, when the swarm of cockroaches suddenly went into a frenzy, Song Ku had prepared herself for a desperate fight. Unexpectedly, as she continued fighting, the surrounding insect tide inexplicably receded. It was truly bizarre. She intended to go over and ask Zhuang Qinyan what he was up to. Song Ku holstered her spear, leaped off the rock, and walked forward with brisk steps. The wind picked up. Raindrops swirled in the air. From far to near, the muffled rumble of thunder approached. Song Ku's footsteps gradually slowed down, and suddenly she turned her head. She sensed a strong surge of spiritual energy. In just a few seconds, a phenomenon emerged. Dark clouds churned on the horizon, and thousands of purple lightning bolts struck down. The ground was filled with swirling sand and dirt, forming mounds resembling old Mongolian yurts, entrapping the scattered and fleeing cockroach swarm. Following closely, heavy snow filled the air, and a multitude of ice spears rained down, freezing countless cockroaches in their tracks. Those zombie cockroaches were first struck by lightning, then buried in dirt, 
and finally frozen. No matter how many there were, they couldn't withstand the onslaught of various natural disasters. They fell in waves, like wheat cleanly harvested. Such commotion could only be created by those with supernatural abilities. After the unknown awakeners finished off the cockroaches, they didn't stop. Several tall individuals carrying large equipment swiftly jumped onto a nearby slope. There, they set up mobile artillery that Song Ku had never seen before sleek and futuristic in design. Boom, boom, boom deep red super particle shells were fired in unison, smashing into the zombies inside the sinkhole. The barrage continued, the smoke lingered, and for a good ten minutes, the sinkhole was filled with the sound of the cannonade. No more screams came from inside. Song Ku stood there dumbfounded, mouth agape, her eyes forgetting to blink. Zhuang Qinyan finally descended from the rooftop and found his golden thigh. What met his eyes was Song Ku, looking like a naive country girl who had never seen the world. He smiled, saying, it looks like reinforcements have arrived. Further along the inner circle of the road, four or five people were slowly pushing a massive terminal. How's the road clearance? A thin flat-headed man approached, asking the busy team members. Oh Yang Pei, an earth element ability user in the group, replied, the main road is almost crumbling to pieces. We managed to clear a few small paths, but there are still quite a number of zombies and insects here. Is this an insect plague? I've always been afraid of these things they give me the creeps. Oh Yang Pei absentmindedly touched the goosebumps on his arm as he continued, maybe I should go clear the zombies with Xiangzi. The flat-headed man, Maya De Jiu, whispered, they're just some mutated low-level insects. Get rid of them quickly, and don't let the captain see you acting scared. At the thought of their captain's cold face, Oh Yang Pei suddenly became spirited, as if infused with chicken blood. All right, I'll make sure to complete the mission. He diligently resumed clearing the insect tide. After a while, he stretched his neck and shouted in surprise, doesn't it seem like there are people ahead? Before the echo of his words subsided, the others in the team started laughing one after another. Quick, treat your nearsightedness, Oh Yang. You mistook zombies for humans. Oh Yang Pei spat, get lost. I'm nearsighted, not blind. And Chi Wen had just returned from the front. Upon hearing this, he snapped his fingers, and purple lightning crackled. Most of the survivors should have gone underground from here. How could there still be ordinary people? Maybe they're awakeners. And Chi Wen flexed his long legs, stepping directly over the pile of cockroach corpses resembling a small hill, and gazed in the direction Ouyang Pei had mentioned. Indeed, he saw two small black dots one sitting and one standing as if engaged in a conversation. Hey, there really are people, he turned his head to call a man behind him, Captain, what do you think? Go over and take a look, Wu Juamin said in a deep voice, verify their identities. Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan hadn't spoken for long when the group of awakeners spotted them and started walking towards their direction. A group of tall individuals, all around one. Eight meters in height, strode towards them in unison, indeed carrying an imposing aura. From the scene itself, an intangible sense of pressure was imparted, except that within this group of tall individuals, a boy of around a dozen years old was mixed in. He was taking small hurried steps to keep up, which appeared somewhat comical and discordant. Upon drawing closer, one of the men with clear eyebrows and eyes spoke, Both of you, please present your identification. Song Ku didn't move. Identification? What was that? She wondered she was an undocumented individual, and besides, District F never required such things. Zhuang Qinyan also didn't move, his gaze skimming over the silver insignia on the soldier's shoulder patches, lost in thought. And Chiwen frowned, thinking they might not have heard him well, and repeated loudly, Please present your identification oh. Little sister, you look quite familiar. Have we met somewhere before? Though his words sounded like a pickup line, there was no trace of recklessness or frivolity on Anchiwen's face, only a serious contemplation. Aren't you that person? The one from the docks. Captain, do you remember? Anchiwen quickly recalled and loudly reminded Wu Juamin. Oh no, why is it them? Song Kuk tightened her grip on the spear in her hand, nervously sidestepping behind Zhuang Qinyan. 
Her disheveled appearance clearly indicated she had just been through a battle the lingering fierceness on her weapon hadn't faded. Even a fool could tell that she was an awakener. The worst part was that she had vehemently denied being an awakener the last time, and now, she had been caught red-handed. Grandfather was right people really shouldn't lie. It's you. Wu Juamin walked closer, his movements deliberate. Yet, with each step he took, an overwhelming pressure surged toward Song Ku. Engaging with mutants, concealing one's awakener identity, leaving the safe zone without permission your actions have constituted a severe threat to public safety. According to Article 45, Section 11 of the Alliance's Emergency Regulations, I have the authority to detain you. Zhuang Qinyan looked at Song Ku. He emitted a formidable spiritual pressure, but she seemed unresponsive. Well, her eyelids drooped, her cheeks puffed out oh. She's unhappy. It made sense she had been so badly mistreated, unable to refute them, and she was probably feeling quite indignant. Zhuang Qinyan chuckled inwardly. He slowly maneuvered his wheelchair forward, positioning himself in front of Song Ku. Hold on a moment, Commander. I believe you might be mistaken about something. Wu Juamin cast him a sidelong glance. Mistaken? Do you have objections to the facts I've listed? Unfazed, Zhuang Qinyan maintained his composure and spun a falsehood, Commander, my friend here awakened as an ability user just last night. There wasn't even time to report, so how could this be considered concealment? While she had long been aware of Zhuang Qinyan's skill at telling lies with a straight face, every time she personally experienced it, she marveled at his thick skin. Wu Juamin's gaze was as sharp as a blade, and his cold expression seemed to convey, Do you think I believe you? As for leaving the safe zone without permission, ah, that's a misunderstanding. We evacuated with the main forces, but we just couldn't compete with others. We weren't able to get into the Bagua formation and ended up being unlucky to be left outside. And engaging with mutants, Zhuang Qinyan lifted an eyebrow, his tone light and unhurried, what law has she violated? The Alliance has never introduced any legislation concerning mutants. Or, are you using the internal discipline of the Azure Phoenix to hold a civilian accountable? Wu Juamin suddenly fixed his gaze on Zhuang Qinyan, who are you? Zhuang Qinyan grinned, I'm a researcher from the Qinglan Institute, and this is my identification. He looked completely innocent, almost as if he wanted to etch him an upright citizen on his forehead. In silence, Wu Juamin accepted his work badge, glanced down to check, and then instructed the team members behind him, go verify it. Yes, Captain. Zhuang Qinyan interjected at the opportune moment, Commander, we've shown you our identification. It wouldn't be fair to detain us, would it? Wu Juamin didn't answer, still fixated on Song Ku. What about her identification? Song Ku's face reddened even more. Zhuang Qinyan raised an eyebrow. My friend is from District F. Wu Juamin asked, and... The high-ranking officials in the military, aloof and detached from the people's lives, might not fully understand the situation. It's forgivable. People from District F not having identification is just the norm, isn't it? And strictly speaking, the military isn't in charge of matters related to household registration, right? He spoke with a sharp tongue, targeting Wu Juamin at every turn. The members of the team behind him were visibly angered, struggling to control their irritability. Wu Juamin didn't seem to mind. He stopped his subordinates with an unaffected expression. Indeed, the military isn't in charge of that, but I need to confirm whether she poses a threat. Commander, perhaps you're being too broad in your oversight. My friend and I are just law-abiding citizens. Cooperatively, Song Ku nodded at law-abiding. Captain, verification is complete. The documents are genuine, the team member who had just checked the documents reported back to Wu Juamin, lowering his voice to add, but his clearance level is very high we couldn't access specific information. After listening to his subordinate's report, Wu Juamin calmly scanned the identification in his hand once again. The young man in the photograph appeared thin, with prominent dark circles under his pale skin. While his appearance was elegant, an inescapable sense of melancholy seemed to linger. Then, Wu Juamin looked at Zhuang Qinyan again. Sitting in the wheelchair, he was slick-tongued, not appearing like a researcher. 
but rather carrying the authoritative manner typical of those well-born young masters from District B, which Wu Juamin had encountered before bossy and domineering. You're a researcher. Without a doubt. What field of research? Zhuang Qinyan wiped away a small droplet of water that had splashed onto the wheelchair. He replied with all seriousness, I am a senior maintenance technician for the weather mimicry system. Song Ku. She was so astonished that she nearly bit her own tongue. Hold on, weren't you a pharmaceutical researcher just two days ago? Chapter, 34. Deceiving them. I am a senior maintenance technician for the weather mimicry system. With this statement, several members of the Azure Phoenix team showed expressions of skepticism and caution on their faces. Deputy Captain Maeda Jio's reaction was particularly direct. He let out a cold snort from his nose and muttered something in an incomprehensible dialect. Ha! Huh. What a coincidence! And Chiwen clasped his hands behind his head and expressed his astonishment in a peculiar manner. Was it really such a coincidence? Just when they felt drowsy, someone showed up to provide a pillow. Their captain was struggling with the temperamental mimicry system, unable to shut it down or dismantle it. And now, this person appeared out of the blue, claiming to be able to fix it. Not a coincidence, Zhuang Qinyan explained with conviction, the T-014 mimicry system was due for its annual inspection. Headquarters dispatched us for a business trip, but as soon as we arrived in Hua City, heavy rain began. I suspected that T-014 had malfunctioned. However, with the city overrun by zombies, I accidentally got separated from my colleague and couldn't contact anyone else. That's why there was a delay until now. Separated? Didn't you eliminate your colleagues one by one? Song Ku silently ridiculed, she remembered it all too clearly. Wu Juamin's keen eyes scrutinized Zhuang Qinyan. From the latter's expression, he couldn't determine if he was lying. The ID had been verified, it was genuine and the photo did indeed match him furthermore, he likely didn't know yet, but if he dared to lie about this matter, he would be exposed immediately. Wu Juamin was more concerned about one thing, can you fix it on your own? Of course. Good, I'll give you the time. You are responsible for restoring T-014 to its original state. Wait a moment, Commander, Zhuang Qingyan's smile seemed to hold a deeper meaning, under what capacity are you ordering me right now? Wu Juamin abruptly raised his head. He was dressed in the standard uniform of the Alliance Combat Task Force, which accentuated his aura of seriousness and coldness. His voice was deep and authoritative, I am Captain Wu Juamin, commanding the 11th Squad of the Azure Phoenix Detachment, a specialized force under the New Asia Alliance. At the moment, I am requesting your cooperation in our work to restore the normal functions of the T-014 weather mimicry system, citing a critical military mission. Over a decade ago, the Alliance's Azure Phoenix forces and the Qinglan Institute shared intelligence and supported each other. They had even collaborated deeply for a time. Wu Juamin's request as a military officer to cooperate with a Qinglan researcher didn't seem unreasonable. Unfortunately, that was over a decade ago. Their relationship now Zhuang Qinyan sneered inwardly. Of course, he maintained a polite demeanor on the surface. Oh, it turns out you're from Azure Phoenix. I'll definitely cooperate then. Captain Wu, could you please lead us to the control center of T-014? Oh, that center should be in the nearest branch of Qinglan. The exact location. No need, Wu Juamin interrupted. Ha! Huh. Zhuang Qinyan blinked slightly. The control center has already been transported here. Wu Juamin lifted his wrist and tapped lightly, summoning the projection interface of his communicator. The air around them distorted for a moment, and the next second, the real-time footage of the Azure Phoenix logistics team appeared. A giant terminal was being escorted by four or five people, moving slowly forward. Song Ku listened to their conversation absent-mindedly, her chin resting on her hand. Once her mind relaxed, drowsiness surged over her. She was almost falling asleep when she saw the novel gadget, instantly widening her eyes. What is this thing? It looks so powerful. From the projection, Zhuang Qinyan clearly saw that enormous object. His perfect expression finally showed a slight crack. So, this was what he meant by transported here. 
Were the people from Azure Phoenix all like this now? Unable to establish a connection to the back-end terminal, did they simply resort to forcefully dismantling the central unit of T-014? These overbearing military bandits no wonder the torrential rain in Hua City had only lessened and not completely stopped. Zhuang Qinyan took a deep breath. He struggled to suppress the mockery on the tip of his tongue. If the internal system can't be connected, I must systematically troubleshoot the problems it might take a few days. That's fine. We'll stay here for a few days, Wu Juamin nodded, then pointed to Song Ku with his finger. However, until you fix T-014, she must stay with you. The captain of Azure Phoenix was inherently cautious. He hadn't completely dropped his suspicion of Song Ku keeping her close was another form of surveillance. And so, Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan followed Wu Juamin and his team to the temporary residence of Azure Phoenix. Although it was called a residence, it was quite rudimentary. It was even cleared out temporarily using their abilities an isolated residential building. It would take some time for the logistics team to bring over the central unit. Song Ku found an empty room, and under Zhuang Qinyan's strong request and disgusted eyes, she cleaned herself up thoroughly, washing away the viscous fluid from her encounter with the swarm of zombie cockroaches. After tidying up, like a boneless cat, Song Ku stretched her limbs and collapsed onto the bed. Finally, she could rest. Immediately, she turned over, staring fixedly at Zhuang Qinyan. That T, T-014, can you really, really fix it? Song Ku expressed a great deal of doubt. What if this Zhuang guy was all talk and no substance? Grandpa had said that some men loved to brag. Zhuang Qinyan grinned, you're this skeptical of me. And you, you even claimed to be a, a pharma, pharmaceutical researcher, Song Ku countered logically. Hmm Zhuang Qinyan appeared calm, that's correct, a pharmaceutical researcher, but, part-time. Hmph. Song Ku huffed. Actually, being a senior maintenance technician is also part-time. Zhuang Qinyan chatted and joked, then dropped a bombshell, you guessed it right, I can't fix any weather mimetic system. Song Ku. Seeing her startled expression, Zhuang Qinyan continued to fan the flames, so, I was lying to them just now. Song Ku. Her fingers shifted to the edge of the bed, clutching the strap of her backpack. She seemed ready to make a sudden escape at any moment. Zhuang Qinyan noticed her subtle movement and smiled brightly, his peach blossom eyes sparkling. Don't worry, T-014 doesn't need any repairs, just turn it off. But I'll need to put in some effort to bypass the firewall. After all, this isn't my area of expertise. He winked mysteriously, this time I'm telling the truth. The Synoptic Mimetic System SMS was a cutting-edge technological creation independently developed by the Azure Phoenix Research Institute. It made its official debut in the year 20 of the new era, alongside the Lu Starships, as a remarkable achievement of the glorious 30 years. Its primary function was to monitor and improve weather conditions. When extreme weather conditions reached a threshold or were about to exceed the limits humans could endure, artificial intelligence would calculate and automatically intervene and adjust. For example, if an area experienced extreme heat, the SMS could release rain and cooling measures to alter local weather and maintain climate balance. Currently, over a hundred SMS units were deployed by the Alliance, distributed across cities ranging from Class B to Class D, covering nearly 90% of regions. The unit near Hua City was numbered T-014. The rampage of T-014 was the main cause of the torrential rain in Hua City. After hearing Zhuang Qinyan's explanation, Song Ku suddenly recalled the day of the heavy rain and the falling incident at the Starship Harbor. Could these two events be related? She quickly shared her speculation with Zhuang Qinyan. You think the collision of the Starship caused T-014 to go out of control? Hmm that's not impossible, Zhuang Qinyan responded with an ambiguous statement. Song Ku still had one more question, why did, did those people want to, to fix it? If the out-of-control T-014 continued running indefinitely, it wouldn't just affect Hua City. It would flood all the areas it covered. By then, it wouldn't just be solved by sacrificing Hua City. So complicated Song Ku scratched her head, finding it hard to fully understand. 
Mischievously, Zhuang Qinyan intentionally reminded her, You haven't used up your quota for questions today. Do you have any more? Actually, she did, but... Song Ku absentmindedly touched her wrist through the air, hesitated for a moment, and then couldn't resist, that thing, thing from earlier, when you tap it and, and a picture appears, what is it? She swung her legs excitedly and opened her hands wide, mimicking the action. Child Zhuang Qinyan chuckled. Only a child would be interested in new toys. That's a communication terminal specific to District B. Oh. As soon as she heard it was from District B, her excitement waned. District B, it was separated from CDF, quite far away. Grandpa had strictly forbidden her to go there. Interested? Song Ku blinked, neither confirming nor denying. With a slight movement of his right hand, Zhuang Qinyan conjured a female version of the communication terminal out of nowhere, teasing her like a cat, here, take it to play. It was a mini terminal in silver white. Although communication and positioning were forcibly disabled, other functions could still be used. Song Ku fiddled with the built-in camera, projecting images onto the floor and playing with it happily. Is it fun? Zhuang Qinyan asked beside her. And do you know who this belongs to? Zhuang Qinyan added casually. Who, whose? Wu Yuru's. Oh, right you know her too. How about it? Remember now? It seemed, perhaps sort of she had a vague impression. Song Ku's memory rapidly rewound to the day when she first met Zhuang Qinyan. At that time, he had taken advantage of the chaos and taken something from the bodies of the two people. She vaguely remembered expressing strong disdain for such behavior. She remembered. Song Ku felt extremely uncomfortable. Chapter 35 A Small White Lotus Flower As Song Ku chased Zhuang Qinyan around the room, the sound of faint movements reached them from the doorway. The door of this room had been mostly broken for a while now. Through the gap, a strange little boy peeked in, secretly observing them. Upon meeting their gazes, the boy's shoulders trembled, and he quickly ran away in fear. Embarrassed, Song Ko put down the half-folded table she had been holding. Had she scared the boy away? After about half an hour, the boy tiptoed back, still hesitant to come in. His curious eyes lingered on Zhuang Qinyan's right leg and wheelchair for two seconds before swiftly moving away and landing on Song Ko. He stared at her with curiosity. Song Ko felt stiff under his gaze, refraining from making any sudden movements. She had never been good at dealing with these soft and delicate human cubs. The only one she could somewhat consider familiar was Uncle Bing's son, Xiao Bao. However, that rascal was always throwing stones at her, giving her a bad impression. Whenever she saw him, she just wanted to kick his butt. This boy was different from Xiao Bao he was much more timid. Nervously, Song Ku sat on the chair. Her gaze coincidentally met his. The boy had soft brown hair, with curls falling around his ears. His small face was fair, and he wore finely crafted long sleeves and pants that made him look like a model from a magazine. Song Ku glanced at him, then took another look. Ha! Huh. He seemed oddly familiar. Wait a minute, she remembered. Wasn't this Su Weigua's son? Called Su Xing. The day Song Ku left F-177 district from Fool's Wharf, Su Xing had lost control of his abilities due to a scare involving Aunt Qing and Xiao Bao. Wu Juemin and the others had knocked him unconscious and taken him away. She didn't expect to meet him again here. So, in a way, they were still from the same hometown. Song Ku nervously fiddled with the hem of her clothes, building up her courage for a while. Finally, she mustered the bravery to greet Su Xing. But as she lifted her head, the boy had run away. The second day, the third day, the fourth day. For the next week, Su Xing would come by Song Ku's door, circling around, checking if she was there. Sometimes he caught glimpses of her testing new spiritual weapons. He would linger at the door for a while, his eyes curiously fixed on her. However, he was very shy and well-behaved, always smiling innocently at Song Ku with his eyes bent yet he never dared to come inside. During this time, Zhuang Qinyan was often not in the room. 
The control center of T-014 was successfully transported to the base, and every day, he would be escorted under the vigilant gaze of Maya Dejio for troubleshooting and maintenance. Although according to Shuang Qinyan, it was more like breaking through the firewall. Of course, Song Kuk could tell he was just slacking off. He would spend about 10 minutes typing away at the screen every day and shamelessly pass off the rest of the time by saying, the terminal can run automatically. Maeda Jio and the others were skeptical but had no choice. After all, they didn't understand the technology. If they hadn't confirmed Zhuang Qingyan's work credentials countless times, they probably wouldn't have tolerated him for so long. As for Wu Juamin, he led his team members to clear out the zombies, remove obstacles, and worked with clear divisions of labor. They took turns resting, staying busy non-stop. The high members of the Phoenix military squad were not easy to get along with. If you wanted someone easier to talk to, and Chiwen could barely pass as one. After a few days of observation and with occasional leading questions from Zhuang Qinyan, Song Ku gradually understood the specifics of this team of Awakeners. The legendary Phoenix Army was indeed an army composed entirely of Awakeners. The team led by Wu Juamin, called the 11th Squad, was labeled a squad, but in reality, it had a full 40 members. The highest-ranked Awakener was the squad leader Wu Juamin, an A-level speed type. According to Nqiwen, the teleportation Song Ku had witnessed was just a part of his ability. Wu Juamin's true strength was unfathomable. And Chiwen was a B-level electric type awakener. His primary focus was on large-scale group damage, making him the main force against the insect tide. Once, Song Ku secretly climbed onto a rooftop to observe. When An Chiwen released his ability, the sky within a radius of two kilometers dimmed as if it were night. Occasional lightning arcs and thunderous roars filled the air. The pure purple light almost seemed to tear through the sky, its power incredibly astonishing. If a B-level Awakener was this powerful, how strong would an A-level be? Song Ku's competitive spirit was itching to challenge Wu Juamin to a fight, to test their strengths against each other. Of course, that desire was currently only in the thinking stage. Song Ku was confident in herself, but if she were to win a fight against Wu Juamin and he got angry and captured her, she felt that would be quite troublesome. Ah well, best to just forget about it. Apart from Wu Juamin and Nqiwen, the other team members were C-level and D-level Awakeners. For instance, Ouyang Pei had C-level Earth-type abilities, Maeda Jiu had a C-level defensive barrier, and Wang Chang had D-level Wind-type abilities, and so on. In addition to the official members, there were also temporary members in the base's logistics, such as Su Xing. They were originally civilians from various regions. Before the apocalypse, Wu Juamin had an Awakener detection device, and through it, he discovered many newly awakened ability users. After Doomsday, these people had nowhere to go, so Wu Juamin temporarily incorporated them into the team, having them take care of transportation and cleaning work. Excluding these logistics personnel, Song Kuk counted and realized that the true number of Phoenix military squad members was down to 12 people. When Wu Juamin revealed his identity to Zhuang Qinyan, he had mentioned that they were carrying out an important mission. However, regarding the details of the mission, everyone had tacitly agreed to keep their lips sealed, showing a strong sense of secrecy. From Anqiwen, Song Ku also learned another piece of less favorable news, the Bagua Formation's core couldn't be activated from the outside. The Bagua Formation was the strongest defense mechanism in Hua City. When it detected a serious natural disaster from the outside, it would abandon the vehicle to protect the commander and cut off all communication with external facilities. The entire core of the formation would be hidden in a pit several kilometers deep. The core was stocked with ample supplies that could last around five years for 30,000 people. Because it was the final resort, once activated, it meant being cut off from the outside world. The core could only be reopened through an internal control console. Wu Juamin had attempted to access the communication channel of the core but with limited success. This frequency band required specialized access permissions. The activation of the core had been so rushed that there was no guarantee that the personnel inside were even alive. In short, the chances of seeing those people from no. One middle school again were extremely slim. Song Ku could only hope that Jiang Rui and Tian Yi were able to survive inside. 
The days passed uneventfully for a week until there was finally a turn of events Su Xing came in. Song Ku heard a knock on the door and looked up, seeing the small figure of Su Xing holding a large bag of supplies, with only his fluffy head visible. Carrying too much, his balance was off. Su Xing wobbled his way in and gave a shy smile. After observing the door for the past few days, his courage had grown slightly. Uncle and asked me to bring some things over. Thank you, Song Ku expressed her gratitude as she took the supplies with one hand. Neither of them was skilled in social interactions. After Su Xing put down the supplies, Song Ku awkwardly said, sit, and they both quickly fell silent. Seeking help, Song Ku looked towards the only articulate speaker in the room, Zhuang Qinyan. Zhuang Qinyan just smiled elegantly and said, I'm going to check on T014. That's it. He was just leaving. It felt like he was impatiently leaving to escape from playing with a child, just like an irresponsible parent using any excuse to get away. Watching his carefree figure as he left, Song Ku's swallowtail dart flipped up and down in her hand, seemingly with a hint of sharpening. Su Xing's short legs swung up and down on the stool, and after watching her play with the dart for a while, he clapped his hands enthusiastically, saying, You're so amazing. Song Ku paused for a moment, her dart becoming even more haphazard in her hand. I've seen you, in the quiet atmosphere, Su Xing suddenly spoke up, uncle and said that you and my dad were in the same cabin. His big watery eyes looked at Song Ku, a hopeful expression on his face. Sister, can I ask you something? Song Ku couldn't possibly refuse, Yi yes. Do you know where my dad went? Ha! Huh. My dad, his name is Su Weigua, contact number is 042XX. The child had pretty good memory, he immediately recited his parents' information. Thinking for a moment, Song Ko recalled that the civilian starship had last landed in a food factory in the northeastern suburbs of Hua City. If nothing unexpected happened, Su Weigua should still be there, but that's assuming nothing unexpected in the events of Doomsday, no one could say for sure. Seeing her not answering for a while, Su Xing's big eyes filled with tears, and he started crying like dropping pearls, saying, Sister, I want to find my dad. Woo woo, dad. Don't, don't be like this. How did you end up crying while talking? During this period, Zhuang Qinyan hadn't been resting well. During the day, he had to deal with the gloomy Maeda Chiyo and also divert his attention to breaking through the firewall of T014. He wasn't lying about this point although he owed a bit to a friend who shared knowledge on how to bypass AI monitoring on the star network, it wasn't his expertise. He had to grope through each step, and he had to make Maeda Jio believe he was repairing and troubleshooting. It was far from easy. At night, when he stayed in the same room with Song Ku, the girl would just flop onto the bed without a care and fall asleep. But Chuang Qinyan couldn't do that. He had been extremely cautious since childhood. He absolutely didn't allow anyone near him when he rested. Otherwise, with his vigilant consciousness, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep no matter what. If he were to tell this to Song Ku, that little girl would probably widen her eyes and mutter incomprehensibly, scolding him, so so troublesome. Zhuang Qinyan tiredly pinched his brow, tilting the back of his wheelchair 45 degrees to transform it into a recliner mode. He relaxedly lay on it, hands resting on his belly, his mental ability gently enveloping the surroundings. He closed his eyes. Outside, raindrops pattered rhythmically. Amid the monotonous and repetitive white noise, his breathing gradually became calm. Suddenly, a clear child's voice rang out, Uncle and, tomorrow, I'll continue monitoring those two people, all right? Xing is so active. Yeah, I want to help you with more work, so uncle and the others can rest more. You're such a good kid. And Chiwen patted Su Xing's head. Uncle and, when are we leaving this place? That's a question for the captain. Woo woo, the captain is so strict, I'm scared. Uncle and, are you hungry? I have cookies here, want some. Uncle and. Zhuang Qinyan opened his eyes, and his mental ability spread outward quickly locating the source of the voice. The spot where the two were talking was quite far from Zhuang Qinyan, and Su Xing and Enqiwen hadn't noticed him at all. 
Su Xing was hopping around in Qiwen like a little bird, cheerful under the sunlight, speaking sweetly with every uncle and making in Qiwen smile from ear to ear. It was a complete contrast to the shy and timid demeanor he had shown in front of them these past few days. Chuan Qinyan tapped his wheelchair's armrest, gradually narrowing his eyes. Ah, so it was a small white lotus after all. Chapter 36 Your father is dead. Su Xing wanted you to accompany him to find someone. Yeah. You agreed. Song Ku nodded, she had no resistance to the soft and gentle human cup. When Su Xing cried, she surrendered. With so many people in Azure Phoenix, Su Xing didn't go to them for help, but came to you? I, I don't know, maybe, he's, timid. Thinking about Wu Juamin's stern expression, it was indeed quite intimidating. Zhuang Qinyan emitted a soft hum from his nose, as if Song Ku were a foolish ruler bewitched by a femme fatale. Timid? Didn't you say his father was a smuggler? A sly and cunning merchant can raise an innocent son. Have you heard an old saying from the ancient civilization? A mouse's son can make holes. Don't understand. You don't even understand this, and you dare to believe strangers so easily. Song Ku gazed at him with pure and clear eyes, murmuring softly, I also, believe in you. When we first met, weren't we strangers too? You even lied to me that you were a pharmaceutical researcher. Zhuang Qingyan's movement paused, evidently that example was quite a failure. Aren't you afraid he'll deceive you? That child is an ice-type ability user of unknown level. Not afraid. What's there to deceive her about? She doesn't have money, and she's not as knowledgeable as Zhuang Qingyan. Apart from knowing how to fight a little bit, oh no, she's especially good at fighting. Anyone who wants to deceive her needs to think twice. The long spear in Song Ku's hand spun into a beautiful floral pattern, whoever deceives me, I'll, I'll beat them. Truly straightforward and brutal way of thinking. Zhuang Qingyan choked. As you wish. Song Ku zipped up her backpack, turned to him and asked, are you going? Zhuang Qingyan was reading her old light screen, not even looking up as he coldly refused, not going. Song Ku stared at his profile for a few seconds, feeling that he seemed somewhat unhappy. It wasn't like the time at the safe zone when he insisted on escorting her to the entrance and said those mushy words. Song Ku felt a bit melancholic for no reason. But then again, she hadn't done anything wrong, so why feel guilty? In the end, it's all Zhuang Qingyan's fault. After several days of effort by Wu Juamin and the others, the roads around Hua City had mostly been cleared, and even the number of zombies had sharply decreased. Song Ko had gone out twice in the past few days, disappearing for a while without drawing too much attention. If she walked a bit faster, she could go and return before nightfall. Amid the ruins of steel and concrete, Song Ko moved swiftly, occasionally stopping to ask, Are you tired? Su Xing was chasing her, his little face flushed, panting heavily, yet he managed to keep up, Sister, I'm not tired. Almost forgot, he's also an awakener, and an ice type with strong offensive abilities. Song Ku always saw him as a harmless kid, but in reality, Su Xing's physical qualities had already surpassed those of an average adult man. Hua City Suburban Area, Food Factory The guard post two kilometers away had collapsed and been abandoned. The 500 square meter warehouse stood silently. Song Ku had a bad feeling. She whispered to Su Xing, Wait here, I'll go over and take a look first. Su Xing gripped the straps of his backpack and nodded obediently. Like a nimble deer, Song Ku lightly stepped along the wall, smoothly climbed onto the roof, and looked inside through a skylight. The interior of the warehouse resembled a garbage disposal site, with rotten food covering the floor. A sea of people could be seen, all zombies. Song Ku searched for Su Weigua's figure but distinguishing individuals in the crowd of zombies, pressed shoulder to shoulder, was quite challenging. A slight movement came from behind. Song Ku turned around, only to find that Su Xing had also climbed up without her noticing. She raised a finger to signal him to be silent. Su Xing immediately understood and covered his mouth with his small hand. His gaze shifted around, and when he saw the huge number of zombies inside, his eyes widened in shock. Fortunately, 
Su Xing was just scared he didn't scream. He wiped the foggy skylight glass with his sleeve and joined Song Ku in searching for Su Weiguo. After a while, Su Xing pointed to a figure in the distance and excitedly whispered, Daddy. It's Daddy. That's my dad. Following his direction, Song Ku saw a man with a shiny golden belt around his waist. No wonder Su Xing could recognize him at a glance. However, the man's body had swelled up several times, not resembling a normal person. Sure enough, when Su Weigua turned around, his irises were grayish-white, his face twisted, showing clear signs of being a zombie. Su Xing's daddy was abruptly cut off in his throat. Perhaps because he was overwhelmed with fear, he sobbed while hiccuping uncontrollably. The temperature around them seemed to drop Song Ku felt the chill on her head. She touched it and realized that raindrops had turned into snowflakes, falling gently. She instantly remembered the tragedy at the dock that day. No, big brother, please don't unleash your supernatural powers again, okay? I'm sorry, sister, I, I can't control it. Su Xing also realized that his supernatural powers were leaking out. Nervous and disordered, his efforts to suppress it proved futile. Snow and ice spun through the air, the temperature plummeted, and Song Ku shivered. Hey, Yishi was about to remind Su Xing to calm down and not attract the zombies. Too late. The rapid drop in temperature caused the fragile skylight to crack open, and a piece of shattered glass fell with a crisp sound. All the zombies in the warehouse looked up at the ceiling, their thousands of white eyes fixated on the falling shard. It was hair-raising. Song Ku sighed inwardly. Hide here, protect yourself. She didn't forget to remind Su Xing. Thud. With a loud noise, Song Ku jumped into the warehouse from the skylight, one hand supporting her weight while the other held a spear. Her landing was clean and stylish. She slowly lifted her head. Although it was a bit troublesome, for her, dealing with these zombies was just a matter of time. The freezing tip of the spear aimed at the enemy, and the zombies charged at her frantically. The situation was about to erupt. Suddenly, countless ice blades descended from the sky, like a gust of wind sweeping fallen leaves, raging and dancing wildly. There was no rhyme or reason they pierced through the zombies upon contact. This kind of wide-ranging group-damaging ability, combined with the advantage of being in a confined space, left the zombies with no escape route. They were completely caught in a trap, and in no time, their bodies were pierced with ice blades. They died thoroughly, leaving only a few wandering aimlessly. Song Ku maintained her spear posture, staring in amazement. She turned back and looked through the bull-sized hole. She saw Su Xing near the skylight, sobbing and breathless, I'm sorry. I also I also don't know what's happening. On the way back, Su Xing's mood was unusually low. In the end, Su Weigua stayed in the food factory. After Song could dealt with the other zombies, she asked Su Xing what to do next. His eyes were red, and he said, Sister, can you not kill my dad? Just let him, let him stay here. Let him stay. But Su Weigua had already turned into a zombie and couldn't revert to being human. Su Xing looked very sad, but Song Ku had no parents, and her emotions in this regard were always dull. She couldn't empathize with him. Well, perhaps if Xuang Qinyan were here, he could explain it to her. In the end, she agreed to Su Xing's request and locked up the food factory with an iron chain. The two hurried back to the base ahead of Wu Juamin and the others. Su Xing wiped his tears and thanked Song Ku, Sister, thank you for taking me to find my dad. I'm sorry, I know I'm useless. It's okay, Song Ku asked him, is your ability, okay? Su Xing lowered his head in frustration, when I'm emotionally excited, I can't control my ability properly. Uncle and said it's because my focus is too scattered, but I will definitely correct it in the future. I won't cause trouble for you guys. Song Ku awkwardly replied, okay, okay. From a certain perspective, Su Xing releasing his powerful ability without regard for the situation was indeed troublesome. For example, just now, due to being too shocked, she accidentally sat down too hard, and now her tailbone was still slightly painful. After leaving the room, Su Xing stopped crying. He walked around the corner, his hands in the pockets of his hoodie, 
bouncing as he walked. At the end of the corridor stood a silver-white wheelchair, with a tall man leaning against it, lazily posed. His superior side profile had a pleasing charm in the misty drizzle. Su Xing pursed his lips, his face showing a shy and bashful smile. Uncle Zhuang. Zhuang Qinyan turned his head. It's you. Uncle Zhuang, what are you doing here? Waiting for you. Waiting for me. Do you have something to tell me? Su Xing tilted his head, looking adorably curious. Zhuang Qinyan adjusted the wheelchair's direction and faced Su Xing. Though the child's face still feigned innocence and curiosity, the corners of his eyes darted around, clearly indicating that his mind was elsewhere. Kid, you knew all along, right? Knew what? Your dad's dead. Although these words sounded like an insult, Zhuang Qinyan calmly stated the facts. Didn't hear clearly. Let me say it again, your dad is dead. Su Xing froze, his small face immediately fell, his reddened eyes locked onto Zhuang Qinyan. Zhuang Qinyan chuckled. With the chaos in Hua City, Wu Juamin couldn't have been unaware. He must have sent people to the food factory long ago to check it out and told you there's no need to go find your dad again, right? Why? Are you that unwilling to give up? Insisting on finding someone to confirm it with you? Su Xing's hand emerged from his pocket and hung at his sides. He murmured softly, as if complaining like a dissatisfied child, Uncle Zhuang, you really love meddling in other people's business. A sharp ice blade appeared, accompanied by a bone-chilling cold, flying straight towards Zhuang Qinyan's right leg through the gap in the wheelchair. Zhuang Qinyan smirked. Children, they can't control their tempers. A second before the ice blade hit Zhuang Qinyan, an invisible force lifted Su Xing off the ground. His hoodie was caught on a beam, and his entire body plummeted uncontrollably, but his head got stuck in the collar. He resembled a little chick with its wings tied, only supported by that bit of force. Let me go. Put me down. You jerk. Su Xing finally panicked. He flailed his limbs desperately, gnashing his teeth and brandishing his claws like an angry little lion. The innocence and purity on his face disappeared, replaced by gnashing of teeth and irritability. This person, this person who's wheelchair-bound, turned out to be an awakener. How infuriating! How infuriating! He's so mad! Zhuang Qinyan admired his predicament, earnestly advising, kids need to learn to be self-reliant and not always rely on others. Especially on other people's thigh. Tian. Dragon-born dragon, chicken-born chicken, chicken mouse's son can make whole. Like father, like son. Chapter, 37 It was better to say goodbye end of Hua City Arc. The next day, Zhuang Qinyan broke through the final security measures of T-014 and accessed the control port. After a total of 14 days, he finally managed to shut down the malfunctioning weather simulation system. Witnessed by everyone, the clouds and mist that had been hanging over the city gradually thinned and disappeared. Then, the sun broke through the clouds, pouring down its radiant light, instantly sweeping away the days of gloom. The high squad members looked at Zhuang Qinyan with visibly different expressions. You, young man, are quite capable. Did you really fix it? We finally freaking see the sun. It's either zombies or stink bugs every day. It's almost driving me emo. Hey Oh Yang, want to sunbathe together? Amidst the lively atmosphere, a team member rushed in, approaching Wu Juamin and Maya Dejio, saying hurriedly, Eyewitness District 72 unable to confirm suspected appearance of the key. Wu Juamin's expression turned serious, and he immediately issued orders, everyone. Speed up, clear the roads out of the city by tomorrow at the latest. The team members who were just talking about sunbathing stood at attention in an instant, responding in unison, Yes, Captain. Song Ku leaned on the back of Zhuang Qingyan's wheelchair, holding a small, skinny pear in her hand. She claimed to be supervising his coding even though she couldn't understand a word of it, but she noticed that his typing speed was getting slower and couldn't help but look down. Zhuang Qingyan's gaze stopped in the direction of the people who were talking, his expression oddly hard to describe. What's wrong with you? Song Ku took a bite of the pear. Oh, it's so sour. 
Zhuang Qinyan withdrew his gaze, pointing to the gigantic terminal in front of him. What's this? T, T-014. No, this isn't T-014. The real T-014 is still above us. This is its control center. Huh. Is there a difference? This control center has always been stored near the Qinglan Research Institute near Hua City. Oh, I see. Wasn't this something everyone knew from the beginning? But you mentioned before that Wu Juamin and the others came from F-177 district. If we were to compare it to a line segment, the positions of Qinglan and F-177 district were like the endpoints of the line segment, while Hua City was roughly the midpoint. Wu Juamin left Hua City before the heavy rain, so it's clear that he just happened to bring T-014 back with him. Well, that's interesting. You're saying that Azure Phoenix's people took such a big detour, just to go to the Qinglan Research Institute. What are they trying to do? Or rather, what compelling reason do they have to go there? Song Ku was puzzled how would she know? Zhuang Qinyan started talking in terms she couldn't understand again. Seeing Song Ku looking utterly confused, Zhuang Qinyan patted her head with a meaningful expression, go on and eat your pear. On that evening, Wu Juamin officially announced that once the roads were open tomorrow morning, their group would depart from Hua City. Due to the nature of their upcoming mission, logistics personnel wouldn't be able to participate, which meant that after reaching the next destination, the twelve members of Azure Phoenix Squad would part ways with them. Dinner was like a farewell feast. Everyone set up makeshift stoves in the courtyard, and those with culinary skills took matters into their own hands, cooking something to eat. Holding an unlit cigarette, and Chiwen brushed sauce onto eggplants, asking Song Ku, little sister, now that T-014 has also been repaired, what are your plans for the future? Song Ku stared at the sizzling, oil-covered eggplants without blinking, absent-mindedly shaking her head. She didn't have any particular place she wanted to go she needed to check with Zhuang Qinyan first. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed a familiar figure. Su Xing was wearing a light yellow sweater, his soft little face tilted as he listened to Ouyang Pei speak. He looked exceptionally docile. Song Ku waved at him, wanting to invite him over to eat. However, when the little guy saw her, he first looked happy, but then his expression changed as if he had seen a ghost, and he scampered away. Song Ku. A familiar casual voice came from behind, Hey, everyone's here. Song Ku turned around and saw two figures slowly approaching. It was Zhuang Qinyan and Wu Juamin. After spending this period of time together, although Wu Juamin hadn't completely let down his guard against Song Ku, she had kept a low profile these days, playing the role of a law-abiding citizen. She hadn't caused any trouble, so Wu Juamin's attitude was slightly less hostile. He didn't threaten to detain her at every turn. Commander Wu, do you have any sensible suggestions about our next destination? Zhuang Qinyan deliberately ignored a certain figure that had fled, chuckling softly. Wu Juamin glanced at Song Ku and spoke coldly, the Alliance has regulations for the management of Awakeners. Since you've awakened, you should register as soon as possible. Registered Awakeners are recognized by the Alliance. Otherwise, you'll forever remain a black household. Song Ku, who had 18 years of experience being a black household, felt like a knife had stabbed her in the back. However, would registering as an Awakener grant her an official identity? Song Ku felt a bit intrigued. Where can, can I register? All the C District cities are fine. C District has had Awakener bases before, but they weren't open to the public, and Chiwen flipped the eggplants. Then continued in a carefree manner, but with the current situation, starships are out of service, and it's difficult to travel anywhere. Oh, by the way, we're headed to District C-72. You can ask the captain to give you a lift. C-72 District. Ferrara, the city of music and art. Zhuang Qinyan suddenly spoke. Yeah, you know about it. And Qiwen seemed surprised. To accurately mention a city's name just by its number, either this person had exceptional memory and was well versed in the Alliance's regional information, or they had been there or heard about it before, making it familiar to them. Not exactly, I've just heard a bit about it, Zhuang Qinyan nodded with a touch of reserve. In the first year of the new calendar, 
the alliance officially divided the territory into 180 districts, graded from A to F based on overall development levels. Among them, District E was developed into various functional areas due to its unique ecological environment E-166, E-175. District F only had numbers without names because it was too backward F-176, F-180. The remaining districts A, B, C, D formed a pyramid distribution. Apart from the distant and mysterious district A-1, A-5, the opulent district B, B-6, B-25 were the privileged gathered, and the most numerous but unremarkable district D, D-76, D-165. The technologically advanced and well-managed district C, C-26, C-75 became the sought-after ideal country for the majority. District C consisted of 50 cities, each with its own irreplaceable uniqueness. Like District C-72, Ferrara. Ferrara not only had nearly a thousand large and small retro opera houses but had also achieved a state of mastery in the application of holographic projection technology. In this land where floating and leaping musical notes and imaginative ideas were everywhere, singers, poets, painters, playwrights from all over the world gathered together. Hoping that one day they could step onto the brilliantly shining stage of the stars and fulfill their lifelong pursuits. In addition, Ferrara had a governing official who was the most free in the entire alliance. Do you want to go to Ferrara? Zhuang Qinyan asked Song Ku. Song Ku nodded. Becoming an officially registered awakener with a formal identity was too attractive a proposition. This way, she wouldn't have to hide for her entire life, and she could proudly say to others, Look! This is my ID. Zhuang Qinyan easily understood Song Ku's thoughts, smiled, and turned to Wu Juamin. I don't have any objections. It depends on Captain Wu's agreement. Though Wu Juamin's demeanor was cold and tough, as an excellent military personnel, he inherently possessed a sense of duty and compassion. Otherwise, when they were in District F-177, he wouldn't have allocated half of the starships to transport civilians. Okay, Wu Juamin nodded coldly, but I'm only responsible for taking you to District C-72. It meant that after reaching District C-72, they would have to find their own way, just like the logistics team members. Zhuang Qinyan expressed his understanding, of course, thank you, Captain Wu. Little sister, are you willing to come with us this time? Here, have a skewer. And Chiwen's roasted eggplant was finally ready. After being politely declined by both Wu Juamin and Zhuang Qinyan, it was Song Ku who took one skewer. She stared at the reddish surface for a while and then took a bite. Oh! It's so spicy! The day of departure arrived quickly. As the light of dawn was just breaking, Song Ku was awakened by a faint rustling sound footsteps. Though the footsteps were numerous, they weren't chaotic. They were well trained, landing softly. If it weren't for her keen supernatural senses, she might have easily overlooked them. She rubbed her eyes, sat up from the bed, and all traces of drowsiness vanished. However, upon a quick glance, she realized the single bed across from hers was empty Zhuang Qinyan was nowhere to be seen. It was only at the second look that she noticed he was seated by the window, lifting the curtain to look outside. Song Ku felt a touch of surprise she hadn't expected Zhuang Qinyan to be so alert, waking up earlier than she did. Who is it? Azure Phoenix's people. Song Ku immediately became anxious, are they trying to, to sneak away? Wasn't it agreed that they would be taken to District C-72? Could they really just renege on that after a night's sleep? Zhuang Qinyan was speechless and choked up, defeated by her unexpectedly circuitous thought process. No, it's not that, his expression turned serious, come over and see, the formation is activated. Song Ku jumped up in shock and hurried to the window. In the faint morning light, that familiar floating mall appeared once again. However, the former grandeur was no longer present. The massive architectural structure lay in ruins, leaning against the ground near the sinkhole. Shadows gathered around it, as if a fair number of people had congregated. Song Ku put on her coat, let's go and take a look. The two of them reached a nearby hilltop. From the elevated position, they saw people emerging from various entrances. Unlike the day the formation contracted and people fled in panic, those coming out now were dispirited and silent. 
Their demeanor was so quiet that it bordered on eerie. Some had looks of confusion, others were mournful and anguished. There were those with bloodshot eyes, their spirits distant and distracted. Homes were gone, the city was in ruins, and even the last refuge had fallen. From this day on, these individuals had become rootless wanderers. Apart from the people, there was also a significant number of zombies that had fled the area, and even half-human, half-zombie creatures in the midst of mutation. Song Ku didn't know what had transpired inside, but the scene was undeniably shocking. She had a foreboding feeling that this city might have to coexist with zombies in the future. Their position was quite conspicuous, and after a while, a hoarse voice called out behind her, Song Ku. Song Ku turned around, her oversized coat fluttering in the night breeze. Jiang Rui stared at her intently, feeling like eons had passed. It had been less than half a month since they last saw each other, yet seeing Song Ku again felt like a world away. She was still alive, and that was wonderful. But what about him? Was he really still considered alive in his current state? The experiences of this period had been like the cruelest purgatory, shattering Jiang Rui's innocence completely. Tian. Black Household A Person With No Household Registration Chapter 38 It was better to say goodbye end of Hua City Arc. If Jiang Rui could have foreseen how things would develop, he would definitely not have chosen to enter the formation. The descent of Hua City's Bagua formation was filled with extreme chaos from beginning to end. Day 1 The landmark mall at the heart of Hua City had 11 floors, with an atrium in the center and rows of shops and restaurants on either side. The crucial control center was located on the lower level, separate from the main structure. As one ascended, the available living space grew larger. When the gangway entrance closed, all the survivors fought over territory, engaging in physical altercations. Jiang Rue and his group managed to secure a small shop, mostly due to the intimidating presence of his supernatural ability. If Jiang Rui hadn't been there, they might not even have been able to hold on to this tiny space. I'm so stupid, how could I be this stupid? Zhang Qi's death had a significant impact on Zhou Anqi. She had lost her former vigor and spent her days crying. Jiang Rui, whether you believe it or not, three years ago, I really didn't initiate bullying Song Ku, Zhou Anqi's eyes were red, as she revealed the truth behind that massive brawl, it was Chao Yi who kept telling me. She said she was pretending and deliberately leading you on ambiguously. My mind got clouded, and I just wanted to teach her a lesson. Putting dead mice in her bag, tossing her uniform, test papers, and even splashing her with food all of those ideas came from Chao Yi. Even your intimate photos were sent to me by her. I always thought of her as a friend Zhou Anqi's regret was overwhelming, and she covered her face and sobbed. Although she was domineering and spoiled, she never intended to harm her classmates. She really hadn't expected Chao Yi to be so heartless. She told you to do something, and you just did it. You really are an obedient tool, pointing wherever she tells you to strike. A surviving person who was still alive couldn't bear it, and he mocked with a cold gaze. Now you regret it. Who knows if you're just pretending, even the usually easygoing Tian Yi couldn't help but feel upset for Song Ku, you. You're just shifting blame. Chao Yi's betrayal filled them with a deep hatred. At the mention of her, each of them wished they could devour her flesh. Bullying. Wasn't it just a little disagreement? Jiang Rui suddenly halted, a realization striking him, a little disagreement was also a term Chao Yi had used. So that's how it was. So he had been kept in the dark all this time. So he was just as foolish as Zhou Anqi, an utter idiot. Back when Jiang Rui's brow bone was injured, he had felt a bit resentful towards Song Ku. He resented her for being so reckless, for not understanding the gravity of her actions. So when the school wanted to hold her accountable, he had asked his family to intervene and smooth things over. But soon after, he learned from Chao Yi that Song Ku had been expelled. After that, he felt disheartened and didn't bother seeking the truth. He even didn't contact her out of frustration. Because of one sentence from Song Ku, he had held on to that grudge for so long. In your eyes, am I the same as everyone else? So you can just attack me mercilessly. Jiang Rui closed his eyes and sighed bitterly. 
He thought about Song Ku, who had stayed outside to save them. Now it was all too late. Day 3. The conflicts were still intensifying. Within a mere half day, waves of disputes erupted on the third, seventh, and ninth floors. Wherever people were present, conflicts arose. In such a confined and stifling space, even the tiniest matters could be amplified into explosive triggers. The survivors pushed and shoved, and verbal disagreements quickly escalated into physical conflicts. The piercing screams reached Jiang Rui and the others on the eighth floor, and they learned some bad news a person had mutated into a zombie. Day 4 Chaos, chaos, chaos. No one knew why zombies had infiltrated, only that impending doom was unavoidable. The number of mutants increased, and the situation worsened. Zhang Hao and his group locked the doors of their shop and guarded the entrance to prevent anyone from forcing their way in. Day 5 Even worse news, the staff responsible for distributing supplies had died. They had been murdered, and the stored supplies had been looted. Those items that were difficult to preserve or carry were trampled underfoot and crushed into pieces. The previously designated safe zone had turned into an absurd killing hell. Day 7 Zombies continue to multiply. Tian Yi unexpectedly discovered traces of Su Liren, or rather, he discovered the zombie Su Liren. At that time, he had already told Jiang Rui and the others about Su Liren's actions. Chao Yi's betrayal had numbed everyone, but even so, upon learning that their respected teacher had turned out to be a heartless villain, Zhang Hao and the others punched the wall in anger. Su Liren blended in with a group of zombies, its head twitching neurotically. It slowly passed by the shop, and when it turned around, Tian Yi noticed a festering wound on its Shudera clear bite mark. Tian Yi thought of those classmates he had pushed out to their deaths, he thought of Kong Zi Qi, his best friend. Tears streamed down his face, and he silently muttered, serves him right. They bit him well. Day 8 Jiang Rui and the others finally broke through to the first floor, following the route provided by Kong Zi Qi to find the secret door. However, the situation did not go smoothly. The secret door required both a password and biometric recognition. The personnel within the formation had mostly been injured or killed, and the rest were nowhere to be found. Day 10 No one expected that they would encounter Chao Yi again. Those who abandoned their companions would eventually be abandoned by them. Chao Yi wasn't faring well inside. Her petty schemes were utterly useless in the face of complete madness. When Jiang Rui and the others found her, her hair was disheveled, her clothes were torn, and she was being held down by a few repugnant-looking men. As soon as she saw them, her eyes lit up, and she struggled with all her might to break free from their grasp and crawled over laboriously. Jiang Rui, Enchi, save me. Save me. The group stopped in their tracks, looking at her with indifference. About four or five men stared at them with unease, especially at the fire whip in Jiang Rui's hand. They hesitated to make a move. Chao Yi didn't receive the rescue she hoped for. The light in her eyes gradually faded, and she hysterically shouted, We're companions. How can you do this? How can you stand by and watch someone die? Then she was dragged away. You won't die well. I won't spare you. Jiang Rui, Zhou Anqi, all of you deserve to die. The curses from behind were incessant and increasingly venomous. What will happen to her? Lin Xia averted her gaze, tightly holding Zhou Anqi's hand. If she didn't hold her back, Zhou Anqi might have lunged to tear Chao Yi's mouth apart. The person who was pulling her has bite marks on his leg, Zhang Hao said. Everyone fell silent. Day 13 Jiang Rui attempted once again to break through the secret door, to no avail. On their way back to the eighth floor, they unexpectedly rescued a clerk from the Hua City Hall who was besieged by zombies. He was emaciated and on the brink of death. Tian Yi gave him water and food, barely keeping him conscious. In the evening, the man finally woke up. They learned from him that he had been the designer of the Bagua Formation Project, responsible for the entire structure of the formation. The Bagua Formation is the best shelter in Hua City, the best. Why? Why can it withstand natural disasters but not human nature? 
I don't want to die here. This place is already hell. The clerk named Li Tong spoke to himself in a vacant murmur. Day 14 After regaining consciousness, Li Tong led them into the main control room. Even though they all knew that opening the formation might very well lead to an endless wave of zombies and insects, Li Tong resolutely pressed the button. Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan listened quietly to their story. They hadn't anticipated that even within the formation, such unforeseen tragedies would occur. Zhou Anqi summoned her courage and walked up to Song Ku. This once haughty little princess had learned to bow her head after experiencing so much. Although I still really dislike you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She apologized to Song Ku, repeating I'm sorry over and over, trembling all over, unable to speak through her tears. In the end, she wiped her tears away and stubbornly said, I'm not forcing you, and you don't have to forgive me. Song Ku sighed deeply in her heart and responded, Okay. Zhuang Qinyan asked, What's your plan now? Jian Rui said, We're planning to head north with Brother Li. Li Tong had internal channels and knew the locations of various small and large alliance shelters. Jian Rui felt responsible. Zhang Hao, Lin Xia, Tian Yi he had to lead these people to survive. They might stop at a certain shelter or perhaps continue to wander until they find a place that would accept them. What about you? Jian Rui looked at Song Ku. We Song Ku lowered her head, and coincidentally, Zhuang Qinyan was also looking at her. We, are going to District C, C-72. From the slope behind them, and Chiwen's loud voice echoed, Little sister, get ready to leave. His booming voice startled the surrounding zombies, and they swarmed toward him like compass needles. And Chiwen exclaimed, here I go, and his purple light flickered as he started cleaning up with grumbling. It was time to say goodbye. Tian Yi and Lin Xia looked at her with teary eyes. Song Ku nodded at them, goodbye, hope to see, see you again. Then she turned to Jiang Rui, goodbye. Goodbye, Song Ku, Jiang Rui's voice was hoarse, but his eyes held a kind of resolute core. Take care. Song Ku turned and walked away. Zhuang Qinyan said something that made her stomp her foot in annoyance, then she chased after him and kicked his wheelchair. Their figures merged into another group of tall figures, quickly disappearing into the night. Song Ku was carefree, open-minded, and graceful in her comings and goings, like the wind that couldn't be grasped in one's hands. And Jiang Rui, once naive and full of confidence, ignorant and foolish. At this moment, he finally understood. They were never meant to travel the same path, just like a lighthouse and drifting ships. Even if they temporarily crossed paths, they were destined for permanent separation. It was better to say goodbye. Chapter 39 Ilya knows everything. Are you sad? What? Zhuang Qinyan observed Song Ku's expression and asked again, Are you sad? Song Ku shook her head. She and Xiang Rui, Tian Yi, and the others were always destined to be apart. She had been mentally prepared for it from the beginning. Zhuang Qinyan TSK Tisked and hinted, I think he's quite sad. This he didn't need to be explicitly mentioned it naturally referred to Jiang Rui. Song Ku slightly furrowed her brow, looking puzzled. He is an, an awakener. He can protect himself, no, no need to be sad. They were talking past each other what they said was fundamentally different. Zhuang Qinyan found it amusing in his mind, well, it's good that you're not sad. It's just a pity fallen flowers have intentions, flowing water is heartless. Song Ku kicked the wheelchair, saying, don't be so cryptic. Zhuang Qinyan hissed, Song Kiki, I'm warning you officially, we only have this one wheelchair. Song Ku stomped her foot, don't call me Song Kiki. Playfully returning to the base, there were already two military pickups parked at the entrance. Wu Juamin had given everyone just ten minutes to pack up, and they were set to depart on time. Song Ku only had a backpack with her belongings, traveling light. She saw logistics personnel moving things around, there were several large and small suitcases. Worth noting, the people from Azure Phoenix military squad were just like her, empty-handed, walking in a carefree manner. She suddenly recalled the powerful mobile artillery she had seen near the formation point before, the ones used to bombard zombies. 
she quickly went to ask Zhuang Qinyan. Zhuang Qinyan gave a concise answer, spatial abilities. The fact that the military possessed spatial containers wasn't much of a secret, and Song Ku would know sooner or later. Song Ku suddenly gained a new piece of knowledge and was greatly surprised. She bombarded him with questions, nearly leaving herself breathless. Zhuang Qinyan simply handed her the necklace he had obtained from Wu Yuru. After pondering for a while, she learned how to activate it with her mental power. She became completely absorbed in it, walking slowly and absent-mindedly. She was still playing with it, opening and closing it repeatedly, even when they were about to board the vehicle. Zhuang Qinyan. You must have too much mental power to spare, right? Wu Juemin and An Qiwen were in the first pickup truck. Because Song Ku had delayed a bit while playing with the necklace, when she arrived, it was already full. So, she and Zhuang Qinyan turned towards the second truck. The back compartment of the second truck was spacious. Someone had turned on the radio, and melodious songs occasionally played. Song Ku unintentionally noticed that Maya Jiu, sitting across from her, had a slight smile at the corner of his mouth. It was a rare and joyful expression. This was the first time she had seen Maya Jiu smile. A tiny flame of curiosity ignited in her heart. She discreetly tugged at Zhuang Qingyan's sleeve, urging him to look as well. As the pleasant melody gradually came to an end, the person sitting next to the radio was about to switch the song. A young team member named Xiong Ping spoke up, Hey, don't change it. Vice Captain loves this song. It's his goddess. Pfft. Who's goddess? Oh Yang Pei sprayed out a mouthful of water, realizing he was being too loud. He quickly lowered his voice, No way, right? Someone like Vice Captain Maeda, who's usually so stern and serious, actually chasing after a celebrity. Maeda Jo's esper ability was an air barrier. He was usually strict and reserved, rarely smiling or speaking much. He held a reputation in the team second only to Wu Juamin. Oh Yang Pei couldn't believe that someone as stiff as him, always looking like he was scolding others, would actually be a fan of a celebrity. And even claim that celebrity as his goddess. Who's vice captain's goddess? Oh Yang Pei suddenly seemed to uncover a great secret, his expression excited and eager. Do you guys know Lin Yu Yu? The sweetest songstress in Ferrara, the superstar who's famous throughout District C. Ah, I've heard of her. Wang Chang joined in on the excitement, and the three of them huddled close together, murmuring to each other, isn't she the one who sang Thank You for Loving Me? That song's been a hit for so long, with over a billion views on the Star Network. I thank you for your honeyed words. Sweet words, I thank you for your honeyed lips. A sword in the belly. Get lost, that's not how it goes. That's not how it goes. That's exactly how it goes. Let me sing it for you, so you can listen carefully. I thank you for your honey. Bang! Maeda Jio's fist struck the compartment wall, his voice sharp, shut up. His face darkened and he said something very fast in his hometown's dialect, sounding like he was cursing someone. Wang Chang's face turned bright red, while Ouyang Pei and Xiong Ping beside him struggled not to burst into laughter. Their facial features twisted in an oddly pained manner, holding back their mirth with great effort. Aside from this somewhat discordant little incident, the atmosphere in the compartment remained quite relaxed. Song Ku saw several members of Azure Phoenix handing torn uniforms to a middle-aged man in a corner. She vaguely remembered him because An Chiwen, with his booming voice, had once exclaimed incredulously, What? A grown man's supernatural ability is actually embroidery. It was said that he was an E-level awakener named Wu Xianghai. His ability was extremely rare something like stitching. He could mend two different things together. Since Azure Phoenix military squad had a limited supply of uniforms and they were frequently damaged, they would seek him out whenever there was a tear. His repairs were so well done that the mended parts looked as good as new. However, Wu Xianghai was small in stature, with sparse eyebrows and restless eyes that constantly darted around, as if he was plotting something. In Zhuang Qingyan's words, he was described as shifty-eyed and sneaky. Though he indeed had a sharp tongue, the description was spot on. After encountering Wu Xianghai, 
Song Ku had to believe that a person's awakened supernatural ability was truly entirely random. On the horizon outside the window, the sun was slowly rising, and the two pickup trucks raced forward as if chasing after the afterglow of dawn. This was the most relaxed morning Song Ku had experienced since the apocalypse. No zombies, no insect swarms, and no endless slaughter. Her entire face was bathed in sunlight, and she silently exclaimed, Let's go, District C-72. After three days and two nights of travel, Wu Juemin's group safely arrived on the outskirts of Ferrara. Song Ku eagerly stuck her head out of the window, feeling the cool breeze on her face, causing her shoulder-length black hair to flutter and fly. At a distance, they could already catch a glimpse of a corner of Ferrara. Massive neon signs floated in the air, and the dreamy Ferris wheel gleamed like a diamond ring. High-frequency searchlights, balloons, and ribbons all shimmered, while high-tech holographic billboards continually changed images. Steam-powered flower boats weaved between countless skyscrapers. Ferrara truly lived up to its status as a sea-level city, with its technological advancement vastly surpassing that of Hua City. As the pickup trucks entered the city through the main road, the path was smooth and unobstructed. A wandering musician playing the guitar leaned against the city gate and upon seeing them, smiled brightly. He warmly sang while dancing around the vehicles, Ferrara the free Ferrara, it's the dream you linger in. Their exaggerated performance startled Song Ku, and she silently withdrew her head. After a while, she whispered to Zhuang Qinyan, aren't there safety checks here? After all, this was District C. Wasn't this too lax? Even their District F had sentries stationed. Zhuang Qinyan, also gazing outside, had the blurry lights reflecting on his profile, making his expression all the more intriguing. Ferrara prides itself on freedom and art, welcoming every traveler from afar. However, while they may welcome you, it's not guaranteed they'll let you stay. Indeed, Ferrara's security was indeed good. The city was bustling with constant foot traffic, but not a single zombie could be seen along the way. It was as if the apocalypse Song Ku and her group had experienced in Hua City was just an illusion. The two pickup trucks eventually parked on the outskirts of the square. Going further into the inner streets was impossible due to their narrowness and heavy pedestrian traffic. When Song Ku got out of the truck, dozens of cool motorbikes zoomed past her, creating a chaotic scene. The convoy had barely moved about 10 meters when the intense music continued pounding in her eardrums. Song Ku raised her head, and the surrounding streets were adorned with colorful lights, constantly flashing in a bling bling manner. She stared for a few seconds, only to find herself dazzled. Looking upwards, she saw towering skyscrapers that seemed to reach the clouds. Their steel and concrete exteriors emitted an intangible sense of pressure in the night. The whole city was enveloped in a light purple, dreamlike haze. As Wu Juamin and his team got off the truck and walked only a few steps, the time struck exactly 8 o'clock. Suddenly, the massive clock high in the air of Ferrara chimed. Dang dang dang. After three chimes, everyone on the streets and within the skyscrapers stopped their actions and looked up. Amidst numerous flower boats, between two towering towers, a giant searchlight projected a holographic image. A slender figure gradually emerged and became clearer. He had a brilliant and dazzling head of golden hair, a flawless face, and was dressed in a sharp, pure white suit. From an exterior perspective, he was beautiful and ethereal, so much so that it was difficult to determine his gender at first glance. The man placed one hand in front of his chest and executed an incredibly graceful gentleman's bow. I'm pleased that new travelers have come to Ferrara today. His lustrous eyes surveyed the crowd, and a slight smile graced his lips. Let's welcome them to the true paradise. HM let's sing paradise once. Cheers, whistles, and deafening applause erupted. The atmosphere in the square was exceptionally fervent. The man extended his right hand and casually gestured. The surroundings seemed to blur, and suddenly Song Ku saw countless flowers blooming, and heard the enchanting voices reminiscent of sea nymphs. And the super stereo sound lingered in everyone's ears, completely immersing the city in a wave of music. The crowd descended into madness, their eyes filled with obsession as they elevated the man to the highest pedestal of idolization, shouting their hearts out. Ilya! 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 
All right, the carnival is over. Let me reveal a little secret, the throne race competition is currently accepting registrations. Ilya has prepared generous rewards, so everyone must remember to participate. Ilya playfully blinked, setting off another wave of cheers. As the spotlight dimmed, the holographic projection vanished, and Ilya's figure disappeared along with it. However, the impact he brought lingered for a long time. The citizens of Ferrara gazed towards the direction of the towers, only regretting that time passed too quickly. Song Ku was left stunned. Who was this person, a superstar? Captain Wu, who is that? Someone from the logistics team couldn't help but ask. Wu Jiuamin stared in the direction where the man had disappeared for a few seconds before saying solemnly, Ilya, the magistrate of District C-72, the lord of Ferrara. Is he v very impressive? Otherwise, why were so many people going crazy for him? It's not he, it's it, Zhuang Qinyan corrected, using a gender-neutral term in the common language of the alliance. Ilya is an artificial intelligence. District C-72, Ferrara, the city of art and freedom, was also the sole city within the alliance entirely governed by artificial intelligence. The lord of Ferrara was elected by its citizens. Initially, Ilya was the most beloved virtual idol in Ferrara. However, in one of the city's elections for lord, for some unknown reason, Ilya's name appeared in the final list of five candidates, alongside a group of insincere and calculating politicians, making it seem entirely out of place. After all, it was merely a heap of data, even if it had a bit of popularity, could it really replace humans? The competing candidates scoffed at this idea, considering Ilya the biggest joke of the year. Yet, they still ordered the error to be rectified quickly. However, the final voting results left everyone dumbfounded. Ilya was elected as the lord with an astonishing 90% support rate. The defeated politicians were initially in disbelief, then they cursed continuously, damn it, have all these artists in Ferrara gone crazy? It was too absurd. What a joke. How could a machine possibly govern a city? But the reality turned out to be quite the opposite. After Ilya's election, Ferrara flourished, and even the crime rate steadily decreased. In Ferrara, everyone had heard a saying, Ilya knows everything. No matter what you had done, you were under the surveillance of artificial intelligence. Chapter, 40 Did you bring money? With tasks at hand, Wu Juamin gave a simple explanation prepared to take Azure Phoenix's people away. He left casually, but the logistics team members had tears in their eyes, reluctant to part. Wu Juamin had rescued them from a perilous situation and led them in a retreat, guiding them all the way to the peaceful District C. They couldn't greedily ask for more it was clearly not his obligation. Even if Wu Juamin had left them today, it could be said that he had fulfilled his duty to the utmost. After parting ways with Azure Phoenix's people, Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan didn't travel with the remaining group they chose to act separately. Ferrara was an open and inclusive city. Capsule sleeping pods for wandering travelers could be found everywhere on the streets. Not only were they free to use, but they were also easy to access just a facial scan away. As it wasn't early anymore, Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan each booked a room and went to sleep. The next morning, after a quick tidying up, the two of them headed straight to the Awakener base. Ferrara's Special Affairs Agency Awakener base was located in a concealed alley on the west side of the square. Its architectural style was consistent with the city's flamboyant and colorful aesthetics. The only difference was that its sign seemed a bit aged. Upon entering, the first thing that caught the eye was a spacious mezzanine. A few individuals were scattered around, and the winding staircase led up to the elevated central desk. A glasses-wearing female staff member was busy there. As Song Ku approached, she faintly heard a melodious tune. Looking down, she was left speechless. On the desk was a small transparent screen, and the holographic projection on it was familiar. Wasn't that Ilya from before? But now Ilya was dressed in elegant clothing, obviously from an early performance video. The girl on the desk was staring at it with rapt attention, wearing an enamored smile. Song Ku, hello, I'd like to, to register as an awakener. The girl swiftly pressed down on the screen, her expression turning formal. She pushed a booklet over, start by filling out the form. 
complete every item on the first three pages, the rest is optional. Then go to the first room on the left for a photograph, turn right to the second room for genetic testing, and proceed to the second floor for an on-site awakener evaluation. Once you've completed everything, come back to me. Oh, and remember to bring all the receipts. The instructions came in a rapid succession, and the pace was quite fast. Song Ku was getting dizzy, half remembering and half forgetting. Fortunately, she had Zhuang Qin Yan with her, who had a good memory, or else it would have been a mess. Following the staff's guidance, Song Ku obediently filled out the form, then hurriedly went to take a photograph. She became nervous as soon as she had to take a picture. Her posture was unnaturally stiff, her lips pressed together, radiating a pitiful look. Luckily, there was no photographer in the room, only a mechanical arm controlling the camera. The emotionless electronic synthesized voice kept prompting with errors, Ding please tilt your head to the right. Ding detected that the person's expression is too stiff. Please relax and tilt your head to the right. Ding unable to detect the photographer. Please return to the center of the frame. Song Ku turned her head to the side, then accidentally tilted it too much and fell out of the chair. Zhuang Qin Yan couldn't help but laugh beside her. Song Ku, just take a proper photo. Why are you bullying the machine? Song Ku glared at him angrily, shook her hand, took a deep breath, and managed to force a fake smile. The final photo turned out to be quite odd, and Zhuang Qin Yan laughed for a full two minutes. After taking the photo, she went to the second room for blood drawing and genetic testing. Ferrara had specialized awakener assessment equipment, much better than the inferior one Wu Juamin had. It could not only test ability levels but was also said to calculate the upper limit of potential that could be unlocked in the future using artificial intelligence. The testing room was also fully automated. Blood was drawn first, then she lay down in a box of unknown purpose, getting scanned from top to bottom. Next was the awakener verification room on the second floor. Its main purpose was on-site verification to establish local records for easy reference later. Song Ku finally encountered people again. Inside the room were three verification officers, two men and one woman, all sitting in a row. After the person in front of her came out, it wasn't long before they called out, next. Song Ku pushed the door open and entered. She was in a closed isolation room with glass only in front, and the speaker on the wall lit up with a green light. The voice of a verification officer came through, please demonstrate your ability. Don't worry, we have top-notch security measures, so please release your ability to the fullest extent to facilitate our judgment. Song Ku's hand touched the edge of the table. Two seconds later, the table disappeared, and she was holding a long spear in her hand, standing obediently in place. The verification officers were a bit taken aback. That's it. Song Ku nodded. If it was just a display of her ability, this was enough. It's a bit crude, isn't it? Doesn't feel particularly special. Well, can you change the shape of objects? This could be considered supportability. Maybe you could help the engineering department with waste material cleanup. I have quite a lot of furniture at home that I don't use. Was just wondering who could tidy it up. If you put it that way, this ability is pretty useful, huh? A practical garbage collector, ha ha ha. To be honest, if she's an E-level, I might consider hiring an awakener to help me with daily trash disposal. Doesn't sound bad, does it? The two male verification officers exchanged a glance and found themselves quite humorous as they burst into laughter. These people weren't as formidable as Xuan Qinyan, who could immediately determine her ability type with just a glance. Song Ku absentmindedly conjured a spear, and the long spear emitted a faint blue light as it traced through the air. The corner of the female evaluator's eyes seemed to catch something. She lifted her head and carefully examined the spiritual weapon. This thing in your hand seems to be an ancient civilization cold weapon, right? Does it have any offensive capabilities, or is it only suitable as a craft? Holding the spear with one hand, Song Ku didn't bother to use any techniques. She simply thrust it straight ahead. Stab. A deeply seated crack appeared on the so called wall with top notch security, and a powerful shockwave surged over the wall, overturning the evaluation forms the officers had on the table. 
The next moment, the entire glass window shattered with a loud boom, and fragments rained down. Oops, used too much force. Song Ku felt a bit guilty. The three verification officers. What damn handicraft, what cursed supportability. She was obviously a living star of disaster. They had actually thought about having her clean up garbage were they eager for their lives to be shorter. Cough, the male evaluator sitting in the middle awkwardly coughed twice. That's enough. It's confirmed to be a strong offensive ability. The specific level will have to wait for the results of the genetic test. Oh. Song Ku shook off her spear, took two steps forward, and tried to step over the broken glass to retrieve her registration form. Don't come out. The door, the door is at the back. The two male evaluators yelled in panic, rapidly retreating their chairs while hurriedly jotting down a few notes on Song Ku's form. Treating it like a hot potato, they handed it over to a mechanical arm, which returned it to the isolation room, submit, submit it, leave it to the central desk. When Song Ku went back, the girl on the desk was once again engrossed in playing around on her device, sneakily watching Ilya's treasured old footage. Song Ku placed the form on the table and gave it a glance before continuing in a formulaic tone, the results of the genetic test will be out within three working days. You can come to pick up your awakener certificate then. For now, please make the payment. It's a total of 10,000 alliance coins. Ha! Huh. Song Ku dumbly inquired, 10,000, what? 10,000 alliance coins, your registration fee, the girl said somewhat impatiently. Song Ku was dumbfounded, oh my goodness. How come no one told her that registering as an awakener also required money? The girl probably hadn't encountered someone as clueless as her, and she became a little flustered herself. Of course it costs money. The machines for ability testing, the algorithm fees for AI, and the daily maintenance all require expenses. We're not a charity. Song Ku, what should she do if she doesn't have money? She turned to Zhuang Qinyan with a perplexed look, her eyes seeming to ask, did you bring money? For the first time, Zhuang Qinyan couldn't answer Song Ku's question. He didn't have money either. But that's not his fault. First, given his upbringing, having lived for almost 30 years, he had never needed to worry about money. Secondly, among the people he knew, there was no one as poor as Song Ku. The two paupers were in a similar situation, both lost in thought. The girl, perhaps feeling sorry for her, offered an idea, well, since you're an awakener, you can take on missions as a contractor. Just join any team and do some miscellaneous tasks. When you have money, come back and register. Ms. Missions? Yes, go out and turn left at the second intersection, walk straight for 100 meters, and you'll find the Special Affairs Commission Center. Ferrara, Special Affairs Commission Center. This was a more impressive building, and it was evident that the people coming and going possessed strong auras, the majority being awakeners. A bald man with an arm as thick as Song Ku's waist sat atop a sculpture at the entrance, his legs spread wide, arms crossed over his chest. The black bean-like eyes sized up Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan as they passed by, radiating disdain and scorn. Little brat and cripple, you really dare enter anywhere. You treat this place like a nursery. The bald man was muscular, probably a muscular type awakener. He spoke loudly, intentionally for them to hear. Zhuang Qinyan's smile turned icy, his gaze shifting to the bald man with chilling precision. Song Ku felt a shiver down her spine. Whenever Zhuang Qinyan displayed this kind of supervillain smile, someone was bound to suffer. However, before they could make any move, several thick vines suddenly descended from above. Smack, smack, Smack they slapped the bald man's face several times, and then one of the vines bound him and flung him away, headfirst, into a fountain. A woman with red hair dashed out from the hall, her anger evident. You bastard, how dare you put your filthy ass on my idol's head. The tough guy had lost two front teeth due to the surprise attack, his mouth was full of blood, and he viciously charged toward the woman. Their abilities clashed, their supernatural powers erupting. They ended up fighting fiercely in the square in front of the commission hall. Others weren't even surprised by the scene. Some even specifically came out to watch and clap their hands. What happened to that baldy? 
Did he provoke that crazy woman, Kihori? Don't you know crazy Kihori yet? Isn't there just one thing that can make her mad? What happened? See that statue? Looks familiar. It's one of Ferrara's top ten rising stars, virtual idol Luo Qingha. Word has it he's got a lot of female fans. Crazy Kihori is his super loyal fan. The rich women's fan club sponsored this. They specially commissioned a famous master to make a life-sized statue of him. Why is that bald guy like this? Acting like he can just sit on it. It's about the same as pulling shit on Crazy Kihori's head. She'll definitely rip him apart. The entertainment circle is truly terrifying. As Crazy Kihori and the bald man continued to fight, the commotion grew louder, leaves flying and dust swirling. Even the fountain stone wall had been broken in several places. In no time, a man in uniform came out from the hall. A quick glance, veins popping on his forehead, he angrily started frantically pressing buttons on his computer. Maintenance fee totaling 124,000 alliance coins. Should I deduct it directly through your terminals or deduct it from both of your mission scores? Why should I pay? She attacked me. The bald head was not only beaten but also had to pay, his whole body was in a mess, and his eyes were as big as copper bells. The commotion at the entrance came to an end, and Song Kook finally managed to squeeze into the lobby. Truly befitting the commission center of District C, the interior was brimming with technology. As soon as she entered, she saw an enormous floating screen divided into three sections left, center, and right scrolling through various commission requests. Above the screen, holographic projections occasionally flashed with colorful announcements like, Congratulations to Team Three Grandsons and a Grandpa for completing B-Grade Commission XX. Three Grandsons and a Grandpa? What kind of random names were these? Around the lobby, there were over a hundred self-service terminals. By swiping their Awakener identification cards, people could search for, accept, or submit missions. Furthermore, the commissions posted here weren't limited to Awakeners. If ordinary people had the strength and courage, they could also join teams with Awakeners for missions. Song Ku looked up for a moment. The displayed missions were incredibly diverse. For example, the simplest E-grade mission was to help buy groceries and deliver them to a nearby resident in District D, but the reward was quite meager 300 alliance coins. D and C grade missions were a bit more challenging, involving tasks like finding missing relatives, hiring bodyguards to escort someone to a certain location, or completing specific Awakener-related tasks, such as need an Earth-type Awakener skilled in engineering to help rebuild a collapsed house and so on. Looking further up, she saw a B grade mission, clearing out zombies in the municipal hall of Luliport District D150. This one suited her well and came with a reward of a whopping 2,000 alliance coins. With five such missions, she could easily cover the registration fee. Feeling motivated, Song Kook cracked her knuckles. She was determined to take on this mission. First, she needed to assemble a team. However, a problem arose. The people in the lobby were in a hurry, each focused on their own matters, and nobody stopped to talk. How was she supposed to form a team? She couldn't just shout out, I want to form a team. She had a stutter, so she couldn't even manage it. Zhuang Qinyan came up with an idea, she could write down her strengths on a signboard and try to attract compatible teammates. Staring at the blank paper for a while, Song Ku wrote three words in the most straightforward and simple language, I'm very strong. Zhuang Qinyan, alright, if it makes you happy. Unfortunately, this tactic didn't yield much result. Most Awakeners ignored it entirely, not even giving her a glance. Occasionally, a person with nothing better to do would pass by, read the three words, and burst out laughing. Song Ku was quite annoyed. If she were more eloquent, she would probably confront them and ask, Why are you laughing? I really am strong. Don't believe it. Let's spar. She had been squatting there for nearly an afternoon, and her corner remained completely ignored. Song Ku also began to see the pattern. Most of the Awakeners coming and going here already had established teams with fixed benefit-sharing arrangements. They were cautious about admitting newcomers and leaned more towards physically strong males. Not only did she appear thin and frail, 
but she was also accompanied by a wheelchair-bound companiona combination that, at first glance, indeed lacked competitiveness. Song Ku wasn't willing to accept defeat. If no one wanted her, she would form her own team herself. She tore apart the I'm very strong sign and strode confidently to the man counter, ready to submit her team formation application. However, she received a devastating blow, in order to create a team on her own, she needed at least two awakeners. Now Song Ku was trapped in a vicious cycle, to register as an awakener, she needed money to earn money, she needed a job to get a job. She needed a team to form a team, she needed at least two awakeners it formed a perfect bias loop, endlessly repeating with no way out. After running around all day accomplishing nothing, Song Ku sat on the ground with a dejected expression, wondering if she was destined to be a nobody forever. Zhuang Qinyan had accompanied her through the whole ordeal, and now he consoled her with a helpless smile, don't be so disheartened, it's just forming a team. Song Ku's voice was full of grievances, no one wants to, to be on my team. How can that be? Isn't there a ready-made candidate? Song Ku's eyes lit up as she quickly looked up, who? Zhuang Qinyan gave a cryptic smile, this person does not have much brains, quite fiery in temper, but could be reluctantly used to make up the numbers. Chapter, 41 Excellent Nourishment The person Zhuang Qinyan referred to as the make-up-the-numbers guy was Su Xing. Before Su Xing separated from them, he secretly slipped a small piece of paper to Song Ku. On the paper, he wrote down the place he was temporarily staying, allowing Song Ku to come and visit him when she had time. Song Ku and Zhuang Qinyan followed that address to find Su Xing, and what they discovered was it was actually a seven-star hotel. Well, look at this white luxurious dome, the evergreen front garden, and the excellent view of the night sky from a high altitude. It looked expensive at first glance. All right, strict access control, even external visitors weren't allowed in. The two of them had to inform the robot butler and waited for a full 20 minutes in the chilly wind before Su Xing finally came downstairs. He was wearing a colorful coat, floating over like a butterfly, sister. Su Xing obediently jumped into Song Ku's arms, his eyes sparkling, his smile sweet. Just as he was about to speak, he suddenly noticed Zhuang Qinyan standing aside. Su Xing, Ovo. His clever words got stuck in his throat, his smile froze on his lips, and a surge of irritability rushed to his forehead, why did he come too? After Song Ku explained, mentioning that she had been together with Zhuang Qinyan during this time, Su Xing reluctantly nodded, leading the two upstairs. As soon as they stepped into the room, Song Ku was stunned. Su Xing was actually staying in a suite, fully equipped with amenities. There was 24-hour warm water if one got thirsty, they could order food anytime they were hungry, and they could watch the latest projection programs when bored. Additionally, there were entertainment rooms, swimming pools, fitness rooms. Turns out they were sleeping rough outside, perhaps even staying in free capsule hotels by the roadside, while Su Xing, the invisible rich kid, was living luxuriously in a big house. His life was undoubtedly extremely enjoyable. Dizzily, Song Ku sat down on the sofa and felt as if she had sunk into a soft cloud. Su Xing offered her a bunch of snacks and drinks as if presenting a treasure. Why are you living here, here? Song Ku asked, her confusion easing after a moment. My dad had a lot of money saved at Yabin Bank. Su Xing innocently blinked. Yabin Bank was a well-known commercial bank within the alliance, with branches scattered across various cities and regions. When Su Weigua passed away, Su Xing became the legitimate heir to his inheritance. Everyone understood the reasoning, but it was hard to avoid jealousy when a ten-year-old kid possessed such astonishing wealth. During his time in the logistics team, Su Xing hadn't revealed anything to others. He acted like a timid little rabbit, happily munching on sesame cakes as if he didn't have a care in the world. Everyone thought he was just like Song Ku, coming from the backward district F, an ignorant and impoverished child. How did you know, know about this hotel? Song Ku still couldn't believe it. Both were from the district F, but as soon as Su Xing arrived at Ferrara, he stayed in a luxury hotel. He seemed to be swimming in comfort, while she couldn't even distinguish the four cardinal directions and suffered the embarrassment of not having enough money to register as an awakener. My dad took me to a concert here before, and we stayed here. 
Su Xing answered matter-of-factly. So, the real poor person was just her. Eating the delicious snacks, Song Ka's mood grew even more melancholic. Sister, why did you come looking for me? Su Xing curled up into a small ball on the carpet, pressed against Song Ka's thigh, and asked softly. He didn't know why, but he felt particularly close to Song Ku. Perhaps a child's intuition was naturally accurate, or maybe both of them being from the District F made them connect. Song Ku was strong and gentle, and Su Xing firmly believed that she wouldn't hurt him. Song Ku stumbled through explaining that she wanted his help to form a team and meet the required number of members. Considering Su Xing was timid, she hastily added, you don't need to, to do the task. I can, can manage it on my own. After listening, Su Xing, without much thought, readily agreed, sure, sister. I'll join your team. This way, the two of us, with two awakeners, two awakeners. He suddenly popped up and pointed at Zhuang Qinyan, two awakeners. Isn't he? Zhuang Qinyan leaned by the window, elegantly sipping tea, maintaining a calm demeanor. Song Ku glanced over, puzzled, him, what's wrong? Su Xing glanced at Zhuang Qinyan, then back at Song Ku. His words trailed off, and his eyes moved around, then suddenly he exclaimed, oh. With an expression that said, I understand now. Sister, are you hungry? I'm really hungry. Can you order some food for me? The service machine is in the living room. Song Ko found herself inexplicably assigned to place an order. With only the two of them in the room, Su Xing paced back and forth, hands behind his back, looking smug and childish, as if he had just discovered something profound about Zhuang Qinyan, you didn't tell sister that you're an awakener. Zhuang Qinyan responded calmly, yeah, she didn't ask, so I didn't have the chance to say. Of course, Su Xing didn't believe him. He stuck his tongue out in disdain and scrunched his face. You're lying to a kid. Clearly, you're an awakener and yet you pretend to be pitiful, and can only sit in a wheelchair. Are you afraid that if you tell the truth, sister won't want you anymore? You want me to be self-reliant? You have no shame. Amid Su Xing's relentless no shame, no shame, no shame, Zhuang Qingyan's expression remained unchanged. He gently placed the tea cup in his hand on the table, making a crisp clink sound. Saying you have no brains, I really haven't wronged you. He interlocked his ten fingers over his abdomen, smiling menacingly at Su Xing. I bet that even if I tell Song Ko I'm an awakener, given the life and death bond between us, she would still bring me along. And you? After pretending to be so innocent and naive before, now that she knows how cunning you are at such a young age, well, let me think she probably won't even have time to run away, will she? Su Xing was taken aback, you. You. You, you, you. He kept stammering, failing to continue his argument, and finally exploded with frustration, stomping his feet and cursing, you villain. When Song Ku returned, she found Su Xing glowering at Zhuang Qinyan, panting heavily. It's ordered, done. Su Xing quickly turned his head, switching his expression faster than flipping a page in a book, putting on a fatally sweet smile. Sister, why don't you stay here? There are still plenty of empty rooms, and I feel scared alone. A luxury hotel was certainly more comfortable than a capsule warehouse, so Song Ku didn't hesitate to say thank you to Su Xing. Ecstatic, Su Xing jumped up and enthusiastically wanted to show Song Ku around the room. As he turned, Zhuang Qinyan also followed. He immediately spread his arms like a protective chick, guarding the door, what are you still doing here? You go stay outside you're not welcome here. Song Ku felt a bit awkward. She had promised to look after Zhuang Qinyan's leg. She also couldn't just leave him alone to sleep in a comfortable room. If Su Xing really didn't want to accommodate Zhuang Qinyan, then she maybe she should sleep in the capsule warehouse with him. Just as she was about to say something, Zhuang Qinyan calmly adjusted the blanket on his knee, Litli Lotus. Ah! Ah! Su Xing irritably started making weird noises, completely controlled by him. In the end, both of them managed to stay. However, Song Ko couldn't shake the feeling that something was a bit off. Had Su Xing's personality changed a bit in the few days they hadn't seen each other? 
And also, when did he become so familiar with Shuang Qinyan? The next day, the three of them set off once again for the commission center. Su Xing skipped and hopped as if he were out shopping, walking backwards with enthusiasm. Sister, after we're done forming the team, let's go eat something delicious. My dad took me to a place. Someone rushed towards them, colliding with Su Xing. He stumbled a bit, and Song Kuk quickly reached out to steady him. The person muttered a vague sorry and hurriedly ran past them, heading in another direction. What's happening? A curious individual poked their head out from a nearby shop. There are zombies up ahead. The person shouting looked excited. Song Ku was momentarily stunned, suspecting she had misheard there's something delicious up ahead as there are zombies up ahead. To be so enthusiastic about encountering zombies, were the citizens of Ferrara all this daring? Should we go, go and take a look? Song Ku asked her companions for their opinions. Both Zhuang Qinyan and Su Xing nodded in agreement. The three of them followed the crowd and soon arrived at the scene. In the center of the crowd, a tall zombie was bound by several ropes, its face twisted in a fierce grimace as it struggled and roared like a trapped beast. There were obvious knife marks, scars, and bruises from the ropes on its body. The ends of the ropes were held by different individuals, each of their faces filled with the excitement of slaughter, the cruelty of bloodlust, and an indescribable eagerness to try. A burly man stepped forward, planted his foot on the zombie's head, spat in its face, and then raised his arms in triumph. The others responded excitedly, as if he were some kind of world-conquering hero. Song Ku couldn't help but furrow her brows. Holding her hand, Su Xing lowered his chattering voice, fearfully hiding behind her. Before long, a mechanized forklift with a special number on its body came roaring in. A massive iron cage descended from the sky, capturing the zombie alive, and then it was lifted away. Why didn't they kill it? Song Ku whispered. A person nearby who had been watching the commotion gave her a sidelong glance, new here. Kill it? That's crude, far too crude. No artistic sense. But this is the throne race competition its excellent nourishment. Chapter, 42 Formation of V587 Throne Race Competition On the day they entered the city, Ilya mentioned this term, but at that time, everyone was more astonished by the identity of the artificial intelligence, so they didn't pay much attention to it. And what was the deal with nourishment? The attitude of the citizens of Ferrara towards zombies was drastically different from the people Song Ku encountered in District F and District D. There was a hint of fanatical hunting in their approach. Zhuang Qinyan leaned forward from his wheelchair, his slender fingers lifting up a poster covered in numerous footprints. He gazed at the words on it and slowly recited, Smooth roads only make people mediocre. Only flames and thorns can temper the true crown of a king. Ichem. Throne race competition, hot registration ongoing, address on the back. Su Xing also leaned in with his little head. If you're curious, you can go take a look, Zhuang Qinyan said. Yeah, Song Ku nodded. Once the Awakener registration was sorted out, she would go check out this throne race competition. But for now, the priority was to form their team at the Commission Center. The group of them arrived at the Ferrara Special Affairs Commission Center again. In just a day, the damaged fountain pool at the entrance had already been repaired. Its surface was as good as new, and the efficiency was astonishing. It seemed that the substantial amount of money paid by Baldi and Crazy Kihori for compensation was not in vain. As soon as Song Ku stepped into the hall, she saw a crowd gathered around the screen. A chorus of amazed voices kept coming, its three grandsons and one grandpa again. How many B-rank commissions is this for them? They're progressing so quickly their points must be over a thousand soon, right? Song Ku paused her steps. That peculiar team name sounded somewhat familiar, didn't it? Her gaze involuntarily turned towards the suspended screen in front of her, and as expected, as if replaying yesterday. A holographic projection once again flickered with a new announcement congratulations to Team Three Grandsons and One Grandpa for completing B-Rank Commission XX. On the overall points leaderboard, this team was also in the lead, sitting comfortably at first place with a score of 966. 
The level of commission tasks not only came with corresponding alliance currency rewards but also carried different point values. For instance, the simplest E-level task was worth 2 points, and the scale increased gradually, D-level was 10 points, C-level was 50 points, B-level was 200 points, and an A-level mission could earn as much as 1,000 points. As for the rumored S-level missions, none had appeared so far, and it was said that there was no upper limit to their point rewards. The rapid ascent of the three grandsons and one grandpa team, reaching 966 points so quickly, indicated that they had completed at least three or more B-level missions, showcasing their considerable strength and unparalleled popularity. Their goal was also Cliardo gain access to District B. Cities ranked C and above within the Alliance had strict access regulations. Regular people who wanted to enter a non-residential district C had to apply for short-term entry permits. The reasons could be sightseeing, visiting relatives, official business trips, and more. Once a permit expired or if someone were still in the city without proper authorization, they would become wanderers, subject to pursuit by the Alliance's Citizenship Enforcement Division. Among the 50 District C areas, only District C-72 was an exception. Ferrara, known for its emphasis on art and freedom, welcomed all travelers from afar. Even for local residents of District C, changing their place of residence wasn't an easy feat. The naturalization process between different cities was extremely stringent. District C inhabitants aiming for District B faced even greater challenges. Before the apocalypse, joining the Azure Phoenix might have been a shortcut, but with the collapse of order and the increasing awakening of abilities, new rules had been established. The Alliance had recently issued an official announcement that individuals with abilities could gain District B citizenship by accumulating points. Of course, the required number of points was quite daunting. Transitioning from District C to District B required a whopping 500,000 points. Song Ku harbored an unspoken desire. She wanted to go outside and explore. Throughout her life, she had hardly left F-177 District, venturing only as far as U Mountain E-166 District and Hua City D-99 District. After forming a team this time, she wanted to take on a B-level mission and test her skills. Even if she wasn't as capable as the three grandsons and one grandpa team, she could slowly accumulate points. Who knows, someday she might have the chance to visit District B. With her dreams in mind, Song Ku approached the service window and said, Hello, I want to, to form a team. A middle-aged woman in uniform inside pushed up her glasses, glanced at Song Ku briefly, and then shifted her gaze away. She paused for a second over Su Xing's fuzzy head, another second on Zhuang Qingyan's legs, two seconds on his face, and finally returned to Song Ku. A teenager around 17 or 18, a well-behaved child, and a disabled person in a wheelchair. She had worked here for five or six years and considered herself to have sharp eyes, but this was the first time she couldn't tell which two of these three were awakeners. Which of you is the captain? Ha! Huh. Regardless of who's the captain, show me your awakener ID. Ha! Huh. Song Ku was taken aback. Wasn't it said that regular people could also form teams and take on missions? Why were they asking her for an awakener ID? The staff member looked skeptical. Team members can be regular people, but the team captain has to be an awakener. Without an awakener ID, how do you intend to take and complete missions? All terminals require identification. Song Ku exclaimed, huh? The staff member thought she was a rebellious teenager who had gone astray and tried to counsel her with a pained expression. Young lady, I don't think you're an awakener, are you? Look at the three of you Sai, taking on contracts is very dangerous. Don't come to cause trouble, okay? Go on, take your brothers back home. Watch a concert of your favorite star, buy some pretty dresses, and live peacefully. If my daughter acted like you, oh my, I'd be so frustrated. Song Ku remained silent. What can I do? What else can I do? I just want to form a team, why is it so difficult? Song Ku was left speechless. Her thoughts were in turmoil. The entire world for Song Ku had turned dark. By the fountain pool, Song Ku sat down dispiritedly. Her fair chin rested on the back of Zhuang Qingyan's wheelchair, and her face wore an expression of utter disillusionment. Zhuang Qingyan, rarely seeing her so listless, 
patted her head comfortingly. Don't be disheartened. There might be other ways. Maybe a kind-hearted person will help us. Su Xing squatted beside them, playing with the water. He stuck his finger in, and the water surface immediately froze. He pulled out a finger-shaped ice stick, looking like he had discovered a new land, and he enjoyed it immensely. Soon, all ten of his fingers were solidly frozen. Sister, why don't you just directly register as an awakener? Because I don't have the money, Song Ku answered wearily. Does it require a lot of money? Su Xing asked, puzzled. Yeah. Song Ku nodded vigorously. Ten thousand alliance coins. Su Xing shook his hand, and the ice stick fell with a tinkling sound, revealing his ten white and tender fingers. Sister, I'll transfer it to you directly. It's your, your money, Song Ku refused. She couldn't just spend someone else's money, especially since Su Xing was just a child. It's okay, sister. Look, I have so much money. Su Xing handed over his new terminal, and Song Ku caught sight of a long string of zeros that seemed endless. All right, let's correct that. Su Xing was a very wealthy child. Song Ku still shook her head. But Su Xing thought his idea was brilliant and pleaded softly, Sister, just consider it a loan from me. You can give it back to me after you complete that commission, okay? I want to register as an awakener too, Sister will you take me? Not getting his way, he began to act cute. Song Ku was worn down by his persistence. All right, I'll ask you, you to lend me first. She lifted her chin from the back of the wheelchair, rummaged in her backpack, took out a piece of paper, and wrote a IOU carefully. Okay, Su Xing brightened up, let's go then. After saying this, he sneakily glanced at Zhuang Qingyan's corner of the eye, like a proud little peacock, chin held high. Humph. Zhuang Qingyan smiled but remained silent. A little foolish fish, easily caught on a hook, yet blissfully unaware. He's kind-hearted at least he shouldn't spoil his good intentions. With the support of the little local tyrant Su Xing, things suddenly became simpler. Soon, Song Ku once again completed the process and obtained her awakener identification a small needle-type terminal that could circulate in District C, with its jurisdiction located in the area of Ferrara. Compared to Wu Yuru's silver-white District B terminal, this one lagged behind in both appearance and functionality. It was like the difference between a basic model and a luxury limited edition. However, Song Ku couldn't put it down it was her official ID, marking an end to her days as a black householder. The girl who was slacking off also told her that once the results of the Awakener level were out, they would be synchronized and updated on the terminal. She wouldn't need to make another trip. Su Xing took this opportunity to register as an Awakener as well. According to his own account, he accidentally lost control of his ice power during the Awakener review and nearly stabbed the auditors with ice shards, startling them quite a bit. He asked me to conjure a cup of water for him, so I did, Su Xing blinked innocently, his expression quite convincing. Chapter, 43 Formation of V587 The three of them returned to the commission center once again. The staff member who had considered Song Ku a rebellious teenager repeatedly checked her Awakener ID and finally pursed her lips, submitting a team formation application in the system, enter the team name. Song Ku looked back to ask her teammates for their opinions. You're the captain, you decide, Zhuang Qinyan said, adopting an attitude of completely deferring to her. Sister, I can't think of anything, Su Xing scratched his head. Song Ku, I can't think of anything either. Suddenly, she kind of understood the difficulty of three grandsons and one grandfather, naming really was tough. Seeing her troubled expression, the staff member casually suggested, if you can't come up with anything, just use a number. Let me see you're the 587th Awakener team registered in Ferrara. The number on the screen jumped by one digit, stopping exactly at 00587, next to which was the full name of the Ferrara Valala Special Affairs Agency. Then, let's go with this, V587. New calendar, year 46, October 2nd. On an ordinary day, the number one Awakener team that would later shake the entire alliance, V587, was established in such an ordinary manner. 
The initial team consisted of only three members, Song Ku Gold Type Awakener, Level Unknown, Su Xing Ice Type Awakener, Level Unknown, and Ordinary Person Zhuang Qinyan. The first thing V587 did after its establishment was to go and complete the B-level mission that Song Ku had set her eyes on. Using the self-service terminal, Song Ku swiped her Awakener ID and searched for that mission from the long list. Luckily, it hadn't been taken by anyone else yet. This mission was issued by the Municipal Hall of Luliport D-150 District, with a reward of 2,000 Alliance coins and 200 team points. The earliest release date was September 25th. Help us clear the zombies on the first floor. We're trapped in the office and can't get out. On September 27th, the mission was updated. Is there anyone to save us? We're running out of food. On September 30th, the mission was updated again. Urgent. The zombies are already outside the door. We can't hold on any longer. Anyone will do, help, help. Today was already October 2nd, and the mission hadn't been updated since then. It's unknown whether the issuer was still alive. Song Ku casually checked the system and found that there were quite a few commission tasks from Luli Port, and most of them were related to zombies. It seemed like the disaster situation was quite severe. She turned to Zhuang Qinyan and asked, D-150 District, do you, do you know about it? In her mind, Zhuang Qinyan knew everything. Sure enough, Zhuang Qinyan just slightly frowned and said, Luli Port. Hmm it's a pretty well-developed tourist city in District D, mostly because of its location by the sea. The other three sides are District C. It became a large-scale resort a few years ago. I remember the artificial beaches and hot springs there are quite popular. A vacation paradise? During the apocalypse, it was the peak of tourism in Luli Port. The local attractions and folk streets were bustling with people. Having a large number of zombies stuck there wasn't surprising. Song Ku switched back to the mission interface. So, should I take this? Zhuang Qinyan confirmed with her, the mission location is the municipal hall. Yes, why, is there a problem? The Municipal Hall of Luli Port is known for its maze-like architectural style. It's intricate and complex inside, easy to get lost. Similar to Hua City, it has won the Gold Award in city planning competitions. A maze? Song Ku's expression became blank. She couldn't even tell North from South. No wonder this mission was so urgent and yet no one had taken it for so long. Zhuang Qinyan smiled and said, if it's just a simulated maze, even if it's a real maze, it would still be a bit difficult to trap me. With him saying that, things seemed easier. Full of confidence, Song Ku clicked accept commission and then confirm. Suddenly, the terminal screen projected a text, detecting that you are currently in District C-72. The format of this mission has changed. Please refresh and complete it according to local requirements otherwise, the mission will be considered a failure. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. What did that mean? Song Ku refreshed the screen. New text appeared on the screen, in support of the throne race tournament, please try to capture the zombies and bring them back to Ferrara you can apply for a free transport vehicle for this commission. Capture zombies? And what's with this? What is that supposed to be? Both Zhuang Qinyan and Su Xing saw this prompt. Su Xing had little reaction, but Zhuang Qinyan sneered, interesting. What was once a straightforward task suddenly turned magical. Song Ku couldn't help but recall the scene she witnessed on the street in the morning, along with the phrase excellent nourishment that the passerby mentioned. The direction of events was becoming increasingly enigmatic. It seemed necessary to figure out what the throne race competition was all about after completing the mission. After exiting the hall, Song Ku was still pondering where to collect the free transport vehicle. The rumbling sound of an engine reached her ears. From the track that stretched across the Ferrara sky, a numbered transport vehicle came rolling along and stopped right in front of Song Ku and her companions. The transport vehicle was entirely silver gray in color. The cockpit was narrow, but it had a total of eight carriages at the back. What was even more chilling was that each carriage was filled with iron cages adorned with barbs. Bloodstains crisscrossed inside, the colors dull and gloomy, having captured countless zombies. 
the terminal made a ding sound, displaying the vehicle information. This vehicle was equipped with automated driving and preset round-trip routes. In theory, Song Ko only needed to capture the zombies and toss them onto the vehicle. It would return on its own. Song Ko and Zhuang Qinyan boarded the cockpit, and as the door was about to close, Su Xing caught the hem of Song Ko's clothes. Sister, I I want to go too. Aren't you, afraid? Su Xing was terrified of zombies to the core. Both instances of his supernatural ability going out of control were due to zombies. Su Xing's hand trembled for a moment, gradually releasing Song Ko's clothes, but the next second, he grabbed them tightly again. He saw Zhuang Qinyan inside the cockpit, looking at him with a smile that wasn't quite a smile. Although Zhuang Qinyan hadn't said a word, Su Xing sensed the disdain in his gaze, as if he were saying, Oh. That's it. Initially hesitating, Su Xing's inner sense of pride was completely aroused. With his neck held high, his voice full of enthusiasm, he exclaimed, I'm not afraid. I want to help you. I won't cause any trouble. After a moment of thought, Song Ku agreed. Although Su Xing was an unstable element, it wasn't a big deal. She just needed to keep a closer eye on him. Come on board. The transport vehicle distributed by Ferrara had a steam-driven engine and didn't use the energy of EU, so its speed was considerably slower compared to a starship. Nevertheless, it could utilize the aerial track. After approximately ten hours of travel, Song Ku and her companions arrived at Luli Port. It was approaching midnight, and the municipal hall of Luli Port was less than three kilometers away. Hordes of zombies were roaming the outskirts. Without clearing a path, they couldn't get in. Song Ku opened the window, hooked her finger, and agilely flipped out, landing on top of the vehicle. In her hand was a repeating crossbow similar to the one Zhuang Qinyan had. I'll distract the zombies on the left. Su Xing, freeze them on the right. Su Xing clenched his fists and nodded nervously, okay. Shouldering the crossbow with one hand, Song Ku squinted her eyes, aimed, and lightly pulled the trigger. Ten arrows shot out simultaneously, accurately piercing a small group of isolated zombies ahead. Those zombies noticed the movement and rushed towards them. Su Xing also stood up, his ability followed suit. A sudden blizzard engulfed the area, and the zombies that were lured out were instantly frozen. The vehicle's surveillance detected the zombie movements. A long mechanical arm extended from the rear compartment, sweeping these zombies into iron cages like garbage. Once a compartment was filled, the door silently closed, automatically shifting to the front, and the second-to-last compartment was then pushed out. Keep going, Song Kuk changed direction and continued shooting arrows to attract the zombies' attention. All right. Su Xing was full of enthusiasm. The first carriage transporting zombies slowly passed the cockpit. Dripping water droplets fell, and one of the frozen zombies had unknowingly melted. Suddenly, it began to roar restlessly. Swipe. Sharp claws protruded from the iron cage, almost touching Su Xing's nose through the window glass. Su Xing's attention was focused forward. He was startled by the attack that came out of nowhere. His pupils trembled, and the blizzard that had been swirling all around him turned into ice spikes. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Several skulls of the supposedly frozen zombies were pierced by ice shards, but the remaining ones kept pushing forward. Su Xing's rhythm became chaotic, affecting Song Ku's concentration. Her arrows couldn't attract so many zombies, and a small group was already rushing towards their position. Song Ku put down the crossbow, reached back, and pulled out two dual-bladed knives from her backpack. Swoosh! She leaped off the top of the vehicle, charging towards the approaching tide of zombies. The moment her feet hit the ground, she swung her blades horizontally, killing the zombies that came rushing. Zhuang Qinyan frowned and yelled in a low voice, Song Ku, capture the live ones. Song Ku's silhouette stiffened for a moment, her actions momentarily delayed, as if she were contemplating how to capture the zombies alive. Then, the catastrophe began. Everything descended into chaos. Su Xing started yelling frantically, his ability alternately turning into blizzards and ice shards. Song Ku was dashing up and down within the swarm of zombies, 
incapacitating one by kicking, chasing another to the left, knocking one down, only to have another on the right run away. After much difficulty capturing a group, just as she was about to throw them into the transport vehicle, ice shards from Su Xing flew over, killing them all. In the midst of endless chaos, Zhuang Qinyan covered his face. V587's first mission, a massive failure. Chapter, 44. A level task, mutant zombie. At the critical moment, Zhuang Qinyan remained calm. He surveyed the chaotic situation on the field and quickly made a judgment, Su Xing, stop and create ice in the direction I indicated. Su Xing, with a defiant tone despite being in a difficult situation, retorted, why should I listen to you? Zhuang Qinyan's icy gaze lingered on his collar for a second, his expression as fierce as a demon, if you don't obey, I'll throw you out right now. Su Xing, TT. He recalled the agony of being dominated. Zhuang Qinyan no longer paid attention to him. His slender fingers continuously manipulated the complex control panel in the cockpit. His gaze fell on Song Ku in the distance. He paused, and certain unpleasant memories suddenly struck him. As a precaution, he turned his head again and confirmed with Su Xing, Do you know the directions north, south, east, west? Su Xing angrily shouted, Of course. Who do you think you're looking down on? Very well. Zhuang Qingyan's lips curled slightly, better than your sister. With a slight movement of his fingertip, he retrieved a collapsible cane from the space, unfolded it in a couple of swift motions, supported the wheelchair's handguard, and then exerted force. After injuring his right leg, he stood up for the first time. Once he stood firm, Zhuang Qingyan extended his right hand, finally reaching the control lever of the mechanical arm, positioned slightly higher. Su Xing was amazed to find that Zhuang Qinyan was actually quite tall. It wasn't the frail and thin figure he had imagined from prolonged wheelchair use. On the contrary, Zhuang Qinyan stood tall and elegant, with superior proportions. His waist and abdomen had smooth and straight lines, and even his exposed forearms were unusually sturdy. While he was lost in thought, Zhuang Qinyan had already opened the car window and shouted from a distance, Song Ku. Head to 11 o'clock direction. Song Ku blocked with her left knife and executed a semicircular slash with her right knife. With a swift whoosh, she leaped to the front of the zombie horde, acting as bait to lure them towards the northwest. Su Xing frees the entire group of zombies to the southwest. Su Xing felt a bit dissatisfied. His sister was clearly running towards the northwest, so why did he have to freeze the zombies to the southwest? But Zhuang Qinyan was indeed quite tall. He seemed to only reach his waist. Su Xing cast an envious glance and obediently followed the command. Northwest direction, 11 o'clock. The zombies brought over by Song Ku were increasing in number, and they finally collided with a nearby carriage with a resounding thud. There was no way forward from here. 6 o'clock. Almost simultaneously, Zhuang Qinyan shouted the next command. Song Ku hit the brakes sharply and made a quick turn. The zombies followed her like rabbits chasing carrots, rushing towards them in a synchronized manner. Su Xing became anxious, they're all coming this way. Zhuang Qinyan said coldly, take care of your ice. If I see another ice shard, you'll be the first one to feed the zombies. The horde of monsters was getting closer and closer to them. Just as the first batch of zombies that Su Xing froze was melting, and they regained their freedom in a daze, continuing forward due to inertia, Song Ku was caught between them like a carrot being chased by two sides. She was about to be overwhelmed by the zombies. Su Xing's heart raced. Right at that moment, Song Ku suddenly switched her grip, reversed her knives, and inserted them perfectly into the gaps of the iron cage covered with inverted hooks. Following that, she propelled herself with a leap, her feet landing on the crossbar of the carriage. In the blink of an eye, she executed two graceful backflips, taking both herself and her weapons onto the roof of the car. The two waves of zombies couldn't react in time and collided with a loud thud, falling to the ground. Just then, the mechanical arm on the side of the carriage emerged mysteriously, sweeping through like a whirlwind, and all these zombies were swept inside. The iron cage swiftly followed, clanging shut the exit. In an instant, the clearing was complete. 
Inside the cockpit, Zhuang Qinyan gave orders to Song Ku while manually controlling the transport vehicle and the mechanical arm, both in synchronized motion. Su Xing was completely stunned. This person was multitasking no, make that triple tasking. He even found time to scold him. Was this really something a human brain could accomplish? With Zhuang Qinyan's guidance, the almost tipping over situation was finally brought under control. Waves of zombies managed to run right into Song Ku's attack range or step into Su Xing's blizzard, and with the synchronized sweeping of the mechanical arms from the six carriages. About half an hour later, the three of them managed to clear a path, narrowly escaping the crisis. With the crisis averted, the remaining few zombies were swiftly dealt with by Song Ku. She wiped her twin swords with cloth, crossed them behind her back, and briskly walked back to the front of the vehicle. Leaning on his crutch, Zhuang Qinyan pushed open the cockpit. Leaning against the door, he appeared relaxed and composed, with the night breeze rustling his clothes, making his handsome features even more profound. Zhuang Qinyan looked at Song Ku with a helpless expression. What did you say before we set off? Both Song Ku and Su Xing were highly offensive supernatural beings. If their cooperation went awry, it could potentially lead to a big mess, wreaking havoc on a catastrophic scale. Having them use their abilities to attract monsters in coordination was a decision they had agreed upon earlier. Zhuang Qinyan had taught them the method personally. On the way, Song Ku had promised with great confidence that she would follow the plan meticulously, being extra cautious. Yet here she was, a skilled long-range archer, engaging in melee combat due to her inability to control the monsters. Su Xing was even more extreme, losing control of his powers at the slightest scare from the zombies, acting like a runaway wild horse. Song Ku lowered her head in embarrassment, her expression sheepish. I, I didn't mean to, I, I forgot. She had gotten so used to cutting off zombie heads that she forgot everything else once she swung into action. Glancing at Zhuang Qingyan's cold gaze and expression, she suddenly had an epiphany. She jumped onto the cockpit and very doggedly reached out to support his arm. I I I'll help you walk. Zhuang Qingyan hesitated for a moment but didn't pull away. Song could desperately signal to Su Xing, who was standing foolishly nearby. Xiao Xing. Having just been lectured by Zhuang Qinyan on how to be a proper person and awed by his immense calculating abilities, Su Xing didn't dare to pout this time. He obediently moved the wheelchair out of the cockpit. Forget it. Men still had to rely on their strengths to speak. Next time, he definitely had to win back his dignity. After a quick check, the three of them estimated that the transport vehicle was now filled with about four carriages worth of materials. The interior was soundproof, and they couldn't hear a thing even when pressed against the carriage walls. The city hall of Luliport was very close now. The vague outline of the building could be seen in the distance. Zhuang Qinyan put away his crutch and returned to his wheelchair. We're almost there. Let's walk. Song Ku hesitated, what about this vehicle? She was about to ask if they were just leaving it here, not fully loaded and without automatic return capability. Before she finished speaking, the two empty carriages actually detached from the main body of the vehicle. Four small wheels emerged from the bottom with a clatter, and in an instant, they transformed into the kind of small shopping carts used to stock goods in supermarkets. They trotted along behind them in a curious manner. Zhuang Qinyan wasn't surprised at all. He had discovered this when manipulating the control panel earlier. The vehicle is equipped with a small-scale artificial intelligence that possesses some autonomous decision-making ability. Don't worry about it, let's go. As Song Ku took a couple of steps forward and turned around to look, the two carriages were right behind them. With their mechanical arms swinging and swaying, the scene was inexplicably eerie, resembling a supervisor more and more. Luli Port City Hall Unlike the local area's natural and charming characteristics, this was a building with a forest steel style, and its industrial facade was covered with lush vegetation. Suspended in the air were dazzling corridors in various shapes, and platforms of different sizes extended freely. One could easily anticipate the complexity and diversity of the interior space. The height of the entrance gate wasn't enough the two compartments couldn't squeeze in. The mechanical arm automatically retracted, entering an energy-saving mode. 
Two small square boxes stopped temporarily at the entrance, finally no longer following them. Song Ku paid no more attention to it and, along with Zhuang Qinyan and Su Xing, entered the entire building. As described in the assigned task, as early as September 25th, the first floor here should have been filled with zombies. However, the reality was different. After entering through the main gate, there were only a few zombies wandering in the spacious lobby. When things deviate from the norm, there must be something amiss. Song Ko became vigilant involuntarily. She raised her head, following the spiral staircase's ascent. The entire six floors of the building were demolished, and the opposite sides were beveled and cut. The top space was distorted, and the environment was extremely quiet. The situation isn't right, be cautious, Zhuang Qinyan warned in a deep voice. Got it, Song Ku sharpened her focus, Xiao Xing, stay close, both of us. Zhuang Qinyan led the way, taking the lead with the two following him upstairs. In the nearly identical corridors, they kept turning and advancing. Before long, his wheelchair stopped, there's someone, someone with abilities. Song Ku was slightly taken aback. The number of rooms here was extensive, and the layout was intricate, often obstructing spiritual exploration. She hadn't heard any sound nor sensed any abilities. How did Zhuang Qinyan determine the presence of an awakener? Go this way. Zhuang Qinyan changed direction, leading them up to the top floor through the staircase and guiding them to a concealed small platform to look down. Sure enough, there were people. Only in the central open space of the fourth floor, Several groups of people were confronting each other from a distance. Compared to the mysteriously vanished zombies inside the building, the number of zombies here seemed to be more normal, but they were gathered together like trapped beasts. Song Ku's keen eyesight noticed that one of the zombies had distinctly different symptoms its skin had a unique shade of blue, and its level of decay was lower than that of ordinary zombies. Its metallic-like claws were particularly sharp, and most peculiarly, its pupils weren't grey-white but intensely dark, pure black. Zhuang Qingyan's expression turned serious. A mutant zombie. Song Ko was startled. Mutant zombie? Weren't those zombies created from fallen awakeners? Zhuang Qingyan had mentioned that the Alliance's approach to dealing with such zombies was only one, execution. In a tense atmosphere of stalemate, a man whose half-body was composed of machinery took a confident step forward. His natural eye and mechanical eye turned simultaneously, presenting a rather peculiar appearance. I say, Brother Duanmu, your family's business is vast. You might not value these low-level mutant zombies. Why not let us have them? Leaning by the staircase, a refined man dressed in vintage robes smiled. His voice was gentle, but his words showed no sign of backing down. Bartle, spare us the insincere words. They sound nauseating. Our team is climbing the points leaderboard. I thought everyone knew that. Duan Mu Chi, don't be too greedy. Exactly. You've already completed most of the B-level tasks. What's left are just dirty and tiring tasks. Don't be too excessive. Aren't you already in first place? Isn't 966 points enough? On the sixth platform, Song Ku, who had just taken on a B-level dirty and tiring task, said, dot. Wait a minute, she suddenly realized with a gasp, belatedly understanding, points for promotion, completion, 966 could this be the team three grandsons and one grandpa that's currently ranked first on the leaderboard. Song Ku focused her gaze and indeed, behind the man named Duan Mu Chi stood three individuals, all concealed in the shadows, their faces revealing a cold and stern expression, each looking quite formidable. Duan Mu Chi, you weren't the first to discover this unique zombie, and an A-level mission isn't something you can just take on as you wish. An elderly man with a head full of white hair, hands behind his back, descended the staircase with a dignified tone, awakeners disregard human emotions. In all endeavors, the victor is king. If you want to claim these 1000 points, you should ask whether we agree. Duan Mu Chi chuckled, I never expected even Mr. Xiang to join in on this lively event. Very well then. Let it be as you wish. The victor is king, and the loser is a bandit. All of you can fight for it. I'm curious to see who can take these 1000 points from me, Duan Mu Chi. So arrogant. 
Brothers, I can't stand this. Let's all go together. I refuse to believe we can't defeat him. A level mission. Song Ku understood the content of the dispute between the people below, and her eyes lit up suddenly. Sister, look, Su Xing leaned over holding the terminal, there is a sudden red commission in the system. Five hours ago, on their way to Luli Port, the Ferrara Commission Center issued an emergency mission with a level of A. Jean Lei, the former D-level awakener of Luli Port D-150 district, with the ability of stone gaze, has now mutated and escaped. This individual is extremely dangerous. Starting today, a nationwide hunt is underway. Once found, terminate on site. This was the first A-level mission that appeared in Ferrara. With a whole 1,000 points, it was no wonder that it attracted so many Awakener teams. The atmosphere on the fourth floor was becoming more and more solidified, and a crisis was imminent. Since that's the case let everyone compete based on their abilities. Bartle, the half-mechanized one-eyed man, suddenly smirked. Taking advantage of everyone's unpreparedness, his mechanical left arm extended rapidly, stabbing straight at the mutant zombie Jean Lei. Bartle. Don't you dare to play tricks. All the Awakeners took action, and dark shadows rushed towards Zhang Lei one after another. Just as they closed in, Duan Mu Qi's robes fluttered, and countless thorns burst from the ground, tightly binding the legs of the leading Awakeners. Thump thump. Like dumplings dropping into boiling water, they all fell back to the ground. Such formidable control ability Duan Mu Qi was undoubtedly a powerful wood-type Awakener. After Duan Mu Qi suppressed the situation, three individuals behind him rushed out from different angles, heading straight for Zhang Lei. They were just about to reach him when suddenly, Zhang Lei vanished on the spot, a displacement occurring in a corner opposite the group. There was a space-type awakener on the scene. This space-type awakener concealed their whereabouts, constantly shifting Zhang Lei's position. A change every five seconds made it difficult for anyone to predict their exact movements. Soon enough, Zhang Lei ended up right beneath Song Ku and the others. The space-type awakener seemed to believe that this spot provided good cover for their line of sight. For a while, they refrained from further displacement. A perfect opportunity. The mantis stalks the cicada, unaware of the oriole behind. Song Ku and her group, who had been observing the battle from the shadows, now became the oriole. Should, should we try to seize, seize it? Song Ku asked her companions for their opinions. Zhuang Qinyan gazed at the chaotic battle below, chuckling softly, of course, why not? A level task after completing this, you'll be rich, won't you? Yeah, I wonder how much this A level task is worth. All the awakeners present couldn't help but focus on the high 1000 point score. Only Song Ku had her mind fixed on the alliance coin reward. If she managed to seize it, would it be enough to pay back the debt she owed Su Xing? Go, pay attention to the direction of three o'clock, Zhuang Qinyan pointed to a certain corner, that space-type awakener is hiding there. Okay, Song Ku nodded. Sister, you can do it. Su Xing clenched his small fist to cheer her up. Xiao Xing, protect him well, Song Ku earnestly instructed. Su Xing, oh. Was there a possibility that the one who needed protection was actually me? After confirming the direction with a glance, Song Ku drew out her dual knives and leaped down from the sixth floor platform. Almost simultaneously, a nimble black shadow jumped down from the rooftop diagonally opposite. There was never just one Oriole lurking in the shadows. Chapter 45 This sister is so fierce. Song Ku jumped from the sixth floor platform, and almost at the same time, a black figure flew out from the opposite direction. Both of them met unexpectedly in mid-air and were momentarily stunned when they saw each other's faces. Soon, they realized each other's intentions, they were both here to snatch an A-level task. Song Ku executed a mid-air somersault and swung her long knife down towards her opponent's head. The fierce blade wind swirled aggressively, forcing the opponent to yield their position. Unexpectedly, this person was just as ruthless and intended to meet her head-on. Clang! Her spiritual weapon's blade struck the opponent's arm, colliding with something similar to steel armor. The shadow absorbed the blow, inwardly rotated their forearm, and used the momentum to continue forward, 
maintaining their speed and even overtaking Song Ko by a step. Song Ko wouldn't let them have their way. She immediately followed up with her short knife in her right hand, swiftly and viciously slashing upwards. Clang! The piercing sound of metal scraping against metal echoed once again as the opponent narrowly dodged by tilting their body to the side. Their movements momentarily slowed, allowing Song Ku to block their escape route. Being repeatedly stopped, the shadow seemed to grow irritated. They grabbed Song Ku's throat with their right hand and kicked her knee with their left leg, attempting to end her with a lethal blow. Song Ku raised both knives to defend herself and agilely dodged. However, her opponent was clearly skilled in close quarters combat, with elusive and deadly strikes. They only attacked when they were certain to strike a lethal blow. In terms of combat skills alone, this was the most formidable opponent Song Ku had encountered so far. Unfortunately, they were still not a match for her. Song Ku lowered her waist, performed a 360 degree backward flip, and kicked the shadow in the chest, pushing them back. Taking advantage of the recoil, she grabbed the collar of the zombie Zhang Lei before the space manipulator could teleport again. Fighting was one thing, but she hadn't forgotten her true objective. Just then, a beautiful song inexplicably echoed in Song Ku's ears. Let me accompany you to sleep gently withdraw my hand. Even more strangely, with each line of the song, her spirit grew more tired, and her desire to attack was gradually disarmed. So tired she wanted to rest. Her eyelids grew heavier and her fingers loosened. In the midst of such an intense battle, she was almost falling asleep. Hot tears in my heart gather into a river. Song Ku uncontrollably shed two clear tears. Why am I crying? The black shadow who had been grappling with Song Ku suddenly flashed, and a cold light flickered at their fingertips. They wielded a gleaming dagger with a green tint, aiming for her throat. Not good. This person was just as cunning as Yang Bo the dagger was clearly poisoned. Song Ku raised her knife again to block, but her arm's movement was slightly slower. She felt sluggish all over and had a strong desire to lie down and take a nap. This inexplicable thought distracted her, and she was momentarily caught off guard as the black shadow severed a few strands of her hair. In just half a minute, they exchanged dozens of moves. Meanwhile, the Awakeners on the fourth floor platform finally realized that there were intruders causing trouble. Damn, there are thieves. They're so damn sneaky, they hid until now. Stop. Don't fight each other. Take them down first. Seeing the imminent threat of their victory being stolen, the group grew furious, launching a barrage of powerful attacks at them. The spatial manipulator hidden in the shadows made another move, causing Zhang Lei the zombie to teleport a few times like a bouncing ball, disappearing and reappearing in different spots. Song Ku and the Black Shadow were left isolated, instantly surrounded on all sides. Sister. Su Xing clung to the railing, tiptoeing to peer down, his palms sweaty with nervousness. Across from them, deep within the empty corridor, a soft and coquettish voice suddenly sounded. Friends on the opposite side, how about considering cooperation? Zhuang Qingyan's wheelchair slid forward, exposing half of his handsome face to the bright overhead light. He chuckled, how do you propose we cooperate? He he the female voice giggled sweetly, of course if you all stop right now, I'll let you go. In the chaotic battle below, with Song Ku surrounded and experiencing the mental disturbance caused by the mysterious singing, their situation was far from favorable. Zhuan Qinyan lightly tapped his wheelchair's armrest, producing a rhythmic clatter, clatter that seemed to convey a certain special melody. He remained calm and didn't speak for quite some time, making the waiting individuals increasingly anxious. The woman couldn't help but urge, aren't you going to decide? Your companion doesn't look like she's doing well. Zhuang Qinyan raised an eyebrow casually and replied, is that so? Perhaps you should take another look. The eerie singing surrounded her from all directions, and its lingering notes, like hooks, penetrated Song Ku's ears relentlessly. Countless supernatural ability attacks came at her, and she found herself unable to move her feet, as if she were a helpless target. No, she couldn't continue like this. Song Ku closed her eyes, rapidly guiding her mental power through her body, and then. She decisively blocked off her own sense of hearing, 
shutting out all external sounds. The world fell silent. She suddenly opened her eyes, her twin knives emitting a blue brilliance, and she released them forward. It was as if she were cutting through rows of harvested wheat stubble, ruthlessly severing the thorns that emerged from the ground. When those incredibly resilient thorns touched the azure blade wind, they instantly decayed and dissipated into fragments. At a distant staircase, Duan Mu Chi took a large step back in disbelief, covering his mouth as blood trickled from the corner. Aki. His teammates abandoned their opponents and rushed back, their faces filled with worry. How are you? Duan Mu Chi swallowed a mouthful of blood foam, his veins throbbing with pain, his spiritual energy running rampant, and his blood surging uncontrollably. He looked up in astonishment. What's that weapon she has in her hand? What in the world was that thing that could so effectively suppress his ability? The twin blades, after clearing the area, returned to Song Ku's hands. She clanged the hilts together, merging them into a jagged and elegant saw. With one hand, she raised the large blade and executed a mowing the grass technique, swinging it roundly. The black shadow was forced back step by step, unable to get close at all, and their previous slight advantage was completely gone. Instead, Song Ku pressed her advantage, and the broad attack range of the elegant saw was particularly effective. She swung the blade at her opponent's back, and with each strike, crack, crack, the protective armor shattered, sending metal fragments scattering all over. How could an ordinary shield withstand the power of a blade that could pierce through anything? The power of metal manipulation was indeed this domineering. The situation downstairs suddenly reversed, and there was a subtle shift in the negotiations on the sixth floor. The soft female voice hadn't spoken for a while, and her shadow companion, now without the steel armor protection, probably couldn't withstand a single blow from Song Ku. Zhuang Qinyan casually leaned against his wheelchair. It seems like we need to reconsider the terms of our cooperation. The soft female voice, sounding somewhat resigned, asked, What do you want? Cooperation is based on mutual benefit. I just need to make sure that what we want doesn't conflict with each other, right? Zhuang Qinyan remained composed and deliberate in his speech, showing no signs of urgency. However, under Song Ku's relentless onslaught, the black shadow sustained more and more injuries, clearly unable to hold out much longer. The soft female voice eventually couldn't hold on any longer and played her trump card first. You can have the zombie, we just want the crystal. Zhuang Qingyan's eyes flickered, and he smiled faintly. Deal. In the silent world, Song Ku was completely focused on her opponent, and her attacks grew even more fierce. In the midst of the heated battle, she noticed a familiar ice shard in her field of vision. It circled around her twice before hovering in front of her. Song Ku instinctively looked up toward the platform where Zhuang Qinyan was. Perhaps knowing that she couldn't hear at the moment, Zhuang Qinyan made two hand gestures they had previously communicated, indicating prioritize capturing the target and withdraw quickly. Song Ku understood and ceased her attacks on the black shadow. Her gaze swept around and quickly located the position of the zombie Zhang Lei. The black shadow also stopped moving, his ears twitching as if he had heard something. He turned the direction of his dagger and followed Song Ku as they charged toward the crowd. Chapter 46 This sister is so fierce. Bartle managed to capture the zombie Zhang Lei amid the chaos. He was ecstatic, and his cold mechanical arm spiraled forward, puncturing Zhang Lei's left side. Then, he stood there, one hand on his hip, and laughed heartily, Ha ha ha, the A-level task is mine. The previously puppet-like Zhang Lei, who had been moving around unnoticed by everyone, suddenly sprang into action. His expression twisted grotesquely as he raised his head. Dark patterns on his neck bulged, and he let out a harsh roar. From the center of his pitch-black pupils, invisible ripples spread out in all directions. Within arm's reach, all awakeners who couldn't escape in time were turned into stone statues, frozen stiff in their tracks. This was Zhang Lei's power, the stone gaze. Originally, it had the effect of immobilizing enemies who met his gaze briefly. However, after turning into a zombie, his power mutated into the even more terrifying petrification, with an expanded range of effect. Two awakeners who were entangled with each other were both hit. Their bodies turned as hard as stone, 
and one of them happened to be standing on the edge of the railing, losing his footing and tumbling down the spiral staircase. With a loud crash, he instantly shattered into pieces. Bartle maintained his posture with his mechanical arm extended, and half of his original eye nervously rolled around. It was too late he was the closest person to Zhang Lei and couldn't escape. Clang! The fearsome zombie swung a powerful slap, knocking Bartel's head off. Swish, swish. A nimble figure was swiftly approaching the scene, and the alert Zhang Lei turned his neck nervously, his nerves twitching. Then, its entirely black pupils met Song Ku's round, unreactive eyes. The two stared at each other for a full two seconds, during which Song Ku remained completely unfazed. She calmly swung her long-handled machete, striking Zhang Lei squarely in the face. His facial features were flattened, eye sockets caved in, and he was almost knocked out. Song Ku flicked the tip of her blade, hooking his collar, and then ran away. The shadowy figure followed closely behind her, and just as pursuers were closing in, he released something onto the ground, causing a roaring fire to erupt, blocking the pursuing superhumans. The two of them soared up and down, swiftly returning to the sixth floor, where they joined their waiting teammates and disappeared from view. As the petrification effect wore off, Elder Xiang hastily ordered, Where are they? Retrieve Zhang Lei. A space distortion appeared behind him, gradually revealing a blurry awakener. In a hoarse voice, he said, the target has disappeared. I can't detect them with my mental power. Humph, Elder Xiang snorted, then seal off all entrances they can't escape. A lean awakener hurried over to report, Elder Xiang, Duan Mu Qi and the others have withdrawn. Withdrawn? At a time like this? Elder Xiang was slightly puzzled. Duan Mu Qi had just been loudly declaring that he wouldn't give up on the A-level task, and now he had gone silent. Something was definitely not right. Elder Xiang's sharp eagle-like gaze showed his discernment. He toyed with his jade thumb ring, then gave a stern command. You, go find out what happened. Yes, Elder. As Elder Xiang took a few steps forward, Bartel's head was rolling towards him, and he kicked it away with a snarl, useless. With Xuang Qinyan as their living navigator, Song Ku and her companions swiftly navigated the complex maze of corridors. Sometimes, what appeared to be a dead-end wall would miraculously transform into a passageway under Zhuang Qinyan's guidance. The pursuers from behind couldn't keep up with them and quickly lost their way in the labyrinthine structure, disoriented and directionless. After shaking off the annoying pursuers, the group reached the third floor and found a locked office. They forcefully entered the room, dumping the half-beaten zombie, Zhang Lei, onto the floor. Song Ku finally had the chance to take a closer look at the two individuals who had come with them. First was the shadowy figure she had been battling. He was a young man, perhaps even taller than Zhuang Qinyan, with dark skin, a robust physique, and dressed entirely in black combat gear. His eyes were wild and untamed, resembling a lone wolf. Noticing Song Ku's gaze, he responded with a cold, ruthless stare, and the greenish gleam on the blade in his hand flickered ominously. His ability likely had something to do with venom or assassination. The other person, the mastermind behind the interference with Song Ku's combat using her singing, revealed her true appearance. Surprisingly, she was a woman with a soft appearance, likely in her mid-twenties. She had chestnut-colored voluminous wavy hair loosely tied into a ponytail, fair and smooth skin, and full, rosy lips. Even without makeup, her beauty was astonishing, and up close, she seemed to emit a radiant aura. Song Ku was taken aback by her extraordinary beauty and couldn't help but be mesmerized. With a slight smile, the beautiful woman gently parted her vermilion lips and smiled at Song Ku, saying, let's quickly divide the spoils. Song Ku was bewildered. De divide the spoils. Hey, we agreed that the zombie belongs to you, and the crystal belongs to us. Don't think about reneging on the deal. The beautiful woman reminded her. Hey, sister, Su Xing leaned closer and whispered to her, openly informing Song Ku of the deal Zhuang Qinyan had made behind her back. He spilled all the details about Zhuang Qinyan's negotiation while watching him in the corner of the office. 
Zhuang Qingyan's expression didn't change, and he casually smiled when he noticed Song Ku's gaze, showing no signs of guilt about using her as bait for their deal. Song Ku didn't mind. After all, she had no idea what the crystal they were talking about was, and she trusted that someone like Zhuang Qingyan wouldn't let her down. In any case, it was done, so she had no objections. Song Ku turned her attention back to the two individuals in front of her. We won't renege on the deal. Then go ahead and deal with it, kill it, the beautiful woman nodded towards Zhang Lei on the floor. Upon hearing this, Su Xing quickly hid behind Song Ku, clearly not eager to engage in such a dirty job. Zhuang Qingyan couldn't be counted on either. Although he didn't hesitate to kill Wu Yiro and Yang Bo earlier, he had no intention of getting involved this time. Song Ku seemed to be the only one left to handle the task. She gripped her cold, serrated saw, hesitated for a moment, and suddenly remembered something. We need to, to complete the mission. Almost forgetting, they hadn't completed the mission yet. How were they supposed to complete it? Did they have to bring the zombie Zhang Lei back to Ferrara, and submit it in front of everyone in the commission center? Just the thought of it was quite. The beautiful woman chuckled and pointed to her own terminal. It's not that complicated. You can complete it at the terminal. Song Ku looked down and realized that she was right. Special assignments could be submitted remotely, but the verification process seemed quite strict. It required recording a video and scanning the biological data of the target. She wasn't very proficient with the terminal, and in her haste, she ended up fumbling around and couldn't figure it out. Feeling increasingly flustered, she handed it over to Zhuang Qinyan to operate. Stop dawdling, the beautiful woman impatiently urged, pouting charmingly. Su Cha. The young man named Su Cha walked forward, raised his hand, and swiftly slashed Zhang Lei's neck. Zhang Lei didn't even make a sound his head was severed. All right, hand in the task. Song Ku finally managed to understand the process and aimed the terminal at Zhang Lei. It automatically scanned the biological data, and after a few seconds of calculation by the artificial intelligence in the background, a prompt appeared on the screen, confirmed, the target is deceased, mission accomplished. Before Song Ku could even see how much the mission was worth in Alliance coins, the beautiful woman pressed, now, it belongs to us, right? She put down the terminal and nodded eagerly, saying, yes, yes. The beautiful woman crouched down, took Su Cha's dagger, and swiftly thrust it into Zhang Lei's head. With a quick motion, she pulled something out of pure white crystal. She wiped the crystal clean with a tissue and held it in her hand. She was about to speak when suddenly, a mournful cry echoed from the corner of the office. No, no lazy, lazy woo-woo. A woman wearing municipal hall uniform with disheveled hair rushed out. Her two colleagues couldn't hold her back and were dragged out from behind the filing cabinet. Their faces were pallid, and they seemed mentally drained, having been trapped here for several days. The woman stumbled and knelt on the ground, cradling Zhang Lei's broken head. She cried out in agony, why did you kill him? Why did you do it? He was a good person, such a good person. He worked so hard and never took a day off. He was saving up just to marry me. We were supposed to get married next month. Why, why did this happen? Ahui one of her colleagues tried to pull her away, but she forcefully shrugged him off. In the depths of her sorrow, Ahui continued to mutter, finally, Lazy became an awakener after all the hard work. We thought things would get better, but you killed him. You killed him. Both Lu Xiaoyi and Zhang Lei worked at the municipal hall. Before Luli Port fell into the zombie apocalypse, they had been working tirelessly in the office, unable to leave when the chaos began. When they finally realized the situation, the first floor had already been overrun by zombies. With no other choice, they hid inside the filing cabinets in the office and waited for rescue. They endured this for a whole week without any sign of help. Eventually, their water and supplies ran out. Zhang Lei, the only awakener among them and Lu Xiaoyi's fiancé, made the courageous decision to go out and divert the zombies' attention, hoping to secure a path for the others. On October 1st, he left the office with two male colleagues and never returned. Lu Xiaoyi remained curled up inside the filing cabinet, praying fervently to the heavens, 
hoping that her fiancé would return soon. However, as time passed, her consciousness began to blur, and she could no longer hold on. Just moments ago, Lu Xiaowei had heard voices from outside the room. She thought her fiancé had returned, so she summoned the last of her strength and peeked through the door's crack, only to witness a woman thrusting a knife into Zhang Lei's head. Lu Xiaowei was overwhelmed by despair. You have to pay for this. You have to pay for lazy. She seemed to descend into madness, stood up with difficulty, and stumbled toward the beautiful woman's face. Unfortunately, she couldn't reach her and was forcefully kicked away by the silent Su Cha, crashing heavily to the ground. What are you doing? Two male colleagues rushed over, filled with grief, anger, and despair. They helped Lu Xiaowei to her feet, glaring at Su Cha and the woman. Su Cha's kick had been gentle, but Lu Xiaowei was already at her limit. She couldn't stand anymore, and her emotions had completely unraveled. Tears streamed down her face as she hurled the most vicious curses at the woman who had killed Zhang Lei. The beautiful woman listened to her curses without any change in expression. Suddenly, she exploded, open your eyes and see clearly. He was already a zombie. I'm not a saint. What's wrong with killing a zombie? Even if it wasn't me, there were at least thirty other people downstairs waiting to kill it. Sooner or later, it was going to die. You don't need to stand on your moral high ground to condemn me. Since you let him out of this room, he was destined to die. Lu Xiaowei was drenched in a shower of verbal abs, and she stared blankly at John Lei, whose face was twisted in a grotesque manner. His inky black pupils were nothing like a human's. No it's not true. I don't believe it. Lazy lazy Lu Xiaowei held John Lei's hand, crying inconsolably. Was it true? Lu Xiaowei asked herself. Was it because they had unanimously agreed to send Zhang Lei, the only awakener, out when they needed someone to divert the zombies? Even she, his fiancée, didn't oppose it. Hadn't they indirectly caused Zhang Lei's death? The beautiful woman sighed. I'm not the one who makes the rules. Don't blame me. If you want to blame someone, blame this absurd world. Song Ku, who had been watching quietly, was impressed by the woman's logical and cutting insults. She stared at her in awe. The beautiful woman suddenly turned her head and glared at Song Ku. What are you looking at? Did I say something wrong? Wow, this sister is so fierce. Chapter, 47 You've corrupted Xiaoxing. Song Ku was scolded. What are you looking at? Did I say something wrong? The beautiful sister not only scolded her but also demanded an answer to her question. Song Ku nodded at first but quickly realized her mistake and shook her head vigorously under the other's angry gaze. Seeing her bewildered expression, the beautiful sister snorted coldly and turned her gaze away without causing further trouble. For a while, no one spoke in the room. The atmosphere gradually fell silent, with occasional sobs from Lu Xiaowei and feeble attempts at comforting from her colleagues. Blocked at the exit, Su Cha observed as he leaned against the window, speaking with an unusual pronunciation, enunciating words strangely, and pausing as if not very familiar with the common language of the Alliance. Can we break through? Asked the beautiful sister. We can, but it will expose us, Su Cha replied. The beautiful sister frowned. In the chaos earlier, they had acted quickly and retreated even faster. The Awakeners on the other side couldn't determine their identities without direct contact. But now, it was clear that the other side was on guard. Trying to force their way out aggressively might not be a good idea. She didn't want to expose their identities here and needed to think of another plan. Song Kuk pushed Chuang Qinyan to the other side of the room, keeping a distance from the two groups of people. You noticed some, someone here a long time ago. She asked quietly. Yeah, Zhuang Qinyan didn't deny it. Lu Xiaowei and the others were ordinary people with no awakened abilities. It was normal for Song Ku's attention to be focused on Zhang Lei at the time. But since the office door was locked from the inside, he figured that there must be someone in the room. After hearing his explanation, Song Ku responded belatedly, not paying too much attention. She held the cold and heavy jagged blade in her hand, considering whether to find a place to hide it. 
Song Ku, Zhuang Qinyan called her name softly. Yeah. Song Ku raised her gaze, and she had just found a good place to put the blade down. Thinking that Zhuang Qinyan wanted to have a quiet conversation, she bent over and placed the saw on the floor against the wall. Her uneven black short hair brushed over his shoulder, causing a slight tingling sensation. Zhuang Qinyan moved his fingertip but didn't avoid it. That person has the rainforest mark on him. Zhuang Qinyan was referring to a young man named Su Cha. The rainforest, the E-170 district, was the alliance's most mysterious ecological area. Due to its humid and hot climate, as well as its rich and diverse species, the rainforest was considered the best breeding ground for special operations personnel such as mercenaries and assassins. It was said that the methods of training combat machines in the rainforest were brutal, harsh, and even sadistic. Many standards far exceeded the limits the human body could endure. Those who could survive and carve a bloody path out of such grueling training not only possessed exceptional individual combat abilities but had also become accustomed to dancing with death. Their empathy was almost non-existent, and their mental fortitude was far from ordinary. The rainforest mark mentioned by Zhuang Qinyan was located on Su Cha's nape, where there was a black serpent-like tattoo. Recalling the details of her encounter with Su Cha, Song Ku slowly spoke, his combat, combat skills were very stro, strong but he didn't possess any, any awakened abilities. You're right, Zhuang Qinyan agreed, Su Cha's awakened ability should be related to poison, possibly at B-level or higher. Awakened abilities at B-level or higher, weren't they as formidable as individuals like in Chiwen and Wu Jiuamin from the Azure Phoenix Army? Such people could be a real headache if they turned into enemies. And there's another one. Song Ku informed Zhuang Qinyan of the recent interference by the beautiful sister's singing, which had left her feeling exhausted. Zhuang Qinyan pondered for a moment. It's either sound wave control or some kind of auditory awakened ability related to mysticism. Based on the current information, we can't make an accurate assessment. This person only imposed side effects on you. If her singing has an effect on her companions as well, this person will be a real problem. A powerful support who could debuff enemies and buff allies simultaneously. Imagine a battle that was evenly matched at first, but as you fought, you grew weaker while your opponent became stronger. Anyone with even a slightly fragile will would easily have their fighting spirit crushed. The beautiful sister's strength was indeed not to be underestimated. No wonder they dared to take on missions and act as the hidden aureole among so many awakeners. However, when it came to Su Cha and his companion, there was still one thing they hadn't figured out. Song Ku locked eyes with Zhuang Qinyan and asked another pressing question, what are, our crystals? Zhuang Qinyan lowered his voice, do you remember when I explained the cause of the apocalypse to you? I do. Excessive solar radiation enters the human body, causing disruptions in the magnetic field and genetic mutations. Ordinary people would turn into zombies. However, if an overwhelming amount of external energy is absorbed at once and cannot be digested by the human body, it will crystallize. Song Ku fell silent for a few seconds, then reached into a hidden pouch in her backpack and pulled out several crystals. This was something she had dug out from Song En and other senior brothers' heads, and the one inside Zhang Lei's body should be the same thing. Zhuang Qinyan picked up the nearly transparent crystal and examined it closely. Crystals are not commonly found in ordinary zombie bodies because they are subjected to overwhelming radiation. However, in the bodies of awakeners, due to previous gene fusion, there is a certain degree of resistance, and the probability of crystallization is basically above 95%. It can be said that whenever an awakened zombie is encountered, there will be crystals. Song Ku lowered her gaze, clenched her fists silently, and felt extremely downcast. So Song An had already awakened his abilities back then. She had encountered awakened zombies so early. While the two were talking, Su Xing remained quiet in the middle, his eyes moving. Although he had awakened early, his theoretical knowledge was not much different from Song Ku's. Hearing Zhuang Qinyan's explanation in a gentle tone, he didn't feel like arguing for the first time. He hadn't expected this person, who usually pretended, to know so much. Humph. What are cries, crystals used for? Song Ku calmed her emotions and asked. 
just thinking about where these things came from, dug out from zombie heads, sent shivers down her spine. What could they be used for that would make those two prefer them over an A-level task, no matter the cost. The official explanation is that crystals have a chance to trigger the awakening of abilities in ordinary people, and even allow awakeners to undergo a second evolution. Su Xing's eyes widened suddenly. Song Ku was also surprised. Awakening and evolution. How did this thing cause evolution? Did they have to eat it? Wait a minute, Song Ku suddenly realized a blind spot in Zhuang Qingyan's words. What do you mean, mean by official explanation? Did that imply the existence of unofficial and secretive methods? This was becoming more and more mysterious. Also, since awakening and evolution were both described as having a chance, did that mean there was a possibility of failure? Song Ku grew more perplexed as she asked, Do crystals really work? A subtle smile appeared on Zhuang Qingyan's face. No, this is a meticulously planned deception by the Alliance. What? Su Xing couldn't help but exclaim in surprise, immediately attracting the attention of Su Cha and the beautiful woman. Zhuang Qingyan knocked on his head, warning in a cold tone, Shut your mouth. Su Xing realized he had overreacted and covered his mouth with a small, pitiful hand. Zhuang Qinyan placed the crystal that belonged to Song En back into Song Ku's hand. While there is still some residual energy within the crystal that can be activated through technological means, its structural form has solidified, and it won't undergo a third mutation. You can think of it as a power bank that can only be charged once. A power bank, what a strange analogy. Song Ku stared at his smiling face, feeling extremely speechless. It turned out that the crystals were completely useless. She had said so. How could Zhuang Qinyan possibly suffer a loss? This was like using a knowledge gap to one's advantage. How cunning. However, she still had some uncertainty. How do you know it's useless? Because this was originally Qinyan Institute's research achievement, oh, it's the one that Wu Yuro and Yang Bo wanted to steal. This achievement had accidentally leaked before, but unfortunately, it was the incorrect part. If it was incorrect, why did it circulate? Because some people don't care about right or wrong they only pursue their interests. Most people nowadays have no idea about the true purpose of the crystals. The Alliance only needs to release a bit of information suggesting that they have materials that can promote awakening and evolution, and they can firmly control the awakeners, after all, this is a valuable strategic resource. Oh, Song Ku replied quietly for a couple of seconds but quickly asked again, how do you know it's incorrect? Why do you have so many questions? Zhuang Qinyan chuckled. I'm out of explanations for today. He was about to tap Song Ku's head as he did earlier, but as his arm reached halfway, he suddenly met her expressionless face. Awkwardly, he withdrew his arm, swerved, and tapped Su Xing's head once again. Su Xing exclaimed, Hey! Chapter, 48 You've corrupted Xiaoxing. Song Ku sat on the ground and took a break, suddenly remembering that she hadn't checked the rewards for the A-level mission. Let's check together. She called out to Zhuang Qinyan and Su Xing with a sense of ceremony. This was their team's first completed mission. Two shiny heads crowded together, along with Zhuang Qinyan lazily leaning on his wheelchair, not wanting to move. All six eyes focused on the projection screen in front of Song Ku. On V587's mission list, there lay a shining red commission, dot. A-level mission code VA00001, status, completed, eliminate the awakened zombie Zhang Lei, biological ID, LYG1301756. Points earned, 1000. Alliance credits earned, 0. Friendly reminder, your team has entered the total ranking list for C-72 district points. Would you like to make it public? Yes slash no. Ignoring the other irrelevant information, Song Ku stared at the middle line, finding it hard to believe as she confirmed it once again. Alliance credits earned, zero. Could someone please tell her why even B-level missions had 2000 Alliance currency, and yet a proper A-level mission had a reward of zero? She had fought so hard to reclaim the awakened zombie, and the result was zero. Who could endure this? Song Ku's eyes went dull, appearing deeply affected, 
and the other two couldn't bear to watch. Sister Su Xing was still trying to figure out how to console her. It's okay, you don't have to pay me back. Zhuang Qinyan interrupted him, it's not that bad. Didn't you accept a B-level mission as well? Song Ke's eyes regained a glimmer of hope. Oh, right. At least there were still 2000 Alliance credits. When clearing the zombies on the first floor of the city hall, did you notice that these people resemble the publishers? Zhuang Qinyan pointed at Lu Xiaowei and the others in the center of the room. I'll go, go ask, Song Ku stood up. Wait, Zhuang Qinyan tugged at her hood. It's not appropriate for you to go. They are very hostile towards us right now. Although Song Ku didn't personally kill Zhang Lei, they all entered the room together. Not to mention that she had casually tossed Zhang Lei's body with a knife earlier. The way these people looked at them was filled with hatred. What should we do then? Song Ku looked troubled. There's someone best suited for this task, Zhuang Qinyan replied cryptically. Who, who is it? Song Ku asked. Who? Su Xing also inquired. Then, he found that the two of them looked at him at the same time. Su Xing, QAQ. Lu Xiaowei had finally managed to regain some composure but sat in place in a dazed and absent minded state, unable to snap out of it. The two remaining male colleagues, physically and mentally exhausted, finally succumbed to fatigue, clutching their heads and slumping to the ground. Just then, a boy with curly hair and big blinking eyes approached slowly. The boy glanced at the lifeless Lu Xiaowei for a moment, then shifted his gaze to the two tired men and softly asked, Big brothers, can I ask you a question? Their willingness to communicate was not strong, but considering that the person asking was an adorable child, one of the slightly plump men nodded in a somewhat more friendly manner. Go ahead. Thank you, big brother. Su Xing blinked his innocent large eyes, looking grateful. He lowered his head and fiddled with his terminal, displaying his task interface. My sister and I came to Luliport because we received this task, clear the first floor zombies at the city hall. Big brother, was this task issued by you? Have you been trapped here for a long time? Su Xing's words were quite skillful. Firstly, he explained their reason for coming, emphasizing that they were here for a rescue mission. Unlike the beautiful woman who often resorted to violence, they were definitely not associated with her. Secondly, after inquiring if the man was the task issuer, he added a caring message, gradually breaking down the man's psychological defenses. Sure enough, the man's attitude softened a bit when he heard Su Xing's words. Yes, I posted it on the survival platform. He took out his phone. Like Hua City D99 District, the Star Network in Luli Port D50 District was also paralyzed, but there was an app called Doomsday Self-Help Platform on his phone. It didn't require an internet connection, was universally used throughout the Alliance, updated in real time, and allowed users to exchange information and post-rescue missions. Su Xing compared it with his terminal and confirmed that this man was the issuer of the B-level task. However, the man's interface was noticeably different from his. It didn't display any ABCDE levels or any information about Awakener teams it was likely that the Alliance's central hub or artificial intelligence collected help requests from various regions. Evaluated them, and then forwarded them to the corresponding local Awakeners. The man gazed at Su Xing's brightly shining cartoon terminal, his eyes devoid of envy but filled with numbness. Citizens in different regions had different statuses, rights, and access to information. People in District D would never use a terminal that surpassed the local technological level unless they became Awakeners. Su Xing turned off the projection and innocently tilted his head. Big brother, the zombies outside have been cleared. You're safe now and you can leave through the main entrance. Indeed, all the zombies in the city hall had been thoroughly cleared. They could leave without much danger. As for the Awakeners, as Zhuang Qinyan put it, they didn't have the time to bother with these small fries. Good, thank you, the man said, his spirit somewhat lifted upon hearing this news. Then, big brother, could you please help us confirm the completion of the mission? Su Xing folded his hands together, his eyes moist, wearing a pitiful expression that seemed to say, please. All right. Not far away, Song Ku was momentarily speechless. 
She turned her head and looked at Zhuang Qinyan with an expressionless face. Why did you teach, teach him all this? You've corrupted Xiaoxing. Me? Corrupted him? Zhuang Qinyan looked puzzled. Ahui, let's go, the man said, taking heavy steps towards his companions. No we should take Lazy with us. Lu Xiaoyi clutched Zhang Lei's head tightly, unwilling to let go. Didn't you just hear? There are many people downstairs looking for Lazy. If we bring him along, we won't be able to escape, the man explained in a pained tone. Lu Xiaoyi shook her head in anguish. Another man shouted with deep sorrow, Ahui, you need to snap out of it. The people who died can't come back. Don't let Lazy sacrifice for us in vain. We need to survive. In the end, Lu Xiaoyi was led away by the two men. They were employees here and were familiar with the labyrinthine corridors of City Hall. Soon, they disappeared into the depths of the corridor. After these people left, two minutes later, Su Cha, who had been leaning against the wall, suddenly whispered, Pursuers are coming. Song Ko released a trace of her mental power and indeed sensed numerous scattered and diverse energy signatures nearby. These awakeners were systematically searching each room, and the sounds of their approach were faintly audible from the office. In a little while, they would be close to this room. Beautiful sister's expression first tightened, but then she seemed to think of something and raised her gaze towards Song Ku's group. Hey, you guys across the hall. Aren't you going to come up with a plan? How are we going to get out of here? The three members of V587 displayed an unexpected level of telepathy at this moment. One looked up at the sky, another looked down at the ground, and the third smiled and stared at the others, but none of them spoke. Beautiful sister exclaimed, what's going on? You had all sorts of tactics when dealing with us earlier, and now you're just giving up. You. She pointed her brightly painted finger at Song Ku and then turned to Zhuang Qinyan. And you, weren't you pretty capable just now? Don't tell me that's all you've got. Sorry. Provocation doesn't work on me, Zhuang Qinyan replied calmly. Beautiful sister. Okay, you guys aren't in a hurry. It's just us who are in a hurry, right? Feeling a bit embarrassed by her words, Song Ku took two steps forward, approached the window, and peered down. The office was about three stories high above the ground, taller than a typical building. She could manage a jump, but it was clear that Zhuang Qinyan and Su Xing wouldn't be able to. Song Kuk picked up the cold jagged blade in the corner and used her eyes to ask Zhuang Qinyan if they should break the window to escape. After pondering for a moment, Zhuang Qinyan extended his hand to her. Give me your terminal. Song Ku removed her needle-shaped terminal and handed it to him. After a few moments of manipulation, they waited for two or three minutes until they suddenly heard a knocking sound from outside the window. The group immediately turned their attention toward the noise and were surprised to discover a mechanical arm. As the electronic eye hanging from the tip of the arm noticed Song Ku's group looking at it, it excitedly shook and gestured with its metallic joints, making a beckoning motion. It was the two transport carriages left at the entrance. The carriages were parked right under the window in the shadow of the building, an extremely concealed location, far from all exits and unlikely to be discovered easily. A long mechanical arm extended all the way up to the third floor, gripping the window sill, then flattening out and unfolding, forming an escape slide. Song Ku, can this even work? Others looked at Zhuang Qinyan in shock. I tried sending the coordinates to it, and it calculated and built the nearest escape route automatically, Zhuang Qinyan explained calmly, without taking undue credit. A simple artificial intelligence possessed this level of intelligence. How terrifying must Ilya, the lord of Ferrara city, be? For the first time, Song Ko started to wonder about the extent of artificial intelligence development in Ferrara. With the slide in place, the group of awakeners slid down smoothly, escaping from under the noses of the heavily guarded pursuers. After leaving City Hall, they ran several kilometers before slowing down, making sure no one was pursuing them. Zhuang Qinyan looked at the other two. Let's part ways here. It's better for both of our sides. Beautiful sister raised her chin. Of course, I have no objections. Their temporary cooperation was fragile, 
even more fragile than paper, easily broken with just a bit of moisture. Moreover, both sides were still wary of each other. Song Ku pulled the two carriages and took a step in the direction where the transport vehicle was parked. Coincidentally, Beautiful Sister and Su Cha also took a step in that direction. Song Ku hesitated for a moment, then lifted her foot and took another step. Oh! They bumped into each other again. She immediately stared cautiously at the people in front of her. What were they up to? Why were they following her? Oh, are you also returning to Ferrara? Beautiful sister teased. She noticed Song Ku's expression and raised an eyebrow. Why are you looking at me like that? You don't know me. She seemed somewhat surprised, her gaze shifting between Song Ku, Su Xing, and Zhuang Qinyan. You really don't know me are you visitors? Who are you, must we know you? Su Xing couldn't help muttering. The beautiful sister burst out laughing, her face absolutely radiant. No need, it's even better if you don't know me. I'm Lin Yuyu. Maybe we'll meet again someday. Farewell. Chapter, 49 What's the cheapest price? I thank you for your honeyed words your sweet words. Song Ku wore a deeply resentful expression, and once again, she pressed the replay button. I thank you for your honeyed words. That's enough, Zhuang Qinyan couldn't bear it any longer and reached out to press the terminals off button. You've listened to it over a dozen times. Song Ku sighed. Listening to it a dozen times still didn't help. Why couldn't she figure it out? Blame herself, blame her complete lack of musical appreciation cells she couldn't recognize the voice that had been singing in her ear before. How could she not be familiar with it? This song, Thank You for Loving Me, had been playing on a loop throughout the journey to Ferrara. The entire train compartment had calloused ears from hearing it so many times, and she almost had the lyrics memorized. But but Lin Yuyu, wasn't she Ferrara's top sweet songstress? When she shouted I'm not a saint. With both hands around her chest, she was incredibly fierce, with absolutely no sweetness involved. Song Ku sighed once again. No wonder Lin Yuyu would hide in the shadows and refuse to reveal her identity, causing her idol image to crumble. This was a major taboo for idols how disappointed her fans must be. She wondered how the conservative Maeda Jio would react if he saw Lin Yuyu's domineering side, what expression would he make? Suddenly, she was a bit curious wait, no, no. Song Ku shook her head to clear away these jumbled thoughts. The current issue was why, if Lin Yuyu didn't want to reveal her identity, did she specifically tell Song Ku her name before leaving? The heart of the beautiful sister was like a needle in the sea, completely inscrutable. Song Ku sighed for the third time. Stop thinking about it. Since she dared to tell you, she must be confident that you won't reveal it. Let's go back to Ferrara and complete the mission first, Zhuang Qinyan admired her troubled expression and casually commented. Okay. Song Ku patted her face, agreeing. She decided not to dwell on things she couldn't understand for now. If the other party said there would be a chance to meet again, she would ask her when they met. They reattached the two detached carriages back to the main body and harvested some zombies nearby to fill the entire transport vehicle. Song Ku and her companions returned to the cockpit, and the artificial intelligence automatically initiated the return program. The vehicle changed its direction and sped towards Ferrara. After another ten hours of a long journey, they safely returned to the commission center. The transport vehicle stopped at the entrance to the high-altitude track, and the horn on the control panel sounded honk-honk, reminding them to disembark. Song Ku glanced back, observing the pure black metal body of the vehicle, which looked like a well-fed beast, quietly lurking in the darkness. Roughly estimating based on a capacity of 200 per carriage, this vehicle had at least 1,200 zombies on board. What could be the purpose of transporting so many monsters into Ferrara City? Where is it going? Song Ku turned to Zhuang Qinyan, who knew everything, and asked with confusion. For now, it's unclear. The final route has been encrypted, and we don't have permission to view it. Zombies, supplies, and the throne race competition Song Ku attempted to connect these clues, but her mind remained hazy. She furrowed her brow and proposed a bold idea, can we follow it? 
Before Zhuang Qinyan could respond, the horn sounded twice again, and a message appeared on the screen, warning. You have exceeded the time limit. Please leave the cockpit immediately, or the emergency plan will be activated. Warning. You have exceeded the time limit. Zhuang Qinyan turned off the incessantly beeping alarm system, but the cockpit continued to flicker with lights, making it hard for them to keep their eyes open. It seems not possible. The transport vehicle could travel on the high-altitude track within Ferrara City, and its speed was significantly faster than when they were wandering around in Luli Port. If they got off now, Song Ku was certain that it would disappear in the blink of an eye, and they wouldn't be able to catch up. Zhuang Qinyan narrowed his eyes for a moment and suddenly thought of something. Your artifact, can you track it if it's not nearby? Within five kilometers, I can, Song Ku nodded. As long as she injected a bit of her spiritual energy during the transformation, she could sense the presence of the artifact within a certain range. Zhuang Qinyan smiled, then it's easy. Let's install a tracker on it. You mean? Leaving the artifact intentionally inside the cockpit? This way, even if the transport vehicle disappeared from their sight, Song Ku could still roughly sense its location with her spiritual power if they chased after it with all their might. The artificial intelligence in the vehicle had no independent consciousness, so they openly discussed their plan without worrying about it eavesdropping. After their discussion, Song Ku even placed a swallowtail dart under her seat in front of the artificial intelligence. The artifact was composed of supernatural elements, not electronic devices, so the poor artificial intelligence remained completely unaware, continuing to beep insistently, urging them to leave. After the three of them got off, the transport vehicle switched to high orbit mode and accelerated with a whoosh, instantly disappearing into the colorful night sky. No rush for now. Let's go complete the mission first, Zhuang Qinyan suggested. Song Ku entered the commission hall and found an empty self-service terminal. She scanned her captain's awakener ID, and the back end confirmed that Team V587 had successfully completed the B-level mission, earning them 2,000 alliance coins. B-level mission code VB00046, clearing zombies on the first floor of the municipal hall in Luli Port completion confirmed. Points earned, 200. Alliance coins earned, 2,000. Friendly reminder, your team has entered the overall ranking list for C-72 district. Do you want to make it public? Yes slash no. Song could dismissively close the friendly reminder and looked at Su Xing happily. Xiaoxing, here's your money back. She had money now. A total of 2,000 alliance coins. Su Xing shook his head. Sister, you can keep it for now. What if we need it later? We can settle it all at once in the future. Oh, all right, Song Ku thought it was a good idea to keep some money on hand. You go back and rest. We're going after the vehicle. Su Xing didn't respond immediately. He scuffed his foot on the floor, showing reluctance to leave a few days ago, he was just eating, drinking, and sleeping in the hotel, which wasn't too bad. However, during this time with Song Ku, even though the process was a bit heart-pounding, it was much happier than being alone. Su Weiguo was dead and he had no close relatives left. He and Song Ku didn't know each other in District F, their relationship was almost like that of strangers, but he couldn't explain why, he felt like sticking with her. Sister, can you take me with you? I won't be a nuisance, Su Xing suddenly hugged Song Ku's arm, pleading in a childish tone. Su Xing was indeed quite sensible, and his courage had grown significantly since the last time they went to the food factory. Except for a brief loss of control when using his ice ability at the beginning, he had become accustomed to the influence of Zhuang Qinyan, if not intimidated by it, and he obediently did what he was asked. Su Xing gently shook Song Ku's arm, his dewy eyes resembling grapes soaked in water. Sister, pretty please, I'll be very well behaved. Behind them, Zhuang Qinyan made a quiet clicking sound with his tongue, his brows furrowing in disdain. This little white lotus was blooming again. As expected, Song Ku completely surrendered to his soft and persuasive tactics. All right, all right. Take a left here. Song Ku used her spiritual power to track the swallowtail dart, and the three of them changed direction once again. 
They had initially thought that the transport vehicle would take a more remote route and eventually stop in the wilderness. However, the reality was quite the opposite. It drove all the way to the central city area, dragging six carriages filled with zombies, passing through the neon-lit Ferris wheel and the mist-shrouded skyscrapers. Finally, it stopped at the back of a magnificent theater. The marble floor tiles slowly sank, and a massive hole appeared, just enough for it to pass through. The transport vehicle slid down slowly, entering the depths below. They entered a theater. Song Ku took two steps back and looked up at the building in front of her. The gray brick walls were both vintage and retro, while the exquisite reliefs were gorgeous and extravagant. The strong contrast made it hard to look away. This was Ferrara's most famous art sanctuary the Saqqara Theater. Countless drones hovered in the sky, dancing around the venue. Thousands of cameras flashed in the dark night. The broadcasts of every concert held here could fetch a sky-high price. Just standing at the entrance, they could hear the deafening cheers and shouts from inside. Song Ku stepped forward to enter, but a mechanical gate stopped her. An electronic eye scanned her face and displayed a recognition failed prompt. A staff member in a tailcoat approached, took off his hat, and elegantly greeted them. Good evening, my dear ladies and gentlemen. Are you here to watch tonight's preliminary round? What round? Song Ku asked. The throne race competition, round 162 preliminaries. Do you have any preferred contestants or teams that you support? I can distribute support gifts for you. No, we don't. Throne race competition. Song Ko looked at the man behind her, and whether it was the popular favorite contestants projected on the walls or the posters scattered on the ground, they all indicated that a fierce competition was taking place inside. No favorite contestants. Are you here to experience the atmosphere in person then? That's indeed a wise choice. Even though the terminal is quite realistic, it can't compare to the experience of being here in person. Although the ticket prices are higher, you can see that we have more than 10,000 tracking projection devices. Every detail is crystal clear. I guarantee that tonight, you won't regret it. The man's tone fluctuated, and his smile remained at the same angle, making it quite eerie. Song Ku, it's an artificial intelligence, Zhuang Qinyan suddenly said. Song Ku looked back at the staff member, who seemed immune to the words artificial intelligence and maintained an impeccable smile. Since they were already here, it didn't seem right not to go inside. How much are the tickets? Song Ku asked nervously. The staff member replied, We have the most luxurious and immersive hoverball tickets, allowing you to get up close to the center of the arena. Today's special price is only 2,888 coins. We also have VIP box seats for 1,888 coins, offering excellent views of the entire arena. Which one would you like? What's the cheapest price? Song Ku pursed her lips and tightly held her terminal. The staff member's smile disappeared, and his exaggerated tone turned into a lifeless straight line. Standing platform tickets, 800 coins per person. Song Ku was about to speak when he added, Sorry, no discounts. 800 coins per person, which meant 2400 for the three of them. Song Ku, who had just received 2000 coins, said, she was so broke, really. Chapter, 50. Luo Qingha. I'm your dog. 2000 alliance coins, of course, were not enough for three people to enter. Su Xing, understanding the situation well, stepped forward and made it clear that he was the one who insisted on coming along, so he could be self-reliant and cover his own ticket money. Song Ku, a dignified team captain, avoided the embarrassing situation of not having enough money, and the three of them were able to enter smoothly. Walking along a dim and narrow corridor, about five or six minutes later, their view suddenly became bright and spacious. Stepping onto the stands, they were hit by a wave of heat and a deafening roar of the crowd, like a surging tide, almost knocking them over. Surprisingly, the interior of the Saqqara Theater did not follow a typical stage design but resembled an ancient arena from the old civilization. It was wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, with a sunken area at the bottom several tens of meters deep, surrounded by five-story high horseshoe-shaped tiers. Regardless of where they stood, they had an unobstructed view of the events below. It seemed to be half-time now, 
as the arena floor was empty, but the stands were packed to capacity, filled with people. The three of them squeezed their way into the crowd, Su Xing's face contorted from the effort, and Zhuang Qingyan's wheelchair had almost no space to maneuver. While the surrounding audience was lively and animated, Song Ke's nose seemed to detect a lingering, inescapable smell of blood. After a while, a spotlight descended from above the theater, and tiny points of light converged to reveal a handsome man in a cyan robe, holding a jade flute. His sleeves moved without the wind, and his raven-like long eyelashes slowly opened, a faintly aloof smile gracing his lips. Hello, everyone. The second round of tonight's preliminary competition is about to begin. I am the special guest for this match, Luo Qingha. The audience erupted in enthusiastic cheers, especially from the female spectators. Luo Qingha. I'm your dog. Not far from Song Ku, a piercing scream echoed. Song Ku almost lost her balance and her jaw dropped as she turned to see Crazy Kihori, whom she had crossed paths with once before, squeezed into Luo Qingha's fan group. She was flushed with excitement, shouting with all her might and gazing at the figure under the spotlight with an infatuated expression. Luo Qingha smiled gracefully, pulling out an ancient scroll from his long sleeves and unfolding it with elegant movements. Next up is Atu and Ashui, a team of two. They are not only teammates but also lovers who depend on each other through life and death. Let's look forward to their debut. You, the audience, can vote for them through the terminals to support your favorite team. As long as they successfully complete the challenge and have a popular vote rate of 60%, they can advance to the next round of the main competition. He spoke calmly and unhurriedly, with a voice as clear as a mountain spring, exuding a refined and cultured aura, resembling a noble young man. The female fan group, led by Crazy Kihori, once again erupted in cheers. Woohoo! My Qingha is so handsome. Such a high-class Qingha should be matched with a low-class me. In the center of the arena, a pure white platform slowly rose from the ground, and a young man and woman dressed in bright red and blue combat suits stood on it, full of confidence. They waved to the audience with cheerful smiles. The two of them took their positions on the arena, and ATU playfully made a peace sign towards a nearby drone, and his smiling face appeared on the floating projection. It looked like they were on vacation, and laughter resounded from all directions, mixed with slight jeers. All right then, let the game begin, Luo Qingha said calmly as he closed the scroll. As his voice fell, the iron barriers on both sides of the arena slowly opened. Following that, there came a rumbling of footsteps and a deep growling from underground, getting closer and closer. In the next moment almost a hundred zombies surged out. The enthusiasm of the audience was instantly ignited, and they stood up, raising their arms and cheering loudly. Song Ku's eyes widened slightly, looking over in disbelief. This so-called preliminary competition was actually a battle against zombies. She exchanged a glance with Zhuang Qingyan, realizing that the zombies were the excellent nutrition for this event. The abilities of the two participants on the field were quite unique. ATU possessed the power of mirror teleportation, allowing him to suck zombies into a separate space, while Ashui had the ability of self-replication. For every zombie ATU sucked, she released a duplicate to fight inside the mirror. The two of them coordinated seamlessly, continually circling the edge of the arena and adopting a strategy of taking out the zombies one by one. In no time, the arena was filled with their mirrors and clones, maneuvering the zombies in circles. The battle raged on, and Luo Qingha's melodious voice resonated once again. The performance of the two contestants is outstanding. Let's see the audience support rate. The drone cut to a close-up, and ATU and Ashui's support rate had already skyrocketed to 43%. Song Ko also noticed the zero-distance hoverballs, which cost 2,888 alliance coins to ride. They were floating alongside numerous drones and balloons, sometimes kicked by running zombies, and sometimes colliding with the mirrors and changing direction. Inside, people tumbled around excitedly, faces flushed with exhilaration, vigorously waving their arms. So, this was the immersive experience. The hobbies of the wealthy were indeed unique. The good times didn't last long. When only one-third of the zombies remained, ATU and Ashui's coordination showed a flaw. 
Perhaps they had released too many clones, or maybe the remaining zombies had become more difficult to deal with. In one of the mirrors, Ashui's attack exposed a vulnerability and was instantly seized by a fierce zombie, brutally torn in half. ATU's mirror shattered in an instant, and the zombies from the independent space rushed out, frantically chasing the remaining clones. What are they doing? Get rid of it quickly. Don't just stand there in a daze. Move. Do they have any on-the-spot reactions? The audience shouted in dissatisfaction, cursing and some even took off their shoes to throw them into the center of the arena, but they were mercilessly stopped by patrolling security robots. However, the situation continued to worsen. After the first zombie ran out, ATU and Ashui's rhythm was completely disrupted. The two were in a state of chaos, and Ashui's duplicates were diminishing rapidly. Finally, another zombie leaped out of the mirror and bit down on the real Ashui's neck. Blood splattered everywhere. ATU's eyes were filled with despair as he rushed forward for a few steps and then abruptly stopped. Losing Ashui's means of attack, he was merely a pure support, and what use could he be? Soon, he would also become a victim of these monsters. Forfeit, I forfeit. ATU shouted desperately, then fled in a terrified scramble. As he saw the zombies closing in on him, he unexpectedly dove into his own mirror, leaving Ashui, who was still struggling, behind. With a few quick shifts, he escaped to the other corner of the arena. Faced with imminent danger, ATU's instinct for self-preservation was laid bare for all to see. The audience immediately erupted in thunderous boos from the stands. ATU, what kind of man are you? You're garbage. I even voted for you. Give me a refund. I want a refund. Unfortunately, ATU was still saved. The mechanical arms responsible for maintaining order acted promptly and drove the remaining zombies back underground. Challenge failed. The large gray letters appeared on the floating screen, and the team's light for ATU and Ashui dimmed. The posters of the participants around the arena were ruthlessly taken down. Sigh. Sighs filled the venue. It's a pity, they couldn't make it through the preliminary round in the end, Luo Qingha said with a faint smile. The next match will begin in 10 minutes, and before that, we have prepared a fantastic halftime performance for everyone. A dazzling AI band descended from the sky, igniting the atmosphere with energetic drumbeats, deep bass, and explosive electric guitar sounds. It's the Rainbow Band. I love their nostalgic heavy metal style. The audience, who had just been sighing and lamenting, immediately got excited again, swaying and head-banging to the intense rhythm. Su Xing had long hidden behind Song Ku when Ashui was being bitten, covering his eyes and refusing to watch. Meanwhile, Song Ku, despite being in the midst of the noisy arena, felt a coldness in her heart. Fighting against zombies should have been a means of self-preservation in a post-apocalyptic world, but in Ferrara, in the Sakara theater that claimed to be a temple of art and freedom, hunting had turned into a frenzied catharsis. Song Ku didn't really sympathize with the zombies. If it were her in the arena, she would have acted without hesitation. However, being watched by so many people was a surreal experience. Could killing really stimulate people's desires? Why were some so passionate about blood and violence? Why did Ferrara organize events like this? Do you still want to watch? Zhuang Qingyan frowned and asked loudly. He wasn't unable to watch it was just that the platform was too crowded, and even the air wasn't flowing properly. Zhuang Qingyan had endured it for a long time, enduring until the match was over. When the people next to him were about to take off their shoes, he couldn't bear it any longer. Let's go. Since none of their companions had the desire to continue watching, Song Ko also found out where the zombies were heading and prepared to leave first. She gripped the wheelchair handles and struggled to make her way through the crowd. Approaching the exit, she happened to overhear two men talking in the corridor. Old Zhang, why do you have that expression again? Did you lose another bet? Don't mention it. I was pretty confident in ATU initially and bet a few tickets. Now they're all down the drain. How much did you lose this time? Old Zhang shook his head without revealing the amount, saying stubbornly, fortunately, the odds weren't high otherwise, would have lost everything. His friend chuckled, 
I told you your information wasn't up to par, didn't I? ATU and Ashui can barely handle a sea level mission. They came to participate in the throne race, isn't it just to feed the zombies? You still went and bet you deserve to be a losing better. I know, but I thought maybe he could have a breakthrough. After all, as long as they pass the preliminary round, they can earn 50,000 alliance coins and 100 points. Who among those awakeners doesn't want points? True, but 2D level are still a bit of a stretch. Thankfully, the competition requires participants to be D level or higher otherwise, there would be too many dull matches. Song Ku's footsteps halted between the two men, and she asked incredulously, Ho how much money? Old Zhang and his friend's conversation was interrupted, and they both turned to look at her. 50,000 alliance coins and 100 points. It's all in the registration rules. Song Ku, who had just lost a large sum of money, instantly had sparkles in her eyes. 50,000 alliance coins. That's a lot of money. Not only could it clear her debt to Xiaoxing in one go, but there would still be 40,000 left over. If she were to take on missions, it might take her a long time to save up that amount, but now, by just passing the preliminary round, she could get it for free. Who wouldn't be tempted by that? Song Ku's wide sparkling eyes was easy to understand. Old Zhang stopped his conversation and scrutinized her, little girl, do you also want to participate? Song Ku hesitated. She didn't particularly enjoy the atmosphere of slaughter in the throne race, but earning money was currently her top priority. During her time in Ferrara, she had realized that being broke was a major obstacle to her every move. Are you an awakener? Are you at least at D-level? Song Ku shook her head. She still didn't know. Old Zhang interpreted her headshake as a negative response and, perhaps still irritable from losing money, sneered, I've watched over a hundred preliminary matches, and someone like you wouldn't last a hundred seconds up there. When the zombie chops you, it's just like chopping vegetables. Are you planning to perform a one-second surrender for the audience? Beside them, Su Xing couldn't help but burst into laughter. Who was chopping whom? This guy was so confident. His friend patted old Zhang on the shoulder and, with an apologetic smile to Song Ku, said, Sorry, sorry, please don't mind him. He's just irritated from losing money. Then, he turned to old Zhang, Why don't you pipe down? You've watched over a hundred matches, how many times have you actually hit the mark? Not even once. Old Zhang, exposed in public, raised his voice, How have I never hit it? Don't talk nonsense, I I. I don't believe it. If even someone like her can make it to the main event, then in the next round, no, in every future round, I'll bet my entire fortune on her. I promise to follow through.